and our eyes have scarcely yet learned to distinguish within the Egyptian style the Old Kingdom and Middle Empire elements corresponding to Doric and Gothic youth and to Ionic and Baroque maturity, because from the Twelfth Dynasty these elements interpenetrate in all harmony in the former language of all the greater works. The task before art history is to write the comparative biographies of the great styles, all of which as organisms of the same genus possess structurally cognate life histories. In the beginning there is the timid, despondent, naked expression of a newly awakened soul which is still seeking for a relation between itself and the world that, though its proper creation, yet is presented as alien and unfriendly. There is the child's fearfulness in Bishop Burnwood's building at Hildsheim, in the early Christian catacomb painting, and in the pillar halls of the Egyptian Fourth Dynasty. A February of art, a deep presentiment of a coming wealth of forms, an immense suppressed tension, lies over the landscape that, still wholly rustic, is adorning itself with the first strongholds and townlets. Then follows the joyous mounting into the high Gothic into the Constantinian age with its pillared basilicas and its domical churches, into the relief ornament of the fifth dynasty temple. Being is understood, a sacred form language has been completely mastered and radiates its glory, and the style ripens into a majestic symbolism of directional depth and of destiny. But fervent youth comes to an end, and contradictions arise within the soul itself. The Renaissance, the Dionysiac musical hostility to Apollonian Doric, the Byzantine of 450 that looks to Alexandria and away from the overjoyed art of Antioch, indicate a moment of resistance, of effective or ineffective impulse to destroy what has been acquired. It is very difficult to elucidate this moment, and an attempt to do so would be out of place here. And now it is the manhood of the style history that comes on. The culture is changing into the intellectuality of the great cities that will now dominate the countryside, and per I pass you the style is becoming intellectualized also. The grand symbolism withers, the riot of superhuman forms dies down, milder and more worldly arts drive out the great art of developed stone. Even in Egypt sculpture and fresco are emboldened to lighter movement. The artist appears and plans what formerly grew out of the soil. Once more existence becomes self-conscious and now, detached from the land and the dream and the mystery, stands questioning, and wrestles for an expression of its new duty, as at the beginning of Baroque when Michelangelo, in wild discontent and kicking against the limitations of his art, piles up the dome of St. Peter's, in the age of Justinian I which built Hagia Sophia and the mosaic deck domed basilicas of Ravenna, at the beginning of that twelfth dynasty in Egypt which the Greeks condensed under the name of Caesostris, and at the decisive epoch in Hellas, c. 600, whose architecture probably, nay certainly, expressed that which is echoed for us in its grandchild Aeschylus. Then comes the gleaming autumn of the style. Once more the soul depicts its happiness, this time conscious of self-completion. The return to nature which already thinkers and poets, Rousseau, Gorgias and their contemporaries in the other cultures, begin to feel and to proclaim, reveals itself in the form world of the arts as a sensitive longing and presentiment of the end. A perfectly clear intellect, joyous urbanity, the sorrow of a parting, these are the colors of these last culture decades of which Toleran was to remark later, qui n'a pas vécu avant 1789 ni connaît pas la douceur de vivre. So it was, too, with the free, sunny and superfine art of Egypt under Caesostras III, c. 1850 BC, and the brief moments of satiated happiness that produce the varied splendor of Pericles' Acropolis and the works of Zeuxis and Phidias. A thousand years later again, in the age of the Omeyyads, we meet it in the glad fairyland of Moorish architecture with its fragile columns and horseshoe arches that seem to melt into air in an iridescence of arabesques and stalactites. A thousand years more, and we see it in the music of Haydn and Mozart, in Dresden Shepherdesses, in the pictures of Watt and Gardy, and the works of German master builders at Dresden, Potsdam. Würzburg and Vienna. Then the style fades out. 
the former language of the Arctium and the Dresden's winner, honeycombed with intellect, fragile, ready for self-destruction, is followed by the flat and senile classicism that we find in the Hellenistic megalopolis, the Byzantium of 900 and the empire modes of the north. The end is a sunset reflected in forms revived for a moment by pedant or by eclectic, semi-earnestness and doubtful genuineness dominate the world of the arts. We today are in this condition, playing a tedious game with dead forms to keep up the illusion of a living art. 9. No one has yet perceived that Arabian art is a single phenomenon. It is an idea that can only take shape when we have ceased to be deceived by the crust which overlaid the young East with post-classical art exercises that, whether they were imitation antique or chose their elements from proper or alien sources at will, were in any case long past all inward life, when we have discovered that early Christian art, together with every really living element in late Roman, is in fact the springtime of the Arabian style, and when we see the epoch of Justinian I as exactly on a par with the Spanish-Venetian Baroque that ruled Europe in the great days of Charles V or Philip II, and the palaces of Byzantium and their magnificent battle pictures and pageant scenes, the vanished glories that inspired the pens of courtly literati like Procopius, on a par with the palaces of early Baroque in Madrid. Vienna and Rome and the great decorative painting of Rubens and Tintoretto. This Arabian style embraces the entire first millennium of our era. It thus stands at a critical position in the picture of a general history of art, and its organic connectedness has been imperceptible under the erroneous conventions thereof. 41. Strange and, if these studies have given us the eye for things latent, moving it is to see how this young soul, held in bondage to the intellect of the classical and, above all, to the political omnipotence of Rome, dares not rouse itself into freedom but humbly subjects itself to obsolete value forms and tries to be content with Greek language, Greek ideas and Greek art elements. Devout acceptance of the powers of the strong day is present in every young culture and is the sign of its youth. Witness the humility of Gothic man in his pious high arched spaces with their pillar statuary and their light filled pictures in glass, the high tension of the Egyptian soul in the midst of its world of pyramids, lotus columns and relief lined halls. But in this instance there is the additional element of an intellectual prostration before forms really dead but supposedly eternal. Yet in spite of all, the taking over and continuance of these forms came to nothing. Involuntarily, unobserved, not supported by an inherent pride as Gothic was, but felt, there in Roman Syria, almost as a lamentable come down, a whole new form world grew up. Under a mask of grey echo Roman conventions, it filled even Rome itself. The master masons of the Pantheon and the Imperial Fora were Syrians. In no other example is the primitive force of a young soul so manifest as here where it has to make its own world by sheer conquest. In this as in every other culture, spring seeks to express its spirituality in a new ornamentation and, above all, in religious architecture as the sublime form of that ornamentation. But of all this rich form world the only part that, till recently, has been taken into account has been the western edge of it which consequently has been assumed to be the true home and habitat of Magian style history. In reality, in matters of style as in those of religion, science and social political life, what we find there is only an irradiation from outside the eastern border of the empire. Regal 42 and Stzygowski 43 have discovered this, but if we are to go further and derive at a conspectus of the development of Arabian art we have to shed many philological and religious prepossessions. The misfortune is that our art research, although it no longer recognizes the religious frontiers, nevertheless unconsciously assumes them. For there is in reality no such thing as a late classical nor an early Christian nor yet an Islamic art in the sense of an art proper to each of those faiths and evolved by the community of believers as such. On the contrary, the totality of these religions, from Armenia to Southern Arabia and Axum, and from Persia to Byzantium and Alexandria, possess a broad uniformity of artistic expression that overrides the contradictions of detail. 44 All these religions, the Christian, the Jewish, the Persian, the Manichaean, the Syncretic, 
possessed cult buildings and, at any rate in their script, an ornamentation of the first rank, and however different the items of their dogmas, they are all pervaded by an homogeneous religiousness and express it in a homogeneous symbolism of depth experience. There is something in the basilicas of Christianity, Hellenistic, Hebrew and Baal cults, and in the Mithraeum, 45 the Mazdaist fire temple and the mosque, that tells of a like spirituality, it is the cavern feeling. It becomes therefore the bounden duty of research to seek to establish the hitherto completely neglected architecture of the South Arabian and Persian temple, the Syrian and the Mesopotamian synagogue, the cult buildings of Eastern Asia Minor and even Abyssinia semicolon 46 and in respect of Christianity to investigate no longer merely the Pauline West but also the Nestorian East that stretched from the Euphrates to China where the old records significantly call its buildings Persian temples. If in all this building practically nothing has, so far, forced itself specially upon our notice, it is fair to suppose that both the advance of Christianity first and that of Islam later could change the religion of a place of worship without contradicting its plan and style. We know that this is the case with late classical temples but how many of the churches in Armenia may once have been fire temples. The artistic center of this culture was very definitely, as Tsigowski has observed, in the triangle of cities Idissa, Nisibis, Amida. To the westward of it is the domain of the late classical pseudomorphosis, the Pauline Christianity that conquered in the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon, Western Judaism and the cults of syncretism. The architectural type of the pseudomorphosis, both for Jew and Gentile, is the Basilica.47 it employs the means of the classical to express the opposite thereof, and is unable to free itself from these means, that is the essence and the tragedy of pseudomorphosis. The more classical syncretism modifies a cult that is resident in a Euclidean place into one which is professed by a community of indefinite estate. The more the interior of the temple gains in importance over the exterior without needing to change either plan or roof or columns very much. The space feeling is different, but not, at first, the means of expressing it. In the pagan religious architecture of the imperial age there is a perceptible, though never yet perceived, movement from the holy corporeal Augustan temple, in which the cellar is the architectural expression of nothingness to one in which the interior only possesses meaning. Finally the external picture of the peripteros of the Doric is transferred to the four inside walls. Columns ranked in front of a windowless wall are a denial of space beyond, that is, for the classical beholder, of space within, and for the magian, of space without. It is therefore a question of minor importance whether the entire space is covered in as in the basilica proper, or only the sanctuary as in the sun temple of Baalbek with the great forecourt, 48 which later becomes a standing element of the mosque and is probably of South Arabian origin. 49 that the nave originates in a court surrounded by halls is suggested not only by the special development of the basilica type in the East Syrian steppe, particularly Oran but also by the basic disposition of porch, nave and choir as stages leading to the altar, for the aisles, originally the side halls of the court, end blind, and only the nave proper corresponds with the apse. This basic meaning is very evident in St. Paul at Rome, albeit the pseudomorphosis, inversion of the classical temple, dictated the technical means, viz, column and architrave. How symbolic is the Christian reconstruction of the Temple of Aphrodisias in Caria, in which the cellar within the columns is abolished and replaced by a new wall outside them.50. Outside the domain of the pseudomorphosis, on the contrary, the cavern feeling was free to develop its own formal language, and here therefore it is the definite roof that is emphasized, whereas in the other domain the protest against the classical feeling led merely to the development of an interior when and where the various possibilities of dome, cupola, barrel vaulting, rib vaulting, came into existence as technical methods is, as we have already said, a matter of no significance. What is of decisive importance is the fact that about the time of Christ's birth and the rise of the new world feeling, the new space symbolism must have begun to make use of these forms and to develop them further in expressiveness.
it will very likely come to be shown that the fire temples and synagogues of Mesopotamia, and possibly also the temples of Athta in southern Arabia, were originally cupola buildings. 51 Certainly the pagan Mana temple at Gaza was so, and long before Pauline Christianity took possession of these forms under Constantine, builders of Eastern origin had introduced them, as novelties to please the taste of the megalopolitans, into all parts of the Roman Empire. In Rome itself, Apollodorus of Damascus was employed under Trajan for the vaulting of the Temple of Venus and Rome and the dome chambers of the baths of Caracalla and the so-called Minerva Medica of Gallinus as time were built by Syrians. But the masterpiece, the earliest of all mosques, is the Pantheon as rebuilt by Hadrian. Here, without a doubt, the emperor was imitating, for the satisfaction of his own taste, cult buildings that he had seen in the East. 52. The architecture of the central dome, in which the Magian world feeling achieved its purest expression, extended beyond the limits of the Roman Empire. For the Nestorian Christianity that extended from Armenia even into China it was the only form, as it was also for the Manichaeans and the Mazdaists, and it also impressed itself victoriously upon the Basilica of the West when the pseudomorphosis began to crumble and the last cults of syncretism to die out. In southern France, where there were Manichaean sects even as late as the Crusades, the form of the East was domesticated. Under Justinian, the interpenetration of the two produced the Domical Basilica of Byzantium and Ravenna. The pure basilica was pushed into the Germanic West, that to be transformed by the energy of the Faustian depth impulse into the cathedral. The domed basilica, again, spread from Byzantium and Armenia into Russia where it came by slow degrees to be felt as an element of exterior architecture belonging to a symbolism concentrated in the roof. But in the Arabian world Islam, the heir of Monophysite and Nestorian Christianity and of the Jews and the Persians, carried the development through to the end. When it turned Hagia Sophia into a mosque it only resumed possession of an old property. Islamic domical building followed Mazdaist and Nestorian along the same tracks to Shantung and to India. Mosques grew up in the far west in Spain and Sicily, where, moreover, the style appears rather in its East Aramean Persian than in its West Aramean Syrian mode. 53 And while Venice looked to Byzantium and Ravenna, St. Mark, the brilliant age of the Norman Hohenstaufen rule in Palermo taught the cities of the Italian west coast and even Florence, to admire and to imitate these Moorish buildings. More than one of the motives that the Renaissance thought were classical, for example, the court surrounded by halls and the union of column and arch, really originated thus. What is true as regards architecture is even more so as regards ornamentation, which in the Arabian world very early overcame all figure representation and swallowed it up in itself. Then, as arabesque, it advanced to meet, to charm and to mislead the young art intention of the West. The early Christian late classical art of the pseudomorphosis shows the same ornament plus figure mixture of the inherited alien and the inborn proper as does the Carolingian early Romanesque of, especially, southern France and upper Italy. In the one case Hellenistic intermingles with early Magian, in the other Moro Byzantine with Faustian. The researcher has to examine line after line and ornament after ornament to detect the form feeling which differentiates the one stratum from the other. In every architrave, in every frieze, there is to be found a secret battle between the conscious old and the unconscious, but victorious, new motives. One is confounded by this general interpenetration of the late Hellenistic and the early Arabian form senses, as one sees it, for example, in Roman portrait busts, here it is often only in the treatment of the hair that the new way of expression is manifested, in the acanthus shoots which show, often on one and the same frieze, chisel work and drill work side by side, in the sarcophagi of the 3rd century in which a childlike feeling of the Giotto and Pisno character is entangled with a certain latent megalopolitan naturalism that reminds one more or less of David or Carstens, and in buildings such as the Basilica of Maxentius 54 and many parts of the Baths and the Imperial Fora that are still very classical in conception. Nevertheless, 
the Arabian soul was cheated of its maturity, like a young tree that is hindered and stunted in its growth by a fallen old giant of the forest. Here there was no brilliant instant felt and experienced as such, like that of ours in which, simultaneously with the Crusades, the wooden beams of the cathedral roof flocked themselves into rib vaulting and an interior was made to actualize and fulfill the idea of infinite space. The political creation of Diocletian was shattered in its glory upon the fact that, standing as he did on classical ground, he had to accept the whole mass of the administrative tradition of Herbs Roma, this sufficed to reduce his work to a mere reform of obsolete conditions. And yet he was the first of the caliphs. With him, the idea of the Arabian state emerges clearly into the light. It is Diocletian's dispensation, together with that of the Sassanids which preceded it somewhat and served in all respects as its model, that gives us the first notion of the ideal that ought to have gone on to fulfillment here. But so it was in all things. To this very day we admire his last creations of the classical, because we cannot or will not regard them otherwise. The thought of Plotinus and Marcus Aurelius, the cults of Isis, Mithras and the Sun God, the Diophantine mathematics, and, lastly, the whole of the art which streamed towards us from the eastern marches of the Roman Empire and for which Antioch and Alexandria were merely points d'appui. This alone is sufficient to explain the intense vehemence with which the Arabian culture, when released at length from artistic as from other fetters, flung itself upon all the lands that had inwardly belonged to it for centuries past. It is the sign of a soul that feels itself in a hurry, that notes in fear the first symptoms of old age before it has had youth. This emancipation of Magian mankind is without a parallel. Syria, is conquered, or rather delivered, in 634. Damascus falls in 637, Ctesiphton in 637. In 641 Egypt and India are reached, in 647 Carthage, in 676 Samarkand, in 710 Spain. And in 732 the Arabs stood before Paris. Into these few years was compressed the whole sum of saved up passions, postponed hopes, reserved deeds, that in the slow maturing of other cultures suffice to fill the history of centuries. The Crusaders before Jerusalem, the Hohenstaufen in Sicily, the Hansa in the Baltic, the Teutonic Knights in the Slavonic East, the Spaniards in America, the Portuguese in the East Indies, the Empire of Charles V on which the sun never set, the beginnings of England's colonial power under Cromwell, the equivalent of all this was shot out in one discharge that carried the Arabs to Spain and France, India and Turkestan. True, all cultures, the Egyptian, the Mexican and the Chinese accepted, have grown up under the tutelage of some older culture. Each of the form worlds shows certain alien traits. Thus, the Faustian soul of the Gothic, already predisposed to reverence by the Arabian origin of Christianity, grasped at the treasures of late Arabian art. An unmistakably southern, one might even say an Arabian. Gothic wove itself over the facades of the Burgundian and Provencal cathedrals, dominated with the magic of stone the outward language of Strasbourg Minster, and fought a silent battle in statues and porches, fabric patterns, carvings and metalwork, and not less in the intricate figures of scholastic philosophy and in that intensely western symbol, the Grey Legend 55 with the Nordic prime feeling of Viking Gothic that rules the interior of the Magdeburg Cathedral, the points of Freiburg Minster and the mysticism of Meister Eckhart. More than once the pointed arch threatens to burst its restraining line and to transform itself into the horseshoe arch of Moorish Norman architecture. So also the Apollinean art of the Doric Spring, whose first efforts are practically lost to us doubtless took over Egyptian elements to a very large extent, and by and through these came to its own proper symbolism. But the Magian soul of the pseudomorphosis had not the courage to appropriate alien means without yielding to them. And this is why the physiognomic of the Magian soul has still so much to disclose to the quester. X. The idea of the macrocosm, then, 
which presents itself in the style problem as simplified and capable of treatment, poses a multitude of tasks for the future to tackle. To make the form world of the arts available as a means of penetrating the spirituality of entire cultures, by handling it in a thoroughly physiognomic and symbolic spirit, is an undertaking that has not hitherto got beyond speculations of which the inadequacy is obvious. We are hardly as yet aware that there may be a psychology of the metaphysical basis of all great architectures. We have no idea what there is to discover in the change of meaning that a form of pure extension undergoes when it is taken over into another culture. The history of the column has never yet been written, nor have we any notion of the deeply symbolic significances that reside in the means and the instruments of art. Consider Mosaic. In Hellenic times it was made up of pieces of marble, it was opaque and corporeal Euclidean. For example, the famous Battle of Issus at Naples, and it adorned the floor. But with the awakening of the Arabian soul it came to be built up of pieces of glass and set in fused gold, and it simply covered the walls and roofs of the domed basilica. This early Arabian mosaic picturing corresponds exactly, as to phase, with the glass picturing of Gothic cathedrals, both being early arts and ancillary to religious architectures. The one by letting in the light enlarges the church space into world space, while the other transforms it into the magic, gold shimmering sphere which bears men away from earthly actuality into the visions of Plotinus, Origen, the Manichaeans, the Gnostics and the Fathers, and the apocalyptic poems. Consider, again, the beautiful notion of uniting the round arch and the column, this again is a Syrian, if not an North Arabian, creation of the third, or high gothic, century. 56 The revolutionary importance of this motif, which is specifically Magian, has never in the least degree been recognized, on the contrary, it has always been assumed to be classical, and for most of us indeed it is even representatively classical. The Egyptians ignored any deep relation between the roof and the column, the latter was for them a plant column, and represented not stoutness but growth. Classical man, in his turn, for whom the monolithic column was the mightiest symbol of Euclidean existence, all body, all unity, all steadiness, connected it, in the strictest proportions of vertical and horizontal, of strength and load, with his architrave. But here, in this union of arch and column which the Renaissance in its tragicomic deludedness admired as expressly classical, though it was a notion that the classical neither possessed nor could possess, the bodily principle of load and inertia is rejected and the arch is made to spring clear and open out of the slender column. The idea actualized here is at once a liberation from all earth gravity and a capture of space and between this element and that of the dome which soars free but yet encloses the great cavern, there is the deep relation of like meaning. The one and the other are eminently and powerfully imagined, and they come to their logical fulfillment in the Rococo stage of Moorish mosques and castles, wherein ethereally delicate columns, often growing out of, rather than based on, the ground, seem to be empowered by some secret magic to carry a whole world of innumerable notched arcs gleaming ornaments, stalactites, and vaultings saturated with colors. The full importance of this basic form of Arabian architecture may be expressed by saying that the combination of column and architrave is the classical, that of column and round arch the Arabian, and that of pillar and pointed arch the Faustian light motif. Take, further, the history of the Acanthus motive.57 in the form in which it appears. For example, on the monument of Lysicrates at Athens, it is one of the most distinctive in classical ornamentation. It has body, it is and remains individual, and its structure is capable of being taken in at one glance. But already it appears heavier and richer in the ornament of the imperial fora, nervas, trojans, and that of the temple of Mars Alta. The organic disposition has become so complicated that, as a rule, it requires to be studied, and the tendency to fill up the surfaces appears. In Byzantine art, of which Regal thirty years ago noticed the latent Saracenic character though he had no suspicion of the connection brought to light here, the acanthus leaf was broken up into endless tendril work which, as in Hagia Sophia, 
is disposed quite inorganically over whole surfaces. To the classical motive are added the old Aramean vine and palm leaves, which have already played a part in Jewish ornamentation. The interlaced borders of late Roman mosaic pavements and sarcophagus edges, and even geometrical plain patterns are introduced, and finally, throughout the Persian and Anatolian world, mobility and bizarrery culminate in the arabesque. This is the genuine magin motive, anti-plastic to the last degree, hostile to the pictorial and to the bodily alike. Itself bodiless, it disembodies the object over which its endless richness of web is drawn. A masterpiece of this kind, a piece of architecture completely opened out into ornamentation, is the facade of the castle of Machetta in Mo built by the Garsanids. 58 The craft art of Byzantine Islamic style, hitherto called Lombard, Frankish, Celtic or Old Nordic, which invaded the whole youthful West and dominated the Carolingian Empire, was largely practiced by Oriental craftsmen or imported as patterns for our own weavers, metal workers and armorers. 59 Ravenna, Lucca, Venice, Granada, Palermo were the efficient centers of this then highly civilized formal language, in the year 1000. When in the north the forms of a new culture were already being developed and established, Italy was still entirely dominated by it. Take, lastly, the changed point of view towards the human body. With the victory of the Arabian world feeling, men's conception of it underwent a complete revolution. In almost every Roman head of the period 100-250 that the Vatican collection contains, one may perceive the opposition of Apollonian and Magian feeling, and of muscular position and look as different bases of expression. Even in Rome itself, since Hadrian, the sculptor made constant use of the drill, an instrument which was wholly repugnant to the Euclidean feeling towards stone, for whereas the chisel brings out the limiting surfaces and ipso facto affirms the corporeal and material nature of the marble block, the drill, in breaking the surfaces and creating effects of light and shade, denies it and accordingly the sculptors, be they Christian or pagan, lose the old feeling for the phenomenon of the naked body. One has only to look at the shallow and empty Antinous statues, and yet these were quite definitely classical. Here it is only the head that is physiognomically of interest, as it never is in Attic sculpture. The drapery is given quite a new meaning, and simply dominates the whole appearance. The consul statues in the Capitol and Museum 60 are conspicuous examples. The pupils are bored, and the eyes look into the distance, so that the whole expression of the work lies no longer in its body but in that magin principle of the pneuma which Neoplatonism and the decisions of the church councils, Mithraism and Mazdaism alike presume in man. The pagan father Iamblichus, about 300, wrote a book concerning statues of gods in which the divine is substantially present and working upon the beholder.61 against this idea of the image, an idea of the pseudomorphosis, the east and the south rose in a storm of iconoclasm, and the sources of this iconoclasm lay in a conception of artistic creation that is nearly impossible for us to understand. Chapter 7 Music and Plastic I the ARTS of form. I. The dearest type of symbolic expression that the world feeling of higher mankind has found for itself is, if we accept the mathematical scientific domain of presentation and the symbolism of its basic ideas, that of the arts of form, comma one of which the number is legion. And with these arts we count music in its many and very dissimilar kinds. Had these been brought within the domain of art historical research instead of being put in a class apart from that of the pictorial plastic art, we should have progressed very much further in our understanding of the import of this evolution towards an end. For the formative impulse that is at work in the wordless two arts can never be understood until we come to regard the distinction between optical and acoustic means as only a superficial one. To talk of the art of the eye and the art of the ear takes us no further. It is not such things that divide one art from another. Only the 19th century could so overestimate the influence of physiological conditions as to apply it to expression, conception or communion. 
a singing picture of Claude Lorraine or of what does not really address itself to the bodily eye any more than the space straining music since Bach addresses itself to the bodily ear. The classical relation between artwork and sense organ, of which we so often and so erroneously remind ourselves here, is something quite different from, something far simpler and more material than ours. We read Othello and Faust and we study orchestral scores, that is, we change one sense agency for another in order to let the undiluted spirit of these works take effect upon us. Here there is always an appeal from the outer senses to the inner, to the truly Faustian and wholly unclassical power of imagination. Only thus can we understand Shakespeare's ceaseless change of scene as against the classical unity of place. In extreme cases indeed, for instance in that of Faust itself, no representation of the work, that is, of its full content, is physically possible. But in music too, in the unaccompanied a cappella of the Palestrina style as well as a fortiori in the passions of Heinrich Schutz, in the fugues of Bach, in the last quartets of Beethoven, and in Tristan, we livingly experience behind the sensuous impressions a whole world of others. And it is only through these latter that all the fullness and depth of the work begins to be present to us, and it is only immediately, through the images of blonde, brown, dusky and golden colors, of sunsets and distant ranked mountain summits, of storms and spring landscapes, of founded cities and strange faces which harmony conjures up for us, that it tells us something of itself. It is not an incident that Beethoven wrote his last works when he was deaf, deafness merely released him from the last fetters. For this music, sight and hearing equally are bridges into the soul and nothing more. To the Greek this visionary kind of artistic enjoyment was utterly alien. He felt the marble with his eye, and the thick tones of an allos moved him almost corporally. For him, I and dear are the receivers of the whole of the impression that he wished to receive. But for us this had ceased to be true even at the stage of Gothic. In the actual, tones are something extended, limited and numerable just as lines and colors are, harmony, melody, rhyme and rhythm no less so than perspective, proportion, chiaroscuro and outline. The distance separating two kinds of painting can be infinitely greater than that separating the painting and the music of a period. Considered in relation to a statue of Myron, the art of a Pausin landscape is the same as that of a contemporary chamber cantata, that of Rembrandt as that of the organ works of Buxtehude, Bachelbel and Bach, that of Gardi as that of the Mozart opera. The inner form language is so nearly identical that the difference between optical and acoustic means is negligible. The importance which the science of art has always attached to a timeless and conceptual delimitation of the individual art spheres only proves that the fundamentals of the problem have not been attacked. Arts are living units, and the living is incapable of being dissected. The first act of the learned pedant has always been to partition the infinitely wide domain into provinces determined by perfectly superficial criteria of medium and technique and to endow these provinces with eternal validity and immutable, form principles. Thus he separated music and painting, music and drama, painting and sculpture. And then he proceeded to define the art of painting, the art of sculpture, and so on. But in fact the technical form language is no more than the mask of the real work. Style is not what the shallow semper, worthy contemporary of Darwin and materialism, supposed it to be, the product of material, technique, and purpose. It is the very opposite of this, something inaccessible to art reason, a revelation of the metaphysical order, a mysterious must, a destiny. With the material boundaries of the different arts it has no concern whatever. To classify the arts according to the character of the sense impression, then, is to pervert the problem of form in its very enunciation. For how is it possible to predicate a genus sculpture of so general a character as to admit of general laws being evolved from it? What is sculpture? Take painting again. There is no such thing as the art of painting, and anyone who compares a drawing of Raphael, affected by outline, with one of Titian affected by flecks of light and shade, without feeling that they belong to two different arts, 
Anyone who does not realize a dissimilarity of essence between the works of Giotto or Mantegna, relief, created by brush stroke, and those of Vermeer or Goya, music, created on colored canvas, such a one will never grasp the deeper questions. As for the frescoes of Polygnatus and the mosaics of Ravenna, there is not even the similarity of technical means to bring them within the alleged genus, and what is there in common between an etching and the art of Francis Angelico, or a proto-Corinthian vase painting in a Gothic cathedral window, or the reliefs of Egypt and those of the Parthenon? If an art has boundaries at all, boundaries of its soul become form, they are historical and not technical or physiological boundaries. Three, an art is an organism, not a system. There is no art genus that runs through all the centuries and all the cultures. Even where, as in the case of the Renaissance, supposed technical traditions momentarily deceive us into a belief in the eternal validity of antique art laws, there is at bottom entire discrepance. There is nothing in Greek and Roman art that stands in any relation whatever to the formal language of a Donatello statue or a painting of Signorelli or a facade of Michelangelo. Inwardly, the Quattrocento is related to the contemporary Gothic and to nothing else. The fact of the archaic Greek Apollo type being influenced by Egyptian portraiture, or early Tuscan representation by Etruscan tomb painting, implies precisely what is implied by that of Bach's writing a fugue upon an alien theme, he shows what he can express with it. Every individual art, Chinese landscape or Egyptian plastic or Gothic counterpoint, is once existent, and departs with its soul and its symbolism never to return. 2. With this, the notion of form opens out immensely. Not only the technical instrument, not only the formal language, but also the choice of art genus itself is seen to be an expression means. What the creation of a masterpiece means for an individual artist, the night watch for Rembrandt or the Meistersinger for Wagner, what the creation of a species of art, comprehended as such, means for the life history of a culture. It is epochal. Apart from the merest externals, each such art is an individual organism without predecessor or successor. Its theory, technique and convention all belong to its character, and contain nothing of eternal or universal validity. When one of these arts is born, when it is spent, whether it dies or is transmuted into another, why this or that art is dominant in or absent from a particular culture, all these are questions of form in the highest sense, just as is that other question of why individual painters and musicians unconsciously avoid certain shades and harmonies or, on the contrary, show preferences so marked that authorship attributions can be based on them. The importance of these groups of questions has not yet been recognized by theory, even by that of the present day. And yet it is precisely from this side, the side of their physiognomic, that the arts are accessible to the understanding. Hitherto it has been supposed, without the slightest examination of the weighty questions that the supposition involves, that the several arts specified in the conventional classification scheme, the validity of which is assumed, are all possible at all times and places, and the absence of one or another of them in particular cases is attributed to the accidental lack of creative personalities or impelling circumstances or discriminating patrons to guide art on its way. Here we have what I call a transference of the causality principle from the world of the become to that of the becoming. Having no eye for the perfectly different logic and necessity of the living, for destiny and the inevitableness and unique occurrence of its expression possibilities, men had recourse to tangible and obvious causes for the building of their art history, which thus came to consist of a series of events of only superficial concordance. I have already, in the earliest pages of this work, exposed the shallowness of the notion of a linear progression of mankind through the stages of ancient, medieval and modern, a notion that has made us blind to the true history and structure of higher cultures. The history of art is a conspicuous case in point. Having assumed as self-evident the existence of a number of constant and well-defined provinces of art, one proceeded to order the history of these several provinces according to the, equally self-evident, scheme of ancient medieval modern, to the exclusion, of course, 
of Indian and East Asiatic art, of the art of Axum and Saba, of the Sassanids and of Russia, which if not omitted altogether were at best relegated to appendices. It occurred to no one that such results argued unsoundness in the method, the scheme was there, demanded facts, and must at any price be fed with them. And so a futile up and down course was stolidly traced out. Static times were described as natural pauses, it was called decline when some great art in reality died, and renaissance where an eye really free from prepossessions would have seen another art being born in another landscape to express another humanity. Even today we are still taught that the renaissance was a rebirth of the classical. And the conclusion was drawn that it is possible and right to take up arts that are found weak or even dead, in this respect the present is a veritable battlefield, and set them going again by conscious reformation program or forced revival. And yet it is precisely in this problem of the end, the impressively sudden end, of a great art, the end of the Attic drama in Euripides of Florentine sculpture with Michelangelo, of instrumental music in Liszt, Wagner and Bruckner, that the organic character of these arts is most evident. If we look closely enough we shall have no difficulty in convincing ourselves that no one art of any greatness has ever been reborn. Of the pyramid style nothing passed over into the Doric. Nothing connects the classical temple with the basilica of the Middle East, for the mere taking over of the classical column is a structural member, though to a superficial observer it seems a fact of the first importance, weighs no more in reality than Goethe's employment of the old mythology in the classical Walpurgis night scene of Faust. To believe genuinely in a rebirth of classical art, or any classical art, in the western 15th century requires a rare stretch of the imagination and that a great art may die not merely with the culture but within it, we may see from the fate of music in the classical world. Four possibilities of great music there must have been in the Doric springtime, how otherwise can we account for the importance of old-fashioned Sparta in the eyes of such musicians as there were later, for Terpander, Thaltas and Alcman were effective though when elsewhere the statuary art was merely infantile. And yet the late classical world refrained. In just the same fashion everything that the Magian culture had attempted in the way of frontal portraiture, deep relief and mosaic finally succumbed before the arabesque, and everything of the plastic that had sprung up in the shade of Gothic cathedrals at Chartres, Reims, Bamberg, Nuremberg, in the Nuremberg of Peter Visser and the Florence of Verrocchio, vanished before the oil painting of Venice and the instrumental music of the Baroque. 3. The Temple of Poseidon at Pestum and the Minster of Ulm, works of the ripest Doric and the ripest Gothic, differ precisely as the Euclidean geometry of bodily bounding surfaces differs from the analytical geometry of the position of points in space referred to spatial axes. All classical building begins from the outside, all western from the inside. The Arabian also begins with the inside, but it stays there. There is one and only one soul the Faustian, that craves for a style which drives through walls into the limitless universe of space and makes both the exterior and the interior of the building complementary images of one and the same world feeling. The exterior of the basilica and the domical building may be a field for ornamentation, but architecture it is not. The impression that meets the beholder as he approaches is that of something shielding, something that hides a secret. The former language in the cavern twilight exists for the faithful only, that is the factor common to the highest examples of the style and to the simplest Mithrasa and catacombs, the prime powerful utterance of a new soul. Now, as soon as the Germanic spirit takes possession of the basilical type, there begins a wondrous mutation of all structural parts, as to both position and significance. Here in the Faustian north the outer form of the building, be it cathedral or mere dwelling house, begins to be brought into relation with the meaning that governs the arrangement of the interior, a meaning undisclosed in the mosque and non-existent in the temple. The Faustian building has a visage and not merely a facade, whereas the front of a peripteros is, after all, only one of four sides and the center domed building in principle has not even a front, and with this visage, this head, 
is associated an articulated trunk that draws itself out through the broad plain like the cathedral at Speyer, or erects itself to the heavens like the innumerable spires of the original design of Reims. The motive of the facade, which greets the beholder and tells him the inner meaning of the house, dominates not only individual major buildings but also the whole aspect of our streets, squares and towns with their characteristic wealth of windows.5. The great architecture of the early period is ever the mother of all following arts, it determines the choice of them and the spirit of them. Accordingly, we find that the history of the classical shaping art is one untiring effort to accomplish one single ideal, viz, the conquest of the free-standing human body is the vessel of the puerile present. The temple of the naked body was to it what the cathedral of voices was to the Faustian from earliest counterpoint to the orchestral writing of the 18th century. We have failed hitherto to understand the emotional force of this secular tendency of the Apollonian, because we have not felt how the purely material, soulless body, for the temple of the body, too, has no interior. Is the object which archaic relief, Corinthian painting on clay, and Attic fresco were all striving to obtain until Polycletus and Phidias showed how to achieve it in full. We have, with a wonderful blindness, assumed this kind of sculpture as both authoritative and universally possible, as in fact, the art of sculpture. We have written its history as one concerned with all peoples and periods, and even today our sculptors, under the influence of unproved Renaissance doctrines, speak of the naked human body as the noblest and most genuine object of the art of sculpture. Yet in reality this statue art, the art of the naked body standing free upon its footing and appreciable from all sides alike, existed in the classical and the classical only, for it was that culture alone which quite decisively refused to transcend sense limits in favor of space. The Egyptian statue is always meant to be seen from the front, it is a variant of plain relief. And the seemingly classically conceived statues of the Renaissance, we are astounded, as soon as it occurs to us to count them, to find how few of them there are six, nothing but a semi-Gothic reminiscence. The evolution of this rigorously non-spatial art occupies the three centuries from 650 to 350 a period extending from the completion of the Doric and the simultaneous appearance of a tendency to free the figures from the Egyptian limitation of frontalness 7 to the coming of the Hellenistic and its illusion painting which closed off the grand style. This sculpture will never be rightly appreciated until it is regarded as the last and highest classical, as springing from a plain art, first obeying and then overcoming the fresco. No doubt the technical origin can be traced to experiments in figure wise treatment of the pristine column, or the plates that served to cover the temple wall, 8, and no doubt there are here and there imitations of Egyptian works, seated figures of Multis, although very few Greek artists can ever have seen 1.9, but as a form ideal, the statue goes back through relief to the archaic clay painting in which fresco also originated. Relief, like fresco, is tied to the bodily wall. All this sculpture right down to Myron may be considered as relief detached from the plane. In the end, the figure is treated as a self-contained body apart from the mass of the building, but it remains essentially a silhouette in front of a wall. Ten direction in depth is excluded, and the work is spread out frontally before the beholder. Even the masias of Myron can be copied upon vases or coins without much trouble or appreciable foreshortenings. 11 Consequently, of the two major late arts after 650, fresco definitely has the priority. The small stock of types is always to be found first in vase figuring, which is often exactly paralleled by quite late sculptures. We know that the centaur group of the West Pediment at Olympia was worked out from a painting. On the Aegina Temple, the advance from the west to the east pediment is an advance from the fresco character to the body character. The change is completed about 460 with polycletus, and thenceforward plastic groups become the model for strict painting. But it is from Lysippus that the wholly cubic and always treatment becomes thoroughly veristic and yields fact. Till then, even in the case of Praxicles, we have still a lateral or planar development of the subject, 
with a clear outline that is only fully effective in respect of one or two standpoints. But an undeviating testimony to the picture origin of independent sculpture is the practice of polychroming the marble, a practice unknown to the Renaissance and to classicism, which would have felt it as barbaric twelve, and we may say the same of the gold and ivory statuary and the enamel overlaying of bronze, a metal which already possesses a shining golden tone of its own. 4. The corresponding stage of Western art occupies the three centuries 1500 to 1800, between the end of late Gothic and the decay of Rococo which marks the end of the great Faustian style. In this period, conformably to the persistent growth into consciousness of the will to spatial transcendence, it is instrumental music that develops into the ruling art. At the beginning, in the 17th century, music uses the characteristic tone colors of the instruments, and the contrasts of strings and wind, human voices and instrumental voices, as means wherewith to faint. Its, quite unconscious, ambition is to parallel the great masters from Titian to Velasquez and Rembrandt. It makes pictures, in the Sonata from Gabrielli, d. 1612, to Corelli, d. 1713, every movement shows a theme embellished with graces and set upon the background of a basso continuo, paints heroic landscapes, in the pastoral cantata, and draws a portrait in lines of melody, in Montevid's Lament of Ariadne, 1608. With the German masters, all this goes. Painting can take music no further. Music becomes itself absolute, it is music that, quite unconsciously again, dominates both painting and architecture in the 18th century. And, ever more and more decisively, sculpture fades out from among the deeper possibilities of this form world. What distinguishes painting as it was before, from painting as it was after, the shift from Florence to Venice, or, to put it more definitely, what separates the painting of Raphael and that of Titian as two entirely distinct arts, is that the plastic spirit of the one associates painting with relief, while the musical spirit of the other works in a technique of visible brush strokes and atmospheric depth effects that is akin to the chromatic of string and wind choruses. It is an opposition and not a transition that we have before us, and the recognition of the fact is vital to our understanding of the organism of these arts. Here, if anywhere, we have to guard against the abstract hypothesis of eternal art laws. Painting is a mere word. Gothic glass painting was an element of Gothic architecture, the servant of its strict symbolism just as the Egyptian and the Arabian and every other art in this stage was the servant of the stone language. Draped figures were built up as cathedrals were. Their folds were an ornamentation of extreme sincerity and severe expressiveness. To criticize their stiffness from a naturalistic imitative point of view is to miss the point entirely. Similarly music is a mere word. Some music there has been everywhere and always, even before any genuine culture, even among the beasts. But the serious music of the classical was nothing but a plastic for the ear. The tetrachords, chromatic and enharmonic, have a structural and not a harmonic meaning colon 13 but this is the very difference between body and space. This music was single voiced. The few instruments that it employed were all developed in respect of capacity for tone plastic, and naturally therefore it rejected the Egyptian harp, an instrument that was probably akin in tone color to the harpsichord. But, above all, the melody, like classical verse from Homer to Hadrian's time, was treated quantitatively and not accentually, that is, the syllables, their bodies and their extent, decided the rhythm. The few fragments that remain suffice to show us that the sensuous charm of this art is something outside our comprehension, but this very fact should cause us also to reconsider our ideas as to the impressions purposed and achieved by the statuary and the fresco, for we do not and cannot experience the charm that these exercised upon the Greek eye. Equally incomprehensible to us is Chinese music, in which, according to educated Chinese, we are never able to distinguish gay from grave. 14 vice versa, to the Chinese all the music of the West without distinction is March music. 
such as the impression that the rhythmic dynamic of our life makes upon the accentless tower of the Chinese soul, and, indeed, the impression that our entire culture makes upon an alien humanity, the directional energy of our church naves and our storied facades, the depth perspectives of our pictures, the march of our tragedy and narrative, not to mention our techniques and the whole course of our private and public life. We ourselves have accent in our blood and therefore do not notice it. But when our rhythm is juxtaposed with that of an alien life, we find the discordance intolerable. Arabian music, again, is quite another world. Hitherto we have only observed it through the medium of the pseudomorphosis, as represented by Byzantine hymns and Jewish Samadhi, and even these we know only insofar as they have penetrated to the churches of the far west as antiphons, responsorial Samadhi and Ambrosian chants. 15 But it is self evident that not only the religious west of Edessa, the syncretic cults, especially Syrian sun worship, the Gnostic and the Mandean, but also those to the east, Mazdaists, Manichaeans, Mithraists, the synagogues of Iraq and in due course the Nestorian Christians, must have possessed a sacred music of the same style, that side by side with this a gay secular music developed, above all, amongst the South Arabian and Sassanid chivalry, and that both found their culmination in the Moorish style that reigned from Spain to Persia. Out of all this wealth, the Faustian soul borrowed only some few church forms and, moreover, in borrowing them, it instantly transformed them root and branch, 10th century, Huckbald, Guido d'Arezzo. Melodic accent and beat produced the march, and polyphony, like the rhyme of contemporary poetry, the image of endless space. To understand this, we have to distinguish between the imitative 16 and the ornamental sides of music, and although owing to the fleeting nature of all tone creations 17 our knowledge is limited to the musical history of our own West, yet this is quite sufficient to reveal the duality of development which is one of the master keys of all art history. The one is soul, landscape, feeling, the other strict form, style, school. West Europe has an ornamental music of the grand style, corresponding to the full plastic of the classical, which is associated with the architectural history of the cathedral, which is closely akin to scholasticism and mysticism, and which finds its laws in the motherland of high gothic between Seine and Celt. Counterpoint developed simultaneously with the flying buttress system and its source was the Romanesque style of the Forksmadon and the Discant with their simple parallel and contrary motion. 18 It is an architecture of human voices and, like the statuary group and the glass paintings, is only conceivable in the setting of these stone vaultings. With them it is a high art of space, of that space to which Nicholas of Orezm, Bishop of Lisieux, gave mathematical meaning by the introduction of coordinates. 19 This is the genuine Rhinassi to and reformatio as Joachim of Floris saw it at the end of the 12th century, the birth of a new soul mirrored in the former language of a new art. Along with this there came into being in castle and village a secular imitative music, that of troubadours, minisanger and minstrels. As Ars Nova this travelled from the courts of Provence to the palaces of Tuscan patricians about 1300, the time of Dante and Petrarch. It consisted of simple melodies that appealed to the heart with their major and minor, of canzoni, madrigals and catches, and it included also a type of galanti operetta, Adam de la Hale's Robin and Marion. After 1400, these forms give rise to forms of collective singing, the ronde and the ballade. All this is art for a public. 20 scenes are painted from life, scenes of love, hunting, chivalry. The point of it is in the melodic inventiveness, instead of in the symbolism of its linear progress. Thus, musically as otherwise, the castle and the cathedral are distinct. The cathedral is music and the castle makes music. The one begins with theory, the other with impromptu, it is the distinction between waking consciousness and living existence, between the spiritual and the nightly singer. Imitation stands nearest to life and direction and therefore begins with melody, while the symbolism of counterpoint belongs to extension and through polyphony signifies infinite space.
the result was, on the one side, a store of eternal rules and, on the other, an inexhaustible fund of folk melodies on which even the 18th century was still drawing. The same contrast reveals itself, artistically, in the class opposition of Renaissance and Reformation. The courtly taste of Florence was antipathetic to the spirit of counterpoint, the evolution of strict musical form from the motet to the four-voice mass through Dunstapel, Binchois and Dufay, c. 1430, proceeded wholly within the magic circle of Gothic architecture. From Francis Angelico to Michelangelo the great Netherlanders ruled alone in ornamental music. Lorenzo de' Medici found no one in Florence who understood the strict style, and had to send for Dufay. And while in this region Leonardo and Raphael were painting, in the north Okegum, d. 1495, and his school and Josquin de Prez, d. 1511, brought the formal polyphony of human voices to the height of fulfillment. The transition into the late age was heralded in Rome and Venice. With Baroque the leadership in music passes to Italy. But at the same time architecture ceases to be the ruling art and there is formed a group of Faustian special arts in which oil painting occupies the central place. About 1560 the empire of the human voice comes to an end in the a cappella style of Palestrina and Orlando Lassu, both d. 1594. Its powers could no longer express the passionate drive into the infinite, and it made way for the chorus of instruments, wind and string. And thereupon Venice produced Titian music, the new madrigal that in its flow and ebb follows the sense of the text. The music of the Gothic is architectural and vocal, that of the Baroque pictorial and instrumental. The one builds, the other operates by means of motives. For all the arts have become urban and therefore secular. We pass from super-personal form to the personal expression of the master, and shortly before 1600 Italy produces the basso continua which requires virtuosi and not pious participants. Thenceforward, the great task was to extend the tone corpus into the infinity, or rather to resolve it into an infinite space of tone. Gothic had developed the instruments into families of definite timbre. But the newborn orchestra no longer observes limitations imposed by the human voice, but treats it as a voice to be combined with other voices, at the same moment as our mathematic proceeds from the geometrical analysis of Fermat to the purely functional analysis of Descartes. In Zarlino's Harmony, 1558, appears a genuine perspective of puronal space. We begin to distinguish between ornamental and fundamental instruments. Melody and embellishment join to produce the motive, and this in development leads to the rebirth of counterpoint in the form of the fugal style, of which Fresco Baldi was the first master and Bach the culmination. To the vocal masses and motets the Baroque opposes its grand, orchestrally conceived forms of the oratorio, Carissimi, the cantata, Viadana, and the opera, Monteverde. Whether a bass melody be set against upper voices, or upper voices be concerted against one another upon a background of basso continuo, always sound worlds of characteristic expression quality work reciprocally upon one another in the infinity of tonal space, supporting, intensifying, raising, illuminating, threatening, overshadowing, a music hall of interplay, scarcely intelligible save through ideas of contemporary analysis. From out of these forms of the early Baroque the preceded, in the 17th century, the sonata-like forms of suite, symphony and concerto grosso. The inner structure and the sequence of movements. The thematic working out and modulation became more and more firmly established. And thus was reached the great, immensely dynamic, form in which music, now completely bodiless, was raised by Corelli and Handel and Bach to be the ruling art of the West. When Newton and Leibniz, about 1670, discovered the infinitesimal calculus, the fugal style was fulfilled. And when, about 1740, Euler began the definitive formulation of functional analysis, Stamitz and his generation were discovering the last and ripest form of musical ornamentation, 
the four-part movement 21 as vehicle of pure and unlimited motion. 4. At that time, there was still this one step to be taken. The theme of the fugue is, that of the new sonata movement becomes, and the issue of its working out is in the one case a picture, in the other a drama. Instead of a series of pictures we get a cyclic succession comma 22 and the real source of this tone language was in the possibilities, realized at last, of our deepest and most intimate kind of music, the music of the strings. Certain it is that the violin is the noblest of all instruments that the Faustian soul has imagined and trained for the expression of its last secrets, and certain it is, too, that it is in string quartets and violin sonatas that it has experienced its most transcendent and most holy moments of full illumination. Here, in chamber music, Western art as a whole reaches its highest point. Here our prime symbol of endless space is expressed as completely as the spearman of Polycletus expresses that of intense bodileanness. When one of those ineffably yearning violin melodies wanders through the space is expanded around it by the orchestration of Tartini or Nardini, Haydn, Mozart or Beethoven, we know ourselves in the presence of an art beside which that of the Acropolis is alone worthy to be set. With this, the Faustian music becomes dominant among the Faustian arts. It banishes the plastic of the statue and tolerates only the minor art, an entirely musical, refined, unclassical and counter-renaissance art, of porcelain, which, as a discovery of the West, is contemporary with the rise of chamber music to full effectiveness. Whereas the statuary of Gothic is through and through architectural ornamentation, human is pallier work, that of the Rococo remarkably exemplifies the pseudo-plastic that results from entire subjection to the formal language of music, and shows to what a degree the technique governing the presented foreground can be in contradiction with the real expression language that is hidden behind it. Compare Cois Vox apostrophe S23, 1686, crouching Venus in the Louvre with its classical prototype in the Vatican. In the one plastic is understudying music, in the other plastic is itself. Terms like staccato, accelerando, and dante and allegro best describe the kind of movements that we have here, the flow of the lines, the fluidity in the being of the stone itself which like the porcelain has more or less lost its fine compactness. Hence our feeling that the granular marble is out of keeping. Hence, too, the wholly unclassical tendency to work with reference to effects of light and shade. This is quite in conformity with the principles of oil painting from Titian onwards. That which in the 18th century is called color in an etching, a drawing, or a sculpture group really signifies music. Music dominates the painting of Watt and Fragonard and the art of Gobelins and pastels, and since then, have we not acquired the habit of speaking of color tones or tone colors? And do not the very words imply a recognition of a final homogeneity between the two arts, superficially dissimilar as they are? And are not these same words perfectly meaningless as applied to any and every classical art? But music did not stop there, it transmuted also the architecture of Benini's Baroque into accord with its own spirit, and made of it Rococo, a style of transcendent ornamentation upon which lights, or rather tones, play to dissolve ceilings, walls and everything else constructional and actual into polyphonies and harmonies, with architectural trills and cadences and runs to complete the identification of the formal language of these halls and galleries with that of the music imagined for them. Dresden and Vienna are the homes of this late and soon extinguished fairyland of visible chamber music, of curved furniture in mirror halls, and shepherdesses in verse and porcelain. It is the final brilliant autumn with which the Western soul completes the expression of its high style. And in the Vienna of the Congress time it faded and died. V. The art of the Renaissance, considered from this particular one of its many aspects, is a revolt against the spirit of the Faustian forest music of counterpoint, which at the time was preparing to vassalize the whole formal language of the Western culture. It was the logical consequence of the open assertion of this will in matured Gothic. It never disavowed its origin and it maintained the character of a simple counter-movement, 
necessarily therefore it remains dependent upon the forms of the original movement, and represented simply the effect of these upon a hesitant soul. Hence, it was without true depth, either ideal or phenomenal. As to the first, we have only to think of the bursting passion with which the Gothic world feeling discharged itself upon the whole western landscape, and we shall see at once what sort of a movement it was that the handful of select spirits, scholars, artists and humanists, initiated about 1420.24 in the first the issue was one of life and death for a newborn soul, in the second it was a point of, taste. The Gothic gripped life in its entirety, penetrated its most hidden corners. It created new men and a new world. From the idea of Catholicism to the state theory of the Holy Roman Emperors, from the knightly tourney to the new city form, from cathedral to cottage, from language building to the village maiden's bridal attire, from oil painting to the spielman's song, everything is hallmarked with the stamp of one and the same symbolism. But the Renaissance, when it had mastered some arts of word and picture, had shot its bolt. It altered the ways of thought and the life feeling of West Europe not one whit. It could penetrate as far as costume and gesture, but the roots of life it could not touch. Even in Italy the world outlook of the Baroque is essentially a continuation of the Gothic.25 It produced no wholly great personality between Dante and Michelangelo, each of whom had one foot outside its limits. And as for the other, phenomenal or manifested depth, the Renaissance never touched the people, even in Florence itself. The man for whom they had ears was Sivanrola a phenomenon of quite another spiritual order and one which begins to be comprehensible when we discern the fact that, all the time, the deep undercurrents are steadily flowing on towards the Gothic musical Baroque. The Renaissance as an anti-Gothic movement and a reaction against the spirit of polyphonic music has its classical equivalent in the Dionysiac movement. This was a reaction against Doric and against the sculptural Apollonian world feeling. It did not originate in the Thrace and Dionysus cult, but merely took this up as a weapon against an counter symbol to the Olympian religion, precisely as in Florence the cult of the antique was called in for the justification and confirmation of a feeling already there. The period of the great protest was the 7th century in Greece and, therefore, the 15th in West Europe. In both cases we have in reality an outbreak of deep-seated discordances in the culture which physiognomically dominates a whole epoch of its history and especially of its artistic world, in other words, a stand that the soul attempts to make against the destiny that at last it comprehends. The inwardly recalcitrant forces, Faust's second soul that would separate itself from the other, are striving to deflect the sense of the culture, to repudiate, to get rid of or to evade its inexorable necessity. It stands anxious in presence of the call to accomplish its historical fate in Ionic and Baroque. This anxiety fastened itself in Greece to the Dionysus cult with its musical, dematerializing, body squandering orgasm, and in the Renaissance to the tradition of the antique and its cult of the bodily plastic tradition. In each case, the alien expression means was brought in consciously and deliberately in order that the force of a directly opposite form language should provide the suppressed feelings with a weight and a pathos of their own, and so enable them to stand against the stream, in Greece the stream which flowed from Homer and the geometrical Tephidias, in the West that which flowed from the Gothic cathedrals, through Rembrandt, to Beethoven. It follows from the very character of a counter-movement that it is far easier for it to define what it is opposing than what it is aiming at. This is the difficulty of all Renaissance research. In the Gothic, and the Doric, it is just the opposite, men are contending for something, not against it, but Renaissance art is nothing more nor less than anti-Gothic art. Renaissance music, too, is a contradiction in itself, the music of the Medicean court was the southern French Ars Nova, that of the Florentine Duomo was the low German counterpoint both alike essentially Gothic and the property of the whole West. The view that is customarily taken of the Renaissance is a very clear instance of how readily the proclaimed intentions of a movement may be mistaken for its deeper meaning. 
Since Burkhardt, 26 criticism has controverted every individual proposition that the leading spirits of the age put forward as to their own tendencies, and yet, this done, it has continued to use the word renaissance substantially in the former sense. Certainly, one is conscious at once in passing to the south of the Alps of a marked dissimilarity in architecture in particular and in the look of the arts in general. But the very obviousness of the conclusion that the impression prompts should have led us to distrust it and to ask ourselves, instead, whether the supposed distinction of Gothic and Antique was not in reality merely a difference between northern and southern aspects of one and the same form world. Plenty of things in Spain give the impression of being classical merely because they are southern, and if a layman were confronted with the great cloister of S. Maria Novella or the facade of the Palazzo Strozzi in Florence and asked to say if these were Gothic he would certainly guess wrong. Otherwise, the sharp change of spirit ought to have set in not beyond the Alps but only beyond the Apennines, for Tuscany is artistically an island in Italian Italy. Upper Italy belongs entirely to a Byzantine tinted Gothic, Cena in particular is a genuine monument of the counter Renaissance, and Rome is already the home of Baroque. But, in fact, it is the change of landscape that coincides with the change of feeling. In the actual birth of the Gothic style Italy had indeed no inward share. At the epoch of 1000 the country was still absolutely under the domination of Byzantine taste in the east and Moorish taste in the south. When Gothic first took root here it was the mature Gothic, and it implanted itself with an intensity and force for which we look in vain in any of the great Renaissance creations, think of the Stabat Mater, the Dizira, Catherine of Sena, Giotto and Simone Martini. At the same time, it was lighted from the south and its strangeness was, as it were, softened in acclimatization. That which it suppressed or expelled was not, as has been supposed, some lingering strains of the classical but purely the Byzantine Kamsaras and form language that appealed to the senses in familiar everyday life, in the buildings of Ravenna and Venice but even more in the ornament of the fabrics, vessels and arms imported from the east. If the Renaissance had been a renewal, whatever that may mean, of the classical world feeling, then, surely, would it not have had to replace the symbol of embraced and rhythmically ordered space by that of closed structural body? But there was never any question of this. On the contrary, the Renaissance practiced wholly and exclusively an architecture of space prescribed for it by Gothic from which it differed only in that in lieu of the northern Sturm und Drang it breathed the clear equable calm of the sunny, carefree and unquestioning south. It produced no new building idea, and the extent of its architectural achievement might almost be reduced to facades and courtyards. Now, this focusing of expressible effort upon the street front of a house or the side of a cloister, many windowed and ever significant of the spirit within, is characteristic of the Gothic, and deeply akin to its art of portraiture, and the cloistered courtyard itself is, from the Sun Temple of Baalbek to the Court of the Lions in the Alhambra, as genuinely Arabian. And in the midst of this art the Poseidon Temple of Pestum, all body, stands lonely and unrelated, no one saw it, no one attempted to copy it. Equally unattic is the Florentine sculpture, for attic is free plastic, in the round in the full sense of the words, whereas every Florentine statue feels behind it the ghost of the niche into which the Gothic sculptor had built its real ancestors. In the relation of figure to background and in the build of the body, the masters of the King's Heads at Chartres and the masters of the George Choir at Bamberg exhibit the same interpenetration of antique and Gothic expression means that we have neither intensified nor contradicted, in the manner of Giovanni Pisno and Ghiberti and even Veraccio. If we take away from the models of the Renaissance all elements that originated later than the Roman Imperial Age, that is to say, those belonging to the Magian form world, nothing is left. Even from late Roman architecture itself all elements derived from the great days of Hellas had one by one vanished. Most conclusive of all, though, is that motive which actually dominates the Renaissance, which because of its southernness we regard as the noblest of the Renaissance characters, viz., the association of round arch and column. This association, no doubt, 
is very ungothic, but in the classical style it simply does not exist, and in fact it represents the leitmotif of the Magian architecture that originated in Syria. But it was just then that the South received from the North those decisive impulses which helped it first of all to emancipate itself entirely from Byzantium and then to step from Gothic into Baroque. In the region comprised between Amsterdam, Cologne and Paris 27, the counterpole to Tuscany in the style history of our culture, counterpoint and oil painting had been created in association with the Gothic architecture. Then Stufe in 1428 and Willett in 1516 came to the papal chapel, and in 1527 the latter founded that Venetian school which was decisive of Baroque music. The successor of Willett was de Rohr of Antwerp. A Florentine commissioned Hugo van der Goes to execute the Portinari altar for Santa Maria Nuova, and Mamelink to paint a last judgment. And over and above this, numerous pictures especially Low Countries portraits, were acquired and exercised an enormous influence. In 1450 Rogier van der Weeden himself came to Florence, where his art was both admired and imitated. In 1470 Justus van Gent introduced oil painting to Umbria, and Antonello di Messina brought what he had learned in the Netherlands to Venice. How much Dutch and how little classical there is in the pictures of Filippino Lippi. Gerlande Eo and Botticelli and especially in the engravings of Pollyolo. Or in Leonardo himself. Even today critics hardly care to admit the full extent of the influence exercised by the Gothic North upon the architecture, music, painting and plastic of the Renaissance. 28 It was just then, too, that Nelors Kisinus, Cardinal and Bishop of Brixen, 1401-1464, brought into mathematics the infinitesimal principle, that contrapuntal method of number which he reached by deduction from the idea of God as infinite being. It was from Nicholas of Cusa that Albniz received the decisive impulse that led him to work out his differential calculus, and thus was forged the weapon with which dynamic, baroque, Newtonian, physics definitely overcame the static idea characteristic of the southern physics that reaches a hand to Archimedes and is still effective even in Galileo. The high period of the Renaissance is a moment of apparent expulsion of music from Faustian art. And in fact, for a few decades, in the only area where classical and western landscapes touched, Florence did uphold with one grand effort that was essentially metaphysical and essentially defensive, an image of the classical so convincing that, although its deeper characters were without exception mere anti-Gothic, it lasted beyond Goethe and, if not for our criticism, yet for our feelings, is valid to this day. The Florence of Lorenzo de' Medici and the Rome of Leo X, that is what for us the classical is, an eternal goal of most secret longing the only deliverance from our heavy hearts and limit upon our horizon. And it is this because, and only because, it is anti-Gothic. So clean-cut is the opposition of Apollinian and Faustian spirituality. But let there be no mistake as to the extent of this illusion. In Florence men practiced fresco and relief in contradiction of Gothic glass painting and Byzantine gold ground mosaic. This was the one moment in the history of the West when sculpture ranked as the paramount art. The dominant elements in the picture are the poised bodies, the ordered groups, the structural side of architecture. The backgrounds possess no intrinsic value, merely serving to fill up between and behind the self-sufficient present of the foreground figures. For a while here, painting is actually under the domination of plastic, Veraccio, Polariulo and Botticelli were goldsmiths. Yet, all the same, these frescoes have nothing of the spirit of Polygnatus in them. Examine a collection of classical painted vases, not in individual specimens or copies, which would give the wrong idea, but in the mass, for this is the one species of classical art in which originals are plentiful enough to impress us effectively with the will that is behind the art. In the light of such a study, the utter unclassicalness of the Renaissance spirit leaps to the eye. The great achievement of Giotto and Masaccio in creating a fresco art is only apparently a revival of the Apollinian way of feeling, but the depth experience and idea of extension that underlies it is not the Apollinian unspatial and self-contained body but the Gothic field, Bile Drum.
however recessive the backgrounds are, they exist. Yet here again there was the fullness of light, the clarity of atmosphere, the great noon calm, of the south. Dynamic space was changed in Tuscany, and only in Tuscany, to the static space of which Piero della Francesca was the master. Though fields of space were painted, they were put, not as an existence unbounded and like music ever striving into the depths, but as sensuously definable. Space was given a sort of bodiliness and order in plain layers, and drawing, sharpness of outline, definition of surface was studied with a care that seemingly approached the Hellenic ideal. Yet there was always this difference, that Florence depicted space perspectively as singular in contrast with things as plural, whereas Athens presented things as separate singulars in contrast to general nothingness. And in proportion as the surge of the Renaissance smoothed down, the hardness of this tendency receded, from Mass Axios frescoes in the Brancaxi Chapel to Raphael's in the Vatican stands, until the sfumato of Leonardo, the melting of the edges into the background, brings a musical ideal in place of the relief ideal into painting. The hidden dynamic is equally unmistakable in the sculpture of Florence, it would be perfectly hopeless to look for an attic companion for Verrocchio's equestrian statue. 29 This art was a mask, a mode of the taste of an elite, and sometimes a comedy, though never was comedy more gallantly played out. The indescribable inward purity of Gothic form often causes us to forget what an excess of native strength and depth it possessed. Gothic, it must be repeated again, is the only foundation of the Renaissance. The Renaissance never even touched the real classical, let alone understood it or revived it. The consciousness of the Florentine elite, wholly under literary influences, fashioned the deceptive name to positivize the negative element of the movement, thereby demonstrating how little such currents are aware of their own nature. There is not a single one of their great works that the contemporaries of Pericles, or even those of Caesar, would not have rejected as utterly alien. Their palace courtyards are Moorish courtyards, and their round arches on slender pillars are of Syrian origin. Cymabia taught his century to imitate with the brush the art of Byzantine mosaic. Of the two famous stomachal buildings of the Renaissance, the domed cathedral of Florence is a masterpiece of late Gothic, and St. Peter's is one of early Baroque. When Michelangelo set himself to build the latter as the Pantheon towering over the Basilica of Maxentius, he was naming two buildings of the purest early Arabian style. And ornament, is there indeed a genuine Renaissance ornamentation? Certainly there is nothing comparable in symbolic force with the ornamentation of Gothic. But what is the provenance of that gay and elegant embellishment which has a real inward unity of its own and has captivated all Europe? There is a great difference between the home of a taste and the home of the expression means that it employs, one finds a great deal that is northern in the early Florentine motives of Pisno, Maiano, Guy Butti and Delia Crilla. We have to distinguish in all these chancels, tombs, niches and porches between the outward and transferable forms, the Ionic column itself is doubly a transfer, for it originated in Egypt and the spirit of the formal language that uses them as means and signs. One classical element or item is equivalent to another so long as something unclassical is being expressed, significance lies not in the thing but in the way in which it is used. But even in Donatello such motives are far fewer than in mature Baroque. As for a strict classical capital, no such thing is to be found. And yet, at moments, Renaissance art succeeded in achieving something wonderful that music could not reproduce, a feeling for the bliss of perfect nearness, for pure, restful and liberating space effects, bright and tidy and free from the passionate movement of Gothic and Baroque. It is not classical, but it is a dream of classical existence, the only dream of the Faustian soul in which it was able to forget itself. Vi. And now, with the 16th century, the decisive epochal turn begins for Western painting. The trusteeship of architecture in the north and that of sculpture in Italy expire, and painting becomes polyphonic, picturesque, infinity seeking. The colors become tones. The art of the brush claims kinship with the style of cantato and madrigal. 
the technique of oils becomes the basis of an art that means to conquer space and to dissolve things in that space. With Leonardo and Georgian begins Impressionism. In the actual picture there is transvaluation of all the elements. The background, hitherto casually put in, regarded as a fill-up and, as space, almost shuffled out of sight, gains a preponderant importance. A development sets in that is paralleled in no other culture, not even in the Chinese which in many other respects is so near to ours. The background as symbol of the infinite conquers the sense perceptible foreground, and at last, herein lies the distinction between the depicting and the delineating styles, the depth experience of the Faustian soul is captured in the kinesis of a picture. The space relief of Mantigna's plane layers dissolves in Tintoretto into directional energy, and there emerges in the picture the great symbol of an unlimited space universe which comprises the individual things within itself as incidentals, the horizon. Now, that a landscape painting should have a horizon has always seemed so self-evident to us that we have never asked ourselves the important question, is there always a horizon, and if not, when not and why not? In fact, there is not a hint of it, either in Egyptian relief or in Byzantine mosaic or in vase paintings and frescoes of the classical age, or even in those of the Hellenistic in spite of its spatial treatment of foregrounds. This line, in the unreal vapor of which heaven and earth melt, the sum and potent symbol of the far, contains the painter's version of the infinitesimal principle. It is out of the remoteness of this horizon that the musk of the picture flows, and for this reason the great landscape painters of Holland paint only backgrounds and atmospheres, just as for the contrary reason anti-musical masters like Signorelli and especially Mantigna, paint only foregrounds and reliefs. It is in the horizon, then, that music triumphs over plastic, the passion of extension over its substance. It is not too much to say that no picture by Rembrandt has a foreground at all. In the north, the home of counterpoint, a deep understanding of the meaning of horizons and highlighted distances is found very early, while in the south the flat conclusive gold background of the Arabic Byzantine picture long remained supreme. The first definite emergence of the pure space feeling is in the books of hours of the Duke of Berry, that at Chantilly and that at Turin about 1416. Thereafter, slowly and surely, it conquers the picture. The same symbolic meaning attaches to clouds. Classical art concerns itself with them no more than with horizons, and the painter of the Renaissance treats them with a certain playful superficiality. But very early the Gothic looked at its cloud masses, and through them, with the long sight of mysticism, and the Venetians, Georgian and Paolo Veronese above all, discovered the full magic of the cloud world, of the thousand tinted being that fills the heavens with its sheets and wisps and mountains. Grunewald and the Netherlanders heightened its significance to the level of tragedy. El Greco brought the grand art of cloud symbolism to Spain. It was at the same time that along with oil painting and counterpoint the art of gardens ripened. Here, expressed on the canvas of nature itself by extended pools, brick walls, avenues, vistas and galleries, is the same tendency that is represented in painting by the efforts towards the linear perspective that the early Flemish artists felt to be the basic problem of their art and Brunelsco, Alberti and Piero della Francesca formulated. We may take it that it was not entirely a coincidence that this formulation of perspective, this mathematical consecration of the picture, whether landscape or interior, as a field limited at the sides but immensely increased in depth, was propounded just at this particular moment. It was the proclamation of the prime symbol. The point at which the perspective lines coalesces at infinity. It was just because it avoided infinity and rejected distance that classical painting possessed no perspective. Consequently the park, the deliberate manipulation of nature so as to obtain space and distance effects, is an impossibility in classical art. Neither in Athens nor in Rome proper was there a garden art, it was only the imperial age that gratified its taste with ground schemes of eastern origin, 
and a glance at any of the plans of those gardens that have been preserved 30 is enough to show the shortness of their range and the emphasis of their bounds. And yet the first garden theorist of the West, L. B. Alberti, was laying down the relation of the surroundings to the house, that is, to the spectators in it, as early as 1450, and from his projects to the parks of the Ludovisi and Albani villas, 31 we can see the importance of the perspective view into distance becoming ever greater and greater. In France, after Francis I. Fontainebleau, the long narrow lake is an additional feature having the same meaning. The most significant element in the Western garden art is thus the point de vue of the greater Rococo Park, upon which all its avenues and clipped hedge walks open and from which vision may travel out to lose itself in the distances. This element is wanting even in the Chinese garden art. But it is exactly matched by some of the silver bright distance pictures of the pastoral music of that age, in Couperin for example. It is the point de vue that gives us the key to a real understanding of this remarkable mode of making nature itself speak the formal language of a human symbolism. It is in principle akin to the dissolution of finite number pictures into infinite series in our mathematic, as the remainder expression 32 reveals the ultimate meaning of the series, so the glimpse into the boundless is what, in the garden, reveals to a Faustian soul the meaning of nature. It was we and not the Helms or the men of the high renaissance that prized and sought out high mountain tops for the sake of the limitless range of vision that they afford. This is a Faustian craving, to be alone with endless space. The great achievement of La Notre and the landscape gardeners of northern France, beginning with Fouquet's epoch-making creation of Vaux le Vicomte, was that they were able to render this symbol with such high emphasis. Compare the Renaissance Park of the Medicean Age, capable of being taken in, gay, cozy, well-rounded, with these parks in which all the waterworks, statue rows, hedges and labyrinths are instinct with the suggestion of long range. It is the destiny of Western oil painting told over again in a bit of garden history. But the feeling for long range is at the same time one for history. At a distance space becomes time and the horizon signifies the future. The Baroque Park is the park of the late season, of the approaching end, of the falling leaf. A Renaissance Park is meant for the summer and the noonday. It is timeless, and nothing in its formal language reminds us of mortality. It is perspective that begins to awaken a premonition of something passing, fugitive and final. The very words of distance possess, in the lyric poetry of all Western languages, a plaintive autumnal accent that one looks for in vain in the Greek and Latin. It is there in Macpherson's Ossian and Holdelin, and in Nietzsche's Dionysus de Thyrums, and lastly in Baudelaire, Verlaine, George and Droham. The late poetry of the withering garden avenues, the unending lines in the streets of a megalopolis, the ranks of pillars in a cathedral, the peak in a distant mountain chain. All tell us that the depth experience which constitutes our space world for us is in the last analysis our inward certainty of a destiny, of a prescribed direction, of time, of the irrevocable. Here, in the experience of horizon as future, we become directly and surely conscious of the identity of time with the third dimension of that experienced space which is living self-extension. And in these last days we are imprinting upon the plan of our megalopolitan streets the same directional destiny character that the 17th century imprinted upon the Park of Versailles. We lay our streets as long arrow flights into remote distance, regardless even of preserving old and historic parts of our towns, for the symbolism of these is not now prepotent in us, whereas a megalopolis of the classical world studiously maintained in its extension the tangle of crooked lanes that enabled Apollonian man to feel himself a body in the midst of bodies.33 Herein, as always, practical requirements, so called, are merely the mask of a profound inward compulsion. With the rise of perspective, then, the deeper form and full metaphysical significance of the picture comes to be concentrated upon the horizon. In Renaissance art the painter had stated and the beholder had accepted the contents of the picture for what they were, as self-sufficient and coextensive with the title. But henceforth the contents became a means, 
the mere vehicle of a meaning that was beyond the possibility of verbal expression. With Mantigna or Signorelli the pencil sketch could have stood as the picture, without being carried out in color, in some cases, indeed, we can only regret that the artist did not stop at the cartoon. In the statue-like sketch, color is a mere supplement. Titian, on the other hand, could be told by Michelangelo that he did not know how to draw. The object, that is, that which could be exactly fixed by the drawn outline, the near and material, had in fact lost its artistic actuality, but, as the theory of art was still dominated by Renaissance impressions, there arose thereupon that strange and interminable conflict concerning the form and the content of an artwork. Misenunciation of the question has concealed its real and deep significance from us. The first point for consideration should have been whether painting was to be conceived of plastically or musically, as a static of things or as a dynamic of space, for in this lies the essence of the opposition between fresco and oil technique, and the second point, the opposition of classical and Faustian world feeling. Outlines define the material, while color tones interpret space.34 But the picture of the first order belongs to directly sensible nature, it narrates. Space, on the contrary, is by its very essence transcendent and addresses itself to our imaginative powers, and in an art that is under its suzerainty, the narrative element enfeebles and obscures the more profound tendency. Hence it is that the theorist, able to feel the secret disharmony but misunderstanding it, clings to the superficial opposition of content and form. The problem is purely a Western one and reveals most strikingly the complete inversion in the significance of pictorial elements that took place when the Renaissance closed down and instrumental music of the grand style came to the front. For the classical mind no problem of form and content in this sense could exist, in an attic statue the two are completely identical and identified in the human body. The case of Baroque painting is further complicated by the fact that it involves an opposition of ordinary popular feeling and the finer sensibility. Everything Euclidean and tangible is also popular, and the genuinely popular art is therefore the classical. It is very largely the feeling of this popular character in it that constitutes its indescribable charm for the Faustian intellects that have to fight for self-expression, to win their world by hard wrestling. For us, the contemplation of classical art and its intention is pure refreshment, here nothing needs to be struggled for, everything offers itself freely. And something of the same sort was achieved by the anti-Gothic tendency of Florence. Raphael is, in many sides of his creativeness, distinctly popular. But Rembrandt is not, cannot be, so. From Titian painting becomes more and more esoteric. So, too, poetry so, too, music. And the Gothic per se had been esoteric from its very beginnings, witness Dante and Wolfram. The masses of Okegum and Palestrina, or of Bach for that matter, were never intelligible to the average member of the congregation. Ordinary people are bored by Mozart and Beethoven, and regard music generally as something for which one is or is not in the mood. A certain degree of interest in these matters has been induced by concert room and gallery since the Age of Enlightenment invented the phrase art for all. But Faustian art is not, and by very essence cannot be, for all. If modern painting has ceased to appeal to any but a small, and ever decreasing, circle of connoisseurs, it is because it has turned away from the painting of things that the man in the street can understand. It has transferred the property of actuality from contents to space, the space through which alone, according to Kant, things are. And with that a difficult metaphysical element has entered into painting, and this element does not give itself away to the layman. For Phidias, on the contrary, the word lay would have had no meaning. His sculpture appealed entirely to the bodily and not to the spiritual eye. An art without space is a priori unphilosophical. 7. With this is connected an important principle of composition. In a picture it is possible to set the things in organically above one another or side by side or behind one another without any emphasis of perspective or interrelation, that is, 
without insisting upon the dependence of their actuality upon the structure of space which does not necessarily mean that this dependence is denied. Primitive men and children draw thus, before their depth experience has brought the sense impressions of their world more or less into fundamental order. But this order differs in the different cultures according to the prime symbols of these cultures. The sort of perspective composition that is so self-evident to us is a particular case, and it is neither recognized nor intended in the painting of any other culture. Egyptian art chose to represent simultaneous events in superposed ranks, thereby eliminating the third dimension from the look of the picture. The Apollonian art placed figures and groups separately, with a deliberate avoidance of space and time relations in the plane of representation. Polygnatus's frescoes in the Lesh of the Cnidians at Delphi are a celebrated instance of this. There is no background to connect the individual scenes, for such a background would have been a challenge to the principle that things alone are actual and space non existent. The pediment of the Aegina temple, the procession of gods on the Francois vase, and the frieze of the giants of Pergamum are all composed as meander syntheses of separate and interchangeable motives without organic character. It is only with the Hellenistic age, the Telephus frieze of the altar of Pergamum is the earliest example that has been preserved, that the UN classical motive of the consistent series comes into existence. In this respect, as in others, the feeling of the Renaissance was truly Gothic. It did indeed carry group composition to such a pitch of perfection that its work remains the pattern for all following ages but the order of it all proceeded out of space. In the last analysis, it was a silent music of color illumined extension that created within itself light resistances, which the understanding I could grasp as things and as existence, and could set marching with an invisible swing and rhythm out into the distance. And with this spatial ordering, with its unremarked substitution of air and light perspective for line perspective, the Renaissance was already, in essence, defeated. And now from the end of the Renaissance in Orlando Lassou and Palestrina right up to Wagner, from Titian right up to Manet and Marie Zendelbl, great musicians and great painters followed close upon one another while the plastic art sank into entire insignificance. Oil painting and instrumental music evolve organically towards aims that were comprehended in the Gothic and achieved in the Baroque. Both arts, Faustian in the highest sense, are within those limits prime phenomena. They have a soul, a physiognomy and therefore a history. And in this they are alone. All that sculpture could thenceforward achieve was a few beautiful incidental pieces in the shadow of painting, garden art, or architecture. The art of the West had no real need of them. There was no longer a style of plastic in the sense that there were styles of painting or music. No consistent tradition or necessary unity links the works of Madonna, Gujan, Puget and Schluter. Even Leonardo begins to despise the chisel outright, at most he will admit the bronze cast, and that on account of its pictorial advantages. Therein he differs from Michelangelo, for whom the marble block was still the true element. And yet even Michelangelo in his old age could no longer succeed with the plastic, and none of the later sculptors are great in the sense that Rembrandt and Bach are great. There were clever and tasteful performances no doubt, but not one single work of the same order as the Night Watch or the Matthew Passion, nothing that expresses, as these express, the whole depth of a whole mankind. This art had fallen out of the destiny of the culture. Its speech meant nothing now. What there is in a Rembrandt portrait simply cannot be rendered in a bust. Now and then a sculptor of power arises, like Bernini or the masters of the contemporary Spanish school, or Piglo Rodan, none of whom, naturally, transcended the decorative and attained the level of grand symbolism, but such an artist is always visibly either a belated imitator of the Renaissance like Thorwaldson, a disguised painter like Howard nor Rodan, an architect like Bernini and Schluter or a decorator like Koisvox and his very appearance on the scene only shows the more clearly that this art, incapable of carrying the Faustian burden, has no longer a mission, and therefore no longer a soul or a life history of specific style development, in the Faustian world. In the classical world, 
correspondingly, music was the art that failed. Beginning with probably quite important advances in the earliest Doric, it had to give way in the ripe centuries of Ionic, 650-350, to the two truly Apollinian arts, sculpture and fresco, renouncing harmony and polyphony, it had to renounce there with any pretensions to organic development as a higher art. 8. The strict style in classical painting limited its palette to yellow, red, black and white. This singular fact was observed long ago, and, since the explanation was only sought for in superficial and definitely material causes, wild hypotheses were brought forward to account for it. For example, a supposed color blindness in the Greeks. Even Nietzsche discussed this, more Jean Rott, 426. But why did this painting in its great days avoid blue and even blue-green? and only begin the gamut of permissible tones at greenish yellow and bluish red. It is not that the ancient artists did not know of blue and its effect. The metopes of many temples had blue backgrounds so that they should appear deep in contrast with the triglyphs, and trade painting used all the colors that were technically available. There are authentic blue horses in archaic Acropolis work and Etruscan tomb painting, and a bright blue coloring of the hair was quite common. The ban upon it in the higher art was, without a doubt, imposed upon the Euclidean soul by its prime symbol. Blue and green are the colors of the heavens, the sea, the fruitful plain, the shadow of the southern noon, the evening, the remote mountains. They are essentially atmospheric and not substantial colors. They are cold, they disembody, and they evoke impressions of expanse and distance and boundlessness. For this reason they were kept out of the frescoes of Polygnatus. And for this reason also, an infinitesimal blue to green is the space creating element throughout the history of our perspective oil painting, from the Venetians right into the 19th century, it is the basic and supremely important tone which supports the ensemble of the intended color effect, as the basso continuo supports the orchestra whereas the warm yellow and red tones are put on sparingly and in dependence upon this basic tone. It is not the full, gorgeous and familiar green that Raphael and Dürer sometimes, and seldom at that, use for draperies, but an indefinite blue-green of a thousand nuances into white and grey and brown, something deeply musical, into which, notably in Gobelin tapestry, the whole atmosphere is plunged. That quality which we have named aerial perspective in contrast to linear, and might also have called baroque perspective in contrast to renaissance, rests almost exclusively upon this. We find it with more and more intense depth effect in Leonardo, Gersino, Albani in the case of Italy, and in Rustale and Homer in that of Holland, but, above all, in the great French painters, from Poussin and Claude Lorraine and Watt to Corot blue, equally a perspective color, always stands in relation to the dark, the unillumined, the unactual. It does not press in on us, it pulls us out into the remote. An enchanting nothingness Goethe calls it in his Farbenlura. Blue and green are transcendent, spiritual, nonsensuous colors. They are missing in the strict attic fresco and therefore dominant in oil painting. Yellow and red, the classical colors are the colors of the material, the near, the full-blooded. Red is the characteristic color of sexuality, hence it is the only color that works upon the beasts. It matches best the phallus symbol, and therefore the statue and the Doric column, but it is pure blue that etherealizes the Madonna's mantle. This relation of the colors has established itself in every great school as a deep-felt necessity. Violet, a red succumbing to blue, is the color of women no longer fruitful and of priests living in celibacy. Yellow and red are the popular colors, the colors of the crowd, of children, of women, and of savages. Amongst the Venetians and the Spaniards high personages affected a splendid black or blue, with an unconscious sense of the aloofness inherent in these colors. For red and yellow, the Apollonian, Euclidean polytheistic colors, belong to the foreground even in respect of social life, they are meat for the noisy hearty market days and holidays, 
the naive immediateness of a life subject to the blind chances of the classical fatum, the point existence. But blue and green, the Faustian, monotheistic colors, are those of loneliness, of care, of a present that is related to a past and a future, of destiny as the dispensation governing the universe from within. The relation of Shakespearean destiny to space and of Sophoclean to the individual body has already been stated in an earlier chapter. All the genuinely transcendent cultures, that is all whose prime symbol requires the overcoming of the apparent, the life of struggle and not that of acceptance, have the same metaphysical inclination to space as to blues and blacks. There are profound observations on the connection between ideas of space and the meaning of color in Goethe's studies of entoptic colors in the atmosphere, the symbolism that is enunciated by him in the Farbenlera and that which we have deduced here from the ideas of space and destiny are in complete agreement. The most significant use of dusky green as the color of destiny is Grunewald's. The indescribable power of space in his nights is equaled only by Rembrandt's. And the thought suggests itself here, is it possible to say that his bluish green, the color in which the interior of a great cathedral is so often clothed, is the specifically Catholic color? It being understood that we mean by Catholic strictly the Faustian Christianity, with the Eucharist as its center, that was founded in the Lateran Council of 1215 and fulfilled in the Council of Trent. This color with its silent grandeur is as remote from the resplendent gold ground of early Christian Byzantine pictures as it is from the gay, loquacious pagan colors of the painted Hellenic temples and statues. It is to be noted that the effect of this color, entirely unlike that of yellow and red, depends upon work being exhibited indoors. Classical painting is emphatically a public art, Western just as emphatically a studio art. The whole of our great oil painting, from Leonardo to the end of the 18th century, is not meant for the bright light of day. Here once more we meet the same opposition as that between chamber music and the freestanding statue. The climatic explanation of the difference is merely superficial, the example of Egyptian painting would suffice to disprove it if disproof were necessary at all. Infinite space meant for classical feeling complete nothingness and the use of blue and green, with their powers of dissolving the near and creating the far, would have been a challenge to the absolutism of the foreground and its unit bodies, and therefore to the very meaning and intent of Apollonian art. To the Apollonian eye, pictures in the colors of what would have been destitute of all essence, things of almost inexpressible emptiness and untruth. By these colors the visually perceived light reflecting surface of the picture is made effectively to render, not circumscribed things, but circumambient space. And that is why they are missing in Greece and dominant in the West. 9. Arabian art brought the Magian world feeling to expression by means of the gold ground of its mosaics and pictures. Something of the uncanny wizardry of this, and by implication of its symbolic purpose, is known to us through the mosaics of Ravenna in the work of the early Rhenish and especially North Italian masters who were still entirely under the influence of Lombardo Byzantine models, and last but not least in the Gothic book illustrations of which the archetypes were the Byzantine purple codices. In this instance we can study the soul of three cultures working upon very similar tasks in very dissimilar ways. The Apollonian culture recognized as actual only that which was immediately present in time and place, and thus it repudiated the background as pictorial element. The Faustian strove through all sensuous barriers towards infinity, and it projected the center of gravity of the pictorial idea into the distance by means of perspective. The Magian felt all happening as an expression of mysterious powers that filled the world cavern with their spiritual substance, and it shut off the depicted scene with a gold background, that is, by something that stood beyond and outside all nature colors. Gold is not a color. As compared with simple yellow, it produces a complicated sense impression, through the metallic, diffuse refulgence that is generated by its glowing surface. Colors, whether colored substance incorporated with the smoothed wall face, fresco, or pigment applied with the brush, are natural. But the metallic gleam, 
which is practically never found in natural conditions, is unearthly. 35 It recalls impressively the other symbols of the culture, alchemy and Kabbalah, the philosopher's stone, the holy scriptures, the arabesque, the inner form of the tales of the thousand and one nights. The gleaming gold takes away from the scene, the life and the body their substantial being. Everything that was taught in the circle of Plotinus or by the Gnostics as to the nature of things, their independence of space, their accidental causes, notions paradoxical and almost unintelligible to our world feeling, is implicit also in the symbolism of this mysterious hieratic background. The nature of bodies was a principal subject of controversy amongst Neopythagoreans and Neoplatonists, as it was later in the schools of Baghdad and Basra. Surawardi distinguishes extension, as the primary existence of the body, from width and height and depth as its accidents. Natsam pronounced against the corporeal substantiality and space-filling character of the atom. These and the like were the metaphysical notions that, from Fulo and Paul to the last great names of the Islamic philosophy, manifested the Arabian world feeling. They played a decisive part in the disputes of the councils upon the substantiality of Christ. And thus the gold background possesses, in the iconography of the Western Church, an explicit dogmatic significance. It is an express assertion of the existence and activity of the Divine Spirit. It represents the Arabian form of the Christian world consciousness and with such a deep appropriateness that for a thousand years this treatment of the background was held to be the only one metaphysically, and even ethically, possible and seemly in representations of the Christian legend. When natural backgrounds, with their blue-green heavens, far horizons and depth perspective, began to appear in early Gothic, they had at first the appearance of something profane and worldly. The change of dogma that they implied was, if not acknowledged, at any rate felt, witness the tapestry backgrounds with which the real depth of space was covered up by a pious or that disguised what it dared not exhibit. We have seen how just at this time, when the Faustian, German Catholic, Christianity attained to consciousness of itself through the institution of the sacrament of contrition, a new religion in the old garb, the tendency to perspective, color, and the mastering of aerial space in the art of the Franciscans 36 transformed the whole meaning of painting. The Christianity of the West is related to that of the East as the symbol of perspective to the symbol of gold ground, and the final schism took place almost at the same moment in church and in art. The landscape background of the depicted scene and the dynamic infiniteness of God were comprehended at the same moment, and, simultaneously with the gold ground of the sacred picture, the vanished from the councils of the West that Magin, ontological problem of Godhead which had so passionately agitated Nicaea, Ephesus, Chalcedon and all the councils of the East. X. The Venetians discovered, and introduced into oil painting as a space-forming and quasi-musical motive, the handwriting of the visible brushstroke. The Florentine masters had never at any time challenged the fashion, would be classical and yet in Gothic employ, of smoothing out all turns of the brush so as to produce pure, cleanly outlined and even color surfaces. In consequence, their pictures have a certain air of being, something felt, unmistakably, as the opposite of the inherent motion quality of the Gothic expression means that were storming in from over the Alps. The 15th century manner of applying color is a denial of past and future. It is only in the brushwork, which remains permanently visible and, in a way, perennially fresh, that the historical feeling comes out. Our desire is to see in the work of the painter not merely something that has become but something that is becoming. And this is precisely what the Renaissance wanted to avoid. A piece of Perugino drapery tells us nothing of its artistic origin, it is ready made, given, simply present. But the individual brush strokes, first met with as a complete new form language in the later work of Titian, are accents of a personal temperament, characteristic in the orchestra colors of Monteverde, melodically flowing as a contemporary Venetian madrigal, streaks and dabs, immediately juxtaposed, cross one another, cover one another, entangle one another, and bring unending movement into the plain element of color. 
just so the geometrical analysis of the time made its objects become instead of being. Every painting has in its execution a history and does not disguise it, and a Faustian who stands before it feels that he too has a spiritual evolution. Before any great landscape by a Baroque master, the one word historical is enough to make us feel that there is a meaning in it wholly alien to the meaning of an attic statue. As other melody, so also this of the restless outline less brush stroke is part of the dynamic stability of the universe of eternal becoming, directional time, and destiny. The opposition of painting style and drawing style is but a particular aspect of the general opposition of historical and ahistorical form, of assertion and denial of inner development, of eternity and instant darnity. A classical artwork is an event, a western is a deed. The one symbolizes the here and now point, the other the living course. And the physiognomy of this script of the brush, an ornamentation that is entirely new, infinitely rich and personal, and peculiar to the Western culture, is purely and simply musical. It is no mere conceit to compare the Allegro Feroz of Franz Hals with the Andante con moto of Van Dyck, or the minor of Gersina with the major of Velasquez. Henceforward the notion of tempo is comprised in the execution of a painting and steadily reminds us that this art is the art of a soul which, in contrast to the classical, forgets nothing and will let nothing be forgotten that once was. The airy web of brush strokes immediately dissolves the sensible surface of things. Contours melt into chiaroscuro. The beholder has to stand a very long way back to obtain any corporeal impression out of our colored space values, and even so it is always the chromatic and active air itself that gives birth to the things. At the same time with this, there appeared in western painting another symbol of highest significance, which subdued more and more the actuality of all color, the studio brown, a tele brown. This was unknown to the early Florentines and the older Flemish and Rhenish masters alike. Pacher, Jura, Holborn, passionately strong as their tendency towards spatial depth seems, are quite without it, and its reign begins only with the last years of the 16th century. This brown does not repudiate its descent from the infinitesimal greens of Leonardo's, Scungo's and Grunewald's backgrounds but it possesses a mightier power over things than they, and it carries the battle of space against matter to a decisive close. It even prevails over the more primitive linear perspective, which is unable to shake off its renaissance association with architectural motives. Between it and the impressionist technique of the visible brush stroke there is an enduring and deeply suggestive connection. Both in the end dissolve the tangible existences of the sense world the world of moments and foregrounds, into atmospheric semblances. Line disappears from the tone picture. The magin gold ground had only dreamed of mystic power that controlled and at will could thrust aside the laws governing corporeal existence within the world cavern. But the brown of these pictures opened a prospect into an infinity of pure forms and therefore its discovery marks for the western style a culmination in the process of its becoming. As contrasted with the preceding green, this color has something Protestant in it. It anticipates the hyperbolic 37 northern pantheism of the 18th century with the archangel's voice in the prologue of Goethe's Faust. 38 The atmosphere of Lear and the atmosphere of Macbeth are akin to it. The contemporary striving of instrumental music towards freer and ever freer chromatics, de raw, Luke Manzio and towards the formation of bodies of tone by means of string and wind choruses corresponds exactly with the new tendency of oil painting to create pictorial chromatics out of pure colors, by means of these unlimited brown shadings and the contrast effect of immediately juxtaposed color strokes. Thereafter both the arts spread through their worlds of tones and colors, color tones and tone colors, an atmosphere of the purest spatiality which enveloped and rendered, no longer body, the human being as a shape, but the soul unconfined. And thus was attained the inwardness that in the deepest works of Rembrandt and of Beethoven is able to unlock the last secrets themselves, the inwardness which Apollonian man had sought with his strictly somatic art to keep at bay. From now onward, 
The old foreground colors yellow and red, the classical tones, are employed more and more rarely and always as deliberate contrasts to the distances and depths that they are meant to set off and emphasize, Vermeer in particular, besides of course Rembrandt. This atmospheric brown, which was entirely alien to the Renaissance, is the unrealist color that there is. It is the one major color that does not exist in the rainbow. There is white light, and yellow and green, and red and other light of the most entire purity. But a pure brown light is outside the possibilities of the nature that we know. All the greenish brown, silvery, moist brown, and deep gold tones that appear in their splendid variety with Georgian, grow bolder and bolder in the great Dutch painters and lose themselves towards the end of the 18th century, have the common quality that they strip nature of her tangible actuality. They contain, therefore, what is almost a religious profession of faith, we feel that here we are not very far from Port Royal, from Ulbniz. With Constable on the other hand, who is the founder of the painting of civilization, it is a different will that seeks expression, and the very brown that he had learned from the Dutch meant to him not what it had meant to them, destiny, God, the meaning of life, but simply romance, sensibility, yearning for something that was gone, memorial of the great past of the dying art. In the last German masters too, Lessing, Maurice, Spitzweg, Dyers, Ulpel 39, whose belated art is a romantic retrospect, an epilogue, the brown tones appear simply as a precious heirloom. Unwilling in their hearts to part with this last relic of the great style, they preferred to set themselves against the evident tendency of their generation, the soulless and soul-killing generation of Planer and Heckel. Rightly understood, as it has never yet been. This battle of Rembrandt Brown and the Planer of the New School is simply one more case of the hopeless resistance put up by soul against intellect and culture against civilization, of the opposition of symbolic necessary art and megalopolitan applied art which affects building and painting and sculpture and poetry alike. Regarded thus, the significance of the Brown becomes manifest enough. When it dies, an entire culture dies with it. It was the masters who were inwardly greatest, Rembrandt above all, who best understood this color. It is the enigmatic brown of his most telling work, and its origin is in the deep lights of Gothic church windows and the twilight of the high vaulted Gothic nave, and the gold tone of the great Venetians, Titian, Veronese, Parma, Georgian, is always reminding us of that old perished northern art of glass painting of which they themselves know almost nothing. Here also the Renaissance with its deliberate bodiliness of color is seen as merely an episode, an event of the very self-conscious surface, and not a product of the underlying Faustian instinct of the western soul, whereas this luminous gold brown of the Venetian painting links Gothic and Baroque, the art of the old glass painting and the dark music of Beethoven, and it coincides precisely in time with the establishment of the Baroque style of color music by the work of the Netherlanders Willet and Cyprian de Roer, the elder Gabrielli, and the Venetian music school which they founded. Brown, then, became the characteristic color of the soul, and more particularly of a historically disposed soul. Nietzsche has, I think, spoken somewhere of the brown music of Bizet but the adjective is far more appropriate to the music which Beethoven wrote for strings 40 and to the orchestration that even as late as Bruckner so often fills space with a browny golden expanse of tone. All other colors are relegated to ancillary functions, thus the bright yellow and the vermilion of Vermeer intrude with the spatial almost as though from another world and with an emphasis that is truly metaphysical and the yellow-green and blood-red lights of Rembrandt seem at most to play with the symbolism of space. In Rubens, on the contrary, brilliant performer but no thinker, the brown is almost destitute of idea, a shadow color. In him and in what? The Catholic blue-green disputes precedence with the brown, all this shows how any particular means may, in the hands of men of inward depth become a symbol for the evocation of such high transcendence as that of the Rembrandt landscape, while for other great masters it may be merely a serviceable technical expedient, or in other words that, as we have already seen, technical form, in the theoretical sense of something opposed to content, 
has nothing whatever to do with their real and true form of a great work. I have called brown a historical color. By this is meant that it makes the atmosphere of the pictured space signify directedness and future, and overpowers the assertiveness of any instantaneous element that may be represented. The other colors of distance have also this significance, and they lead to an important, considerable and distinctly bizarre extension of the Western symbolism. The Helms had in the end come to prefer bronze and even gilt bronze to the painted marble, the better to express, by the radiance of this phenomenon against a deep blue sky, the idea of the individualness of any and every corporeal thing. 41 Now, when the Renaissance dug these statues up, it found them black and green with the patina of many centuries. The historic spirit, with its piety and longing, fastened onto this, and from that time forth our form feeling has canonized this black and green of distance. Today our eye finds it indispensable to the enjoyment of a bronze, an ironical illustration of the fact that this whole species of art is something that no longer concerns us as such. What does a cathedral dome or a bronze figure mean to us without the patina which transmutes the short-range brilliance into the tone of remoteness of time and place? Have we not got to the point of artificially producing this patina? Question mark 42. But even more than this is involved in the ennoblement of decay to the level of an art means of independent significance. That a Greek would have regarded the formation of patina as the ruin of the work, we can hardly doubt. It is not merely that the color green, on account of its distant quality, was avoided by him on spiritual grounds. Patina is a symbol of mortality and hence related in a remarkable way to the symbols of time measurement and the funeral rite. We have already in an earlier chapter discussed the wistful regard of the Faustian soul for ruins and evidences of the distant past, its proneness to the collection of antiquities and manuscripts and coins, to pilgrimages to the Forum Romanum and to Pompeii, to excavations and philological studies, which appears as early as the time of Petrarch. When would it have occurred to a Greek to bother himself with the ruins of Knossos or Terence? Question mark 43 Every Greek knew his Iliad but not one ever thought of digging up the hill of Troy. We, on the contrary, are moved by a secret piety to preserve the aqueducts of the Campagna, the Etruscan tombs, the ruins of Luxor and Karnak, the crumbling castles of the Rhine, the Roman limes, Hersfeld and Pauline Zeller from becoming mere rubbish but we keep them as ruins, feeling in some subtle way that reconstruction would deprive them of something, indefinable in terms, that can never be reproduced. 44 Nothing was further from the classical mind than this reverence for the weather beaten evidences of a once and a formerly. It cleared out of sight everything that did not speak of the present, never was the old preserved because it was old. After the Persians had destroyed old Athens, the citizens threw columns, statues, reliefs, broken or not, over the Acropolis wall, in order to start afresh with a clean slate, and the resultant scrap heaps have been our richest sources for the art of the 6th century. Their action was quite in keeping with the style of a culture that raised cremation to the rank of a major symbol and refused with scorn to bind daily life to a chronology. Our choice has been, as usual, the opposite. The heroic landscape of the Claude Lorraine type is inconceivable without ruins. The English park with its atmospheric suggestion, which supplanted the French about 1750 and abandoned the great perspective idea of the latter in favor of the nature of Addison, Pope and sensibility, introduced into its stock of motives perhaps the most astonishing bizarrery ever perpetrated, the artificial ruin in order to deepen the historical character in the presented landscape. 45 The Egyptian culture restored the works of its early period, but it would never have ventured to build ruins as the symbols of the past. Again, it is not the classical statue, but the classical torso that we really love. It has had a destiny, something suggestive of the past has passed envelops it and our imagination delights to fill the empty space of missing limbs with the pulse and swing of invisible lines. A good restoration, and the secret charm of endless possibilities is all gone. I venture to maintain that it is only by way of this transposition into the musical that the remains of classical sculpture can really reach us.
the green bronze, the black and marble, the fragments of a figure abolish for our inner eye the limitations of time and space. Picturesque this has been called, the brand new statue and building and the two well-groomed park are not picturesque, and the word is just to this extent, that the deep meaning of this weathering is the same as that of the studio brown. But, at bottom, what both express is the spirit of instrumental music. Would the spearman of Polyclitus, standing before us in flashing bronze and with enamel eyes and gilded hair, affect us as it does in the state of black and age? Would not the Vatican torso of Heracles lose its mighty impressiveness if, one fine day, the missing parts were discovered and replaced? And would not the towers and domes of our old cities lose their deep metaphysical charm if they were sheathed in new copper? Age, for us as for the Egyptian, ennobles all things. For classical man, it depreciates them. Lastly, consider Western tragedy, observe how the same feeling leads it to prefer historical material, meaning thereby not so much demonstrably actual or even possible, but remote and crusted subjects. That which the Faustian soul wanted, and must have, could not be expressed by any event of purely momentary meaning lacking in distance of time or place, or by a tragic art of the classical kind, or by a timeless myth. Our tragedies, consequently, are tragedies of the past and of the future. The latter category, in which men yet to be are shown as carriers of a destiny, is represented in a certain sense by Faust, Piergint and the Gotted Amarung. But tragedies of the present we have not apart from the trivial social drama of the 19th century. 46 if Shakespeare wanted on occasion to express anything of importance in the present, he at least removed the scene of it to some foreign land, Italy for preference, in which he had never been, and German poets likewise take England or France, always for the sake of getting rid of that nearness of time and place which the Attic drama emphasized even in the case of a mythological subject. Chapter 8 music and plastic. 2. Act 1 and portrait. I. The classical has been characterized as a culture of the body and the northern as a culture of the spirit, and not without a certain re-ear pensee of disprising the one in favor of the other. Though it was mainly in trivialities that Renaissance taste made its contrasts between classical and modern, pagan and Christian. Yet even this might have led to decisive discoveries if only men had seen how to get behind formula to origins. If the environment of man, whatever else it may be, is with respect to him a macrocosm with respect to a microcosm, an immense aggregate of symbols, then the man himself, in so far as he belongs to the fabric of actuality, in so far as he is phenomenal, must be comprised in the general symbolism. But, in the impress of him made upon men like himself, what is it that possesses the force of symbol, viz., the capacity of summing within itself and intelligibly presenting the essence of that man and the signification of his being? Art gives the answer. But this answer is necessarily different in different cultures. As each lives differently, so each is differently impressed by life. For the mode of human imagining, metaphysical, ethical, artistic imagining alike, it is more than important, it is determinant that the individual feels himself as a body amongst bodies or, on the contrary, as a center in endless space, that he subtilizes his ego into lone distinctness or, on the contrary, regards it as substantially part of the general consensus, that the directional character is asserted or, on the contrary, denied in the rhythm and course of his life. In all these ways the prime symbol of the great culture comes to manifestation, this is indeed a world feeling, but the life ideal conforms to it. From the classical ideal followed unreserved acceptance of the sensuous instant, from the western a not less passionate wrestle to overcome it. The Apollonian soul, Euclidean and point formed, felt the empirical visible body as the complete expression of its own way of being, the Faustian roving into all distances, found this expression not in person, comma but in personality, character, call it what you will. Soul for the real Hellene was in last analysis the form of his body, and thus Aristotle defined it. Body for Faustian man was the vessel of the soul, and thus Goethe felt it. 
but the result of this is that culture and culture differ very greatly in their selection and formation of their humane arts. While Gluck expresses the woe of Armida by a melody combined with drear gnawing tones in the instrumental accompaniment, the same is achieved in Pergamene sculptures by making every muscle speak. The Hellenistic portraiture tries to draw a spiritual type in the structure of its heads. In China the heads of the saints of Ling Yanxi tell of a wholly personal inner life by their look and the play of the corners of the mouth. The classical tendency towards making the body the sole spokesman is emphatically not the result of any carnal overload in the race, to the man of wantonness was not permitted to, it was not, as Nietzsche thought, an orgiastic joy of untrammeled energy and perfervid passion. This sort of thing is much nearer to the ideals of Germanic Christian or of Indian chivalry. What a Paulinian man and a Paulinian art can claim as their very own is simply the apotheosis of the bodily phenomenon, taking the word perfectly literally, the rhythmic proportioning of limbs and harmonious build of muscles. This is not pagan as against Christian, it is Attic as against Baroque, for it was Baroque mankind, Christian or unbeliever, monk or rationalist that first utterly put away the cult of the palpable comma carrying its alienation indeed to the extremes of bodily uncleanliness that prevailed in the entourage of Louis XIV, three whose full wigs and lace scuffs and buckled shoes covered up body with a whole web of ornament. Thus the classical plastic art, after liberating the form completely from the actual or imaginary back wall and setting it up in the open, free and unrelated, to be seen as a body among bodies, moved on logically till the naked body became its only subject. And, moreover, it is unlike every other kind of sculpture recorded in art history in that its treatment of the bounding surfaces of this body is anatomically convincing. Here is the Euclidean world principle carried to the extreme, any envelope whatever would have been in contradiction, however slightly, with the Apollonian phenomenon, would have indicated, however timidly, the existence of the circumspace. In this art, what is ornamental in the high sense resides entirely in the proportions of the structure for and the equivalence of the axes in respect of support and load. Standing, sitting, lying down but always self-secure, the body has, like the peripteros, no interior, that is, no soul. The significance of the muscle relief, carried out absolutely in the round is the same as that of the self-closing array of the columns, both contain the whole of the form language of the work. It was a strictly metaphysical reason, the need of a supreme life symbol for themselves, that brought the later Helms to this art, which under all the consummate achievement is a narrow one. It is not true that this language of the outer surface is the completest, or the most natural, or even the most obvious mode of representing the human being quite the contrary. If the Renaissance, with its ardent theory and its immense misconception of its own tendency, had not continued to dominate our judgment, long after the plastic art itself had become entirely alien to our inner soul, we should not have waited till today to observe this distinctive character of the Attic style. No Egyptian or Chinese sculptor ever dreamed of using external anatomy to express his meaning. In Gothic image work a language of the muscles is unheard of. The human tracery that clothes the mighty Gothic framework with a web of countless figures and reliefs, Charter a cathedral has more than 10,000 such, is not merely ornament, as early as about 1,200 it is employed for the expression of schemes and purposes far grander than even the grandest of classical plastic. For these masses of figures constitute a tragic unit. Here, by the North even earlier than by Dante, the historical feeling of the Faustian soul, of which the deep sacrament of contrition is the spiritual expression and the rite of confession the grave teacher, is intensified to the tragic fullness of a world drama. That which Joachim of Florus, at this very time, was seeing in his Apollyon cell, the picture of the world, not as cosmos, but as a divine history and succession of three world ages, the craftsmen were expressing a dreams, Amiens and Paris in serial presentation of it from the fall to the last judgment. Each of the scenes, each of the great symbolic figures, had its significant place in the sacred edifice, each its role in the immense world poem. Then, too, 
Each individual man came to feel how his life course was fitted as ornament in the plan of divine history, and to experience this personal connection with it in the forms of contrition and confession. And thus these bodies of stone are not mere servants of the architecture. They have a deep and particular meaning of their own, the same meaning as the memorial tomb brings to expression with ever increasing intensity from the royal tombs of Saint Denis onward, they speak of a personality, just as classical man properly meant, with his perfected working out of superficial body, for all the anatomical aspiration of the Greek artist comes to that in the end, to exhaust the whole essence of the living phenomenon in and by the rendering of its bounding surfaces, so Faustian man no less logically found the most genuine, the only exhaustive, expression of his life feeling in the portrait. The Hellenic treatment of the nude is the great exceptional case, in this and in this only has it led to an art of the high order. Five. Act and portrait have never hitherto been felt as constituting an opposition, and consequently the full significance of their appearances in art history has never been appreciated. And yet it is in the conflict of these two form ideals that the contrast of two worlds is first manifested in full. There, on the one hand, an existence is made to show itself in the composition of the exterior structure, here, on the other hand, the human interior, the soul, is made to speak of itself, as the interior of a church speaks to us through its facade or face. A mosque had no face and consequently the iconoclastic movement of the Muslims and the Paulicians, which under Leo III spread to Byzantium and beyond, necessarily drove the portrait element quite out of the arts of form, so that thenceforward they possessed only a fixed stock of human arabesques. In Egypt the face of the statue was equivalent to the pylon, the face of the temple plan, it was a mighty emergence out of the stone mass of the body as we see in the Hyksos Sphinx of Tanis and the portrait of Menemet III. In China the face is like a landscape, full of wrinkles and little signs that mean something. But, for us, the portrait is musical. The look, the play of the mouth, the pose of head and hands, these things are a fugue of the subtlest meaning, a composition of many voices that sounds to the understanding beholder. But in order to grasp the significance of the portraiture of the West more specifically in contrast with that of Egypt and that of China, we have to consider the deep change in the language of the West that began in Merovingian times to foreshadow the dawn of a new life feeling. This change extended equally over the Old German and the Vulgar Latin, but it affected only the tongues spoken in the countries of the coming culture, for instance, Norwegian and Spanish, but not Romanian. The change would be inexplicable if we were to regard merely the spirit of these languages and their influence of one upon another, the explanation is in the spirit of the mankind that raised a mere way of using words to the level of a symbol. Instead of some, Gothicim, we say Ikbin, I am, Jesus, instead of Fesisti, we say to Habes Factum, to Asfet, Du Habes Gutten, and again, Das Whip, Unhom, Manhat. This has hitherto been a riddle six because families of languages were considered as beings, but the mystery is solved when we discover in the idiom the reflection of a soul. The Faustian soul is here beginning to remold for its own use grammatical material of the most varied provenance. The coming of this specific eye is the first dawning of that personality idea which was so much later to create the sacrament of contrition and personal absolution. This ego habio factum, the insertion of the auxiliaries heaven be between a doer and a deed, in lieu of the fessy which expresses activated body, replaces the world of bodies by one of functions between centers of force, the static syntax by a dynamic. And this I and thou is the key to Gothic portraiture. A Hellenistic portrait is the type of an attitude, a confession it is not, either to the creator of it or to the understanding spectator. But our portraits depict something sui generis, once occurring and never occurring, a life history expressed in a moment, a world center for which everything else is whirled around, exactly as the grammatical subject I becomes the center of force in the Faustian sentence. It has been shown how the experience of the extended has its origin in the living direction, time, destiny. In the perfected being of the all-round nude body the depth experience has been cut away, 
but the look of a portrait leads this experience into the super sensuous infinite. Therefore the ancient art is an art of the near and tangible and timeless, it prefers motives of brief, briefest, pause between two movements, the last moment before Myron's athlete throws the discus, or the first moment after Poeonius's Nike has alighted from the air, when the swing of the body is ending and the streaming draperies have not yet fallen, attitudes devoid equally of duration and of direction, disengaged from future and from past. Veni, vidi, visi is just such another attitude. But in I, came, I, saw, I, conquered there is a becoming each time in the very build of the sentence. The depth experience is a becoming and effects a become, signifies time and evokes space is at once cosmic and historical. Living direction marches to the horizon as to the future. As early as 1230 the Madonna at the Saint Anne entrance of Notre Dame dreams of this future, so, later, the Cologne Madonna with the bin blossom of Meister Wilhelm. Long before the Moses of Michelangelo, the Moses of Klaus suitors well in the Chartres as of Dijon meditates on destiny, and even the symbols of the Sistine Chapel are forestalled by those of Giovanni Pisno in Sant'Andrea at Bistoa, 1300. And, lastly, there are the figures on the Gothic tombs, how they rest from the long journey of destiny and how completely they contrast with the timeless grave and gay that is represented on the steely of Attic cemeteries. Seven, The Western portraiture is endless in every sense for it begins to wake out of the stone from about 1200 and it has become completely music in the 17th century. It takes its man not as a mere center of the world as nature which as phenomenon receives shape and significance from his being, but, above all, as a center of the world as history. The classical statue is a piece of present nature and nothing besides. The classical poetry is statuary in verse. Herein is the root of our feeling that ascribes to the Greek an unreserved devotion to nature. We shall never entirely shake off the idea that the Gothic style as compared with the Greek is unnatural. Of course it is, for it is more than nature, only we are unnecessarily loath to realize that it is a deficiency in the Greek that our feeling has detected. The Western form language is richer, portraiture belongs to nature and to history. A tomb by one of those great Netherlanders who worked on the royal graves of St. Denis from 1160, a portrait by Holborn or Titian or Rembrandt or Goya, is a biography, and a self-portrait is a historical confession. To make one's confession is not to avow an act but to lay before the judge the inner history of that act. The act is patent, its roots the personal secret. When the Protestant or the free thinker opposes auricular confession, it never occurs to him that he is rejecting merely the outward form of the idea and not the idea itself. He declines to confess to the priest, but he confesses to himself, to a friend, or to all and sundry. The whole of northern poetry is one outspoken confession. So are the portrait of Rembrandt and the music of Beethoven. What Raphael and Calderon and Haydn told to the priests, these men put into the language of their works. One who is forced to be silent because the greatness of form that can take in even the ultimate things has been denied him. Goes under like Holderlin. Western man lives in the consciousness of his becoming and his eyes are constantly upon past and future. The Greek lives pointwise, ahistorically, somatically. No Greek would have been capable of a genuine self-criticism. As the phenomenon of the nude statue is the completely ahistoric copy of a man, so the Western self-portrait is the exact equivalent of the Werther or Tasso autobiography. To the classical both are equally and wholly alien. There is nothing so impersonal as Greek art, that Skippers or Polycletus should make an image of himself is something quite inconceivable. Looking at the work of Phidias, of Polycletus, or of any master later than the Persian Wars, do we not see in the doming of the brow, the lips, the set of the nose, the blind eyes, the expression of entirely non-personal, plant-like, soulless vitality? And may we not ask ourselves whether this is the form language that is capable even of hinting at an inner experience?
Michelangelo devoted himself with all passion to the study of anatomy, but the phenomenal body that he works out is always the expression of the activity of all bones, sinews and organs of the inside, without deliberate intention, the living that is under the skin comes out in the phenomenon. It is a physiognomy, and not a system, of muscles that he calls to life. But this means that once that the personal destiny and not the material body has become the starting point of the form feeling. There is more psychology, and less nature, in the arm of one of his slaves eight than there is in the whole head of Praxiteles' Hermes. Nine Myron's Discibolus ten on the other hand, renders the exterior form purely as itself, without relation of any sort to the inner organs, let alone to any soul. One has only to take the best work of this period and compare it with the old Egyptian statues, say the village Sheikh Levin or King Phiopes, P.P., or again with Donatello's David, 12 to understand at once what it means to recognize a body purely with reference to its material boundaries. Everything in a head that might allow something intimate or spiritual to become phenomenal the Greeks, and markedly this same Myron, most carefully avoid. Once this characteristic has struck us, the best heads of the great age sooner or later begin to pall. Seen in the perspective of our world feeling, they are stupid and dull, wanting in the biographical element, devoid of any destiny. It was not out of caprice that that age objected so strongly to votive images. The statues of Olympian victors are representatives of a fighting attitude. Right down to Lysippus there is not one single character head but only masks. Again, considering the figure as a whole, with what skill the Greeks avoid giving any impression that the head is the favored part of the body. That is why these heads are so small, so insignificant in their pose, so unthoroughly modeled. Always they are formed as a part of the body like arms and legs, never as the seat and symbol of an eye. At last, even, we come to regard the feminine, not to say feminine, look of many of these heads of the 5th, and still more of the 4th, centuries 13 as there, no doubt an intentional, outcome of an effort to get rid of personal character entirely. We should probably be justified in concluding that the ideal facial type of this art, which was certainly not an art for the people, as the later naturalistic portrait sculpture at once shows, was arrived at by rejecting all elements of an individual or historical character, that is, by steadily narrowing down the field of view to the pure Euclidean. The portraiture of the great age of Baroque, on the contrary, applies to historical distance all those means of pictorial counterpoint that we already know as the fabric of their spatial distance, the brown dipped atmosphere, the perspective, the dynamic brush stroke, the quivering color tones and light, and with their aid succeeds in treating body as something intrinsically non-material as the highly expressive envelope of a space commanding ego. This problem the fresca technique, Euclidean that it is, is powerless to solve. The whole painting has only one theme, a soul. Observe the rendering of the hands and the brow in Rembrandt, for example, in the etching of Burgomaster Six or the portrait of an architect at Kassel, and again, even so late, in Marie's and Albel 14, spiritual to the point of dematerializing them, visionary, lyrical. Compare them with the hand and brow of an Apollo or a Poseidon of the Periclean age. The Gothic, too, had deeply and sincerely felt this. It had draped body, not for its own sake but for the sake of developing in the ornament of the drapery a formal language consonant with the language of the head and the hands in a fugue of life. So, too, with the relations of the voices in counterpoint and, in Baroque those of the continuo to the upper voices of the orchestra. In Rembrandt there is always interplay of bass melody in the costume and motives in the head. Like the Gothic draped figure, the old Egyptian statue denies the intrinsic importance of body. As the former, by treating the clothing in a purely ornamental fashion, reinforces the expressiveness of head and hands, so the latter, with a grandeur of idea never since equaled, at any rate in sculpture, holds the body, as it holds a pyramid or an obelisk, to a mathematical scheme and confines the personal element to the head. The fall of draperies was meant in Athens to reveal the sense of the body, in the north to conceal it, in the one case the fabric becomes body, 
in the other it becomes music. And from this deep contrast springs the silent battle that goes on in high renaissance work between the consciously intended and the unconsciously insistent ideals of the artist, a battle in which the first, anti-gothic, often wins the superficial, but the second, gothic becoming baroque, invariably wins the fundamental victory. 2. The opposition of Apollinean and Faustian ideals of humanity may now be stated concisely. Act and portrait are to one another as body and space, instant and history, foreground and background, Euclidean and analytical number, proportion and relation. The statue is rooted in the ground. Music, and the western portrait is music, soul woven of color tones, invades and pervades space without limit. The fresco painting is tied to the wall, trained on it, but the oil painting, the picture on canvas or board or other table, is free from limitations of place. The Apollinian form language reveals only the become, the Faustian shows above all a becoming. It is for this reason that child portraits and family groups are amongst the finest and most intimately right achievements of the Western art. In the Attic sculpture this motive is entirely absent and although in Hellenistic times the playful motive of the Cupid or Putto came into favor, it was expressly as a being different from the other beings and not at all as a person growing or becoming. The child links past and future. In every art of human representation that has a claim to symbolic import, it signifies duration in the midst of phenomenal change, the endlessness of life. But the classical life exhausted itself in the completeness of the moment. The individual shut his eyes to time distances, he comprehended in his thought the men like himself whom he saw around him, but not the coming generations, and therefore there has never been an art that so emphatically ignored the intimate representation of children as the Greek art did. Consider the multitude of child figures that our own art has produced from early Gothic to dying Rococo and in the Renaissance above all, and find if you can in classical art write down to Alexander one work of importance that intentionally sets by the side of the worked out body of man or woman any child element with existence still before it. Endless becoming is comprehended in the idea of motherhood, woman as mother is time and is destiny. Just as the mysterious act of depth experience fashions, out of sensation, extension and world, so through motherhood the bodily man is made an individual member of this world, in which thereupon he has a destiny. All symbols of time and distance are also symbols of maternity. Care is the root feeling of future, and all care is motherly. It expresses itself in the formation and the idea of family and state and in the principle of inheritance which underlies both. Care may be either affirmed or denied, one can live care-filled or care-free. Similarly, time may be looked at in the light of eternity or in the light of the instant, and the drama of begetting and bearing, or the drama of the nursing mother with her child, may be chosen as the symbol of life to be made apprehensible by all the means of art. India and the classical took the first alternative, Egypt and the West the second. There is something of pure unrelated present in the phallus and the lingam, and in the phenomenon of the Doric column and the Attic statue as well. But the nursing mother points into the future, and she is just the figure that is entirely missing in the classical art. She could not possibly be rendered in the style of Phidias. One feels that this form is opposed to the sense of the phenomenon. But in the religious art of the West, the representation of motherhood is the noblest of all tasks. As Gothic dawns, the Theoticos of the Byzantine changes into the Mater Dolorosa, the Mother of God. In German mythology she appears, doubtless from Carolingian times only, as a Frigga and Frau Hall. The same feeling comes out in beautiful Menzinger fancies like Lady Sun, Lady World, Lady Love. The whole panorama of early Gothic mankind is pervaded by something maternal, something caring and patient and Germanic Catholic Christianity, when it had ripened into full consciousness of itself and in one impulse settled its sacraments and created its Gothic style, placed not the suffering Redeemer but the suffering Mother in the center of its world picture. About 1150, in the great epic of statuary of Reims Cathedral, the principal place in the center of the main porch, 
which in the cathedrals of Paris and Amiens was still that of Christ, was assigned to the Madonna, and it was about this time, too, that the Tuscan school Laterestso and Sina, Guido di Sina, began to infuse a suggestion of mother love into the conventional Byzantine Theoticos. And after that the Madonnas of Raphael led the way to the purely human type of the Baroque, the mother in the sweetheart, Aphelia, Gretchen, whose secret reveals itself in the glorious close of Faust II and in its fusion with the early Gothic Mary. As against these types, the imagination of the Greeks conceived goddesses who are either Amazons like Athene or Heta like Aphrodite. In the root feeling which produced the classical type of womanhood, fruitfulness has a vegetal character, in this connection as in others the word exhaustively expresses the meaning of the phenomenon. Think of the masterpieces of this art, the three mighty female bodies of the east pediment of the Parthenon, 15 and compare with them that noblest image of a mother, Raphael's Sistine Madonna. In the latter, all bodileanness has disappeared. She is all distance and space. The Helen of the Iliad, compared with Greenhild, the motherly comrade of Siegfried, is a courtesan, while Antigone and Clytemnestra are Amazons. How strangely even Aeschylus passes over in silence the mother tragic in Clytemnestra. The figure of Medea is nothing less than the mythic inverse of the Faustian Mater Dolorosa, her tragic is not one of future or children, it is with her lover, the symbol of holy present life, that her universe collapses. Creamhild revenges her unborn children, it is this future that has been murdered in her, but Medea revenges only a past happiness. When the classical sculpture, late art that it is comma 16 arrives at secularizing 17 the pictures of the god, it creates the antique ideal of female form in Echnidian Aphrodite, merely a very beautiful object, not a character or an ego but a piece of nature. And in the end Praxiteles finds the hardihood to represent a goddess entirely naked. This innovation met with severe criticism for it was felt to be a sign of the decline of the classical world feeling, suitable as it was to erotic symbolism, it was in sharp contradiction with the dignity of the older Greek religion. But exactly then, too, a portrait art ventured to show itself, simultaneously with the invention of a form that has never since been forgotten, the bust. Unfortunately, here as elsewhere, art research has made the mistake of discovering in this the beginnings of the portrait. In reality, whereas a Gothic visage speaks of an individual destiny, and even an Egyptian, in spite of the rigid formalism of the figure, has the recognizable traits of the individual person, since otherwise it could not serve as dwelling for the higher soul of the dead. His ca, the Greeks developed a taste for typical representations just as the contemporary comedy produced standard men and situations, to which any names whatever could be affixed. The portrait is distinguishable not by personal traits but by the label only. This is the general custom amongst children and primitive men, and it is connected with name magic. The name serves to capture some essence of what is named and to bind it as an object which thereupon becomes specific for every beholder. The statues of the Tyrannocides, 18 there, Etruscan, statues of kings in the capital and the iconic portraits of victors at Olympia must have been portraits of this sort, viz, not likenesses but figures with names. But now, in the later phase, there was an additional factor, the tendency of the time towards genre and applied art, which produced also the Corinthian column. What the sculptors worked out was the types of life's stage the which we mistranslate by character but which is really the kinds and modes of public behavior and attitude, thus there is the grave commander, the tragic poet, the passion-torn actor, the absorbed philosopher. Here is the real key to the understanding of the celebrated Hellenistic portraiture, for which the quite unjustifiable claim has been set up that its products are expressions of a deep spiritual life. It is not of much moment whether the work bears the name of someone long dead, the Sophocles 19 was sculptured about 340, or of a living man like the Pericles of Chrysalis.20 It was only in the 4th century that Demetrius of Olapic began to emphasize individual traits in the external build of the man and Lysistratus the brother of Lysippus to copy, 
as Pliny tells us, a plaster of Paris cast of the subject's face without much subsequent modification. And how little such portraiture is portraiture in Rembrandt's sense should surely have been obvious to anyone. The soul is missing. The brilliant fidelity of Roman busts especially has been mistaken for physiognomic depth. But what really distinguishes the higher work from this craftsman's and virtuoso's work is an intention that is the precise opposite of the artistic intention of a more resourable. That is, in such work the important and significant is not brought out, it is put in. An example of this is seen in the Demosthenes statue, 21, the artist of which possibly saw the orator in life. Here the particulars of the body surface are emphasized, perhaps overemphasized true to nature, they call this then, but into the disposition so conceived he works the character type of the serious orator which we meet again on different bases in the portraits of Eskines and Lysias at Naples. That is truth to life, undoubtedly, but it is truth to life as classical man felt it, typical and impersonal. We have contemplated the result with our eyes, and have accordingly misunderstood it. 3. In the oil painting age that followed the end of the Renaissance, the depth of an artist can be accurately measured by the content of his portraits. To this rule there is hardly an exception. All forms in the picture, whether single, or in scenes, groups or masses 22 are fundamentally felt as portraits, whether they are meant to be so or not is immaterial, for the individual painter has no choice in the matter. Nothing is more instructive than to observe how under the hands of a real Faustian man even the act transforms itself into a portrait study. 23 Take two German masters like Lucas Cranach and Tilman Riemann Schneider who were untouched by any theory and, in contrast to Dürer, whose inclination to aesthetic subtlety made him pliant before alien tendencies, worked an unqualified naivete. They seldom depict the act, and when they do so, they show themselves entirely unable to concentrate their expression on the immediately present plain specified bodileanness. The meaning of the human phenomenon, and therefore of the representation of it, remains entirely in the head, and is consistently physiognomical rather than anatomical. And the same may be said of Dürer's Lucrezia, notwithstanding his Italian studies and the quite opposite intention. A Faustian act is a contradiction in itself. Hence the character heads that we so often see on feeble act representations, as far back as the job of old French cathedral sculpture, and hence also the laborious, forced, equivocal character that arouses our dislike in two manifest efforts to placate the classical ideal, sacrifices offered up not by the soul but by the cultivated understanding. In the whole of painting after Leonardo there is not one important or distinctive work that derives its meaning from the Euclidean being of the nude body. It is mere incomprehension to quote Rubens here, and to compare his unbridled dynamism of swelling bodies in any respect whatever with the art of Praxiteles and even Scopas. It is owing precisely to his splendid sensuality that he is so far from the static of Signorelli's bodies. If there ever was an artist who could put a maximum of becoming into the beauty of naked bodies, who could treat bodily floridness historically and convey the, utterly unhellenic, idea of an inexhaustible outflowing from within, it was Rubens. Compare the horse's head from the path and on pediment 24 with his horse's heads in the Battle of the Amazons, 25 and the deep metaphysical contrast between the two conceptions of the same phenomenal element is felt at once. In Rubens, recalling once more the characteristic opposition of Apollinian and Faustian mathematics, the body is not magnitude but relation. What matters is not the regimen of its external structure but the fullness of life that streams out of it and the stride of its life along the road from youth to age, where the last judgment that turns bodies into flames takes up the motive and intertwines it in the quivering web of active space. Such a synthesis is entirely unclassical, but even nymphs, when it is Coro who paints them, are likewise shapes ready to dissolve into color patches reflecting endless space. Such was not the intention of the classical artist when he depicted the act. At the same time, the Greek form ideal, the self-contained unit of being expressed in sculpture, 
has equally to be distinguished from that of the merely beautiful bodies on which painters from Georgian to Boucher were always exercising their cleverness, which are fleshly still life, genre work expressing merely a certain gay sensuousness, for example, Rubens's wife in a fur cloak. 26 and in contrast with the high ethical significance of the classical act have almost no symbolic force. 27 Magnificent as these men's painting is, therefore, they have not succeeded in reaching the highest levels either of portraiture or of space representation in landscape. Their brown and their green and their perspective lack religiousness, future, destiny. They are masters only in the domain of elementary form, and when it has actualized this their art is exhausted. It is they who constitute the substance element in the development history of a great art. But when a great artist pressed on beyond them to a form that was to be capable of embracing the whole meaning of the world, he had necessarily to push to perfection the treatment of the nude body if his world was the classical, and not to do so if it was an auth. Rembrandt never once painted an act, in this foreground sense, and if Leonardo, Titian, Velasquez, and, among moderns, Menzel, Maurice and Manet, did so at all, it was very rarely, and even then, so to say, they painted bodies as landscapes. The portrait is ever the touchstone. 28. But no one would ever judge masters like Signorelli, Mantigna, Botticelli, or even Verrocchio, by the quality of their portraits. The equestrian statue of Congrand 29 of 1330 is in a far higher sense a portrait than the Bartolomeo Colleone is, and Raphael's portraits, the best of which for example, Pope Julius II were done under the influence of the Venetian Sebastian del Piombo, could be ignored altogether in an appreciation of his creative work. It is only with Leonardo that the portrait begins to count seriously. Between fresco technique and oil painting there is a subtle opposition. In fact, Giovanni Bellini's Doge, Laudano 30 is the first great oil portrait. Here too the character of the Renaissance as a protest against the Faustian spirit of the West betrays itself. The episode of Florence amounts to an attempt to replace the portrait of the Gothic style, as distinct from the ideal portrait of late classical art, which was well known through the Caesar busts by the actor's human symbol. Logically, therefore, the entire art of the Renaissance should be wanting in the physiognomic traits. And yet the strong undercurrent of Faustian art will kept alive, not only in the smaller towns and schools of Middle Italy, but also in the instincts of the great masters themselves, a Gothic tradition that was never interrupted. Nay, the physiognomic of Gothic art even made itself master of the southern nude body alien as this element was. Its creations are not bodies that speak to us through static definition of their bounding surfaces. What we see is a dumb show that spreads from the face over all parts of the body, and the appreciative eye detects in this very nudity of Tuscany a deep identity with the drapery of the Gothic. Both are envelopes, neither all imitation. The reclining nude figures of Michelangelo in the Medici chapel are wholly and entirely the visage and the utterance of a soul. But, above all, every head, painted or modelled, became of itself a portrait, even when the heads were of gods or saints. The whole of the portrait work of A. Rossellino, Donatello, Benedetto de Maiano, Mino di Afisol, stands so near in spirit to that of Van Eyck, Mumlink and the early Rhenish masters as to be often indistinguishable from theirs. There is not and there cannot be, I maintain, any genuine Renaissance portraiture, that is, a portraiture in which just that artistic sentiment which differentiates the court of the Palazzo Strozzi from the Loggia di Lanzi and Perugino from Cimabue applies itself to the rendering of a visage. In architecture, little as the new work was Apollonian in spirit, it was possible to create anti-Gothically, but in portraiture, no. It was too specifically Faustian a symbol. Michelangelo declined the task, passionately devoted as he was to his pursuit of a plastic ideal, he would have considered it an abdication to busy himself with portraiture. His Brutus bust is as little of a portrait as his De Medici, whereas Botticelli's portrait of the latter is actual, and frankly gothic to boot. 
Michelangelo's heads are allegories in the style of dawning Baroque, and their resemblance even to Hellenistic work is only superficial. And however highly we may value the used Sarno bust of Donatello 31, which is perhaps the most important achievement of that age in that circle, it will be admitted that by the side of the portraits of the Venetians it hardly counts. It is well worth noting that this overcoming of, or at least this desire to overcome, the Gothic portrait with the classical act, the deeply historical and biographical form by the completely ahistoric, appears simultaneously with, and in association with, a decline in the capacity for self-examination and artistic confession in the Goethean sense. The true Renaissance man did not know what spiritual development meant. He managed to live entirely outwardly, and this was the great good fortune and success of the Quattrocento. Between Dante's Vita Nuova and Michelangelo's sonnets there is no poetic confession, no self-portrait of the high order. The Renaissance artist and humanist is the one single type of Western man for whom the word loneliness remained unmeaning. His life accomplished its course in the light of a courtly existence. His feelings and impressions were all public, and he had neither secret discontents nor reserves, while the life of the great contemporary Netherlanders, on the contrary, moved on in the shadow of their works. Is it perhaps permissible to add that it was because of this that that other symbol of historic distance, duration, care and ponderation, the state, also disappeared from the purview of the Renaissance, between Dante and Michelangelo? In fickle Florence, whose great men one and all were cruelly maltreated and whose incapacity for political creation seems, by the side of other western state forms, to border on sheer bizarrery, and, more generally, wherever the anti-Gothic, which in this connection means anti-dynastic, spirit displayed itself vigorously in art and public life, the state made way for a truly Hellenic Sarinus of Medicis, Sforzas, Borgias, Malatistas, and waste republics. Only that city where sculpture gained no foothold, where the southern music was at home, where Gothic and Baroque joined hands in Giovanni Bellini and the Renaissance remained an affair of occasional dilettantism, had an art of portraiture and there with a subtle diplomacy and a will to political duration, Venice. 4. The Renaissance was born of defiance, and therefore it lacked depth, width and sureness of creative instinct. It is the one and only epoch which was more consistent in theory than in performance and, in sharp contrast to Gothic and Baroque, the only one in which theoretically formulated intention preceded, often enough surpassed, the ability to perform. But the fact that the individual arts were forced to become satellites of a classicist sculpture could not in the last analysis alter the essence of them, and could only impoverish their store of inward possibilities. For natures of medium size, the Renaissance theme was not too big, it was attractive indeed from its very plainness, and we miss consequently that Gothic wrestling with overpowering imprecise problems which distinguishes the Rhenish and Flemish schools. The seductive ease and clarity of the Renaissance rests very largely upon evasion, the evasion of deeper reluctances by the aid of speciously simple rule. To men of the inwardness of Mamelin core the power of Grunewald such conditions as those of the Tuscan form world would have been fatal. They could not have developed their strength in and through it, but only against it. Seeing as we do no weakness in the form of the Renaissance masters, we are very prone to overrate their humanity. In Gothic, and again in Baroque, an entirely great artist was fulfilling his art in deepening and completing its language but in Renaissance he was necessarily only destroying it. So it was in the cases of Leonardo, Raphael and Michelangelo, the only really great men of Italy after Dante. Is it not curious that between the masters of the Gothic, who were nothing but silent workers in their art and yet achieved the very highest that could be achieved within its convention and its field, and the Venetians and Dutch of 1600, who again were purely workers, there should be these three men who were not sculptors or painters but thinkers, and thinkers who of necessity busied themselves not merely with all the available means of artistic expression but with a thousand other things besides, ever restless and dissatisfied, in their effort to get at the real essence and aim of their being. Does it not mean, 
that in the Renaissance they could not find themselves? Each in his own fashion, each under his own tragic illusion, these three giants strove to be classical in the Medicean sense, and yet it was they themselves who in one and another way, Raphael in respect of the line, Leonardo in respect of the surface, Michelangelo in respect of the body, shattered the dream. In them the misguided soul is finding its way back to its Faustian starting points. What they intended was to substitute proportion for relation, drawing for light and air effect, Euclidean body for pure space. But neither they nor others of their time produced a Euclidean static sculpture, for that was possible once only, in Athens. In all their work one feels a secret music, in all their forms the movement quality and the tending into distances and depths. They are on the way, not to Phidias but to Palestrina, and they have come thither not from Roman ruins but from the still music of the cathedral. Raphael thawed the Florentine fresco, and Michelangelo the statue, and Leonardo dreamed already of Rembrandt and Bach. The higher and more conscientious the effort to actualize the ideas of the age, the more intangible it became. Gothic and Baroque, however, are something that is, while Renaissance is only an ideal, unattainable like all ideals, that floats over the will of a period. Giotto is a Gothic, and Titian is a Baroque, artist. Michelangelo would be a Renaissance artist, but fails. Visibly, the plastic in him, for all its ambitiousness, is overpowered by the pictorial spirit, and a pictorial spirit, too, in which the northern space perspective is implicit. Even as soon as 1520 the beautiful proportion, the pure rule, that is, the conscious classical, are felt as frigid and formal. The cornice which he put onto Sangallo's purely classical facade of the Palazzo Farnese was no doubt, from the strictly Renaissance standpoint, a disfigurement, but he himself and many with him felt it to be far superior to the achievements of Greeks and Romans. As Petrarch was the first, so Michelangelo was the last Florentine who gave himself up passionately to the antique. But it was no longer an entire devotion. The Franciscan Christianity of Francis Angelico, with its subtle gentleness and its quiet, reflective piety, to which the southern refinement of ripe Renaissance work owes far more than has been supposed 32, came now to its end. The majestic spirit of the Counter-Reformation, massive, animated, gorgeous, lives already in Michelangelo. There is something in Renaissance work which at the time passed for being classical but as really only a deliberately noble dress for the Christian German world feeling, as we have already mentioned, the combination of round arch and pillar, that favorite Florentine motive, was of Syrian origin. But compare the pseudo-Corinthian column of the 15th century with the columns of a real Roman ruin, remembering that these ruins were known and on the spot. Michelangelo alone would tolerate no half and half. Clarity he wanted and he would have. The question of form was for him a religious matter, for him, and only for him, it was all or nothing. And this is the explanation of the lonely fearful wrestlings of this man, surely the unhappiest figure in our art, of the fragmentary, the tortured, the unsatisfied, the terrible in his forms that frightened his contemporaries. The one half of his nature drew him towards the classical and therefore to sculpture, we all know the effect produced upon him by the recently discovered lacoon. No man ever made a more honest effort than he did to find a way with the chisel into a buried world. Everything that he created he meant sculpturally, sculpturally, that is, in a sense of the word that he and he alone stood for. The world, presented in the great pan the element which Goethe meant to render when he brought Helena into the second part of Faust, the Apollonian world in all its powerful sensuous corporal presence, that was what Michelangelo was striving with all his might to capture and to fix in artistic being when he was painting the Sistine ceiling. Every resource of fresco, the big contours, the vast surfaces, the immense nearness of naked shapes, the materiality of color was here for the last time strained to the utmost to liberate the paganism, the high renaissance paganism, that was in him. But his second soul, the soul of gothic Christian Dante and of the music of great expanses, is pulling in the opposite sense, 
His scheme for the ensemble is manifestly metaphysical in spirit. His was the last effort, repeated again and again, to put the entirety of the artist personality into the language of stone. But the Euclidean material failed him. His attitude to it was not that of the Greek. In the very character of its being the chiseled statue contradicts the world feeling that tries to find something by, and not to possess something in, its artworks. For Phidias, marble is the cosmic stuff that is crying for form. The story of Pygmalion and Galatea expresses the very essence of that art. But for Michelangelo marble was the foe to be subdued, the prison out of which he must deliver his idea as Siegfried delivered Brunhilde. Everyone knows his way of setting to work. He did not approach the rough block coolly from every aspect of the intended form, but attacked it with a passionate frontal attack, hewing into it as though into space, cutting away the material layer by layer and driving deeper and deeper until his form emerged, while the members slowly developed themselves out of the quarry. Never perhaps has there been a more open expression of world dread in the presence of the become, death of the will to overpower and capture it in vibrant form. There is no other artist of the West whose relation to the stone has been that of Michelangelo, at once so intimate and so violently masterful. It is his symbol of death. In it dwells the hostile principle that his demonic nature is always striving to overpower, whether he is cutting statues or piling great buildings out of it. 33 He is the one sculptor of his age who dealt only with marble. Bronze, as cast, allows the modeler to compromise with pictorial tendencies, and it appealed therefore to other Renaissance artists and to the softer Greeks. The giant stood aloof from it. The instantaneous bodily posture was what the classical sculptor created, and of this Faustian man was incapable. It is here just as it is in the matter of love, in which Faustian man discovers, not primarily the act of union between man and woman but the great love of Dante and beyond that the caring mother. Michelangelo's erotic, which is that of Beethoven also, is as unclassical as it is possible to be. It stands subspeciate and it and not under that of sense and the moment. He produced acts, a sacrifice to the Hellenic idol, but the soul in them denies or overmasters the visible form. He wills infinity as the Greek willed proportion and rule, he embraces past and future as the Greek embraced present. The classical eye absorbs plastic form into itself, but Michelangelo saw with the spiritual eye and broke through the foreground language of immediate sensuousness. And inevitably, in the long run, he destroyed the conditions for this art. Marble became too trivial for his will to form. He ceased to be sculptor and turned architect. In full old age, when he was producing only wild fragments like the Rondini Madonna and hardly cutting his figures out of the rough at all, the musical tendency of his artistry broke through. In the end the impulse towards contrapuntal form, was no longer to be repressed and, dissatisfied through and through with the art upon which he had spent his life, yet dominated still by the unquenchable will to self-expression, he shattered the canon of Renaissance architecture and created the Roman Baroque. For relations of material and form, he substituted the contest of force and mass. He grouped the columns in sheaves or else pushed them away into niches. He broke up the stories with huge pilasters and gave the facade a sort of surging and thrusting quality. Measure yielded to melody, the static to the dynamic. And thus, Faustian music enlisted in its service the chief of all the other arts. With Michelangelo the history of Western sculpture is at an end. What of it there was after him was mere misunderstandings or reminiscences. His real heir was Palestrina. Leonardo speaks another language. In essentials his spirit reached forward into the following century, and he was in no wise bound, as Michelangelo was bound by every tie of heart, to the Tuscan ideal. He alone had neither the ambition to be sculptor nor the ambition to be architect. It was a strange illusion of the Renaissance that the Hellenic feeling and the Hellenic cult of the exterior structure could be got at by way of anatomical studies. But when Leonardo studied anatomy it was not, as in Michelangelo's case, foreground anatomy, the topography of human surfaces, studied for the sake of plastic, 
but physiology studied for the inward secrets. While Michelangelo tried to force the whole meaning of human existence into the language of the living body, Leonardo's studies show the exact opposite. His much admired sfumato is the first sign of the repudiation of corporeal bounds, in the name of space, and as such it is the starting point of Impressionism. Leonardo begins with the inside, the spiritual space within us, and not with the considered definition line, and when he ends, that is, if he ends at all and does not leave the picture unfinished, the substance of color lies like a mere breathing over the real structure of the picture, which is something incorporeal and indescribable. Raphael's paintings fall into planes in which he disposes his well-ordered groups, and he closes off the whole with a well-proportioned background. But Leonardo knows only one space, wide and eternal, and his figures, as it were, float therein. The one puts inside a frame a sum of individual near things, the other a portion cut out of the infinite. Leonardo discovered the circulation of the blood. It was no Renaissance spirit that brought him to that, on the contrary, the whole course of his thought took him right outside the conceptions of his age. Neither Michelangelo nor Raphael could have done it, for their painter's anatomy looks only at the form and position, not the function, of the parts. In mathematical language, it is stereometry as against analysis. Did not the Renaissance find it quite sufficient preparation for great painted scenes to study corpses, suppressing the becoming in favor of the become and calling on the dead to make classical accessible to northern creative energy? But Leonardo investigated the life in the body as Rubens did, and not the body in itself as Signorelli did. His discovery was contemporary with that of Columbus, and the two have a deep affinity, for they signify the victory of the infinite over the material limitedness of the tangibly present. Would a Greek ever have concerned himself with questions like theirs? The Greeks inquired as little into the interior of their own organization as they sought for the sources of the Nile. These were problems that might have jeopardized the Euclidean constitution of their being. The Baroque, on the other hand, is truly the period of the great discoveries. The very word discovery has something bluntly unclassical in it. Classical man took good care not to take the cover, the material wrapping, of anything cosmic, but to do just this is the most characteristic impulse of a Faustian nature. The discoveries of the new world, the circulation of the blood, and the Copernican universe were achieved almost simultaneously and, at bottom, are completely equivalent, and the discovery of gunpowder, that is, the long-range weapon 34, and of printing, the long-range script, were little earlier. Leonardo was a discoverer through and through, and discovery was the sum in one word of his whole nature. Brush, chisel, dissecting knife pencil for calculating and compasses for drawing, all were for him of equal importance. They were for him what the mariner's compass was for Columbus. When Raphael completes with color the sharply drawn outline he asserts the corporeal phenomenon in every brush stroke, but Leonardo, in his red chalk sketches and his backgrounds reveals aerial secrets with every line. He was the first, too, who set his mind to work on aviation to fly, to free one's self from earth, to lose one's self in the expanse of the universe, is not this ambition Faustian in the highest degree? Is it not in fact the fulfillment of our dreams? Has it never been observed how the Christian legend became in western painting a glorious transfiguration of this motive? All the picture descends into heaven and falls into hell, the divine figures floating above the clouds, the blissful detachment of angels and saints, the insistent emphasis upon freedom from earth's heaviness, are emblems of soul flight, peculiar to the art of the Faustian, utterly remote from that of the Byzantine. V. The transformation of Renaissance fresco painting into Venetian oil painting is a matter of spiritual history. We have to appreciate very delicate and subtle traits to discern the process of change. In almost every picture from Massaxio's Peter and the Tribute Money in the Brancaxi Chapel, through the soaring background that Piero della Francesca gave to the figures of Federigo and Battista of Urbino, 35 to Perugino's Christ giving the keys, 
36 The fresco manner is contending with the invasive new form, though Raphael's artistic development in the course of his work on the Vatican stands is almost the only case in which we can see comprehensively the change that is going on. The Florentine fresco aims at actuality in individual things and produces a sum of such things in an architectonic setting. Oil painting, on the other hand, sees and handles with ever-growing sureness extension as a whole, and treats all objects only as representatives thereof. The Faustian world feeling created the new technique that it wanted. It rejected the drawing style, as, from Moorism's time, coordinate geometry rejected it. It transformed the linear perspective associated with the architectural motif into a purely aerial perspective rendered by imponderable gradations of tone. But the condition of Renaissance art generally, its inability either to understand its own deeper tendencies or to make good its anti-Gothic principle, made the transition an obscure and difficult process. Each artist followed the trend in a way of his own. One painted in oils on the bare wall, and thereby condemned his work to perish, Leonardo's Last Supper. Another painted pictures as if they were wall frescoes, Michelangelo. Some ventured, some guessed, some fell by the way, some shied. It was, as always, the struggle between hand and soul, between eye and instrument, between the form willed by the artist and the form willed by time, the struggle between plastic and music. In the light of this, we can at last understand that gigantic effort of Leonardo, the cartoon of the adoration of the Magi in the Euphysi. It is the grandest piece of artistic daring in the Renaissance. Nothing like it was even imagined till Rembrandt. Transcending all optical measures, everything then called drawing, outline, composition and grouping, he pushes fearlessly on to challenge eternal space. Everything bodily floats like the planets in the Copernican system and the tones of a bark organ fugue in the dimness of old churches. In the technical possibilities of the time, so dynamic an image of distance could only remain a torso. In the Sistine Madonna, which is the very summation of the Renaissance, Raphael causes the outline to draw into itself the entire content of the work. It is the last grand line of Western art. Already, and it is this that makes Raphael the least intelligible of Renaissance artists, convention is strained almost to breaking point by the intensity of inward feeling. He did not indeed wrestle with problems. He had not even an inkling of them. But he brought art to the brink where it could no longer shirk the plunge, and he lived to achieve the utmost possibilities within its form world. The ordinary person who thinks him flat simply fails to realize what is going on in his scheme. Look again, reader, at the hackneyed Madonna. Have you ever noticed the little dawn cloudlets, transforming themselves into baby heads, that surround the soaring central figure? These are the multitudes of the unborn that the Madonna is drawing into life. We meet these light clouds again, with the same meaning. In the wondrous finale of Faust 237 it is just that which does not charm in Raphael, his sublime unpopularity, that betrays the inner victory over the Renaissance feeling in him. We do understand Perugino at a glance, we merely think we understand Raphael. His very line, that drawing character that at first sight seems so classical, is something that floats in space, supernal, Beethoven-like. In this work Raphael is the least obvious of all artists, less obvious even than Michelangelo, whose intention is manifest through all the fragmentariness of his works. In Francis Bartolomeo the material bounding line is still entirely dominant. It is all foreground, and the whole sense of the work is exhaustively rendered by the definition of bodies. But in Raphael line has become silent, expectant, veiled waiting in an extremity of tension for dissolution into the infinite, into space and music. Leonardo is already over the frontier. The adoration of the Magi is already music. It is not a casual but a deeply significant circumstance that in this work, as also in his Saint Jerome, 38 he did not go beyond the brown under painting, the Rembrandt stage, the atmospheric brown of the following century. For him, entire fullness and clearness of intention was attained with the work in that state, and one step into the domain of color, 
for that domain was still under the metaphysical imitations of the fresco style, would have destroyed the soul of what he had created. Feeling, in all its depth, the symbolism of which oil painting was later to be the vehicle, he was afraid of the fresco slickness, fertigue key it, that must have mined his idea. His studies for this painting show how close was his relation to the Rembrandt etching, an art whose home was also that of the art, unknown to Florence, of counterpoint. Only it was reserved for the Venetians, who stood outside the Florentine conventions, to achieve what he strove for here, to fashion a color world subserving space instead of things. For this reason, too, Leonardo, after innumerable attempts, decided to leave Christ's head in the Last Supper unfinished. The men of his time were not even ripe for portraiture as Rembrandt understood the word, the magistral building up of a soul history out of dynamic brush strokes and lights and tones. But only Leonardo was great enough to experience this limitation as a destiny. Others merely set themselves to paint heads, in the modes prescribed by their respective schools, but Leonardo, the first, here, to make the hands also speak, and that with a physiognomic mastery, had an infinitely wider purpose. His soul was lost afar in the future, though his mortal part, his eye and hand, obeyed the spirit of the age. Assuredly he was the freest of the three great ones. From much of that which Michelangelo's powerful nature vainly wrestled with, he was already remote. Problems of chemistry, geometrical analysis, physiology, Goethe's living nature was also Leonardo's, the technique of firearms, all were familiar to him. Deeper than Dürer, bolder than Titian, more comprehensive than any single man of his time, he was essentially the artist of torsos.39 Michelangelo the belated sculptor was so, too, but in another sense, while in Goethe's day that which had been unattainable for the painter of the Last Supper had already been reached and overpassed. Michelangelo strove to force life once more into a dead form world, Leonardo felt a new form world in the future, Goethe divined that there could be no new form worlds more. Between the first and the last of these men lie the ripe centuries of the Faustian culture. Vi. It remains now to deal with the major characters of Western art during the phase of accomplishment. In this we may observe the deep necessity of all history at work. We have learned to understand arts as prime phenomena. We no longer look to the operations of cause and effect to give unity to the story of development. Instead, we have set up the idea of the destiny of an art, and admitted arts to be organisms of the culture, organisms which are born, ripen, age and forever die. When the Renaissance, its last illusion, closes, the Western soul has come to the ripe consciousness of its own strength and possibilities. It has chosen its arts. As a late period, the Baroque knows, just as the Ionic had known, what the formal language of its arts has to mean. From being a philosophical religion, art has to be a religious philosophy. Great masters come forward in the place of anonymous schools. At the culmination of every culture we have the spectacle of a splendid group of great arts, well ordered and linked as a unit by the unity of the prime symbol underlying them all. The Apollonian group, to which belong vase painting, fresco relief, the architecture of ranked columns, the Attic drama and the dance, centers upon the naked statue. The Faustian group forms itself round the ideal of pure spatial infinity and its center of gravity is instrumental music. From this center, fine threads radiate out into all spiritual form languages and weave our infinitesimal mathematic, our dynamic physics, the propaganda of Jesuits and the power of our famous slogan of progress, the modern machine technique, credit economics and the dynastic diplomatic state all into one immense totality of spiritual expression. Beginning with the inward rhythm of the cathedral and ending with Wagner's Tristan and Parsifal, the artistic conquest of endless space deploys its full forces from about 1550. Plastic is dying with Michelangelo in Rome just when planimetry, dominant hitherto, is becoming the least important branch of our mathematic. At the same time, Venice is producing Zarlino's theories of harmony and counterpoint, 1558, 
and the practical method of the basso continuo, a perspective and an analysis of the world of sound, and this music's sister, the northern mathematic of the calculus, is beginning to mount. Oil painting and instrumental music, the arts of space, are now entering into their kingdom. So also, consequently, we say, the two essentially material and Euclidean arts of the classical culture, viz., the all-round statue and the strictly plain fresco, attain to their primacy at the corresponding date of c. 600 BC and further, in the one and in the other case, it is the painting that ripens first. For in either kind painting on the plane is a less ambitious and more accessible art than modeling in solid or composing in immaterial extension. The period 1550 to 1650 belongs as completely to oil painting as fresco and vase painting belong to the 6th century BC the symbolism of space and of body, expressed in the one case by perspective and in the other by proportion, are only indicated and not immediately displayed by pictorial arts. These arts, which can only in each case produce their respective prime symbols, that is, their possibilities in the extended, as illusions on a painted surface, are capable indeed of denoting and evoking the ideal, classical or western, as the case may be, but they are not capable of fulfilling it, they appear therefore in the path of the late culture as the ledges before the last summit. The nearer the grand style comes to its point of fulfillment, the more decisive the tendency to an ornamental language of inexorable clarity of symbolism. The group of great arts is further simplified. About 1670, just when Newton and Leibniz were discovering the differential calculus, oil painting had reached the limit of its possibilities. Its last great masters were dead or dying, Velasquez 1660, Pouce in 1665, Franz Hals 1666, Rembrandt 1669. Vermeer 1675, Murillo, Rustale and Claude Lorraine 1682, and one has only to name the few successors of any importance, what, Hogarth, Tiepolo, to feel at once the descent, the end, of an art. In this time also, the great forms of pictorial music expired. Heinrich Schutz died in 1672, Karsimi in 1674, and Purcell in 1695. The last great masters of the cantata, who had played around image themes with infinite variety of vocal and instrumental color and had painted veritable pictures of fine landscape and grand legend scene. With Lolly, 1687, the heart of the heroic Baroque opera of Montevard ceased to beat. It was the same with the old classical sonata for orchestra, organ and string trio which was a development of image themes in the fugal style. Thereafter, the forms become those of final maturity, the concerto grosso, the suite, and the three-part sonata for solo instruments. Music frees itself from the relics of bodiliness inherent in the human voice and becomes absolute. The theme is no longer an image but a pregnant function, existent only in and by its own evolution. For the fugal style as bar practiced it can only be regarded as a ceaseless process of differentiation and integration. The victory of pure music over painting stands recorded in the passions which Heinrich Schutz composed in his old age, the visible dawn of the new form language, in the sonatas of Dallabago and Corelli, the oratorios of Handel and the Baroque polyphony of Bach. Henceforth this music is the Faustian art and what may fairly be described as a painter Cooperin, Tiepolo as a painter Handel. In the classical world the corresponding change occurred about 460, when Polygnatus, the last of the great fresco painters, ceded the inheritance of the grand style to Polycletus and free sculpture in the round. Till then, as late even as Polygnatus's contemporaries Myron and the masters of the Olympia pediment, the former language of a purely planar art had dominated that of statuary also, for, just as painting had developed its form more and more towards the ideal of the silhouette of color with internal drawing superposed, to such an extent that at last there was almost no difference between the painted relief and the flat picture, 
so also the sculptor had regarded the frontal outline as it presented itself to the beholder as the true symbol of the ethos, the cultural type, that he meant his figure to represent. The field of the temple pediment constitutes a picture, seen from the proper distance, it makes exactly the same impression as its contemporary the red figure vase painting. In Polycletus's generation the monumental wall painting gives place to the board picture, the picture proper, in tempera or wax. A clear indication that the great style has gone to reside elsewhere. The ambition of Apollodorus's shadow painting was not in any sense what we call chiaroscuro and atmosphere, but sheer modeling in the round in the sculptor's sense, and of Zeuxis Aristotle says expressly that his work lacked ethos. Thus, this newer classical painting with its cleverness and human charm is the equivalent of our 18th century work. Both lacked the inner greatness and both tried by force of virtuosity to speak in the language of that single and final art which in each case stood for ornamentation in the higher sense. Hence Polycletus and Phidias align themselves with Bach and Handel, as the Western masters liberated strict musical form from the executive methods of the painting, so the Greek masters finally delivered the statue from the associations of the relief. And with this full plastic and this full music the two cultures reach their respective ends. A pure symbolism of mathematical rigor had become possible. Polycletus could produce his canon of the proportions of the human body, and his contemporary Bach the Kunst der Fugue and Waltemps Clavier. In the two arts that ensued, we have the last perfection of achievement that pure form saturated with meaning can give. Compare the tone body of Faustian instrumental music, and within that system again the body of the strings, in Bach, too, the virtual unity of the winds, with the bodies of Attic statuary. Compare the meaning of the word figure to Haydn with its meaning to Praxiteles. In the one case it is the figure of a rhythmic motif in a web of voices, in the other the figure of an athlete. But in both cases the notion comes from mathematics and it is made plain that the aim thus finally attained is a union of the artistic and the mathematical spirit, for analysis like music, and Euclidean geometry like plastic, have both come to full comprehension of their tasks and the ultimate meaning of their respective number languages. The mathematics of beauty and the beauty of mathematics are henceforth inseparable. The unending space of tone and the all-round body of marble or bronze are immediate interpretations of the extended. They belong to number as relation and to number as measure. In fresco and in oil painting, in the laws of proportion and those of perspective, the mathematical is only indicated, but the two final arts are mathematics, and on these peaks Apollinian art and Faustian art are seen entire. With the exit of fresco and oil painting, the great masters of absolute plastic and absolute music file onto the stage, man after man. Polycletus is followed by Phidias, Puionius, Alchemus, Scippus, Praxicles, Lysippus. Behind Bach and Handel come Gluck, Stamitz, the younger Bachs, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, in their hands an armory of wonderful and now long forgotten instruments a whole magician's world created by the discovering and inventing spirit of the West in the hope of getting more and more tones and timbers for the service and enhancement of musical expression, in their winds an abundance of grand, solemn, ornate, dainty, ironic, laughing and sobbing forms of perfectly regular structure, forms that no one now understands. In those days, in 18th century Germany especially, there was actually and effectively a culture of music that suffused all life. Its type was Hoffmann's Kapell Mr. Chrysler. Today it is hardly even a memory. And with the 18th century, too, architecture died at last, submerged and choked in the music of Rococo. On that last wonderful fragile growth of the Western architecture criticism has blown mercilessly, failing to realize that its origin is in the spirit of the fugue and that its non-proportion and non-form, its evanescence and instability and sparkle, its destruction of surface and visual order, are nothing else than a victory of tones and melodies over lines and walls, the triumph of pure space over material, of absolute becoming over the become. They are no longer buildings, 
these abbeys and castles and churches with their flowing facades and porches and gingerbread courts and their splendid staircases, galleries, salons and cabinets, they are sonatas, minuets, madrigals in stone, chamber music in stucco, marble, ivory and fine woods, cantilene of volutes and car touches, cadences of flyers and copings. The Dresden's winner is the most completely musical piece in all the world's architecture, with an ornamentation like the tone of an old violin, an allegro fugitivo for small orchestra. Germany produced the great musicians and therefore also the great architects of this century, Pop Ellmann, Schluter, Bach, Norman, Fischer von Erlach, Dinsenhofer. In oil painting she played no part at all, in instrumental music, on the contrary, hers was the principal role. 7. There is a word, Impressionism, which only came into general use in Manet's time, and then, originally, as a word of contempt like Baroque and Rococo, but very happily summarizes the special quality of the Faustian way of art that has evolved from oil painting. But, as we ordinarily speak of it, the idea has neither the width nor the depth of meaning that it ought to have, we regard it as a sequel to or derivative of the old age of an art which, in fact, belongs to it entirely and from first to last. What is the imitation of an impression? Something purely western, something related to the idea of Baroque and even to the unconscious purposes of Gothic architecture and diametrically opposed to the deliberate aims of the Renaissance. Does it not signify the tendency, the deeply necessary tendency of awaking consciousness to feel pure endless space as the supreme and unqualified actuality, and all sense images as secondary and conditioned actualities within it? A tendency that can manifest itself in artistic creations, but has a thousand other outlets besides. Does not Kant's formula space as a priori form of perception sound like a slogan for the whole movement that began with Leonardo? Impressionism is the inverse of the Euclidean world feeling. It tries to get as far as possible from the language of plastic and as near as possible to that of music. The effect that is made upon us by things that receive and reflect light is made not because the things are there but as though they in themselves are not there. The things are not even bodies but light resistance is in space, and their elusive density is to be unmasked by the brush stroke. What is received and rendered is the impression of such resistances, which are tacitly evaluated as simple functions of a transcendent extension. The artist's inner eye penetrates the body, breaks the spell of its material bounding surfaces and sacrifices it to the majesty of space. And with this impression, under its influence, he feels an endless movement quality in the sensuous element that is in utter contrast to the statuesque ataraxia of the fresco. Therefore, there was not and could not be any Hellenic impressionism, if there is one art that must exclude it on principle, it is classical sculpture. Impressionism is the comprehensive expression of the world feeling, and it must obviously therefore permeate the whole physiognomy of our late culture. There is an impressionistic mathematic which frankly and with intent transcends all optical imitations. It is analysis, as developed after Newton and Leibniz, and to it belong the visionary images of number bodies, aggregates, and the multi-dimensional geometry. There is again an impressionistic physics which sees in lieu of bodies systems of mass points, units that are evidently no more than constant relations between variable agents. There are impressionistic ethics tragedy, and logic, and even, in pietism, an impressionistic Christianity. Be the artist painter or musician, his art consists in creating with a few strokes or spots or tones an image of inexhaustible content, a microcosm meet for the eyes or ears of Faustian man, that is, in laying the actuality of infinite space under enchantment by fleeting and incorporeal indications of something objective which, so to say, forces that actuality to become phenomenal. The daring of these arts of moving the immobile has no parallel. Right from the later work of Titian to Corot and Menzel, matter quivers and flows like a solution under the mysterious pressure of brush stroke and broken colors and lights. It was in pursuit of the same object that Baroque music became thematic instead of melodic and, 
reinforcing the theme with every expedient of harmonic charm, instrumental color, rhythm, and tempo, developed the tone picture from the imitative piece of Titian's day to the leitmotif fabric of Wagner, and captured a whole new world of feeling and experience. When German music was at its culmination, this art penetrated also into lyric poetry, German lyric, that is, for in French it is impossible, and gave rise to a whole series of tiny masterpieces, from Goethe's Erforce to Holderlin's last poems, passages of a few lines apiece, which have never yet been noticed, let alone collected, but include nevertheless whole worlds of experience and feeling. On a small scale, it continually repeats the achievements of Copernicus and Columbus. No other culture possesses an ornament language of such dynamical impressiveness relatively to the means it employs. Every point or stroke of color, every scarcely audible tone releases some surprising charm and continually feeds the imagination with fresh elements of space creating energy. In Massaccio and Piero della Francesca we have actual bodies bathed in air. Then Leonardo, the first, discovers the transitions of atmospheric light and dark, the soft edges, the outlines that merge in the depth, the domains of light and shade in which the individual figures are inseparably involved. Finally, in Rembrandt, objects dissolve into mere colored impressions, and forms lose their specific humanness and become collocations of strokes and patches that tell as elements of a passionate depth rhythm. Distance, so treated comes to signify future, for what impressionism seizes and holds is by hypothesis a unique and never recurring instant, not a landscape in being but a fleeting moment of the history thereof. Just as in a Rembrandt portrait it is not the anatomical relief of the head that is rendered, but the second visage in it that is confessed, just as the art of his brush stroke captures not the eye but the look, not the brow but the experience, not the lips but the sensuousness so also the impressionist picture in general presents to the beholder not the nature of the foreground but again a second visage, the look and soul of the landscape. Whether we take the Catholic heroic landscape of Claude Lorraine, the passage in time of Corro, the sea and river banks and villages of Kuyp and Van Goyne, we find always a portrait in the physiognomic sense, something uniquely occurring, unforeseen, brought to light for the first and last time. In this love of the character and physiognomy in landscape, just the motive that was unthinkable in fresco art and permanently barred to the classical, the art of portraiture widens from the immediately human to the immediately human, to the representation of the world as a part of the ego or the self world in which the painter paints himself and the beholder sees himself. For the expansion of nature into distance reflects a destiny. In this art of tragic, demonic, laughing and weeping landscapes there is something of which the man of another culture has no idea and for which he has no organ. Anyone who in the presence of this form world talks of Hellenistic illusion painting must be unable to distinguish between an ornamentation of the highest order and a soulless imitation, an ape mimicry of the obvious. If Lysippus said, as Pliny tells us he said, that he represented men as they appeared to him, his ambition was that of a child, of a layman, of a savage, not that of an artist. The great style, the meaning, the deep necessity, are absent, even the cave dwellers of the Stone Age painted thus. In reality, the Hellenistic painters could do more when they chose. Even so late, the wall paintings of Pompeii and the Odyssey landscapes in Rome contain a symbol. In each case it is a group of bodies that is rendered, rocks, trees, even the sea as a body among bodies. There is no depth, but only superposition. Of course, of the objects represented one or several had necessarily to be furthest away, or rather least near, but this is a mere technical servitude without the remotest affinity to the illumined supernal distances of Faustian art. 8. I have said that oil painting faded out at the end of the 17th century when one after another all its great masters died, and the question will naturally, therefore, be asked, is Impressionism, in the current narrow sense, a creation of the nineteenth century? Has painting lived, after all, two centuries more? Is it still existing? But we must not be deceived by appearances. 
Not only was there a dead space between Rembrandt and Delacroix or Constable, for when we think of the living art of high symbolism it was Rembrandt's the purely decorative artists of the 18th century do not count, but, further, that which began with Delacroix and Constable was, notwithstanding all technical continuity, something quite different from that which had ended with Rembrandt. The new episode of painting that in the 19th century, that is, beyond the 1800 frontier and in civilization, has succeeded in awakening some illusion of a great culture of painting, has itself chosen the word plein air, frilict, to designate its special characteristic. The very designation suffices to show the significance of the fleeting phenomenon that it is. It implies the conscious, intellectual, cold-blooded rejection of that for which a sudden wit invented the name brown source, but which the great masters had, as we know, regarded as the one truly metaphysical color. On it had been built the painting culture of the schools, and especially the Dutch school, that had vanished irretrievably in the Rococo. This brown, the symbol of a spatial infinity, which had for Faustian mankind created a spiritual something out of a mere canvas, now came to be regarded, quite suddenly, as an offense to nature. What had happened? Was it not simply this? that the soul for which this supernal color was something religious, the sign of wistfulness, the whole meaning of living nature, had quietly slipped away? The materialism of a western cosmopolis blew into the ashes and rekindled this curious brief flicker, a brief flicker of two generations, for with the generation of man a all was ended again. I have, as the reader will recall characterized the noble green of Grunewald and Claude and Georgian as the Catholic space color and the transcendent brown of Rembrandt as the color of the Protestant world feeling. On the other hand, Plenaire and its new color scale stand for irreligion.40 from the spheres of Beethoven and the stellar expanses of Kant, Impressionism has come down again to the crust of the earth. Its space is cognized, not experienced, seen, not contemplated, there is tunedness in it, but not destiny. It is the mechanical object of physics and not the felt world of the pastoral that Corbet and Manet give us in their landscapes. Rousseau's tragically correct prophecy of a return to nature fulfills itself in this dying art, the senile, too, return to nature day by day. The modern artist is a workman, not a creator. He sets unbroken spectrum colors side by side. The subtle script, the dance of brush strokes, give way to crude commonplaces, pilings and mixings and daubings of points, squares, broad in organic masses. The whitewasher's brush and the trowel appear in the painter's equipment. The oil priming of the canvas is brought into the scheme of execution and in places left bare. It is a risky art, meticulous, cold, diseased, an art for overdeveloped nerves but scientific to the last degree, energetic in everything that relates to the conquest of technical obstacles, acutely assertive of program. It is the satiric pendant of the great age of oil painting that stretches from Leonardo to Rembrandt, it could only be at home in the Paris of Baudelaire. Corot's sylvan landscapes, with their grey-greens and browns, dream still of the spiritual of the old masters, but Corbet and Manet conquered their physical space factual space. The meditative discoverer represented by Leonardo gives way to the painting experimentalist. Corot, the eternal child, French but not Parisian, finds his transcendent landscapes anywhere and everywhere, Corbet, Manet, Cézanne, portray over and over again, painfully, laboriously, soullessly, the forest of Fontainebleau, the bank of the Seine at Argentale, or that remarkable valley near Arles. Rembrandt's mighty landscapes lie essentially in the universe, Manet's near a railway station. The plein air painters, true megalopolitans, obtain as it were specimens of the music of space from the least agitated sources of Spain and Holland, from Velasquez, Goya, Hummer, Franz Hals, in order, with the aid of English landscapists and, later, the Japanese, highbrows all, to restate it in empirical and scientific terms. It is natural science as opposed to nature experience, head against heart, knowledge in contrast to faith. 
In Germany it was otherwise. Whereas in France it was a matter of closing off the great school, in Germany it was a case of catching up with it. For in the picturesque style, as practiced from Rotman, Wassmann, K.D. Friedrich and Runge to Maurice Andelbl, an unbroken evolution is the very basis of technique, and even a new style school requires a closed tradition behind it. Herein lies the weakness and the strength of the last German painters. Whereas the French possessed a continuous tradition of their own from early Baroque to Chardin and Corot, whereas there was living connection between Claude Lorraine and Corot, Rubens and Delacroix, all the great Germans of the 18th century had been musicians. After Beethoven this music, without change of inward essence, was diverted, one of the modalities of the German Romantic movement, back into painting. And it was in painting that it flowered longest and bore its kindliest fruits, for the portraits and landscapes of these men are suffused with a secret wistful music, and there is a breath of each and off and more I cleft even in Tummu and Bocklin. But a foreign teacher had to be asked to supply that which was lacking in the native tradition, and so these painters one and all went to Paris, where they studied and copied the old masters of 1670. So also did Manet and his circle. But there was this difference, that the Frenchmen found in these studies only reminiscences of something that had been in their art for many generations, whereas the Germans received fresh and wholly different impressions. The result was that, in the 19th century, the German arts of form, other than music, were a phenomenon out of season, hasty, anxious, confused, puzzled as to both aim and means. There was indeed no time to be lost. The level that German music or French painting had taken centuries to attain had to be made good by German painting in two generations. The expiring art demanded its last phase, and this phase had to be reached by a vertiginous race through the whole past. Hence, the unsteadiness, in everything pertaining to form, of high Faustian natures like Maurice and Bocklin an unsteadiness that in German music with its short tradition, think of Bruckner, would have been impossible. The art of the French Impressionists was too explicit in its program and correspondingly too poor in soul to expose them to such a tragedy. German literature, on the contrary, was in the same condition as German painting, from Goethe's time, every major work was intended to found something and obliged to conclude something. Just as Clist felt in himself both Shakespeare and Stendhal, and labored desperately, altering and discarding without end and without result, to forge two centuries of psychological art into a unit, just as Hebel tried to squeeze all the problems from Hamlet to Rosmersham into one dramatic type, so Menzel, Hebel, and Marie sought to force the old and new models, Rembrandt, Claude, Van Gogh, and Watt, Delacroix, Corbet and Manet into a single form. While the little early interiors of Menzel anticipated all the discoveries of the Manet circle and Lebel not seldom succeeded where Corbett tried and failed, their pictures renew the metaphysical browns and greens of the old masters and are fully expressive of an inward experience. Menzel actually re-experienced and reawakened something of Prussian Rococo, Marie's something of Rubens, Lebel his Frauged and something of Rembrandt's portraiture. Moreover, the studio Brown of the 17th century had had by its side a second art, the intensely Faustian art of etching. In this, as in the other, Rembrandt is the greatest master of all time, this, like the other, has something Protestant in it that puts it in a quite different category from the work of the Southern Catholic painters of blue-green atmospheres and the Gobelin tapestries. And Lubl, the last artist in the brown, was the last great etcher whose plates possess that Rembrandtesque infinity that contains and reveals secrets without end. In Maurice, lastly, there was all the mighty intention of the great Baroque style, but, though Jericault and Daumier were not too belated to capture it in positive form, he, lacking just that strength that a tradition would have given him, was unable to force it into the world of painter's actuality. 9. The last of the Faustian arts died in Tristan. This work is the giant keystone of Western music. Painting achieved nothing like this as a finale, on the contrary, the effect of Manet, Menzel and Lubl, 
with their combination of free light and resurrected old master styles, is weak. Contemporaneously, in our sense, Apollinian art came to its end in Pergamon sculpture. Pergamon is the counterpart of Bayreuth. The famous altar itself, 41 indeed, is later, and probably not the most important work of the epoch at that, we have to assume a century, 330-220 BC, of development now lost in oblivion. Nevertheless, all Nietzsche's charges against Wagner and Bayreuth, the Ring and Parsifal, decadence, theatricalness and the like, could have been leveled in the same words at the Pergamene sculpture. A masterpiece of this sculpture, a veritable ring, has come down to us in the gigantomaca frieze of the great altar. Here is the same theatrical note, the same use of motives from ancient discredited mythology as points d'appui, the same ruthless bombardment of the nerves, and also, though the lack of inner power cannot altogether be concealed, the same fully self-conscious force and towering greatness. To this art the Farnese bull and the older model of the Laocoon group certainly belong. The symptom of decline in creative power is the fact that to produce something round and complete the artist now requires to be emancipated from form and proportion. Its most obvious, though not its most significant, manifestation is the taste for the gigantic. Here size is not, as in the Gothic and the Pyramid styles, the expression of inward greatness, but the dissimulation of its absence. This swaggering in specious dimensions is common to all nascent civilizations, we find it in the Zeus Psalter of Pergamum, the Helios of Chaz called the Colossus of Rhodes, the architecture of the Roman Imperial Age, the new empire work in Egypt, the American skyscraper of today. But what is far more indicative is the arbitrariness and immoderateness that tramples on and shatters the conventions of centuries. In Bayreuth and in Pergamum, it was the superpersonal rule, the absolute mathematic of form, the destiny imminent in the quietly matured language of a great art, that was found to be intolerable. The way from Polycletus to Lysippus and from Lysippus to the sculptors of the groups of Gauls 42 is paralleled by the way from Bach, by Beethoven, to Wagner. The earlier artists felt themselves masters, the later uneasy slaves, of the great form. While even Praxiteles and Haydn were able to speak freely and gaily within the limits of the strictest canon, Lysippus and Beethoven could only produce by straining their voices. The sign of all living art, the pure harmony of will, must and can, the self-evidence of the aim, the UN self-consciousness of the execution, the unity of the art and the culture, all that is past and gone. In Coro and Taipolo, Mozart and Cimarosa, there is still a real mastery of the mother tongue. After them, the process of mutilation begins, but no one is conscious of it because no one now can speak it fluently. Once upon a time, freedom and necessity were identical, but now what is understood by freedom is in fact and discipline. In the time of Rembrandt or Bach the failures that we know only too well were quite unthinkable. The destiny of the form lay in the race or the school, not in the private tendencies of the individual. Under the spell of a great tradition full achievement is possible even to a minor artist, because the living art brings him in touch with his task and the task with him. Today, these artists can no longer perform what they intend, for intellectual operations are a poor substitute for the trained instinct that has died out. All of them have experienced this. Maurice was unable to complete any of his great schemes. Lubl could not bring himself to let his late pictures go, and worked over them again and again to such an extent that they became cold and hard. Cézanne and Renoir left work of the best quality unfinished because, strive as they would, they could do no more. Manet was exhausted after he had painted thirty pictures, and his shooting of the Emperor Maximilian, in spite of the immense care that is visible in every item of the picture and the studies for it, hardly achieved as much as Goya managed without effort in its prototype the shootings of the 3rd of May. Bach, Haydn, Mozart and a thousand obscure musicians of the 18th century could rapidly turn out the most finished work as a matter of routine, 
but Wagner knew full well that he could only reach the heights by concentrating all his energy upon getting the last ounce out of the best moments of his artistic endowment. Between Wagner and Manet there is a deep relationship, which is not, indeed, obvious to everyone but which Baudelaire with his unerring flair for the decadent detected at once. For the Impressionists, the end and the culmination of art was the conjuring up of a world in space out of strokes and patches of color, and this was just what Wagner achieved with three bars. A whole world of soul could crowd into these three bars. Colors of starry midnight, of sweeping clouds, of autumn, of the day dawning in fear and sorrow, sudden glimpses of sunlit distances, world fear, impending doom, despair and its fierce effort, helpless hope, all these impressions which no composer before him had thought it possible to catch, he could paint with entire distinctness in the few tones of a motive. Here the contrast of western music with Greek plastic has reached its maximum. Everything merges in bodiless infinity, no longer even does a linear melody wrestle itself clear of the vague tone masses that in strange surgings challenge an imaginary space. The motive comes up out of dark terrible deeps. It is flooded for an instant by a flash of hard bright sun. Then, suddenly, it is so close upon us that we shrink. It laughs, it coaxes, it threatens, and anon it vanishes into the domain of the strings only to return again out of endless distances, faintly modified and in the voice of a single oboe, to pour out a fresh cornucopia of spiritual colors. Whatever this is, it is neither painting nor music, in any sense of these words that attache is to previous work in the strict style. Rossini was asked once what he thought of the music of the Huguenots, music. He replied. I heard nothing resembling it. Many a time must this judgment have been passed at Athens on the new painting of the Asiatic and Sicyonian schools, and opinions not very different must have been current in Egyptian Thebes with regard to the art of Knossos and Tel El Amarna. All that Nietzsche says of Wagner is applicable, also, to Manet. Ostensibly a return to the elemental, to nature, as against contemplation painting, Enholtz Melroy, and abstract music, their art really signifies a concession to the barbarism of the megalopolis, the beginning of dissolution sensibly manifested in a mixture of brutality and refinement. As a step, it is necessarily the last step. An artificial art has no further organic future, it is the mark of the end. And the bitter conclusion is that it is all irretrievably over with the arts of form of the West. The crisis of the 19th century was the death struggle. Like the Apollonian, the Egyptian and every other, the Faustian art dies of senility, having actualized its inward possibilities and fulfilled its mission within the course of its culture. What is practiced as art today, be it music after Wagner or painting after Cezanne, Lubl and Menzel, is impotence and falsehood. Look where one will, can one find the great personalities that would justify the claim that there is still an art of determinate necessity? Look where one will, can one find the self-evidently necessary task that awaits such an artist? We go through all the exhibitions, the concerts, the theatres, and find only industrious cobblers and noisy fools, who delight to produce something for the market, something that will catch on with the public for whom art and music and drama have long ceased to be spiritual necessities. At what a level of inward and outward dignity stand today that which is called art and those who are called artists. In the shareholders meeting of any limited company, or in the technical staff of any first-rate engineering works there is more intelligence, taste, character and capacity than in the whole music and painting of present-day Europe. There have always been, for one great artist, a hundred superfluities who practiced art, but so long is a great tradition and therefore great art, endured even these achieved something worthy. We can forgive this hundred for existing, for in the ensemble of the tradition they were the footing for the individual great man. But today we have only these superfluities, and ten thousand of them, working art for a living, as if that were a justification. One thing is quite certain, that today every single art school could be shut down without art being affected in the slightest. 
we can learn all we wish to know about the art clamor which a megalopolis sets up in order to forget that its art is dead from the Alexandria of the year 200. There, as here in our world cities, we find a pursuit of illusions of artistic progress, of personal peculiarity, of the new style, of unsuspected possibilities, theoretical babble, pretentious fashionable artists, weightlifters with cardboard dumbbells, the literary man in the poet's place, the unabashed farce of expressionism which the art trade has organized as a phase of art history, thinking and feeling and forming as industrial art. Alexandria, too, had problem dramatists and box office artists whom it preferred to Sophocles, and painters who invented new tendencies and successfully bluffed their public. What do we possess today as art? A faked music, filled with artificial noisiness of massed instruments, a raked painting, full of idiotic, exotic and show card effects, that every ten years or so concocts out of the form wealth of millennia some new style which is in fact no style at all since everyone does as he pleases. Our lying plastic that steals from Assyria, Egypt and Mexico indifferently. Yet this and only this, the taste of the man of the world, can be accepted as the expression and sign of the age, everything else, everything that sticks to old ideals, is for provincial consumption. The grand ornamentation of the past has become as truly a dead language as Sanskrit or Church Latin. 45 instead of its symbolism being honored and obeyed its mummy, its legacies of perfected forms, are put into the pot anyhow, and recast in wholly inorganic forms. Every modern age holds change to be development, and puts revivals and fusions of old styles in the place of real becoming. Alexandria also had its pre raphaelite comedians with their vases, chairs, pictures and theories, its symbolists, naturalists and expressionists. The fashion at Rome was now Greco-Asiatic, now Greco-Egyptian, now, after Praxicles, Neoatic. The relief of the XLXTH dynasty, the modern age in the Egyptian culture, that covered the monstrous, meaningless, inorganic walls, statues and columns, seems like a sheer parody of the art of the Old Kingdom. The Ptolemaic Horus Temple of Edfu is quite unsurpassed in the way of vacuous eclecticism so far, for we are only at the beginning of our own development in this line, showy and assertive as the style of our streets and squares already is. In due course, even the strength to wish for change fades out. Ramesses the Great, so soon, appropriated to himself buildings of his predecessors by cutting out their names and inserting his own in the inscriptions. It was the same consciousness of artistic impotence that led Constantine to adorn his triumphal arch in Rome with sculptures taken from other buildings, but classical craftsmanship had set to work long before Constantine, as early, in fact, as 150, on the business of copying old masterpieces, not because these were understood and appreciated in the least, but because no one was any longer capable of producing originals. It must not be forgotten that these copyists were the artists of their time, their work therefore, done in one style or another according to the moment's fashion, represent the maximum of creative power then available. All the Roman portrait statues, male and female, go back for posture and mean to a very few Hellenic types, these, copied more or less true to style, served for torsos while the heads were executed as likenesses by simple craftsmen who possessed the knack. The famous statue of Augustus in armor, for example, is based on the spearman of Polyclotus, just as, to name the first harbingers of the same phase in our own world, Lenba crests upon Rembrandt and Macart upon Rubens. For 1,500 years, a Masisite Cleopatra, Egyptus is a piled portrait on portrait in the same way. Instead of the steady development that the Great Age had pursued through the Old and Middle Kingdoms, we find fashions that change according to the taste of this or that dynasty. Amongst the discoveries at Turfan are relics of Indian dramas, contemporary with the birth of Christ, which are similar in all respects to the Kalidaza of a later century. Chinese painting as we know it shows not an evolution but an up and down of fashions for more than a thousand years on end 
and this unsteadiness must have set in as early as the hand period. The final result is that endless industrious repetition of a stock of fixed forms which we see today in Indian, Chinese, and Arabian Persian art. Pictures and fabrics, verses and vessels, furniture, dramas and musical compositions, all is pattern work. 46 We cease to be able to date anything within centuries, let alone decades, by the language of its ornamentation. So it has been in the last act of all cultures. Chapter 9 Soul Image and Life Feeling I. On the Form of the Soul. I. Every professed philosopher is forced to believe, without serious examination, in the existence of a something that in his opinion is capable of being handled by the reason, for his whole spiritual existence depends on the possibility of such a something. For every logician and psychologist, therefore, however skeptical he may be, there is a point at which criticism falls silent and faith begins, a point at which even the strictest analytical thinker must cease to employ his method, the point, namely, at which analysis is confronted with itself and with the question of whether its problem is soluble or even exists at all. The proposition it is possible by thought to establish the forms of thought was not doubted by Kant, dubious as it may appear to the unphilosophical. The proposition there is a soul the structure of which is scientifically accessible, and that which I determine, by critical dissection of conscious existence acts into the form of psychic elements, functions, and complexes, is my soul is a proposition that no psychologist has doubted hitherto. And yet it is just here that his strongest doubts should have risen. Is an abstract science of the spiritual possible at all? Is that which one finds on this path identical with that which one is seeking? Why has psychology, meaning thereby not knowledge of men and experience of life but scientific psychology, always been the slowest and most worthless of the disciplines of philosophy, a field so empty that it has been left entirely to mediocre minds and barren systematists? The reason is not far to seek. It is the misfortune of experimental psychology that it does not even possess an object as the word is understood in any and every scientific technique. Its searches and solutions are fights with shadows and ghosts. What is it, the soul? If the mere reason could give an answer to that question, the science would be ab initio unnecessary. Of the thousands of psychologists of today not one can give an actual analysis or definition of the will or of regret, anxiety, jealousy, disposition, artistic intention. Naturally, since only the systematic can be dissected, and we can only define notions by notions. No subtleties of intellectual play with notional distinctions, no plausible observations of connections between sensuous corporeal states and inward processes touch that which is in question here. Will, this is no notion, but a name a prime word like God, a sign for something of which we have an immediate inward certainty but which we are forever unable to describe. We are dealing here with something eternally inaccessible to learned investigation. It is not for nothing that every language presents a baffling complexity of labels for the spiritual, warning us thereby that it is something not susceptible of theoretical synthesis or systematic ordering. Here there is nothing for us to order. Critical that is, literally, separating, methods apply only to the world as nature. It would be easier to break up a theme of Beethoven with dissecting knife or acid than to break up the soul by methods of abstract thought. Nature knowledge and man knowledge have neither aims nor ways in common. The primitive man experiences soul, first in other men and then in himself, as a Newman, just as he knows Numena of the outer world and develops his impressions in mythological form. His words for these things are symbols, sounds, not descriptive of the indescribable but indicative of it for him who hath ears to hear. They evoke images, likenesses, in the sense of Faust too, the only language of spiritual intercourse that man has discovered to this day. Rembrandt can reveal something of his soul, to those who are in inward kinship with him by way of a self-portrait or a landscape, and to go to a god gave it to say what he suffered. 
certain ineffable stirrings of soul can be imparted by one man to the sensibility of another man through a look, two bars of a melody, an almost imperceptible movement. That is the real language of souls, and it remains incomprehensible to the outsider. The word as utterance, as poetic element, may establish the link, but the word as notion, as element of scientific prose, never. Soul, for the man who has advanced from mere living and feeling to the alert and observant state, is an image derived from quite primary experiences of life and death. It is as old as thought, that is, as the articulate separation of thinking, thinking over, from seeing. We see the world around us, and since every free moving being must for its own safety understand that world, the accumulating daily detail of technical and empirical experience becomes a stock of permanent data which man, as soon as he is proficient in speech, collects into an image of what he understands. This is the world as nature. What is not environment we do not see, but we do divine its presence in ourselves and in others, and by virtue of its physiognomic impressive power it evokes in us the anxiety and the desire to know, and thus arises the meditated or pondered image of a counter world which is our mode of visualizing that which remains eternally alien to the physical eye. The image of the soul is mythic and remains objective in the field of spiritual religion so long as the image of nature is contemplated in the spirit of religion, and it transforms itself into a scientific notion and becomes objective in the field of scientific criticism as soon as nature comes to be observed critically. As time is a counter-concept to space, so the soul is a counter-world to nature and therefore variable in dependence upon the notion of nature as this stands from moment to moment. It has been shown how time arose, out of the feeling of the direction quality possessed by ever mobile life, as a conceptual negative to a positive magnitude, as an incarnation of that which is not extension, and that all the properties of time by the cool analysis of which the philosophers believe they can solve the problem of time, have been gradually formed and ordered in the intellect as inverses to the properties of space. In exactly the same way, the notion of the spiritual has come into being as the inverse and negative of the notion of the world, the spatial notion of polarity assisting, outward, inward, and the terms being suitably transvalued. Every psychology is a counterphysics. To attempt to get an exact science out of the ever mysterious soul is futile. But the late period city must needs have abstract thinking and it forces the physicist of the inner world to elucidate a fictitious world by ever more fictions, notions by more notions. He transmutes the non extended into the extended, builds up a system as cause for something that is only manifested physiognomically and comes to believe that in this system he has the structure of the soul before his eyes. But the very words that he selects, in all the cultures, to notify to others the results of his intellectual labors betray him. He talks of functions, feeling complexes, mainsprings, thresholds of consciousness, course, breadth, intensity and parallelism in spiritual processes. All these are words proper to the mode of representation that natural science employs. Their will is related to objects is a spatial image pure and simple. Conscious and unconscious are only too obviously derivatives of above ground and below ground. In modern theories of the will we meet with all the vocabulary of electrodynamics. Will functions and thought functions are spoken of in just the same way as the function of a system of forces. To analyze a feeling means to set up a representative silhouette in its place and then to treat this silhouette mathematically and by definition, partition, and measurement. All soul examination of this stamp, however remarkable as a study of cerebral anatomy, is penetrated with the mechanical notion of locality, and works without knowing it under imaginary coordinates in an imaginary space. The pure psychologist is quite unaware that he is copying the physicist, but it is not at all surprising that the naivest methods of experimental psychology give depressingly orthodox results. Brain paths and association threads, as modes of representation, conform entirely to an optical scheme, the course of the will or the feeling, both deal with cognate spatial phantoms. 
it does not make much difference whether I define some psychic capacity conceptually or the corresponding brain region graphically. Scientific psychology has worked out for itself a complete system of images, in which it moves with entire conviction. Every individual pronouncement of every individual psychologist proves on examination to be merely a variation of this system conformable to the style of outer world science of the day. Clear thought, emancipated from all connection with seeing, presupposes as its organ a culture language, which is created by the soul of the culture as a part supporting other parts of its expression semicolon one and presently this language itself creates a nature of word meanings a linguistic cosmos within which abstract notions, judgments and conclusions, representations of number, causality, motion, can lead a mechanically determinate existence. At any particular time, therefore, the current image of the soul is a function of the current language and its inner symbolism. All the Western, Faustian, languages possess the notion of will. This mythical entity manifested itself, simultaneously in all, in that transformation of the verb which decisively differentiated our tongues from the classical tongues and therefore our soul from the classical soul. When ego habio factum replaced Fessi, a new Newman of the inner world spoke. And at the same time, under specific label, there appeared in the scientific soul pictures of all the western psychologies the figure of the will of a well-rounded capacity of which the definition may be formulated in different ways by different schools, but the existence is unquestionable. 2. I maintain, then, that scientific psychology, and, it may be added, the psychology of the same kind that we all unconsciously practice when we try to figure to ourselves the stirrings of our own or others' souls, has, in its inability to discover or even to approach the essence of the soul, simply added one more to the symbols that collectively make up the macrocosm of the culture man. Like everything else that is no longer becoming but become, it has put a mechanism in place of an organism. We miss in its picture that which fills our feeling of life, and should surely be so if anything is, the destiny quality, the necessary directedness of existence, the possibility that life in its course actualizes. I do not believe that the word destiny figures in any psychological system whatsoever, and we know that nothing in the world could be more remote from actual life experience and knowledge of men than a system without such elements. Associations, perceptions, affections, motives, thought, feeling, will, all are dead mechanisms, the mere topography of which constitutes the insignificant total of our soul science. One looked for life and one found an ornamental pattern of notions. And the soul remained what it was, something that could neither be thought nor represented, the secret, the ever becoming, the pure experience. This imaginary soul body, let it be called so outright for the first time, is never anything but the exact mirror image of the form in which the matured culture man looks on his outer world. In the one as in the other, the depth experience actualizes the extension world. Alike out of the perception of the outside and the conception of the inside, the secret that is hinted at in the root word time creates space. The soul image like the world image has its directional depth, its horizon, and its boundedness or its unboundedness. An inner eye sees, an inner rear hears. There exists a distinct idea of an inner order and this inner order like the outer wears the badge of causal necessity. This being so, everything that has been said in this work regarding the phenomenon of the high cultures combines to demand an immensely wider and richer sort of soul study than anything worked upon so far. For everything that our present day psychologist has to tell us, and here we refer not only to the systematic science but also in the wider sense to the physiognomic knowledge of men relates to the present condition of the western soul, and not, as hitherto gratuitously assumed, to the human soul at large. A soul image is never anything but the image of one quite definite soul. No observer can ever step outside the conditions and the limitations of his time and circle, and whatever it may be that he knows or cognizes, the very cognition itself involves in all cases choice, direction and inner form, and is therefore ab initio an expression of his proper soul.
the primitive himself appropriates a soul image out of facts of his own life as subjected to the formative working of the basic experiences of waking consciousness, distinction of ego and world, of ego and two, and those of being, distinction of body and soul, sense life and reflection, sex life and sentiment. And as it is thoughtful men who think upon these matters, an inner human, spirit, logos, ka, ruach, always arises as an opposite to the rest. But the dispositions and relations of this Newman in the individual case, and the conception that is formed of the spiritual elements, layers of forces or substances, unity or polarity or plurality, mark the thinker from the outset as a part of his own specific culture. When, therefore, one convinces one's self that one knows the soul of an alien culture from its workings in actuality, the soul image underlying the knowledge is really one's own soul image. In this wise new experiences are readily assimilated into the system that is already there, and it is not surprising that in the end one comes to believe that one has discovered forms of eternal validity. In reality, every culture possesses its own systematic psychology just as it possesses its own style of knowledge of men and experience of life, and just as even each separate stage the age of scholasticism, that of the sophists, that of enlightenment, forms special ideas of number and thought and nature that pertain to itself only, so even each separate century mirrors itself in a soul image of its own. The best judge of men in the western world goes wrong when he tries to understand the Japanese, and vice versa. But the man of learning goes equally wrong when he tries to translate basic words of Arabic or Greek by basic words of his own tongue. Nefesh is not animus and Atman is not soul, and what we consistently discover under our label will classical man did not find in his soul picture at all. Taking one thing with another, it is no longer possible to doubt the immense importance of the individual soul images that have severally arisen in the general history of thought. Classical, Apollonian man, the man of Euclidean point form being, looked upon his soul as a cosmos ordered in a group of excellent parts. Plato called it comma comma and compared it with man, beast and plant, in one place even with southern, northern and Hellenic man. What seems to be copied here is nature as seen by the classical age, a well-ordered sum of tangible things, in contrast to a space that was felt as the non-existent the nonant. Where in this field is will? Or the idea of functional connections? Or the other creations of our psychology? Do we really believe that Plato and Aristotle were less sure in analysis than we are, and did not see what is insistently obvious to every layman amongst us? Or is it that will is missing here for the same reason as space is missing in the classical mathematic and force in the classical physics? Take, on the contrary, any western psychology that you please, and you will always find a functional and never a bodily ordering. The basic form of all impressions which we receive from within y equals fx and that, because the function is the basis of our outer world. Thinking, feeling, willing, no western psychologist can step outside this trinity, however much he may desire to do so. Even in the controversies of Gothic thinkers concerning the primacy of will or reason it already emerges that the question is one of a relation between forces. It matters not at all whether these old philosophers put forward their theories as original or read them into Augustine or Aristotle. Associations, a perceptions, will processes, call them what you will, the elements of our picture are without exception of the type of the mathematico-physical function and in very form radically unclassical. Now, such psychology examines the soul, not physiognomically to indicate its traits, but physically, as an object, to ascertain its elements, and it is quite natural therefore to find psychology reduced to perplexity when confronted with the problem of motion. Classical man, too, had his inward elitic difficulty comma to and the inability of the schoolman to agree as to the primacy of will or reason foreshadows the dangerous flaw in baroque physics, its inability to reach an unchallengeable statement of the relation between force and movement. Directional energy, denied in the classical and also in the Indian soul image, where all is settled and rounded, is emphatically affirmed in the Faustian and in the Egyptian, 
wherein all is systems and centers of forces, and yet, precisely because this affirmation cannot but involve the element of time, thought, which is alien to time, finds itself committed to self-contradictions. The Faustian and the Apollinean images of the soul are in blunt opposition. Once more all the old contrasts crop up. In the Apollinean we have, so to call it, the soul body, in the Faustian the soul space, as the imagination unit. The body possesses parts, while the space is the scene of processes. Classical man conceives of his inner world plastically. Even Homer's idiom betrays it, echoing, we may well believe, immemorial temple traditions. He shows us, for instance, the dead in Hades as well recognizable copies of the bodies that had been. The pre-Socratic philosophy, with its three well-ordered parts comma 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 suggests at once the Laocoon group. In our case the impress is a musical one, the sonata of the inner life has the will as first subject, thought and feeling as themes of the second subject, the movement is bound by the strict rules of a spiritual counterpoint, and psychology's business is to discover this counterpoint. The simplest elements fall into antithesis like classical and western number, on the one hand magnitudes, on the other spiritual relations, and the spiritual static of Apollonian existence. The stereometric ideal of and comma stands opposed to the soul dynamic of Faustian. The Apollonian soul image, Plato's beaker team with as charioteer, takes to flight at once on the approach of the Magian soul. It is fading out already in the later star, where the principal teachers came predominantly from the Aramaic East, and by the time of the early Roman Empire, even in the literature of the city itself, it has come to be a mere reminiscence. The hallmark of the Magian soul image is a strict dualism of two mysterious substances, spirit and soul. Between these two there is neither the classical, static, nor the western, functional, relation, but an altogether differently constituted relation which we are obliged to call merely Magian for want of a more helpful term, though we may illustrate it by contrasting the physics of Democritus and the physics of Galileo with alchemy and the philosopher's stone. On this specifically Middle Eastern soul image rests, of inward necessity, all the psychology and particularly the theology with which the Gothic springtime of the Arabian culture, 0300 AD, is filled. The Gospel of Saint John belongs there too, and the writings of the Gnostics, the early fathers, the Neoplatonists, the Manichaeans, and the dogmatic texts in the Talmud and the Avesta, so, too, does the tired spirit of the Imperium Romanum, now expressed only in religiosity and drawing the little life that is in its philosophy from the young East, Syria, and Persia. Even in the first century BC the great Posidonius, a true Semite and young Arabian in spite of the classical dress of his immense learning, was inwardly sensible of the complete opposition between the classical life feeling and this Magian soul structure which for him was the true one. There is a patent difference of value between a substance permeating the body and a substance which falls from the world cavern into humanity, abstract and divine, making of all participants a consensus.7 This spirit it is which evokes the higher world, and through this creation triumphs over mere life, the flesh and nature. This is the prime image that underlies all feeling of ego. Sometimes it is seen in religious sometimes in philosophical, sometimes in artistic guise. Consider the portraits of the Constantinian age, with their fixed stare into the infinite, that look stands for the dot it is felt by Platonus and by Origen. Paul distinguishes, for example in I Cor, 15, 44, between and dot the conception of a double, bodily or spiritual, ecstasy and of the partition of men into lower and higher, psychics and pneumatics was familiar currency amongst the Gnostics. Late classical literature, Plutarch, is full of the dualistic psychology of and comma derived from Oriental sources. It was very soon brought into correlation with the contrast between Christian and heathen and that between spirit and nature, and it issued in that scheme of world history as man's drama from creation to last judgment, with an intervention of God as means, which is common to Gnostics, Christians. Persians and Jews alike, and has not even now been altogether overcome. 
This Majin Soul image received its rigorously scientific completion in the schools of Baghdad and Basra. Three Alpha Arabi and Al Kindi dealt thoroughly with the problems of this Majin psychology, which to us are tangled and largely inaccessible. And we must by no means underrate its influence upon the young and wholly abstract soul theory, as distinct from the ego feeling, of the West. Scholastic and mystic philosophy, no less than Gothic art, drew upon Moorish Spain, Sicily and the East for many of its forms. It must not be forgotten that the Arabian culture is the culture of the established revelation religions, all of which assume a dualistic soul image. The Kabbalah for and the part played by Jewish philosophers in the so-called medieval philosophy, that is, late Arabian followed by early Gothic, is well known. But I will only refer here to the remarkable and little appreciated Spinoza.5 Child of the Ghetto, he is, with his contemporary Skyrazi, the last belated representative of the Magian, a stranger in the form world of the Faustian feeling. As a prudent pupil of the Baroque he contrived to clothe his system in the colors of Western thought, but at bottom he stands entirely under the aspect of the Arabian dualism of two soul substances. And this is the true and inward reason why he lacked the force concept of Galileo and Descartes. This concept is the center of gravity of a dynamic universe and ipso facto is alien to the Magian world feeling. There is no link between the idea of the philosopher's stone, which is implicit in Spinoza's idea of deity is causa sui, and the causal necessity of our nature picture. Consequently, his determinism is precisely that which the orthodox wisdom of Baghdad had maintained, kismet. It was there that the home of the more geometric 06 method was to be looked for, it is common to the Talmud, the Zendavasta and the Arabian Kalam, but its appearance in Spinoza's ethics is a grotesque freak in our philosophy. Once more this Magin soul image was to be conjured up, for a moment. German Romanticism found in magic and the tangled thought threads of Gothic philosophers the same attractiveness as it found in the crusade ideals of cloisters and castles, and even more in Saracenic art and poetry, without of course understanding very much of these remote things. Schelling, Oaken, Bader, Goz and their circle indulged in barren speculations in the Arabic Jewish style, which they felt with evident self-satisfaction to be dark and deep precisely what, for Orientals, they were not, understanding them but partially themselves and hoping for similar quasi-incomprehension in their audiences. The only noteworthy point in the episode is the attractiveness of obscurity. We may venture the conclusion that the clearest and most accessible conceptions of Faustian thought, as we have it, for instance, in Descartes or in Kant's Prolegomena, would in the same way have been regarded by an Arabian student as nebulous and abstruse. What for us is true, for them is false, and vice versa, and this is valid for the soul images of the different cultures as it is for every other product of their scientific thinking. 3. The separation of its ultimate elements is a task that the Gothic world outlook and its philosophy leaves to the courage of the future. Just as the ornamentation of the cathedral and the primitive contemporary painting still shirk the decision between gold and wide atmosphere in backgrounds, between the Magian and the Faustian aspects of God in nature, so this early, timid, immature soul image as it presents itself in this philosophy mingles characters derived from the Christian Arabian metaphysic and its dualism of spirit and soul with northern inklings of functional soul forces not yet avowed. This is the discrepancy that underlies the conflict concerning the primacy of will or reason, the basic problem of the Gothic philosophy, which men tried to solve now in the old Arabian, now in the new western sense. It is this myth of the mind, which under ever-changing guises accompanies our philosophy throughout its course, that distinguishes it so sharply from every other. The rationalism of late Baroque, in all the pride of the self-assured city spirit, decided in favor of the greater power of the goddess reason, Kant, the Jacobins, but almost immediately thereafter the 19th century, Nietzsche above all, went back to the stronger formula volunteers superior intellect too, and this indeed is in the blood of all of us. Seven Schopenhauer, the last of the great systematists, has brought it down to the formula world as will and idea, 
and it is only his ethic and not his metaphysic that decides against the will. Here we begin to see by direct light the deep foundations and meaning of philosophizing within a culture. For what we see here is the Faustian soul trying in labor of many centuries to paint a self portrait, and one, moreover, that is in intimate concordance with its world portrait. The Gothic world view with its struggle of will and reason is in fact an expression of the life feeling of the men of the Crusades, of the Hohenstaufen Empire, of the great cathedrals. These men saw the soul thus, because they were thus. Will and thought in the soul image correspond to direction and extension, history and nature, destiny and causality in the image of the outer world. Both aspects of our basic characters emerge in our prime symbol which is infinite extension. Will links the future to the present, thought the unlimited to the here. The historic future is distance becoming. The boundless world horizon distance become, this is the meaning of the Faustian depth experience. The direction feeling as will and the space feeling as reason are imagined as entities, almost as legend figures, and out of them comes the picture that our psychologists of necessity abstract from the inner life. To call the Faustian culture a will culture is only another way of expressing the eminently historical disposition of its soul. Our first person idiom, our ego habio factum, our dynamic syntax, that is, faithfully renders the way of doing things that results from this disposition and, with its positive directional energy, dominates not only our picture of the world as history but our own history to boot. This first person towers up in the Gothic architecture, the spire is an eye, the flying buttress is an eye. And therefore the entire Faustian ethic, from Thomas Aquinas to Kant, is an excelsior, fulfillment of an eye, ethical work upon an eye, justification of an eye by faith and works, respect of the neighbor thou for the sake of one's eye and its happiness, and, lastly and supremely, immortality of the eye. Now this, precisely this, the genuine Russian regards as contemptible vain glory. The Russian soul, will less, having the limitless plane as its prime symbol, seeks to grow up, serving, anonymous, self-oblivious, in the brother world of the plane. To take I as the starting point of relations with the neighbor, to elevate I morally through I's love of near and dear, to repent for I's own sake, are to him traits of western vanity as presumptuous as is the upthrusting challenge to heaven of our cathedrals that he compares with his plain church roof and its sprinkling of cupolas. Tolstoy's hero Nikolaev looks after his moral eye as he does after his fingernails. This is just what betrays Tolstoy as belonging to the pseudomorphosis of Petrinism. But Raskolnikov is only something in a we. His fault is the fault of all, and even to regard his sin as special to himself is pride and vanity. Something of the kind underlies the Magin soul image also. If any man come to me, says Jesus, Luke 14, 26, and hate not his father and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, yea, and his own life, comma also eight he cannot be my disciple, and it is the same feeling that makes him call himself by the title that we mistranslate son of man. 9 The consensus of the orthodox too is impersonal and condemns I as a sin. So too with the, truly Russian, conception of truth as the anonymous agreement of the elect. Classical man, belonging wholly to the present is equally without that directional energy by which our images of world and of soul are dominated, which sums all our sense impressions as a path towards distance and our inward experiences as a feeling of future. He is will less. The classical idea of destiny and the symbol of the Doric column leave no doubt as to that. And the contest of thinking and willing that is the hidden theme of every serious portrait from Jan van Niek to Maurice is impossible in classical portraiture, for in the classical soul image thought, comma the inner Zeus, is accompanied by the wholly ahistoric entities of animal and vegetative impulse, and comma wholly somatic and wholly destitute of conscious direction and drive towards an end. The actual designation of the Faustian principle, which belongs to us and to us alone, is a matter of indifference. A name is in itself mere sound. Space, too, 
is a word that is capable of being employed with a thousand nuances, by mathematicians and philosophers, poets and painters, to express one and the same indescribable, a word that is ostensibly common to all mankind and yet, carrying a metaphysical undermeaning that we gave it and could not but give it, is in that sense valid only for our culture. It is not the notion of will, but the circumstance that we possess it while the Greeks were entirely ignorant of it, that gives it high symbolic import. At the very bottom, there is no distinction between space as depth and will. For the one, and therefore for the other also, the classical languages had no expression. Ten the pure space of the Faustian world picture is not mere extension, but efficient extension into the distance, as an overcoming of the merely sensuous, as a strain and tendency, as a spiritual will to power. I am fully aware how inadequate these paraphrases are. It is entirely impossible to indicate in exact terms the difference between what we and what the men of the Indian or the Arabian culture call space, or feel or imagine in the word. But that there is some radical distinction is proved by the very different fundamentals of the respective mathematics, arts of form, and, above all, immediate utterances of life. We shall see how the identity of space and will comes to expression in the acts of Copernicus and Columbus, as well as in those of the Hohenstaufen and Napoleon, but it underlies also, in another way, the physical notions of fields of force and potential, ideas that it would be impossible to convey to the comprehension of any Greek. Space as a priori form of perception, the formula in which Kant finally enunciated that for which Baroque philosophy had so long and tirelessly striven, implies an assertion of supremacy of soul over the alien. The ego, through the form, is to rule the world. Eleven. This is brought to expression in the depth perspective of oil painting, which makes the space field of the picture, conceived as infinite, dependent on the observer, who in choosing his distance asserts his dominion. It is this attraction of distance that produces the type of the heroic and historically felt landscape that we have alike in the picture and the park of the Baroque period, and that is expressed also in the mathematico-physical concept of the vector. For centuries painting fought passionately to reach this symbol, which contains all that the words space, will and force are capable of indicating and correspondingly we find in our metaphysic the steady tendency to formulate pairs of concepts, such as phenomena and things in themselves, will and idea, ego and non-ego, all of the same purely dynamic content, and, in utter contrast to Protagoras's conception of man as the measure, not the creator, of things, to establish a functional dependence of things upon spirit. The classical metaphysic regarded man as a body among bodies and knowledge as a sort of contact, passing from the known to the knower and not vice versa. The optical theories of Anaxagoras and Democritus were far from admitting any active participation of the percipient in sense perception. Plato never felt, as Kant was driven to feel, the ego as center of a transcendent sphere of effect. The captives in his celebrated cave are really captives, the slaves and not the masters of outer impressions recipients of light from the common sun and not themselves suns which irradiate the universe. The relation of our will to our imaginary space is evidenced again in the physical concept of space energy, that utterly unclassical idea in which even spatial interval figures as a form, and indeed as prime form thereof, for the notions of capacity and intensity rest upon it. We feel will in space. The dynamic world picture of Galileo and Newton and the dynamic soul picture which as well as its center of gravity and center of reference, as of identical significance. Both are Baroque ideas, symbols of the fully ripened Faustian culture. It is wrong, though it may be usual, to regard the cult of the will as common, if not to mankind, at any rate to Christendom, and derived in consequence from the early Arabian ethos. The connection is merely a phenomenon of the historical surface, and the deduction fails because it confuses their, formal, history of words and ideas such as volunteers with the course of their destiny, thereby missing the profoundly symbolical changes of connotation that occur in that course. When Arabian psychologists, Matada for instance, discuss the possibility of several wills, 
a will that hangs together with the act, another will that independently precedes the act, another that has no relation to the act at all, a will that is simply the parent of a willing, they are obviously working in deeper connotations of the Arabic word and on the basis of a soul image that in structure differs entirely from the Faustian. For every man, whatever the culture to which he belongs, the elements of the soul are the deities of an inner mythology. What Zeus was for the outer Olympus, was for the inner world that every Greek was entirely conscious of possessing, the throned lord of the other soul elements. What God is for us, God as breadth of the world, the universal power, the ever-present doer and provider, that also, reflected from the space of world into the imaginary space of soul and necessarily felt as an actual presence, is will. With the microcosmic dualism of the Magian culture, with Ruach and Nefesh, Numa and Psyche, is necessarily associated the macrocosmic opposition of God and Devil, Ormuzd and Araman for Persians, Yahweh and Beelzebub for Jews, Allah and Ibli for Mohammedans, in brief. Absolute good and absolute evil. And note, further, how in the Western world feeling both these oppositions pale together. In proportion as their will emerges, out of the Gothic struggle for primacy between intellectors and volunteers, as the center of a spiritual monotheism, the figure of the devil fades out of the real world. In the Baroque age the pantheism of the outer world immediately resulted in one of the inner world also, and the word God in antithesis to world has always, however interpreted in this or that case, implied exactly what is implied in the word will with respect to soul, viz, the power that moves all that is within its domain. Twelve thought no sooner leaves religion for science than we get the double myth of concepts, in physics and psychology. The concepts force, mass, will, passion rest not on objective experience but on a life feeling. Darwinism is nothing but a specially shallow formulation of this feeling. No Greek would have used the word nature as our biology employs it, in the sense of an absolute and methodical activity. The will of God for us is a pleonism, God, or nature, as some say, is nothing but will. After the Renaissance the notion of God sheds the old sensuous and personal traits, omnipresence and omnipotence are almost mathematical concepts, becomes little by little identical with the notion of infinite space and in becoming so becomes transcendent world will. And therefore it is that about 1700 painting has to yield to instrumental music, the only art that in the end is capable of clearly expressing what we feel about God. Consider, in contrast with this, the gods of Homer. Zeus emphatically does not possess full powers over the world, but is simply primus inter pairs, a body amongst bodies, as the Apollonian world feeling requires. Blind necessity, the anonym imminent in the cosmos of classical consciousness, is in no sense dependent upon him, on the contrary, the gods are subordinate to it. Aeschylus says so outright in a powerful passage of the Prometheus, 13 but it is perceptible enough even in Homer, for example, in the strife of the gods and in that decisive passage in which Zeus takes up the scales of destiny, not to settle, but to learn, the fate of Hector. 14 the classical soul, therefore, with its parts and its properties, imagines itself as an Olympus of little gods and to keep these at peace and in harmony with one another is the ideal of the Greek life ethic of and dot more than one of the philosophers but raise the connection by calling comma the highest part of the soul, Zeus. Aristotle assigns to his deity the single function of comma contemplation, and this is Diogenes's ideal also, a completely matured static of life in contrast to the equally ripe dynamic of our 18th century ideal. The enigmatic something in the soul image that is called will, the passion of the third dimension, is therefore quite specially a creation of the Baroque, like the perspective of oil painting and the force idea of modern physics and the tone world of instrumental music. In every case the Gothic had foreshadowed what these intellectualizing centuries brought to fullness. Here, where we are trying to take in the cast of Faustian life in contradiction to that of all other lives, what we have to do is to keep a firm hold on the fact that the primary words will, space, force, God, upborne by and permeated with connotations of Faustian feeling, 
our emblems, are the effective framework that sustains the great and kindred form worlds in which this being expresses itself. It has been believed, hitherto, that in these matters one was holding in one's grip a body of eternal facts, of facts in themselves, which sooner or later would be successfully treated, known, and proved by the methods of critical research. This illusion of natural science was shared by psychology also. But the view that these universally valid fundamentals belong merely to the Baroque style of apprehension and comprehension, that as expression forms they are only of transitory significance, and that they are only true for the Western type of intellect, alters the whole meaning of those sciences and leads us to look upon them not only as subjects of systematic cognition but also, and in a far higher degree, as objects of physiognomic study. Baroque architecture began, as we have seen, when Michelangelo replaced the tectonic elements of the Renaissance, support and load, by those of dynamics, force and mass. While Brunelleschi's Chapel of the Pay in Florence expresses a bright composedness, Vignola's facade of the Gesù in Rome is will become stone. The new style in its ecclesiastical form has been designated the Jesuit, and indeed there is an inward connection between the achievement of Vignola and Giacomo di Leoporto and the creation by Ignatius Loyola of the order that stands for the pure and abstract will of the Church, 15 just as there is between the invisible operations and the unlimited range of the order and the arts of calculus and fugue. Henceforward, then, the reader will not be shocked if we speak of a Baroque, and even of a Jesuit, style in psychology mathematics, and pure physics. The former language of dynamics, which puts the energetic contrast of capacity and intensity in place of the volitionless somatic contrast of material and form, is one common to all the mind creations of those centuries. 4. The question is now, how far is the man of this culture himself fulfilling what the soul image that he has created requires of him? If we can, today, state the theme of Western physics quite generally to be efficient space, we have ipso facto defined also the kind of existence, the content of existence as lived by contemporary man. We, as a Faustian natures, are accustomed to take note of the individual according to his effective and not according to his plastic static appearance in the field of our life experience. We measure what a man is by his activity, which may be directed inwardly or outwardly, and we judge all intentions, reasons, powers, convictions and habits entirely by this directedness. The word with which we sum up this aspect is character. We habitually speak of the character of heads and landscapes, of ornaments, brush strokes and scripts, of whole arts and ages and cultures. The art of the characteristic is, above all, Baroque music, alike in respect of its melody and its instrumentation. Here again is a word indicating an indescribable, a something that emphasizes, among all the cultures, the Faustian in particular. And the deep relation between this word character and the word will is unmistakable, what will is in the soul image, character is in the picture of life as we see it, the western life that is self-evident to western men. It is the fundamental postulate of all our ethical systems differ otherwise as they may in their metaphysical or practical precepts, that man has character. Character, which forms itself in the stream of the world, the personality, the relation of living to doing, is a Faustian impression of the man made by the man, and, significantly enough, just as in the physical world picture it has proved impossible, in spite of the most rigorous theoretical examination to separate the vectorial idea of forces from the idea of motion, because of the inherent directional quality of the vector, so also it is impossible to draw a strict distinction between will and soul, character and life. At the height of our culture, certainly since the 17th century, we feel the word life as a pure and simple synonym of willing. Expressions like living force, life will, active energy, abound in our ethical literature and their import is taken for granted, whereas the age of Pericles could not even have translated them into its language. Hitherto the pretension of each and every morale to universal validity has obscured the fact that every culture, as a homogeneous being of higher order, 
possesses a moral constitution proper to itself. There are as many morals as there are cultures. Nietzsche was the first to have an inkling of this, but he never came anywhere near to a really objective morphology of morale beyond good, all good, and evil, all evil. He evaluated classical, Indian, Christian and Renaissance morale by his own criteria instead of understanding the style of them as a symbol. And yet if anything could detect the prime phenomenon of morale as such, it should have been the historical insight of a Westerner. However, it appears that we are only now ripe enough for such a study. The conception of mankind as an active, fighting, progressing whole is, and has been since Joachim of Fleuris and the Crusades, so necessary an idea for us that we find it hard indeed to realize that it is an exclusively Western hypothesis, living and valid only for a season. To the classical spirit mankind appears as a stationary mass, and correspondingly there is that quite dissimilar morale that we can trace from the Homeric dawn to the time of the Roman Empire. And, more generally, we shall find that the immense activity of the Faustian life feeling is most nearly matched in the Chinese and the Egyptian, and the rigorous passivity of the classical in the Indian. If ever there was a group of nations that kept the struggle for existence constantly before its eyes, it was the classical culture. All the cities, big and little, fought one another to sheer extinction, without plan or purpose, without mercy, body against body, under the stimulus of a completely anti-historical instinct. But Greek ethics, notwithstanding Heraclitus, were far from making struggle an ethical principle. The Stoics and the Epicureans alike preached abstention from it as an ideal. The overcoming of resistances may far more justly be called the typical impulse of the Western soul. Activity, determination, self-control, are postulates. To battle against the comfortable foregrounds of life, against the impressions of the moment, against what is near, tangible and easy to win through to that which has generality and duration and links past and future, these are the sum of all Faustian imperatives from earliest Gothic to Kant and Fichte, and far beyond them again to the ethos of immense power and will exhibited in our states, our economic systems and our techniques. The carpe diem, the saturated being, of the classical standpoint is the most direct contrary of that which is felt by Goethe and Kant and Pascal by church and free thinker, as alone possessing value, active, fighting and victorious being.16. As all the forms of dynamic, whether pictorial, musical, physical, social or political, are concerned with the working out of infinite relations and deal, not with the individual case and the sum of individual cases as the classical physics had done, but with the typical course or process and its functional rule character must be understood as that which remains in principle constant in the working out of life, where there is no such constant we speak of lack of character. It is character, the form in virtue of which a moving existence can combine the highest constancy in the essential with the maximum variability in the details, that makes telling biography, such as Goethe's Wachheit und Dichtung, possible at all. Plutarch's truly classical biographies are by comparison mere collections of anecdotes strung together chronologically and not ordered pictures of historical development, and it will hardly be disputed that only this second kind of biography is imaginable in connection with Alcibiades or Pericles or, for that matter, any purely Apollonian figure. Their experiences lack, not mass, but relation, there is something atomic about them. Similarly in the field of science the Greek did not merely forget to look for general laws in the sum of his experiential data, in his cosmos they were simply not there to be found. It follows that the sciences of character study, particularly physiognomy and graphology, would not be able to glean much in the classical field. Its handwriting we do not know, but we do know that its ornament, as compared with the Gothic, is of incredible simplicity and feebleness of character expression, think of the meander and the acanthus shoot. On the other hand, it has never been surpassed in timeless evenness. It goes without saying that we, when we turn to look into the classical life feeling, must find the some basic element of ethical values that is antithetical to character in the same way as the statue is antithetical to the fugue, 
Euclidean geometry to analysis, and body to space. We find it in the gesture. It is this that provides the necessary foundation for a spiritual static. The word that stands in the classical vocabulary where personality stands in our own is comma persona, namely role or mask. In late Greek or Roman speech it means the public aspect and mean of a man, which for classical man is tantamount to the essence and kernel of him. An orator was described as speaking in the comma not the character or the vein as we should say, of a priest or a soldier. The slave was comma that is, he had no attitude or figure in the public life, but not comma that is, he did have a soul. The idea that destiny had assigned the role of king or general to a man was expressed by Romans in the words persona regis, imperatoris.17 The Apollonian cast of life is manifest enough here. What is indicated is not the personality, that is, an unfolding of inward possibilities in active striving, but a permanent and self-contained posture strictly adapted to a so to say plastic ideal of being. It is only in the classical ethic that beauty plays a distinct role. However labeled, as comma or comma it always amounts to the well-ordered group of tangible and publicly evident traits, defined for other men rather than specific to one's self. A man was the object and not the subject of outward life. The pure present, the moment, the foreground were not conquered but worked up. The notion of an inward life is impossible in this connection. The significance of Aristotle's phrase comma quite untranslatable and habitually translated with a western connotation, is that it refers to men who are nothing when single and lonely, what could be more preposterous than an Athenian Robinson Crusoe, and only count for anything when in a plurality, in agora or forum, where each reflects his neighbor and thus, only thus, acquires a genuine reality. It is all implicit in the phrase comma used for the burghers of the city. And thus we see that the portrait, the center of Baroque art, is identical with the representation of a man to the extent that he possesses character, and that in the best age of Attic the representation of a man in respect of his attitude, as persona, necessarily leans to the form ideal of the nude statue. V. This opposition, further, has produced forms of tragedy that differ from one another radically in every respect. The Faustian character drama and the Apollonian drama of noble gesture have in fact nothing but name in common. Starting, significantly enough, from Seneca and not from Aeschylus and Sophocles 18, just as the contemporary architecture linked itself with Imperial Rome and not with Pestum, the Baroque drama with ever increasing emphasis makes character instead of a currency its center of gravity, the origin of a system of spiritual coordinates so to express it, which gives the scenic facts position, sense, and value in relation to itself. The outcome is a tragedy of willing, of efficient forces, of inward movement not necessarily exhibited in visible form, whereas Sophocles's method was to employ a minimum of happening and to put it behind the scenes particularly by means of the artifice of the messenger. The classical tragedy relates to general situations and not particular personalities. It is specifically described by Aristotle as dot that which in his Poetica, assuredly the most fateful of all books for our poetry, he calls common namely the ideal bearing of the ideal Helene in a painful situation, has as little in common with our notion of character, viz, a constitution of the ego which determines events as a surface in Euclidean geometry has with the like-named concept in Riemann's theory of algebraic equations. It has, unfortunately, been our habit for centuries past to translate as character instead of paraphrasing it, exact rendering is almost impossible, by role, bearing or gesture, to reproduce myth, comma which is timeless occurrence, by action, and to derive from doing. It is Othello, Don Quixote, the misanthrope, Werther and Head to Gabler that are characters, and the tragedy consists in the mere existence of human beings thus constituted in their respective milieu. Their struggle, whether against this world or the next, or themselves, is forced on them by their character and not by anything coming from outside, a soul is placed in a web of contradictory relations that admits of no net solution. Classical stage figures, on the contrary, are roles and not characters, 
Over and over again the same figures appear, the old man, the slayer, the lover, all slow moving bodies under masks and on stilts. Thus in classical drama, even of the late period, the mask is an element of profound symbolic necessity, whereas our pieces would not be regarded as played at all without the play of features. It is no answer to point to the great size of the Greek theater, for even the strolling player, even the portrait statue, wore a mask, and had there been any spiritual need of a more intimate setting the required architectural form would have been forthcoming quickly enough. In the tragedy of a character, what happens is the outcome of a long inner development. But in what befalls Ajax and Philoctetes, Antigone and Electra, their psychological antecedents, even supposing them to have any, play no part. The decisive event comes upon them, brutally, as accident, from without, and it might have befallen another in the same way and with the same result. It would not be necessary even for that other to be of the same sex. It is not enough to distinguish classical and western tragedy merely as action drama and event drama. Faustian tragedy is biographical. Classical anecdotal, that is, the one deals with the sense of a whole life and the other with the content of the single moment. 19 What relation, for instance, has the entire inward past of Oedipus or Orestes to the shattering event that suddenly meets him on his way? There is one sort of destiny, then, that strikes like a flash of lightning, and just as blindly, and another that interweaves itself with the course of a life, an invisible thread twenty that yet distinguishes this particular life from all others. There is not the smallest trait in the past existence of Othello, that masterpiece of psychological analysis, that has not some bearing on the catastrophe. Race hatred, the isolation of the upstart amongst the patricians, the more as soldier and as child of nature, the loneliness of the aging bachelor, all these things have their significance. Lear, too, and Hamlet, compare the exposition of these characters with that of Sophoclean pieces. They are psychological expositions through and through and not summations of outward data. The psychologist, in our sense of the word, namely the fine student, hardly nowadays to be distinguished from the poet, of spiritual turning points was entirely unknown to the Greeks. They were no more analytical in the field of soul than in that of number, vis-a-vis -vis the classical soul, how could they be so? Psychology in fact is the proper designation for the western way of fashioning men. The word holds good for a portrait by Rembrandt as for the music of Tristan, for Stendhal's Julian Sorel as for Dante's Vita Nuova. The like of it is not to be found in any other culture. If there is anything that the classical arts scrupulously exclude it is this, for psychology is the form in which art handles man as incarnate will and not as dot to call Euripides a psychologist is to betray ignorance of what psychology is. What an abundance of character there is even in the mere mythology of the north with its sly dwarfs, its slumpy giants, its teasing elves, its Loki, Baldr and the rest. Zeus, Apollo, Poseidon, Ares are simply men, Hermes the youth, Athena matura Aphrodite, and the minor gods, as the later plastic shows, distinguishable only by the labels. And the same is true without reservation of the figures of the attic stage. In Wolfram von Ischenbach, Cervantes, Shakespeare, Goethe, the tragic is individual, life develops from within outwards. Dynamic, functional, and the life courses are only fully understandable with reference to the historical background of the century. But in the great tragedians of Athens it comes from outside, it is static, Euclidean. To repeat a phrase already used in connection with world history, the shattering event is epochal in the former and merely episodic in the latter, even the finale of death being only the last bead in the string of sheer accidents that makes up an existence. A Baroque tragedy is nothing but this same directive character brought into and developed in the light world, and shown as a curve instead of as an equation, as kinetic instead of as potential energy. The visible person is the character as potential, the action the character at work. This, under the heap of classicist reminiscences and misunderstandings that still hides it, is the whole meaning of our idea of tragedy. 
the tragic man of the classical is a Euclidean body that is struck by the Himamin in a position that it did not choose and cannot alter, but is seen, in the light that plays from without upon its surfaces, to be indeformable quaint meme. This is the sense in which Agamemnon is and in which Oedipus is, is subjected to the oracle. Down to Alexander the significant figures of Greek history astonish us with their inelasticity, not one of them, apparently, undergoes in the battle of life any such inward transformation as those which we know took place in Luther and Loyola. What we are prone, too prone, to call characterization in Greek drama is nothing but the reflection of events upon the of the hero, never the reflection of a personality on events. Of deep necessity, therefore, we Faustians understand drama as a maximum of activity, and, of deep necessity also, the Greek understood it as a maximum of passivity. 21 Speaking generally, the Attic tragedy had no action at all. The mysteries were purely or comma that is, ritual performances, and it was from the mystery form with its peripteia that Aeschylus, himself an Eleusinian, derived the high drama that he created. Aristotle describes tragedy as the imitation of an occurrence. This imitation is identical with the profanation of the mysteries, and we know that Aeschylus went further and made the sacral vestments of the Eleusinian priesthood the regular costume of the Attic stage, and was accused on that account. 22 for the proper, with its reversal from lamentation to joy, consisted not in the fable that was narrated but in the ritual action that lay behind it and was understood and felt by the spectator as deeply symbolic. With this element of the non-Homeric early religion there became associated another, a boorish, the burlesque, whether phallic or dithyrambic, scenes of the spring festivals of Demeter and Dionysus. The beast dances 23 and the accompanying song were the germ of the tragic chorus which puts itself before the actor or answerer of Thespis, 534. The genuine tragedy grew up out of the solemn death lament, Thrnos, Nenya. At some time or other the joyous play of the Dionysus festival, which also was a soul feast, became a mourner's chorus of men, the satyr play being relegated to the end. In 494 Phrynichus produced the fall of Miltis, not a historical drama but a lament of the women of Miltis, and was heavily fined for thus recalling the public calamity. It was Aeschylus's introduction of the second actor that accomplished the essential of classical tragedy. The lament as given theme was thenceforward subordinated to the visual presentation of a great human suffering as present motive. The foreground story, comma is not action but the occasion for the songs of the chorus, which still constitutes the proper. It is immaterial whether the occurrence is indicated by narrative or exposition. The spectator was in solemn mood and he felt himself and his own fate to be meant in the words of pathos. It was in him that the comma the central element of the holy pageant, took place. Whatever the environment of message and tale, the liturgical lament for the woe of mankind remained always the center of gravity of the whole, as we see more particularly in the Prometheus, the Agamemnon and the Oedipus Rex. But presently, at the very time when in Polycletus the pure plastic was triumphing over the fresco, there emerges high above the lament the grandeur of human endurance, the attitude, the of the hero. The theme is, not the heroic doer whose will surges and breaks against the resistance of alien powers or the demons in his own breast, but the will less patient whose somatic existence is, gratuitously, destroyed. The Prometheus trilogy of Aeschylus begins just where Goethe would in all probability have left off. King Lear's madness is the issue of the tragic action, but Sophocles's Ajax is made mad by Athene before the drama opens, here is the difference between a character and an operated figure. Fear and compassion, in fact, are, as Aristotle says, the necessary effect of Greek tragedy upon the Greek, and only the Greek, spectator as is evident at once from his choice of the most effective scenes, which are those of piteous crash of fortune, comma and of recognition, dot in the first, the ruling impression is, terror, and in the second it is, pity, and the inner spectator presupposes his existence ideal to be that of dot 24 the classical soul is pure present, pure comma unmoved and point formed being.
to see this imperiled by the jealousy of the gods or by that blind chance that may crash upon any man's head without reason and without warning, is the most fearful of all experiences. The very roots of Greek being are struck at by what for the challenging Faustian is the first stimulus to living activity. And then, to find one's self delivered, to see the sun come out again and the dark thunder clouds huddle themselves away on the remote horizon, to rejoice profoundly in the admired grand gesture, to see the tortured mythical soul breathe again, that is the dot but it presupposes a kind of life feeling that is entirely alien to us, the very word being hardly translatable into our languages and our sensations. It took all the aesthetic industry and assertiveness of the Baroque and of Classicism, backed by the meekest submissiveness before ancient texts, to persuade us that this is the spiritual basis of our own tragedy as well. And no wonder. For the fact is that the effect of our tragedy is precisely the opposite. It does not deliver us from dead weight pressure of events, but evokes active dynamic elements in us, stings us, stimulates us. It awakens the primary feelings of an energetic human being, the fierceness and the joy of tension, danger, violent deed, victory, crime, the triumph of overcoming and destroying, feelings that have slumbered in the depths of every northern soul since the days of the Vikings, the Hohenstaufen and the Crusades. That is Shakespearean effect. A Greek would not have tolerated Macbeth, nor, generally, would he have comprehended the meaning of this mighty art of directional biography at all. That figures like Richard III, Don Juan, Faust, Michael Cole has, Golo, unclassical from top to toe, awaken in us not sympathy but a deep and strange envy, not fear but a mysterious desire to suffer, to suffer with, compassion of quite another sort, is visibly, even today when Faustian tragedy in its final form, the German, is dead at last, the standing motive of the literature of our Alexandrian phase. In the sensational adventure and detective story, and still more recently in the cinema drama, the equivalent of the late classical mimes, a relic of the unrestrainable Faustian impulse to conquer and discover is still palpable. There are corresponding differences between the Apollinean and the Faustian outlook in the forms of dramatic presentation which are the complement of the poetic idea. The antique drama is a piece of plastic, a group of pathetic scenes conceived as reliefs, a pageant of gigantic marionettes disposed against the definitive plane of the back wall. 25 presentation is entirely that of grandly imagined gestures, the meager facts of the fable being solemnly recited rather than presented. The technique of western drama aims at just the opposite unbroken movement and strict exclusion of flat static moments. The famous three unities of place, time and action, as unconsciously evolved, though not expressly formulated, in Athens, are a paraphrase of the type of the classical marble statue and, like it, an indication of what classical man, the man of the poles in the pure present and the gesture, felt about life. The unities are all, effectively, negative, denials of past and future, repudiation of all spiritual action at a distance. They can be summed in the one word. Dot the postulates of these unities must not be confused with the superficially similar postulates in the drama of the Romance peoples. The Spanish theatre of the 16th century bowed itself to the authority of classical rules, but it is easy to see the influence of noblesse oblige in this, Castilian dignity responded to the appeal without knowing or indeed troubling to find out, the original sense of the rules. The great Spanish dramatists, Terso de A. Molina above all, fashioned the unities of the Baroque, but not as metaphysical negations, but purely as expressions of the spirit of high courtesy, and it was as such that Corneille, the docile pupil of Spanish grandistsa, borrowed them. It was a fateful step. If Florence threw herself into the imitation of the classical sculpture, at which everyone marveled and of which no one possessed the final criteria, no harm was done, for there was by then no northern plastic to suffer thereby. But with tragedy it was another matter. Here there was the possibility of a mighty drama, purely Faustian, of unimagined forms and daring. That this did not appear, 
that for all the greatness of Shakespeare the Teutonic drama never quite shook off the spell of misunderstood convention, was the consequence of blind faith in the authority of Aristotle. What might not have come out of Baroque drama had it remained under the impression of the knightly epic and the Gothic Easter play in mystery, in the near neighborhood of oratorios and passions, without ever hearing of the Greek theatre. A tragedy issuing from the spirit of contrapuntal music, free of limitations proper to plastic but here meaningless, a dramatic poetry that from Orlando Lasso and Palestrina could develop, side by side with Heinrich Schutz, Bach, Handel, Gluck and Beethoven, but entirely free, to a pure form of its own, that was what was possible, and that was what did not happen and it is only to the fortunate circumstance that the whole of the fresco art of Hellas has been lost that we owe the inward freedom of our oil painting. Vi. The unities were not sufficient for the Attic drama. It demanded, further, the rigid mask in lieu of facial play, thus forbidding spiritual characterization in the same spirit as Attic sentiment for bad likeness statuary, it demanded more than life-sized figures and got them by means of the cotternus and by padding and draping the actor till he could scarcely move, thus eliminating all his individuality. Lastly, it required monotonous sing-song delivery, which it ensured by means of a mouthpiece fixed in the mask. The bare text as we read it today, not without reading into it the spirit of Goethe and Shakespeare and of our perspective vision conveys little of the deeper significance of these dramas. Classical artworks were created entirely for the eye, even the physical eye, of classical man, and the secrets reveal themselves only when put in sensuous forms. And here our attention is drawn to a feature of Greek tragedy that any true tragedy of the Faustian style must find intolerable, the continual presence of the chorus. The chorus is the primitive tragedy for without it there would be impossible. Character one possesses for one's self, but attitude has meaning only in relation to others. This chorus is crowd, the ideal opposite to the lonely or inward man and the monologue of the West, this chorus which is always there, the witness of every soliloquy, this chorus by which, in the stage life as in the real life, fear before the boundless and the void is banished, is truly a polynine self-review as a public action, pompous public mourning in lieu of the solitary anguish of the bedchamber, the tears and lamentations that fill a whole series of dramas like the Philoctetes and the Trachinias, the impossibility of being alone, the feeling of the polis, all the feminine of this culture that we see idealized in the Belvedere Apollo, betrays itself in this symbol of the chorus. In comparison with this kind of drama, Shakespeare's is a single monologue. Even in the conversations, even in the group scenes we are sensible of the immense inner distance between the persons, each of whom at bottom is only talking with himself. Nothing can overcome this spiritual remoteness. It is felt in Hamlet as in Tasso and in Don Quixote as in Werther, but even Wolfram von Ischenbach's Pars Evil is filled with and stamped by the sense of infinity. The distinction holds for all Western poetry against all classical. All our lyric verse from Walther von der Vogelweide to Goethe and from Goethe to the poems of our dying world cities is monologue, while the classical lyric is a choral lyric, a singing before witnesses. The one is received inwardly, in wordless reading, as soundless music, and the other is publicly recited. The one belongs to the still chamber and is spread by means of the book, the other belongs to the place where it is voiced. Thus, Although the Eleusinian mysteries and the Thracian festival of the Epiphany of Dionysus had been nocturnal celebrations, the art of Thespis developed, as its inmost nature required, as a scene of the morning and the full sunlight. On the contrary, our Western popular and passion plays, which originated in the sermon of allocated parts and were produced first by priests in the church, and then by laymen in the open square, on the mornings of high festivals led almost unnoticed to an art of evening and night. Already in Shakespeare's time performances took place in the late afternoon, and by Goethe's this mystical sense of a proper relation between artwork and light setting had attained its object. In general, every art and every culture has its significant times of day. The music of the 18th century is a music of the darkness and the inner eye, 
and the plastic of Athens is an art of cloudless day. That this is no superficial contrast we can see by comparing the Gothic plastic, wrapped eternally in dim religious light, and the Ionic flute, the instrument of high noon. The candle affirms and the sunlight denies space as the opposite of things. At night the universe of space triumphs over matter, at midday things and nearness assert themselves and space is repudiated. The same contrast appears in Attic fresco and northern oil painting, and in the symbols of Helios and Pan and those of the starry night and red sunset. It is at midnight, too, and particularly in the twelve long nights after Christmas, that the souls of our dead walk abroad. In the classical world, the souls belong to the day, even the early church still speaks of the comma the twelve dedicated days, but with the awakening of the Faustian soul these become twelfth night. The classical vase painting and fresco, though the fact has never been remarked, has no time of day. No shadow indicates the state of the sun, no heaven shows the stars. There is neither morning nor evening, neither spring nor autumn, but pure aimless brightness. 26 For equally obvious reasons, our royal painting developed in the opposite direction, towards an imaginary darkness, also independent of time of day, which forms the characteristic atmosphere of the Faustian soul space. This is all the more significant as the intention is from the outset to treat the field of the picture with reference to a certain time of day, that is, historically. There are early mornings, sunset clouds, the last gleams upon the skyline of distant mountains, the candlelit room, the spring meadows and the autumn woods, the long and short shadows of bushes and furrows. But they are all penetrated through and through with a subdued darkness that is not derived from the motion of the heavenly bodies. In fact, steady brightness and steady twilight are the respective hallmarks of the classical and the western, alike in painting and in drama and may we not also describe Euclidean geometry as a mathematic of the day and analysis as a mathematic of the night? Change of scene, undoubtedly regarded by the Greeks as a sort of profanation, is for us almost a religious necessity, a postulate of our world feeling. There seems something pagan in the fixed scene of Tasso. We inwardly need a drama of perspectives and wide backgrounds, a stage that shakes off sensuous limitations and draws the whole world into itself. In Shakespeare, who was born when Michelangelo died and ceased to write when Rembrandt came into the world, dramatic infinity, the passionate overthrow of all static limitations, attained the maximum. His woods, seas, alleys, gardens, battlefields lie in the afar, the unbounded. Years fly past in the space of minutes. The mad leer between fool and reckless outcast on the heath, in the night and the storm, the unutterably lonely ego lost in space, here is the Faustian life feeling. From such a scene as this it is but a step to the inwardly seen and inwardly felt landscapes of the almost contemporary Venetian music, for on the Elizabethan stage the whole thing was merely indicated, and it was the inner eye that out of a few hints fashioned for itself an image of the world in which the scenes far-fetched always, played themselves out. Such scenes the Greek stage could not have handled at all. The Greek scene is never a landscape, in general, it is nothing, and at best it may be described as a basis for movable statues. The figures are everything, in drama, as in fresco. It is sometimes said that classical man lacked the feeling for nature. Insensitive to Faustian nature, that of space and of landscape, classical man certainly was. His nature was the body, and if once we have let the sentiment of this sink into us, we suddenly comprehend the eye with which the Greek would follow the mobile muscle relief of the nude body. This, and not clouds and stars and horizon, was his living nature. 7. Now, whatever is sensuously near is understandable for all, and therefore of all the cultures that have been, the classical is the most popular, and the Faustian the least popular, in its expressions of life feeling. A creation is popular that gives itself with all its secrets to the first comer at the first glance, that incorporates its meaning in its exterior and surface. In any culture, 
that element is popular which has come down unaltered from primitive states and imaginings, which a man understands from childhood without having to master by effort any really novel method or standpoint, and, generally, that which is immediately and frankly evident to the senses, as against that which is merely hinted at and has to be discovered, by the few, and sometimes the very, very few. There are popular ideas, works, men and landscapes. Every culture has its own quite definite sort of esoteric or popular character that is imminent in all its doings, so far as these have symbolic importance. The commonplace eliminates differences of spiritual breadth as well as depth between man and man, while the esoteric emphasizes and strengthens them. Lastly, considered in relation to the primary depth experience of this and that kind of awakening man, that is, in relation to the prime symbol of his existence and the cast of his world around, the purely popular and naive associates itself with the symbol of the bodily, while to the symbol of endless space belongs a frankly unpopular relation between the creations and the men of the culture. The classical geometry is that of the child, that of any layman, Euclid's elements are used in England as a school book to this day. The workaday mind will always regard this as the only true and correct geometry. All other kinds of natural geometry that are possible, and have in fact, by an immense effort of overcoming the popular obvious, been discovered, are understandable only for the circle of the professional mathematicians. The famous four elements of Empedocles are those of every naive man and his instinctive physics while the idea of isotopes which has come out of research into radioactivity is hardly comprehensible even to the adept in closely cognate sciences. Everything that is classical is comprehensible in one glance, be it the Doric temple, the statue, the polis, the cults, backgrounds and secrets there are none. But compare a Gothic cathedral facade with the Proplia, an etching with a vase painting, the policy of the Athenian people with that of the modern cabinet. Consider what it means that every one of our epoch-making works of poetry, policy and science has called forth a whole literature of explanations, and not indubitably successful explanations at that. While the path and non-sculptures were the for every Hellene, the music of Bach and his contemporaries was only for musicians. We have the types of the Rembrandt expert, the Dante scholar, the expert in contrapuntal music, and it is a reproach, a justifiable reproach, to Wagner that it was possible for far too many people to be Wagnerians, that far too little of his music was for the trained musician. But do we hear of Phidias experts or even Homer scholars? Herein lies the explanation of a set of phenomena which we have hitherto been inclined to treat, in a vein of moral philosophy, or, better, of melodrama, as weakness is common to humanity, but which are in fact symptoms of the Western life feeling, viz., the misunderstood artist, the poet left to starve, the derided discoverer, the thinker who is centuries in advance of his time and so on. These are types of an esoteric culture. Destinies of this sort have their basis in the passion of distance in which is concealed the desire to infinity and the will to power and they are as necessary in the field of Faustian mankind, at all stages, as they are unthinkable in the Apollonine. Every high creator in Western history has in reality aimed, from first to last, at something which only the few could comprehend. Michelangelo made the remark that his style was ordained for the correction of fools. Gauss concealed his discovery of non-Euclidean geometry for thirty years, for fear of the clamor of the Boeotians. It is only today that we are separating out the masters of Gothic cathedral art from the rank and file. But the same applies also to every painter, statesman, philosopher. Think of Giordano Bruno, Albniz, or Kant, as against Anaximander, Heraclitus or Protagoras. What does it mean, that no German philosopher worth mentioning can be understood by the man in the street? and that the combination of simplicity with majesty that is Homer's is simply not to be found in any Western language. The Nibelungen Lied is a hard, reserved utterance, and as for Dante, in Germany at any rate the pretension to understand him is seldom more than a literary pose. We find everywhere in the Western what we find nowhere in the classical, the exclusive form. 
whole periods, for instance, the Provencal culture and the Rococo, are in the highest degree select and uninviting, their ideas and forms having no existence except for a small class of higher men. Even the Renaissance is no exception, for though it purports to be the rebirth of that antique which is so utterly non-exclusive and caters so frankly for all, it is in fact, through and through, the creation of a circle or of individual chosen souls, a taste that rejects popularity from the outset, and how deep this sense of detachment goes we can tell from the case of Florence, where the generality of the people viewed the works of the elect with indifference, on with open mouths, on with dislike, and sometimes, as in the case of Savonarola, turned and rent them. On the contrary, every Attic burger belonged to the Attic culture, which excluded nobody, and consequently, the distinctions of deeps and shallows, which are so decisively important for us, did not exist at all for it. For us, popular and shallow are synonymous, in art as in science, but for classical man it was not so. Consider our sciences too. Every one of them, without exception, has besides its elementary groundwork certain higher regions that are inaccessible to the layman, symbols, these also, of our will to infinity and directional energy. The public for whom the last chapters of up-to-date physics have been written numbers at the utmost a thousand persons, and certain problems of modern mathematics are accessible only to a much smaller circle still, for our popular sciences without value, detraqui, and falsified. We have not only an art for artists, but also a mathematic for mathematicians, a politic for politicians, of which the profanum vulgus of newspaper readers has not the smallest inkling, 27 whereas classical politics never got beyond the horizon of the agora, a religion for the religious genius and a poetry for philosophers. Indeed, we may take the craving for wide effect as a sufficient index by itself of the commencing and already perceptible decline of Western science. That the severe esoteric of the Baroque age is felt now as a burden, is a symptom of sinking strength and of the dulling of that distant sense which confessed the limitation with humility. The few sciences that have kept the old fineness, depth, and energy of conclusion and deduction and have not been tainted with journalism, and few indeed they are, for theoretical physics, mathematics, Catholic dogma, and perhaps jurisprudence exhaust the list, address themselves to a very narrow and chosen band of experts. And it is this expert, and his opposite the layman, that are totally lacking in the classical life, wherein everyone knows everything. For us, the polarity of expert and layman has all the significance of a high symbol, and when the tension of this distance is beginning to slacken, there the Faustian life is fading out. The conclusion to be argued from this as regards the advances of Western science in its last phase, which will cover, or quite possibly will not cover, the next two centuries, is, that in proportion as megalopolitan shallowness and triviality drive arts and sciences on to the bookstall and into the factory, the posthumous spirit of the culture will confine itself more and more to very narrow circles, and that there, remote from advertisement, it will work in ideas and forms so abstruse that only a mere handful of superfine intelligences will be capable of attaching meanings to them. 8. In no classical artwork is a relation with the beholder attempted, for that would require the formal language of the individual object to affirm and to make use of the existence of a relation between that object and ambient unlimited space. An attic statue is a completely Euclidean body, timeless and relationless, wholly self-contained. It neither speaks nor looks. It is quite unconscious of the spectator. Unlike the plastic forms of every other culture, it stands wholly for itself and fits into no architectural order, it is an individual amongst individuals, a body amongst bodies. And the living individuals merely perceive it as a neighbor, and do not feel it as an invasive influence, an efficient capable of traversing space. Thus is expressed the Apollonian life feeling. The awakening Maginot at once reversed the meaning of these forms. The eyes of the statues and portraits in the Constantinian style are big and staring and very definitely directed. They represent the pneuma, the higher of the two soul substances. 
the classical sculptor had fashioned the eyes as blind, but now the pupils are bored, the eye, unnaturally enlarged, looks into the space that in Attic art it had not acknowledged as existing. In the classical fresco painting, heads are turned towards one another, but in the mosaics of Ravenna and even in the relief work of early Christian late Roman sarcophagi they are always turned towards the beholder, and their holy spiritual look is fixed upon him. Mysteriously and quite unclassically the beholder's sphere is invaded by an action at a distance from the world that is in the artwork. Something of this magic can still be traced in early Florentine and early Rhenish gold ground pictures. Consider, now, Western painting as it was after Leonardo, fully conscious of its mission. How does it deal with infinite space as something singular which comprehends both picture and spectator as mere centers of gravity of a spatial dynamic? The full Faustian life feeling, the passion of the third dimension, takes hold of the form of the picture, the painted plane, and transforms it in an unheard of way. The picture no longer stands for itself, nor looks at the spectator, but takes him into its sphere. The sector defined by the sides of the frame, the peep show field, twin with the stage field, represents universal space itself. Foreground and background lose all tendency to materiality and propinquity and disclose instead of marking off. Far horizons deepen the field to infinity, and the color treatment of the close foreground eliminates the ideal plane of separation formed by the canvas and thus expands the field so that the spectator is in it. It is not he, now who chooses the standpoint from which the picture is most effective, on the contrary, the picture dictates position and distance to him. Lateral limits, too, are done away with, from 1500 onwards overrunnings of the frame are more and more frequent and daring. The Greek spectator stands before the fresco of Polygnatus. We sink into a picture, that is, we are pulled into it by the power of the space treatment. Unity of space being thus re-established, the infinity that is expanded in all directions by the picture is ruled by the western perspective, and from perspective there runs a road straight to the comprehension of our astronomical world picture and its passionate pioneering into unending farness. Apollinian man did not want to observe the broad universe, and the philosophical systems one and all are silent about it. They know only problems concerned with tangible and actual things, and have never anything positive or significant to say about what is between the things. The classical thinker takes the earth sphere, upon which he stands and which, even in Hipparchus, is enveloped in a fixed celestial sphere, as the complete and given world, and if we probe the depths and secrets of motive here we are almost startled by the persistency with which theory attempted time after time to attach the order of these heavens to that of the earth in some way that would not impugn the primacy of the latter. Compare with this the convulsive vehemence with which the discovery of Copernicus, the contemporary of Pythagoras, drove through the soul of the West and the deep spirit of awe in which Kepler looked upon the laws of planetary orbits which he had discovered as an immediate revelation from God, not daring to doubt that they were circular because any other form would have been too unworthy a symbol. Here the old northern life feeling, the Viking infinity wistfulness, comes into its own. Here, too, is the meaning of the characteristically Faustian discovery of the telescope which, penetrating into spaces hidden from the naked eye and inaccessible to the will to power, widens the universe that we possess. The truly religious feeling that seizes us even today when we dare to look into the depths of starry space for the first time, the same feeling of power that Shakespeare's greatest tragedies aim at awakening, would to Sophocles appear as the impiety of all impieties. Our denial of the vault of heaven, then, is a resolve and not a sense experience. The modern ideas as to the nature of starry space, or, to speak more prudently, of an extension indicated by light indices that are communicated by eye and telescope, most certainly do not rest upon sure knowledge, for what we see in the telescope is small bright disks of different sizes. The photographic plate yields quite another picture, not a sharper one but a different one and the construction of a consistent world picture such as we crave depends upon connecting the two by numerous and often very daring hypotheses, 
for example, of distances, magnitudes and movements, that we ourselves frame. The style of this picture corresponds to the style of our own soul. In actual fact we do not know how different the light powers of one and another star may be, nor whether they vary in different directions. We do not know whether or not light is altered, diminished, or extinguished in the immensities of space. We do not know whether our earthly conceptions of the nature of light, and therefore all the theories and laws deduced from them, have validity beyond the immediate environment of the earth. What we see are merely light indices, what we understand are symbols of ourselves. The strong upspringing of the Copernican world idea, which belongs exclusively to our culture and, to risk an assertion that even now may seem paradoxical, would be and will be deliberately forced into oblivion whenever the soul of a coming culture shall feel itself endangered by it. 28, was founded on the certainty that the corporeal static, the imagined preponderance of the plastic earth, was henceforth eliminated from the cosmos. Till then, the heavens which were thought of, or at any rate felt, as a substantial quantity, like the earth, had been regarded as being in polar equilibrium with it. But now it was space that ruled the universe. World signifies space, and the stars are hardly more than mathematical points, tiny balls in the immense, that as material no longer affect the world feeling. While Democritus, who tried, as on behalf of the Apollonian culture he was bound to try, to settle some limit of a bodily kind to it all, imagined a layer of hook-shaped atoms as a skin over the cosmos, an insatiable hunger drives us ever further and further into the remote. The solar system of Copernicus, already expanded by Giordano Bruno to a thousand such systems, grew immeasurably wider in the Baroque age and today we know that the sum of all the solar systems, about 35 million, constitutes a closed, and demonstrably finite 29, stellar system which forms an ellipsoid of rotation and has its equator approximately along the band of the Milky Way. Swarms of solar systems traverse this space, like flights of migrant birds, with the same velocity and direction. One such group with an apex in the constellation of Hercules, is formed by our sun together with the bright stars Capella, Vega, Altair and Betelgeuse. The axis of this immense system, which has its midpoint not far from the present position of our sun, is taken as 470 million times as long as the distance from the earth to the sun. Any night, the starry heavens give us at the same moment impressions that originated 3700 years apart in time for that is the distance in light years from the extreme outer limit to the earth. In the picture of history as it unfolds before us here, this period corresponds to a duration covering the whole classical and Magian ages and going back to the zenith of the Egyptian culture in the XLLTH dynasty. This aspect, an image, I repeat, and not a matter of experimental knowledge, is for the Faustian a high and noble thirty aspect, but for the Apollonian it would have been woeful and terrible, an annihilation of the most profound conditions of his being. And he would have felt it as sheer salvation when after all a limit, however remote, had been found. But we, driven by the deep necessity that is in us, must simply ask ourselves the new question, is there anything outside this system? Are there aggregates of such systems, at such distances that even the dimensions established by our astronomy 31 are small by comparison? As far as sense observations are concerned, it seems that an absolute limit has been reached, neither light nor gravitation can give a sign of existence through this outer space, void of mass. But for us it is a simple necessity of thought. Our spiritual passion, our unresting need to actualize our existence idea in symbols, suffers under this limitation of our sense perceptions. 9. So also it was that the old northern races, in whose primitive souls the Faustian was already awakening, discovered in their grey dawn the art of sailing the seas which emancipated them. 32 The Egyptians knew the sail, but only profited by it as a labor saving device. They sailed, as they had done before in their oared ships, along the coast to Punt and Syria, but the idea of the high seas voyage, what it meant as a liberation, a symbol, 
was not in them. Sailing, real sailing, is a triumph over Euclidean land. At the beginning of our 14th century, almost coincident with each other, and with the formation periods of oil painting and counterpoint, came gunpowder and the compass, that is, long range weapons and long range intercourse, means that the Chinese culture 33 2 had, necessarily, discovered for itself. It was the spirit of the Vikings and the Hansa, as of those dim peoples, so unlike the Helms with their domestic funerary urns, who heaped up great barrows as memorials of the lonely soul on the wide plains. It was the spirit of those who sent their dead kings to sea in their burning ships, thrilling manifests of their dark yearning for the boundless. The spirit of the Norsemen drove their cockle boats, in the tenth century that heralded the Faustian birth, to the coasts of America. But to the circumnavigation of Africa, already achieved by Egyptians and Carthaginians, classical mankind was wholly indifferent. How statuesque their existence was, even with respect to intercourse, is shown by the fact that the news of the First Punic War, one of the most intense wars of history, penetrated to Athens from Sicily merely as an indefinite report. Even the souls of the Greeks were assembled in Hades as unexcitable shadows, comma without strength, wish or feeling. But the northern dead gathered themselves in fierce unresting armies of the cloud and the storm. The event which stands at the same cultural level as the discoveries of the Spaniards and Portuguese is that of the Hellenic colonizations of the 8th century BC but, while the Spaniards and the Portuguese were possessed by the adventured craving for uncharted distances and for everything unknown and dangerous, the Greeks went carefully, point by point, on the known tracks of the Phoenicians, Carthaginians and Etruscans, and their curiosity in no wise extended to what lay beyond the pillars of Hercules and the Isthmus of Suez, easily accessible as both were to them. Athens no doubt heard of the way to the North Sea, to the Congo, to Zanzibar, to India, in Nero's time the position of the southern extremity of India was known, also that of the islands of Sunda, but Athens shut its eyes to these things just as it did to the astronomical knowledge of the Old East. Even when the lands that we call Morocco and Portugal had become Roman provinces, no Atlantic voyaging ensued, and the Canaries remained forgotten. A Polynian man felt the Columbus longing as little as he felt the Copernican. Possessed though the Greek merchants were with the desire of gain, a deep metaphysical shyness restrained them from extending the horizon, and in geography as in other matters they stuck to near things and foregrounds. The existence of the polis, that astonishing ideal of the status statue, was in truth nothing more nor less than a refuge from the wide world of the sea peoples, and that though the classical, alone of all the cultures so far, had a ring of coasts about a sea of islands, and not a continental expanse, as its motherland. Not even Hellenism, with all its proneness to technical diversions, freed itself from the oared ship which tethered the mariner to the coasts. The naval architects of Alexandria were capable of constructing giant ships of 260 feet length, 34 and, for that matter, the steamship was discovered in principle. But there are some discoveries that have all the pathos of a great and necessary symbol and reveal depths within, and there are others that are merely play of intellect. The steamship is for Apollonians one of the latter and for Faustians one of the former class. It is prominence or insignificance in the macrocosm as a whole that gives discovery and the application thereof the character of depth or shallowness. The discoveries of Columbus and Vasco de Gama extended the geographical horizon without limit, and the world sea came into the same relation with land as that of the universe of space with earth. And then first the political tension within the Faustian world consciousness discharged itself. For the Greeks. Hellas was and remained the important part of the Earth's surface, but with the discovery of America West Europe became a province in a gigantic whole. Thenceforward the history of the Western culture has a planetary character. Every culture possesses a proper conception of home and fatherland, which is hard to comprehend, scarcely to be expressed in words, full of dark metaphysical relations, but nevertheless unmistakable in its tendency. 
the classical home feeling which tied the individual corporally and Euclideanly to the polis is the very antithesis of that enigmatic highway of the northerner which has something musical, soaring and unearthly in it. Classical man felt his home just what he could see from the acropolis of his native city. Where the horizon of Athens ended, the alien, the hostile, the fatherland of another began. Even the Roman of late Republican times understood by Patria nothing but Herbs Roma, not even Latium, still less Italy. The classical world, as it matured, dissolved itself into a large number of point Patriae, and the need of bodily separation between them took the form of hatreds far more intense than any hatred that there was of the barbarian. And it is therefore the most convincing of all evidences of the victory of the Magian world feeling that Caracalla in 212 AD granted Roman citizenship to all provincials. For this grant simply abolished the ancient, statuesque, idea of the citizen. There was now a realm and consequently a new kind of membership. The Roman notion of an army, too, underwent a significant change. In genuinely classical times there had been no Roman army in the sense in which we speak of the Prussian army, but only armies, that is, definite formations, as we say, created as core, limited and visibly present bodies, by the appointment of a legatus to command, an exocitus Scipiones, Crassi for instance, but never an exocitus Romanus. It was Caracalla, the same who abolished the idea of civis Romanus by decree and wiped out the Roman civic deities by making all alien deities equivalent to them, who created the UN classical and Magian idea of an imperial army, something manifested in the separate legions. These now meant something, whereas in classical times they meant nothing, but simply were. The old Fides Exocitum is replaced by Fides Exocitus in the inscriptions and, instead of individual bodily conceived deities special to each legion and richly honored by its legatus, we have a spiritual principle common to all. So also, and in the same sense, the fatherland feeling undergoes a change of meaning for Eastern men, and not merely Christians, in imperial times. Apollinian man so long as he retained any effective remnant at all of his proper world feeling, regarded home in the genuinely corporeal sense as the ground on which his city was built, a conception that recalls the unity of place of Attic tragedy and statuary. But to imagine man, to Christians, Persians, Jews, Greeks, 35 Manichaeans, Nestorians and Mohammedans, it means nothing that has any connection with geographical actualities and for ourselves it means an impalpable unity of nature, speech, climate, habits and history, not earth but country, not point like presence but historic past and future, not a unit made up of men, houses and gods but an idea, the idea that takes shape in the restless wanderings, the deep loneliness, and that ancient German impulse towards the south which has been the ruin of our best, from the Saxon emperors to Holdlin and Nietzsche. The bent of the Faustian culture, therefore, was overpoweringly towards extension, political, economic or spiritual. It overrode all geographical material bounds. It sought, without any practical object, merely for the symbol's own sake, to reach North Pole and South Pole. It ended by transforming the entire surface of the globe into a single colonial and economic system. Every thinker from Meister Eckhart to Kant willed to subject the phenomenal world to the asserted domination of the cognizing ego, and every leader from Otto the Great to Napoleon did it. The genuine object of their ambitions was the boundless, alike for the great Franks and Hohenstaufen with their world monarchies, for Gregory VII and Innocent III, for the Spanish Habsburgs on whose empire the sun never set and for the imperialism of today on behalf of which the world war was fought and will continue to be fought for many a long day. Classical man, for inward reasons, could not be a conqueror, notwithstanding Alexander's romantic expedition, for we can discern enough of the inner hesitations and unwillingnesses of his companions not to need to explain it as an exception proving the rule. 36 The never still desire to be liberated from the binding element, to range far and free, which is the essence of the fancy creatures of the north, the dwarfs, elves and imps, 
is utterly unknown to the Dryads and or Aeads of Greece. Greek daughter cities were planted by the hundred along the rim of the Mediterranean, but not one of them made the slightest real attempt to conquer and penetrate the hinterlands. To settle far from the coast would have meant to lose sight of home, while to settle in loneliness, the ideal life of the trapper and prairie man of America as it had been of Icelandic saga heroes long before, was something entirely beyond the possibilities of classical mankind. Dramas like that of the emigration to America, man by man, each on his own account, driven by deep promptings to loneliness, or the Spanish conquest, or the Californian gold rush, dramas of uncontrollable longings for freedom, solitude, immense independence, and of giant like contempt of all imitations whatsoever upon the home feeling, these dramas are Faustian and only Faustian. No other culture, not even the Chinese, knows them. The Hellenic emigrant, on the contrary, clung as a child clings to its mother's lap. To make a new city out of the old one, exactly like it, with the same fellow citizens, the same gods, the same customs, with the linking sea never out of sight, and there to pursue in the agar of the familiar life of the comma this was the limit of change of scene for the Apollonian life. To us, for whom freedom of movement, if not always as a practical, yet in any case as an ideal, right, is indispensable, such a limit would have been the most crying of all slaveries. It is from the classical point of view that the oft misunderstood expansion of Rome must be looked at. It was anything rather than an extension of the fatherland, it confined itself exactly within fields that had already been taken up by other culture men whom they dispossessed. Never was there a hint of dynamic world schemes of the Hohenstaufen or Habsburg stamp, or of an imperialism comparable with that of our own times. The Romans made no attempt to penetrate the interior of Africa their later wars were waged only for the preservation of what they already possessed, not for the sake of ambition nor under a significant stimulus from within. They could give up Germany and Mesopotamia without regret. If, in fine, we look at it all together, the expansion of the Copernican world picture into that aspect of stellar space that we possess today, the development of Columbus's discovery into a worldwide command of the Earth's surface by the West, the perspective of oil painting and of tragedy scene, the sublimed home feeling, the passion of our civilization for swift transit, the conquest of the air, the exploration of the polar regions and the climbing of almost impossible mountain peaks, we see, emerging everywhere the prime symbol of the Faustian soul, limitless space. And those specially, in form, uniquely, western creations of the soul myth called will, force and deed must be regarded as derivatives of this prime symbol. Chapter 10 Soul Image and Life Feeling 2. Buddhism, Stoicism, Socialism I. We are now at last in a position to approach the phenomenon of morale comma one the intellectual interpretation of life by itself to ascend the height from which it is possible to survey the widest and gravest of all the fields of human thought. At the same time, we shall need for this survey an objectivity such as no one has as yet set himself seriously to gain. Whatever we may take morale to be, it is no part of morale to provide its own analysis, and we shall get to grips with the problem, not by considering what should be our acts and aims and standards, but only by diagnosing the Western feeling in the very form of the enunciation. In this matter of morale, Western mankind, without exception, is under the influence of an immense optic illusion. Everyone demands something of the rest. We say thou shalt in the conviction that so and so in fact will, can and must be changed or fashioned or arranged conformably to the order, and our belief both in the efficacy of, and in our title to give, such orders is unshakable. That, and nothing short of it, is, for us, morale. In the ethics of the West everything is direction, claim to power, will to affect the distant. Here Luther is completely at one with Nietzsche, popes with Darwinians, socialists with Jesuits, for one and all, the beginning of morale is a claim to general and permanent validity. It is a necessity of the Faustian soul that this should be so. He who thinks or teaches otherwise is sinful, a backslider, a foe, 
and he is fought down without mercy. You shall, the state shall, society shall, this form of morale is to us self-evident, it represents the only real meaning that we can attach to the word. But it was not so either in the classical, or in India, or in China. Buddha, for instance, gives a pattern to take or to leave, and Epicurus offers counsel. Both undeniably are forms of high morale, and neither contains the will element. What we have entirely failed to observe is the peculiarity of moral dynamic. If we allow that socialism, in the ethical, not the economic, sense, is that world feeling which seeks to carry out its own views on behalf of all, then we are all without exception, willingly or no, wittingly or no, socialists. Even Nietzsche, that most passionate opponent of herd morale, was perfectly incapable of limiting his zeal to himself in the classical way. He thought only of mankind, and he attacked everyone who differed from himself. Epicurus, on the contrary, was heartily indifferent to others' opinions and acts and never wasted one thought on the transformation of mankind. He and his friends were content that they were as they were and not otherwise. The classical ideal was indifference. Comet to the course of the world, the very thing which it is the whole business of Faustian mankind to master, and an important element both of Stoic and of Epicurean philosophy was the recognition of a category of things neither preferred nor rejected to. Dot in hell as there was a pantheon of morals as there was of deities, as the peaceful coexistence of Epicureans, Cynics and Stoics shows, but the Nyats Sheen Zarathustra, though professedly standing beyond good and evil, breathes from end to end the pain of seeing men to be other than as he would have them be, and the deep and utterly unclassical desire to devote a life to their reformation. His own sense of the word, naturally, being the only one. It is just this, the general transvaluation, that makes ethical monotheism and, using the word in a novel and deep sense, socialism. All world improvers are socialists. And consequently there are no classical world improvers. The moral imperative as the form of morale is Faustian and only Faustian. It is wholly without importance that Schopenhauer denies theoretically the will to live, or that Nietzsche will have it affirmed, these are superficial differences, indicative of personal tastes and temperaments. The important thing, that which makes Schopenhauer the progenitor of ethical modernity, is that he too feels the whole world as will, as movement, force, direction. This basic feeling is not merely the foundation of our ethics, it is itself our whole ethics, and the rest are byblows. That which we call not merely activity but action three is a historical conception through and through, saturated with directional energy. It is the proof of being, the dedication of being, in that sort of man whose ego possesses the tendency to future, who feels the momentary present not as saturated being but as epoch, as turning point, in a great complex of becoming, and, moreover, feels it so of both his personal life and of the life of history as a whole. Strength and distinctness of this consciousness are the marks of higher Faustian man, but it is not wholly absent in the most insignificant of the breed, and it distinguishes his smallest acts from those of any and every classical man. It is the distinction between character and attitude, between conscious becoming and simple accepted statuesque becomeness, between will and suffering in tragedy. In the world as seen by the Faustian's eyes, everything is motion with an aim. He himself lives only under that condition, for to him life means struggling, overcoming, winning through. The struggle for existence as ideal form of existence is implicit even in the Gothic age, of the architecture of which it is visibly the foundation, and the 19th century has not invented it but merely put it into mechanical utilitarian form. In the Apollonian world there is no such directional motion. The purposeless and aimless seesaw of Heraclitus is becoming, comma is irrelevant here, no Protestantism, no Sturm und Drang, no ethical, intellectual or artistic revolution to fight and destroy the existent. The Ionic and Corinthian styles appear by the side of the Doric without setting up any claim to soul and general validity, but the Renaissance expelled the Gothic and Classicism expelled the Baroque styles and the history of every European literature is filled with battles over form problems. 
even our monasticism, with its Templars, Franciscans, Dominicans and the rest, takes shape as an order movement, in sharp contrast to the Askesis of the early Christian hermit. To go back upon this basic form of his existence, let alone transform it, is entirely beyond the power of Faustian man. It is presupposed even in efforts to resist it. One fights against advanced ideas, but all the time he looks on his fight itself as an advance. Another agitates for a reversal, but what he intends is in fact a continuance of development. A moral is only a new kind of moral and sets up the same claim to primacy. The will to power is intolerant, all that is Faustian wills to reign alone. The Apollonian feeling, on the contrary, with its world of coexistent individual things, is tolerant as a matter of course. But, if toleration is in keeping with will less ataraxia, it is for the Western world with its oneness of infinite soul space and the singleness of its fabric of tensions the sign either of self-deception or of fading out. The enlightenment of the 18th century was tolerant towards, that is, careless of, differences between the various Christian creeds, but in respect of its own relation to the church as a whole, it was anything but tolerant as soon as the power to be otherwise came to it. The Faustian instinct, active, strong-willed, as vertical in tendency as its own Gothic cathedrals, as upstanding as its own ego habio factum, looking into distance and future, demands toleration, that is, room, space, for its proper activity, but only for that. Consider, for instance, how much of it the city democracy is prepared to accord to the church in respect of the latter's management of religious powers, while claiming for itself unlimited freedom to exercise its own and adjusting the common law to conform thereto whenever it can. Every movement means to win, while every classical attitude only wants to be and troubles itself little about the ethos of the neighbor. To fight for or against the trend of the times, to promote reform or reaction, construction, reconstruction or destruction, all this is as unclassical as it is un-Indian. It is the old antithesis of Sophoclean and Shakespearean tragedy, the tragedy of the man who only wants to exist and that of the man who wants to win. It is quite wrong to bind up Christianity with the moral imperative. It was not Christianity that transformed Faustian man, but Faustian man who transformed Christianity, and he not only made it a new religion but also gave it a new moral direction. The it became I, the passion charged center of the world, the foundation of the great sacrament of personal contrition. Will to power even in ethics the passionate striving to set up a proper morale as a universal truth, and to enforce it upon humanity, to reinterpret or overcome or destroy everything otherwise constituted, nothing is more characteristically our own than this is. And in virtue of it the Gothic springtime proceeded to a profound, and never yet appreciated, inward transformation of the morale of Jesus. A quiet spiritual morale welling from imagined feeling, a morale or conduct recommended is potent for salvation, a morale the knowledge of which was communicated as a special act of grace, was recast as a morale of imperative command. For Every ethical system, whether it be of religious or of philosophical origin, has associations with the great arts and especially with that of architecture. It is in fact a structure of propositions of causal character. Every truth that is intended for practical application is propounded with a because and a therefore. There is mathematical logic in them, in Buddha's four truths as in Kant's critique of practical reason five and in every popular catechism. What is not in these doctrines of acquired truth is the uncritical logic of the blood, which generates and matures those conduct standards, sitin, of social classes and of practical men, for example, the chivalry obligations in the time of the Crusades, that we only consciously realize when someone infringes them. A systematic morale is, as it were, an ornament, and it manifests itself not only in precepts but also in the style of drama and even in the choice of art motives. The meander, for example, is a stoic motive. The Doric column is the very embodiment of the antique life ideal. And just because it was so, it was the one classical order which the Baroque style necessarily and frankly excluded, indeed, 
even Renaissance art was warned off it by some very deep spiritual instinct. Similarly with the transformation of the Magin Dome into the Russian roof cupola, the Chinese landscape architecture of devious paths, the Gothic cathedral tower. Each is an image of the particular and unique morale which arose out of the waking consciousness of the culture. 2. The old riddles and perplexities now resolve themselves. There are as many morales as there are cultures, no more and no fewer. Just as every painter and every musician has something in him which, by force of inward necessity, never emerges into consciousness but dominates a priori the formal language of his work and differentiates that work from the work of every other culture, so every conception of life held by a culture man possesses a priori, in the very strictest Kantian sense of the phrase, a constitution that is deeper than all momentary judgments and strivings and impresses the style of these with the hallmark of the particular culture. The individual may act morally or immorally, may do good or evil with respect to the primary feeling of his culture, but the theory of his actions is not a result but a datum. Each culture possesses its own standards, the validity of which begins and ends with it. There is no general morale of humanity. It follows that there is not and cannot be any true conversion in the deeper sense. Conscious behavior of any kind that rests upon convictions is a primary phenomenon, the basic tendency of an existence developed into a timeless truth. It matters little what words or pictures are employed to express it, whether it appears as the predication of a deity or as the issue of philosophic meditation, as proposition or as symbol as proclamation of proper or confutation of alien convictions. It is enough that it is there. It can be wakened and it can be put theoretically in the form of doctrine, it can change or improve its intellectual vehicle but it cannot be begotten. Just as we are incapable of altering our world feeling, so incapable that even in trying to alter it we have to follow the old lines and confirm instead of overthrowing it, so also we are powerless to alter the ethical basis of our waking being. A certain verbal distinction has sometimes been drawn between ethics the science and morale the duty, but, as we understand it, the point of duty does not arise. We are no more capable of converting a man to a morale alien to his being than the Renaissance was capable of reviving the classical or of making anything but a southernized Gothic, an anti-Gothic, out of Apollonian motives. We may talk today of transvaluing all our values, we may, as megalopolitans, go back to Buddhism or paganism or a romantic Catholicism, we may champion as anarchists an individualist or as socialists a collectivist ethic, but in spite of all we do, will and feel the same. A conversion to theosophy or free thinking or one of the present day transitions from a supposed Christianity to a supposed atheism, or vice versa? is an alteration of words and notions, of the religious or intellectual surface, no more. None of our movements have changed man. A strict morphology of all the morals is a task for the future. Here, too, Nietzsche has taken the first and essential step towards the new standpoint. But he has failed to observe his own condition that the thinker shall place himself beyond good and evil. He tried to be at once skeptic and prophet, moral critic and moral gospeller. It cannot be done. One cannot be a first class psychologist as long as one is still a romantic. And so here, as in all his crucial penetrations, he got as far as the door, and stood outside it. And so far, no one has done any better. We have been blind and uncomprehending before the immense wealth that there is in the moral as in other form languages. Even the skeptic has not understood his task, at bottom he, like others, sets up his own notion of morale, drawn from his particular disposition and private taste, as standard by which to measure others. The modern revolutionaires, Stirner, Ibsen, Strindberg, sure, are just the same, they have only managed to hide the facts, from themselves as well as from others, behind new formulas and catchwords. But a morale, like a sculpture, a music, a painting art, is a self-contained form world expressing a life feeling, it is a datum, fundamentally unalterable, an inward necessity. It is ever true within its historical circle, ever untrue outside it.
As we have seen already, what his several works are to the poet or musician or painter, that its several art genera are for the higher individual that we call the culture, viz, organic units, and that oil painting as a whole, act sculpture as a whole and contrapuntal music as a whole, and rhyme lyric and so on are all epoch making, and as such take rank as major symbols of life. In the history of the culture as in that of the individual existence, we are dealing with the actualization of the possible, it is the story of an inner spirituality becoming the style of a world. By the side of these great form units, which grow and fulfill themselves and close down within a predeterminate series of human generations, which endure for a few centuries and pass irrevocably into death, we see the group of Faustian morals and the sum of Apollinian morals also as individuals of the higher order. That they are, is destiny. They are data, and revelation, or scientific insight, as the case may be, only put them into shape for the consciousness. There is something, hardly to be described, that assembles all the theories from Hesiod and Sophocles to Plato and the Sto and opposes them collectively to all that was taught from Francis of Assisi and Abelard to Ibsen and Nietzsche, and even the morale of Jesus is only the noblest expression of a general morale that was put into other forms by Marcin and Manny, by Philo and Plotinus, by Epictetus, Augustine and Priclus. All classical ethic is an ethic of attitude, all western an ethic of deed. And, likewise, the sum of all Indian and the sum of all Chinese systems forms each a world of its own. 3. Every classical ethic that we know or can conceive of constitutes man an individual static entity, a body among bodies, and all western valuations relate to him as a center of effect in an infinite generality. Ethical socialism is neither more nor less than the sentiment of action at a distance, the moral pathos of the third dimension, and the root feeling of care, care for those who are with us, and for those who are to follow, is its emblem in the sky. Consequently there is for us something socialistic in the aspect of the Egyptian culture, while the opposite tendency to immobile attitude, to non-desire, to static self-containedness of the individual recalls the Indian ethic and the man formed by it. The seated Buddha statue, looking at its navel, and Zeno's Atarixio are not altogether alien to one another. The ethical ideal of classical man was that which is led up to in his tragedy, and revealed in its catharsis. This in its last depths means the purgation of the Apollinian soul from its burden of what is not Apollinian, not free from the elements of distance and direction and to understand it we have to recognize that Stoicism is simply the mature form of it. That which the drama effected in a solemn hour, the Sto wished to spread over the whole field of life, viz, statuesque steadiness and will-less ethos. Now, is not this conception of closely akin to the Buddhist ideal of Nirvana, which as a formula is no doubt very late but as an essence is thoroughly Indian and traceable even from Vedic times? And does not this kinship bring ideal classical man and ideal Indian man very close to one another and separate them both from that man whose ethic is manifested in the Shakespearean tragedy of dynamic evolution and catastrophe? When one thinks of it, there is nothing preposterous in the idea of Socrates, Epicurus, and especially Diogenes, sitting by the Ganges, whereas Diogenes in a western megalopolis would be an unimportant fool. Nor. On the other hand, is Frederick William the first of Prussia, the prototype of the socialist in the grand sense, unthinkable in the polity of the Nile, whereas in Periclean Athens he is impossible. Had Nietzsche regarded his own times with fewer prejudices and less disposition to romantic championship of certain ethical creations, he would have perceived that a specifically Christian morale of compassion in his sense does not exist on West European soil. We must not let the words of humane formulas mislead us as to their real significance. Between the morale that one has and the morale that one thinks one has, there is a relation which is very obscure and very unsteady, and it is just here that an incorruptible psychology would be invaluable. Compassion is a dangerous word, and neither Nietzsche himself, for all his mastery, nor anyone else has yet investigated the meaning, conceptual and effective of the word at different times.
the Christian morale of Regin's time was quite different from the Christian morale of St. Francis's. This is not the place to inquire what Faustian compassion, sacrifice or ebullience or again race instinct in a chivalrous society, means as against the fatalistic Magian Christian kind, how far it is to be conceived as action at a distance and practical dynamic, or, from another angle, as a proud soul's demand upon itself or again as the utterance of an imperious distance feeling. A fixed stock of ethical phrases, such as we have possessed since the Renaissance, has to cover a multitude of different ideas and a still greater multitude of different meanings. When a mankind so historically and retrospectively disposed as we are accepts the superficial as the real sense, and regards ideals as subject matter for minnowing, it is really evidencing its veneration for the past in this particular instance, for religious tradition. The text of a conviction is never a test of its reality, for man is rarely conscious of his own beliefs. Catchwords and doctrines are always more or less popular and external as compared with deep spiritual actualities. Our theoretical reverence for the propositions of the New Testament is in fact of the same order as the theoretical reverence of the Renaissance and of Classicism for antique art the one has no more transformed the spirit of men than the other has transformed the spirit of works. The oft quoted cases of the mendicant orders, the Moravians and the Salvation Army prove by their very rarity, and even more by the slightness of the effects that they have been able to produce, that they are exceptions in a quite different generality, namely, the Faustian Christian morale. That morale will not indeed be found formulated either by Luther or by the Council of Trent, but all Christians of the great style, Innocent III and Calvin, Loyola and Sivanarola, Pascal and Street Teresa, have had it in them, even in unconscious contradiction to their own formal teachings. We have only to compare the purely Western conception of the manly virtue that is designated by Nietzsche's moral and free virtue, the grandeur of Spanish and the grandeur of French Baroque with that very feminine of the Hellenic ideal, of which the practical application is presented to us as capacity for enjoyment, comma placidity of disposition, comma comma absence of wants and demands, and, above all, the so typical dot what Nietzsche called a blonde beast and conceived to be embodied in the type of Renaissance man that he so overvalued, for it is really only a jackal counterfeit of the great Hohenstorf and Germans, is the utter antithesis to the type that is presented in every classical ethic without exception and embodied in every classical man of worth. The Faustian culture has produced a long series of granite men, the classical never a one. For Pericles and Themistocles were soft natures in tune with Attic, comma, and Alexander was a romantic who never woke up, Caesar a shrewd reckoner. Hannibal, the alien, was the only man amongst them all. The men of the early time, as Homer presents them to our judgment, the Odysseuses and Ajaxes, would have cut a queer figure among the Chevaliers of the Crusades. Very feminine natures, too, are capable of brutality, a rebound brutality of their own, and Greek cruelty was of this kind. But in the north the great Saxon, Frankenian and Hohenstaufen emperors appear on the very threshold of the culture, surrounded by giant men like Henry the Lion and Gregory VII. Then come the men of the Renaissance, of the struggle of the Two Roses, of the Huguenot Wars, the Spanish Conquistadors, the Prussian Electors and Kings, Napoleon, Bismarck, Rhodes. What other culture has exhibited the like of these? Where in all Hellenic history is so powerful a scene as that of 1176, the Battle of Legnano as foreground? the suddenly disclosed strife of the great Hohenstaufen and the great wealth as background. The heroes of the great migrations, the Spanish chivalry, Prussian discipline, Napoleonic energy, how much of the classical is there in these men and things? And where, on the heights of Faustian morale, from the Crusades to the World War, do we find anything of the slave morale, the meek resignation, the deaconesses care us question mark six only in pious and honored words, nowhere else. The type of the very priesthood is Faustian, 
Think of those magnificent bishops of the old German Empire who on horseback led their flocks into the wild battle, comma 7 or those popes who could force submission on a Henry IV and a Frederick II, of the Teutonic Knights in the Ostmark, of Luther's challenge in which the old northern heathendom rose up against old Roman, of the great cardinals, Richelieu, Mazarin, Fleury, who shaped France. That is Faustian morale and one must be blind indeed if one does not see it efficient in the whole field of West European history. And it is only through such grand instances of worldly passion which express the consciousness of a mission that we are able to understand those of grand spiritual passion, of the upright and forthright caritas which nothing can resist, the dynamic charity that is so utterly unlike classical moderation and early Christian mildness. There is a hardness in the sort of compassion that was practiced by the German mystics, the German and Spanish military orders, the French and English Calvinists. In the Russian, the Raskolnikov, type of charity a soul melts into the fraternity of souls, in the Faustian it arises out of it. Here too ego habio factum is the formula. Personal charity is the justification before God of the person, the individual. This is the reason why compassion morale, in the everyday sense, always respected by us so far as words go, and sometimes hoped for by the thinker, is never actualized. Kant rejected it with decision, and in fact it is in profound contradiction with the categorical imperative, which sees the meaning of life to lie in actions and not in surrender to soft opinions. Nietzsche's slave morale is a phantom, his master morale is a reality. It does not require formulation to be effective, it is there, and has been from of old. Take away his romantic Borgia mask and his nebulous vision of supermen, and what is left of his man is Faustian man himself, as he is today and as he was even in saga days, the type of an energetic, imperative and dynamic culture. However it may have been in the classical world, our great well-doers are the great doers whose forethought and care affects millions the great statesmen and organizers, a higher sort of men, who thanks to their preponderance of will, knowledge, wealth and influence make use of democratic Europe as their aptest and most mobile tool, in order to bring into their own hands the destinies of the earth and as artists to shape man himself. Enough, the time is coming when men will unlearn and relearn the art of politics. So Nietzsche delivered himself in one of the unpublished drafts that are so much more concrete than the finished works. We must either breed political capacities, or else be ruined by the democracy that has been forced upon us by the failure of the older alternatives, eight says Shaw in Man and Superman. Limited though his philosophic horizon is in general, Shaw has the advantage over Nietzsche of more practical schooling and less ideology and the figure of the multi-millionaire under shaft in Major Barbara translates the Superman ideal into the unromantic language of the modern age, which in truth is its real source for Nietzsche also, though it reached him indirectly through Malthus and Darwin. It is these fact men of the grand style who are the representatives today of the will to power over other men's destinies and therefore of the Faustian ethic generally. Men of this sort do not broadcast their millions to dreamers artists, weaklings and down and outs to satisfy a boundless benevolence, they employ them for those who like themselves count as material for the future. They pursue a purpose with them. They make a center of force for the existence of generations which outlives the single lives. The mere money, too, can develop ideas and make history, and roads, precursor of a type that will be significant indeed in the 21st century provided, in disposing of his possessions by will, that it should do so. It is a shallow judgment, and one incapable of inwardly understanding history, that cannot distinguish the literary chatter of popular social moralists and humanity apostles from the deep ethical instincts of the West European civilization. Socialism, in its highest and not its street corner sense, is, like every other Faustian ideal, exclusive. It owes its popularity only to the fact that it is completely misunderstood even by its exponents, who present it as a sum of rights instead of as one of duties, an abolition instead of an intensification of the Kantian imperative, a slackening instead of a tautening of directional energy. 
the trivial and superficial tendency towards ideals of welfare, freedom, humanity, the doctrine of the greatest happiness of the greatest number, are mitigations of the Faustian ethic, a very different matter from the tendency of Epicureanism towards the ideal of happiness, for the condition of happiness was the actual sum and substance of the classical ethic. Here precisely is an instance of sentiments, to all outward appearance much the same, but meaning in the one case everything and in the other nothing. From this point of view, we might describe the content of the classical ethic as philanthropy, a boon conferred by the individual upon himself, his soma. The view has Aristotle on its side, for it is exactly in this sense that he uses the word comma which the best heads of the classicist period, above all Lessing, found so puzzling. Aristotle describes the effect of the Attic tragedy on the Attic spectator as philanthropic. Its periptera relieves him from compassion with himself. A sort of theory of master morale and slave morale existed also in the early Hellenism, in Clickles for example, naturally, under strictly corporeal Euclidean postulates. The ideal of the first class is Alcibiades. He did exactly what at the moment seemed to him best for his own person, and he is felt to be, and admired as, the type of classical Calicagathia. But Protagoras is still more distinct, with his famous proposition, essentially ethical in intention, that man, each man for himself, is the measure of things. That is master morale in a statuesque soul. 4. When Nietzsche wrote down the phrase transvaluation of all values for the first time, the spiritual movement of the centuries in which we are living found at last its formula. Transvaluation of all values is the most fundamental character of every civilization. For it is the beginning of a civilization that it remolds all the forms of the culture that went before, understands them otherwise, practices them in a different way. It begets no more but only reinterprets, and herein lies the negativeness common to all periods of this character. It assumes that the genuine act of creation has already occurred, and merely enters upon an inheritance of big actualities. In the late classical, we find the event taking place inside Hellenistic Roman Stoicism, that is, the long death struggle of the Apollonian soul. In the interval from Socrates, who is the spiritual father of the star and in whom the first signs of inward impoverishment and city intellectualism became visible, to Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, every existence ideal of the old classical underwent transvaluation. In the case of India, the transvaluation of Brahman life was complete by the time of King Asoka, 250 BC, as we can see by comparing the parts of the Vedanta put into writing before and after Buddha and ourselves? Even now the ethical socialism of the Faustian soul, its fundamental ethic, as we have seen, is being worked upon by the process of transvaluation as that soul is walled up in the stone of the great cities. Rousseau is the ancestor of this socialism. He stands, like Socrates and Buddha, as the representative spokesman of a great civilization. Rousseau's rejection of all great culture forms and all significant conventions, his famous return to the state of nature, his practical rationalism, are unmistakable evidences. Each of the three buried a millennium of spiritual depth. Each proclaimed his gospel to mankind, but it was to the mankind of the city intelligentsia, which was tired of the town and the late culture, and whose pure, that is, soulless reason longed to be free from them and their authoritative form and their hardness, from the symbolism with which it was no longer in living communion and which therefore it detested. The culture was annihilated by discussion. If we pass in review the great 19th century names with which we associate the march of this great drama, Schopenhauer, Hebel, Wagner, Nietzsche, Ibsen, Strindberg, we comprehend in a glance that which Nietzsche, in a fragmentary preface to his incomplete masterwork, deliberately and correctly called the coming of nihilism. Every one of the great cultures knows it, for it is of deep necessity inherent in the finale of these mighty organisms. Socrates was a nihilist, and Buddha. There is an Egyptian or an Arabian or a Chinese desoling of the human being, just as there is a Western. This is a matter not of mere political and economic, 
nor even of religious and artistic, transformations, nor of any tangible or factual change whatsoever, but of the condition of a soul after it has actualized its possibilities in fall. It is easy, but useless, to point to the bigness of Hellenistic and of modern European achievement. Mass slavery and mass machine production, progress and ataraxia, Alexandrianism and modern science, Pergamum and Bayreuth, social conditions as assumed in Aristotle and as assumed in Marx, are merely symptoms on the historical surface. Not external life and conduct, not institutions and customs, but deepest and last things are in question here, the inward finishedness, Fertigsen, of megalopolitan man, and of the provincial as well. For the classical world this condition sets in with the Roman age, for us it will set in from about the year 2000. Culture and civilization, the living body of a soul and the mummy of it. For Western existence the distinction lies at about the year 1800, on the one side of that frontier life in fullness and sureness of itself, formed by growth from within, in one great uninterrupted evolution from Gothic childhood to Goethe and Napoleon, and on the other the autumnal, artificial, rootless life of our great cities, under forms fashioned by the intellect, culture and civilization, the organism born of Mother Earth, and the mechanism proceeding from hardened fabric. Culture man lives inwards. Civilization man outwards in space and amongst bodies and facts. That which the one feels as destiny the other understands as a linkage of causes and effects and thenceforward he is a materialist, in the sense of the word valid for, and only valid for, civilization, whether he wills it or no, and whether Buddhist, Stoic or Socialist doctrines were the garb of religion or not. To Gothic and Doric men, Ionic and Baroque men, the whole vast form world of art, religion, custom, state, knowledge, social life was easy they could carry it and actualize it without knowing it. They had over the symbolism of the culture that unstrained mastery that Mozart possessed in music. Culture is the self-evident. The feeling of strangeness in these forms. The idea that they are a burden from which creative freedom requires to be relieved, the impulse to overhaul the stock in order by the light of reason to turn it to better account. The fatal imposition of thought upon the inscrutable quality of creativeness are all symptoms of a soul that is beginning to tire. Only the sick man feels his limbs. When men construct an unmetaphysical religion in opposition to cults and dogmas, when a natural law is set up against historical law, when, in art, styles are invented in place of the style that can no longer be born or mastered, when men conceive of the state as an order of society which not only can be but must be altered nine then it is evident that something has definitely broken down. The cosmopolis itself, the supreme inorganic, is there, settled in the midst of the culture landscape, whose men it is uprooting, drawing into itself and using up. Scientific worlds are superficial worlds, practical, soulless and purely extensive worlds. The ideas of Buddhism, of Stoicism, and of socialism alike rest upon them. Ten life is no longer to be lived as something self evident, hardly a matter of consciousness, let alone choice, or to be accepted as God will destiny, but is to be treated as a problem, presented as the intellect sees it, judged by utilitarian or rational criteria. This, at the back, is what all three mean. The brain rules, because the soul abdicates. Culture men live unconsciously civilization men consciously. The megalopolis, skeptical, practical, artificial, alone represents civilization today. The soil peasantry before its gates does not count. The people means the city people, an inorganic mass, something fluctuating. The peasant is not democratic, this again being a notion belonging to mechanical and urban existence, and he is therefore overlooked, despised, detested. With the vanishing of the older states, gentry and priesthood, he is the only organic man, the sole relic of the early culture. There is no place for him either in Stoic or in socialistic thought. Thus the Faust of the first part of the tragedy, the passionate student of solitary midnights, 
is logically the progenitor of the Faust of the second part and the new century, the type of a purely practical, far-seeing, outward-directed activity. In him Goethe presaged, psychologically, the whole future of West Europe. He is civilization in the place of culture, external mechanism in place of internal organism, intellect as the petrifact of extinct soul. As the Faust of the beginning is to the Faust of the end, so the Hellene of Pericles' age is to the Roman of Caesar's. V. So long as the man of a culture that is approaching its fulfillment still continues to live straight before him naturally and unquestioningly, his life has a settled conduct. This is the instinctive morale, which may disguise itself in a thousand controversial forms but which he himself does not controvert, because he has it. As soon as life is fatigued, as soon as a man is put onto the artificial soil of great cities, which are intellectual worlds to themselves, and needs a theory in which suitably to present life to himself, morale turns into a problem. Culture morale is that which a man has. Civilization morale that which he looks for. The one is too deep to be exhaustible by logical means, the other is a function of logic. As late as Plato and as late as Kant ethics are still mere dialectics, a game with concepts, or the rounding off of a metaphysical system, something that at bottom would not be thought really necessary. The categorical imperative is merely an abstract statement of what, for Kant, was not in question at all. But with Zeno and with Schopenhauer this is no longer so. It had become necessary to discover, to invent or to squeeze into form, as a rule of being, that which was no longer anchored in instinct, and at this point therefore begin the civilized ethics that are no longer the reflection of life but the reflection of knowledge upon life. One feels that there is something artificial, soulless, half true in all these considered systems that fill the first centuries of all the civilizations. They are not those profound and almost unearthly creations that are worthy to rank with the great hearts. All metaphysic of the high style, all pure intuition, vanishes before the one need that has suddenly made itself felt, the need of a practical morale for the governance of a life that can no longer govern itself. Up to Kant, up to Aristotle, up to the Yoga and Vedanta doctrines, philosophy had been a sequence of grand world systems in which formal ethics occupied a very modest place. But now it became moral philosophy with a metaphysic as background. The enthusiasm of epistemology had to give way to hard practical needs. Socialism, Stoicism and Buddhism are philosophies of this type. To look at the world, no longer from the heights as Aeschylus, Plato, Dante and Goethe did, but from the standpoint of oppressive actualities is to exchange the bird's perspective for the frogs. This exchange is a fair measure of the fall from culture to civilization. Every ethic is a formulation of a soul's view of its destiny, heroic or practical, grand or commonplace, manly or old manly. I distinguish, therefore, between a tragic and a plebeian morale. The tragic morale of a culture knows and grasps the heaviness of being, but it draws therefrom the feeling of pride that enables the burden to be borne. So Aeschylus, Shakespeare, the thinkers of the Brahman philosophy felt it so Dante and German Catholicism. It is heard in the stern battle hymn of Lutheranism Manfest Bergestun Sagot, and it echoes still in the mass lays. The plebeian morale of Epicurus and the Sta, the sects of Buddha's day and the 19th century made rather battle plans for the outmaneuvering of destiny. What Aeschylus did in grand, the Sta did in little, no more fullness, but poverty, coldness and emptiness of life and all that Roman bigness achieved was to intensify this same intellectual chill and void. And there is the same relation between the ethical passion of the great Baroque masters, Shakespeare, Bach, Kant, Goethe, the manly will to inward mastery of natural things that it felt to be far below itself, and modern Europe's state provision, humanity ideals, world peace, greatest happiness of greatest number, etc which express the will to an outward clearance from the path of things that are on the same level. This, no less than the other, is a manifestation of the will to power, as against the classical endurance of the inevitable.
but the fact remains that material bigness is not the same as metaphysical majesty of achievement. The former lacks depth, lacks that which former men had called God. The Faustian world feeling of deed, which had been efficient in every great man from the Hohenstaufen and the wealth to Frederick the Great, Goethe and Napoleon, smooths itself down to a philosophy of work. Whether such a philosophy attacks or defends work does not affect its inward value. The culture idea of deed and the civilization idea of work are related as the attitude of Aeschylus is Prometheus and that of Diogenes. The one suffers and bears, the other lolls. It was deeds of science that Galileo, Kepler and Newton performed, but it is scientific work that the modern physicist carries out. And, in spite of all the great words from Schopenhauer to Schur, it is the plebeian morale of everyday and sound human reason that is the basis of all our expositions and discussions of life. Vi. Each culture, further, has its own mode of spiritual extinction, which is that which follows of necessity from its life as a whole. And hence Buddhism, Stoicism and Socialism are morphologically equivalent to Zen phenomena. For even Buddhism is such. Hitherto the deeper meaning of it has always been misunderstood. It was not a Puritan movement like, for instance, Islamism and Jansenism, not a Reformation as the Dionysiac wave was for the Apollonia world, and, quite generally, not a religion like the religions of the Vedas or the religion of the Apostle Paul, 11 but a final and purely practical world sentiment of tired megalopolitans who had a closed off culture behind them and no future before them. It was the basic feeling of the Indian civilization and as such both equivalent to and contemporary with Stoicism and Socialism. The quintessence of this thoroughly worldly and unmetaphysical thought is to be found in the famous sermon near Ben Ayres, the four noble truths that won the prince philosopher his first adherents. Twelve its roots lay in the rationalist atheistic Sankhya philosophy, the world view of which it tacitly accepts just as the social ethic of the 19th century comes from the sensualism and materialism of the 18th and the star, in spite of its superficial exploitation of Heraclitus, is derived from Protagoras and the Sophists. In each case it is the all power of reason that is the starting point from which to discuss morale, and religion, in the sense of belief in anything metaphysical, does not enter into the matter. Nothing could be more irreligious than these systems in their original forms, and it is these, and not derivatives of them belonging to later stages of the civilizations, that concern us here. Buddhism rejects all speculation about God and the cosmic problems, only self and the conduct of actual life are important to it. And it definitely did not recognize a soul. The standpoint of the Indian psychologist of early Buddhism was that of the Western psychologist and the Western socialist of today, who reduce the inward man to a bundle of sensations and an aggregation of electrochemical energies. The teacher Nagasana tells King Mylinda 13 that the parts of the car in which he is journeying are not the car itself, that car is only a word and that so also is the soul. The spiritual elements are designated skandhas, groups, and are impermanent. Here is complete correspondence with the ideas of association psychology, and in fact the doctrines of Buddha contain much materialism. 14 As the Stoic appropriated Heraclitus's idea of logos and flattened it to a materialist sense, as the socialism based on Darwin has mechanicalized, with the aid of Hegel, Goethe's deep idea of development, so Buddhism treated the Brahman notion of karma, the idea, hardly achievable in our thought, of a being actively completing itself. Often enough it regarded this quite materially as a world stuff under transformation. What we have before us is three forms of nihilism, using the word in Nietzsche's sense. In each case, the ideals of yesterday, the religious and artistic and political forms that have grown up through the centuries, are undone, yet even in this last act, this self-repudiation, each several culture employs the prime symbol of its whole existence. The Faustian nihilist, Ibsen or Nietzsche, Marx or Wagner, shatters the ideals. The Apollonian, Epicurus or Antisthenes or Zeno, watches them crumble before his eyes. And the Indian withdraws from their presence into himself. 
Stoicism is directed to individual self-management, to statuesque and purely present being, without regard to future or past or neighbor. Socialism is the dynamic treatment of the same theme, it is defensive like Stoicism, but what it defends is not the pose but the working out of the life, and more, it is offensive defensive, for with a powerful thrust into distance it spreads itself into all future and over all mankind which shall be brought under one single regimen. Buddhism, which only a mere dabbler in religious research could compare with Christianity, 15 is hardly reproducible in words of the Western languages. But it is permissible to speak of a Stoic nirvana and point to the figure of Diogenes, and even the notion of a socialist nirvana has its justification in so far that European weariness covers its flight from the struggle for existence under catchwords of world peace humanity and brotherhood of man. Still, none of this comes anywhere near the strange profundity of the Buddhist conception of nirvana. It would seem as though the soul of an old culture, when from its last refinements it is passing into death, clings, as it were, jealously to the property that is most essentially its own, to its form content and the innate prime symbol. There is nothing in Buddhism that could be regarded as Christian, nothing in Stoicism that is to be found in the Islam of AD 1000, nothing that Confucius shares with Socialism. The phrase si duo facient idem, nonest idem, which ought to appear at the head of every historical work that deals with living and uniquely occurring becomings and not with logically, causally and numerically comprehensible becomes is specially applicable to these final expressions of culture movements. In all civilizations being ceases to be suffused with soul and comes to be suffused with intellect, but in each several civilization the intellect is of a particular structure and subject to the form language of a particular symbolism. And just because of all this individualness of the being which, working in the unconscious, fashions the last phase creations on the historical surface, relationship of the instances to one another in point of historical position becomes decisively important. What they bring to expression is different in each case, but the fact that they bring it to expression so marks them as contemporary with one another. The Buddhistic abnegation of full resolute life has a Stoic flavor, the Stoic abnegation of the same a Buddhistic flavor, Allusion has already been made to the affinity between the catharsis of the Attic drama and the Nirvana idea. One's feeling is that ethical socialism, although a century has already been given to its development, has not yet reached the clear hard resigned form of its own that it will finally possess. Probably the next decades will impart to it the ripe formulation that Chrysippus imparted to the star. But even now there is a look of the star in socialism when it is that of the higher order and the narrower appeal, when its tendency is the Roman Prussian and entirely unpopular tendency to self-discipline and self-renunciation from sense of great duty, and a look of Buddhism in its contempt for momentary ease and carpe diem. And, on the other hand, it has unmistakably the Epicurean look in that mode of it which alone makes it effective downward and outward as a popular ideal, in which it is a hedonism, not indeed of each for himself, but, of individuals in the name of all. Every soul has religion, which is only another word for its existence. All living forms in which it expresses itself, all arts, doctrines, customs, all metaphysical and mathematical form worlds, all ornament, every column and verse and idea, are ultimately religious, and must be so. But from the setting in of civilization they cannot be so any longer. As the essence of every culture is religion, so, and consequently, the essence of every civilization is a religion, the two words are synonymous. He who cannot feel this in the creativeness of Manet as against Velasquez, of Wagner as against Haydn, of Lysippus as against Phidias, of Theocritus as against Pindar, knows not what the best means in art. Even Rococo in its worldliest creations is still religious. But the buildings of Rome, even when they are temples, are irreligious, the one touch of religious architecture that there was in old Rome was the intrusive magencilled pantheon, first of the mosques. The megalopolis itself, as against the old culture towns, Alexandria was against Athens, Paris as against Bruges, Berlin as against Nuremberg, 
is a religious 16 down to the last detail, down to the look of the streets, the dry intelligence of the faces.17 and, correspondingly, the ethical sentiments belonging to the former language of the megalopolis are irreligious and soulless also. Socialism is the Faustian world feeling become irreligious, Christianity, so called, and qualified even as true Christianity, is always on the lips of the English socialist, to whom it seems to be something in the nature of a dogma less morale. Stoicism also was irreligious as compared with Orphic religion, and Buddhism as compared with Vedic, and it is of no importance whatever that the Roman Stoic approved and conformed to emperor worship, that the later Buddhist sincerely denied his atheism, or that the socialist calls himself an earnest free thinker or even goes on believing in God. It is this extinction of living in religiousness, which gradually tells upon even the most insignificant element in a man's being, that becomes phenomenal in the historical world picture at the turn from the culture to the civilization, the climacteric of the culture, as I have already called it, the time of change in which a mankind loses its spiritual fruitfulness forever, and building takes the place of begetting. Unfruitfulness, understanding the word in all its direct seriousness, marks the brain man of the megalopolis, as the sign of fulfilled destiny, and it is one of the most impressive facts of historical symbolism that the change manifests itself not only in the extinction of great art, of great courtesy, of great formal thought, of the great style in all things, but also quite carnally in the childlessness and race suicide of the civilized and rootless strata, a phenomenon not peculiar to ourselves but already observed and deplored, and of course not remedied, in imperial Rome and imperial China. 7. As to the living representatives of these new and purely intellectual creations, the men of the new order upon whom every decline time founds such hopes, we cannot be in any doubt. They are the fluid megalopolitan populace, the rootless city mass, comma as Athens called it, that has replaced the people, the culture folk that was sprung from the soil and peasant like even when it lived in towns. They are the marketplace loungers of Alexandria and Rome, the newspaper readers of our own corresponding time. The educated man who then and now makes a cult of intellectual mediocrity and a church of advertisement semicolon 18 the man of the theatres and places of amusement, of sport and bestsellers. It is this late appearing mass and not mankind that is the object of stoic and socialist propaganda, and one could match it with equivalent phenomena in the Egyptian New Empire, Buddhist India and Confucian China. Correspondingly, there is a characteristic form of public effect, the diatribe.19 first observed as a Hellenistic phenomenon, it is an efficient form in all civilizations. Dialectical, practical and plebeian through and through, it replaces the old meaningful and far-ranging creation of the great man by the unrestrained agitation of the small and shrewd, ideas by aims, symbols by programs. The expansion element common to all civilizations, the imperialistic substitution of outer space for inner spiritual space, characterizes this also. Quantity replaces quality, spreading replaces deepening. We must not confuse this hurried and shallow activity with the Faustian will to power. All it means is that creative inner life is at an end and intellectual existence can only be kept up materially, by outward effect in the space of the city. Diatri belongs necessarily to the religion of the irreligious and is the characteristic form that the cure of souls takes therein. It appears as the Indian preaching, the classical rhetoric, and the Western journalism. It appeals not to the best but to the most, and it values its means according to the number of successes obtained by them. It substitutes for the old thoughtfulness and intellectual male prostitution by speech and writing which fills and dominates the halls and the marketplaces of the megalopolis. As the whole of Hellenistic philosophy is rhetorical, so the social ethical system of Zola's novel and Ibsen's drama is journalistic. If Christianity in its original expansion became involved with this spiritual prostitution, it must not be confounded with it. The essential point of Christian missionarism has almost always been missed. 
Primitive Christianity was a Magian religion and the soul of its founder was utterly incapable of this brutal activity without tact or depth. And it was the Hellenistic practice of Paul that, against the determined opposition of the original community, as we all know, introduced it into the noisy, urban, demagogic publicity of the Imperium Romanum. Slight as his Hellenistic tincture may have been, it sufficed to make him outwardly a part of the classical civilization. Jesus had drawn unto himself fishermen and peasants, Paul devoted himself to the marketplaces of the great cities and the megalopolitan form of propaganda. The word pagan, man of the heath or countryside, survives to this day to tell us who it was that this propaganda affected last. What a difference, indeed, what diametrical opposition between Paul and Boniface the passionate Faustian of woods and lone valleys, the joyous cultivating Cistercens, the Teutonic Knights of the Slavonic East. Here was youth once more, blossoming and yearning in a peasant landscape, and not until the 19th century, when that landscape and all pertaining to it had aged into a world based on a megalopolis and inhabited by the masses, did diatribe appear in it. A true peasant re-enters into the field of view of socialism as little as it did into those of Buddha and the Star. It is only now, in the western megalopolis, that the equivalent of the Paul type emerges, to figure in Christian or anti-Christian, social or theosophical causes, free thought or the making of religious fancy wear. This decisive turn towards the one remaining kind of life, that is, life as a fact, seen biologically and under causality relations instead of as destiny, is particularly manifest in the ethical passion with which men now turn to philosophies of digestion, nutrition and hygiene. Alcohol questions arid vegetarianism are treated with religious earnestness, such, apparently, being the gravest problems that the men of the new order, the generations of frog perspective, are capable of tackling. Religions, as they are when they stand newborn on the threshold of the new culture, the Vedic, the Orphic, the Christianity of Jesus and the Faustian Christianity of the old Germany of chivalry, would have felt it degradation even to glance at questions of this kind. Nowadays, one rises to them. Buddhism is unthinkable without a bodily diet to match its spiritual diet, and amongst the sophists, in the circle of antistans, in the sta and amongst the skeptics such questions became ever more and more prominent. Even Aristotle wrote on the alcohol question, and a whole series of philosophers took up that of vegetarianism. And the only difference between Apollinian and Faustian methods here is that the cynic theorized about his own digestion while sure treats of everybody's. The one disinterests himself, the other dictates. Even Nietzsche, as we know, handled such questions with relish in his Ecce Homo. 8. Let us, once more, review socialism, independently of the economic movement of the same name, as the Faustian example of civilization ethics. Its friends regard it as the form of the future, its enemies as a sign of downfall, and both are equally right. We are all socialists, wittingly or unwittingly, willingly or unwillingly even resistance to it wears its form. Similarly, and equally necessarily, all classical men of the late period were Stoics unawares. The whole Roman people, as a body, has a Stoic soul. The genuine Roman, the very man who fought Stoicism hardest, was a Stoic of a stricter sort than ever a Greek was. The Latin language of the last centuries before Christ was the mightiest of Stoic creations. Ethical socialism is the maximum possible of attainment to a life feeling under the aspect of aims semicolon 20 for the directional movement of life that is felt as time and destiny, when it hardens, takes the form of an intellectual machinery of means and end. Direction is the living, aim the dead. The passionate energy of the advance is genetically Faustian, the mechanical remainder, progress, is specifically socialistic the two being related as body and skeleton, and of the two it is the generic quality that distinguishes socialism from Buddhism and Stoicism, these, with their respective ideals of nirvana and ataraxia, are no less mechanical in design than socialism is, 
but they know nothing of the latter's dynamic energy of expansion, of its will to infinity, of its passion of the third dimension. In spite of its foreground appearances, ethical socialism is not a system of compassion, humanity, peace and kindly care, but one of will to power. Any other reading of it is illusory. The aim is through and through imperialist, welfare, but welfare in the expansive sense, the welfare not of the diseased but of the energetic man who ought to be given and must be given freedom to do, regardless of obstacles of wealth, birth and tradition. Amongst us, sentimental morale, morale directed to happiness and usefulness, is never the final instinct, however we may persuade ourselves otherwise. The head and front of moral modernity must ever be Kant, who, in this respect Rousseau's pupil, excludes from his ethics the motive of compassion and lays down the formula act so that, all ethic in this style expresses and is meant to express the will to infinity and this will demands conquest of the moment, the present, and the foreground of life. In place of the Socratic formula knowledge is virtue we have, even in Bacon, the formula knowledge is power. The Stoic takes the world as he finds it, but the Socialist wants to organize and recast it in form and substance, to fill it with his own spirit. The Stoic adapts himself, the Socialist commands. He would have the whole world bear the form of his view thus transferring the idea of the critique of pure reason into the ethical field. This is the ultimate meaning of the categorical imperative, which he brings to bear in political, social and economic matters alike, act as though the maxims that you practice were to become by your will the law for all. And this tyrannical tendency is not absent from even the slowest phenomena of the time. It is not attitude and mean, but activity that is to be given form. As in China and in Egypt, Life only counts in so far as it is deed. And it is the mechanicalizing of the organic concept of deed that leads to the concept of work as commonly understood, the civilized form of Faustian effecting. This morale, the insistent tendency to give to life the most active forms imaginable, is stronger than reason, whose moral programs, be they never so reverenced, inwardly believed or ardently championed, are only effective in so far as they either lie or are mistakenly supposed to lie, in the direction of this force. Otherwise they remain mere words. We have to distinguish, in all modernism, between the popular side with its dolce far niente, its solicitude for health, happiness, freedom from care, and universal peace, in a word, its supposedly Christian ideals, and the higher ethos which values deeds only, which, like everything else that is Faustian, is neither understood nor desired by the masses, which grandly idealizes the aim and therefore work. If we would set against the Roman Panametsa senses, the final life symbol of Epicurean Stoic existence, and, at bottom, of Indian existence also, some corresponding symbol of the North, and of old China and Egypt, it would be the right to work. This was the basis of Fichte's thoroughly Prussian, and now European, conception of state socialism, and in the last terrible stages of evolution it will culminate in the duty to work. Think, lastly, of the Napoleonic in it, the air perennius, the will to duration. Apollonian man looked back to a golden age, this relieved him of the trouble of thinking upon what was still to come. The socialist, the dying Faust of part two, is the man of historical care, who feels the future as his task and aim and accounts the happiness of the moment as worthless in comparison. The classical spirit, with its oracles and its omens, wants only to know the future, but the westerner would shape it. The third kingdom is the Germanic ideal. From Joachim of Fleuris to Nietzsche and Ibsen, arrows of yearning to the other bank, as the Zarathustra says, every great man has linked his life to an eternal morning. Alexander's life was a wondrous paroxysm, a dream which conjured up the Homeric ages from the grave. Napoleon's life was an immense toil, not for himself nor for France, but for the future. It is well, at this point, to recall once more that each of the different great cultures has pictured world history in its own special way. Classical man only saw himself and his fortunes as statically present with himself, and did not ask when saw we there. 
universal history was for him an impossible notion. This is the static way of looking at history. Imagine man sees it as the great cosmic drama of creation and foundering, the struggle between soul and spirit, good and evil, God and devil, a strictly defined happening with, as its culmination, one single periptea, the appearance of the Savior. Faustian man sees in history a tense unfolding towards a name, its ancient medieval modern sequence is a dynamic image. He cannot picture history to himself in any other way. This scheme of three parts is not indeed world history as such, general world history. But it is the image of world history as it is conceived in the Faustian style. It begins to be true and consistent with the beginning of the Western culture and ceases with its ceasing, and socialism in the highest sense is logically the crown of it, the form of its conclusive state that has been implicit in it from Gothic onwards. And here socialism, in contrast to Stoicism and Buddhism, becomes tragic. It is of the deepest significance that Nietzsche, so completely clear and sure in dealing with what should be destroyed, what transvalued, loses himself in nebulous generalities as soon as he comes to discuss the wither, the aim. His criticism of decadence is unanswerable, but his theory of the Superman is a castle in the air. It is the same with Ibsen. Brand and Rosmersham, Emperor and Galilean and Master Builder, and with Hebel, with Wagner and with everyone else. And therein lies a deep necessity, for, from Rousseau onwards, Faustian man has nothing more to hope for in anything pertaining to the grand style of life. Something has come to an end. The northern soul has exhausted its inner possibilities, and of the dynamic force and insistence that had expressed itself in world historical visions of the future visions of millennial scope, nothing remains but the mere pressure, the passion yearning to create, the form without the content. This soul was will and nothing but will. It needed name for its Columbus longing, it had to give its inherent activity at least the illusion of a meaning and an object. And so the keener critic will find a trace of Hilmerichtel in all modernity, even its highest phenomena. Ibsen called it the lie of life. There is something of this lie in the entire intellect of the Western civilization, so far as this applies itself to the future of religion, of art or of philosophy, to a social ethical aim, a third kingdom. For deep down beneath it all is the gloomy feeling, not to be repressed, that all this hectic zeal is the effort of a soul that may not and cannot rest to deceive itself. This is the tragic situation, the inversion of the Hamlet motive that produced Nietzsche's strained conception of a return, which nobody really believed but he himself clutched fast lest the feeling of a mission should slip out of him. This life sly is the foundation of Bayreuth, which would be something whereas Pergamum was something, and a thread of it runs through the entire fabric of socialism, political, economic and ethical, which forces itself to ignore the annihilating seriousness of its own final implications so as to keep alive the illusion of the historical necessity of its own existence. 9. It remains, now, to say a word as to the morphology of a history of philosophy. There is no such thing as philosophy in itself. Every culture has its own philosophy, which is a part of its total symbolic expression and forms with its posing of problems and methods of thought and intellectual ornamentation that is closely related to that of architecture and the arts of form. From the high and distant standpoint it matters very little what truths thinkers have managed to formulate in words within their respective schools, for, here as in every great art, it is the schools, conventions and repertory of forms that are the basic elements infinitely more important than the answers are the questions, the choice of them, the inner form of them. For it is the particular way in which a macrocosm presents itself to the understanding man of a particular culture that determines a priori the whole necessity of asking them, and the way in which they are asked. The classical and the Faustian cultures, and equally the Indian and the Chinese, have each their proper ways of asking, and further, in each case, all the great questions have been posed at the very outset. There is no modern problem that the Gothic did not see and bring into form, no Hellenistic problem that did not of necessity come up for the old Orphic temple teachings. 
it is of no importance whether the subtilizing turn of mind expresses itself here in oral tradition and there in books, whether such books are personal creations of an eye as they are amongst ourselves or anonymous fluid masses of texts as in India, and whether the result is a set of comprehensible systems or, as in Egypt, glimpses of the last secrets are veiled in expressions of art and ritual. Whatever the variations, the general course of philosophies as organisms is the same. At the beginning of every springtime period, philosophy, intimately related to great architecture and religion, is the intellectual echo of a mighty metaphysical living, and its task is to establish critically the sacred causality in the world image seen with the eye of faith. The basic distinctions, not only of science but also of philosophy, are dependent on, not divorced from, the elements of the corresponding religion. In this springtime, thinkers are, not merely in spirit but actually in status, priests. Such were the schoolmen and the mystics of the Gothic and the Vedicas of the Homeric 21 and the early Arabian centuries. With the setting in of the late period, and not earlier, philosophy becomes urban and worldly, frees itself from subservience to religion and even dares to make that religion itself the object of epistemological criticism. The great theme of Brahman, Ionic and Baroque philosophies is the problem of knowing. The urban spirit turns to look at itself, in order to establish the proposition that there is no higher judgment seat of knowing beyond itself, and with that thought draws nearer to higher mathematics and instead of priests we have men of the world statesmen and merchants and discoverers, tested in high places and by high tasks, whose ideas about thought rest upon deep experience of life. Of such are the series of great thinkers from Thales to Protagoras and from Bacon to Hume, and the series of pre-Confucian and pre-Buddha thinkers of whom we hardly know more than the fact that they existed. At the end of such series stand Kant and Aristotle, 22 and after them the set in the civilization philosophies. In every culture, thought mounts to a climax, setting the questions at the outset and answering them with ever-increasing force of intellectual expression, and, as we have said before, ornamental significance, until exhausted, and then it passes into a decline in which the problems of knowing are in every respect stale repetitions of no significance. There is a metaphysical period, originally of a religious and finally of a rationalistic caste, in which thought and life still contain something of chaos, an unexploited fund that enables them effectively to create, and an ethical period in which life itself, now become megalopolitan, appears to call for inquiry and has to turn the still available remainder of philosophical creative power onto its own conduct and maintenance. In the one period life reveals itself, the other has life as its object. The one is theoretical, contemplative, in the grand sense, the other perforce practical. Even the Kantian system is in its deepest characters contemplated in the first instance and only afterwards logically and systematically formulated and ordered. We see this evidenced in Kant's attitude to mathematics. No one is a genuine metaphysician who has not penetrated into the form world of numbers, who has not lived them into himself as a symbolism. And in fact it was the great thinkers of the Baroque who created the analytical mathematic, and the same is true mutatis mutandis, of the great pre-Socratics and Plato. Descartes and Leibniz stand beside Newton and Gauss, Pythagoras and Plato by Archytas and Archimedes, at the summits of mathematical development. But already in Kant the philosopher has become, as mathematician, negligible. Kant no more penetrated to the last subtleties of the calculus as it stood in his own day than he absorbed the axiomatic of Leibniz. The same may be said of Aristotle and thenceforward there is no philosopher who is counted as a mathematician. Fichte, Hegel and the Romantics were entirely unmathematical, and so was Eno 23 and Epicurus. Schopenhauer in this field is weak to the point of crudity, and of Nietzsche the less said the better. When the form world of numbers passed out of its ken, philosophy lost a great convention, and since then it has lacked not only structural strength but also what may be called the grand style of thinking. Schopenhauer himself admitted that he was a hand-to-mouth thinker, Jelgin Hznka. With the decline of metaphysics, 
ethics has outgrown its status as a subordinate element in abstract theory. Henceforth it is philosophy, the other divisions being absorbed into it and practical living becoming the center of consideration. The passion of pure thought sinks down. Metaphysics, mistress yesterday, is handmade now, all it is required to do is to provide a foundation for practical views. And the foundation becomes more and more superfluous. It becomes the custom to despise and mock at the metaphysical, the unpractical, the philosophy of stone for bread. In Schopenhauer it is for the sake of the fourth book that the first three exist at all. Kant merely thought that it was the same with him, in reality, pure and not applied reason is still his center of creation. There is exactly the same difference in classical philosophy before and after Aristotle, on the one hand, a grandly conceived cosmos to which a formal ethic adds almost nothing, and, on the other, ethics as such, as program, as necessity with a desultory ad hoc metaphysic for basis. And the entire absence of logical scruple with which Nietzsche, for instance, dashes off such theories makes no difference whatever to our appreciation of his philosophy proper. It is well known 24 that Schopenhauer did not proceed to pessimism from his metaphysic but, on the contrary, was led to develop his system by the pessimism that fell upon him in his seventeenth year. Sure, a most significant witness, observes in his quintessence of Ibsen is that one may quite well accept Schopenhauer's philosophy and reject his metaphysics, therein quite accurately discriminating between that which makes him the first thinker of the new age and that which is included because an obsolete tradition held it to be indispensable in a complete philosophy. No one would undertake to divide Kant thus, and the attempt would not succeed if it were made. But with Nietzsche one has no difficulty in perceiving that his philosophy was through and through an inner and very early experience while he covered his metaphysical requirements rapidly and often imperfectly by the aid of a few books, and never managed to state even his ethical theory with any exactitude. Just the same overlay of living seasonable ethical thought on a stratum of metaphysics required by convention, but in fact superfluous, is to be found in Epicurus and the Stoics. We need have no doubt after this as to what is the essence of a civilization philosophy. Strict metaphysics has exhausted its possibilities. The world city has definitely overcome the land, and now its spirit fashions a theory proper to itself, directed of necessity outward, soulless. Henceforward, we might with some justice replace the word soul by the word brain. And, since in the Western brain the will to power, the tyrannical set towards the future and purpose to organize everybody and everything, demands practical expression, ethics, as it loses touch more and more with its metaphysical past, steadily assumes a social ethical and social economic character. The philosophy of the present that starts from Hegel and Schopenhauer is, so far as it represents the spirit of the age, which, for example, Lotz and Herbart do not, a critique of society. The attention that the Stoic gave to his own body, the Westerner devotes to the body social. It is not chance that Hegelian philosophy has given rise to socialism, Marx, Engels, to anarchism, Stirner, and to the problem posing social drama, Hebel. Socialism is political economy converted into the ethical and, moreover, the imperative mood. So long as a metaphysic existed, that is, till Kant, political economy remained a science. But as soon as philosophy became synonymous with practical ethics, it replaced mathematics as the basis of thought about the world, hence the importance of cousin, Bentham, Kant, Mill and Spencer. To choose his material at will is not given to the philosopher, neither is the material of philosophy always and everywhere the same. There are no eternal questions, but only questions arising out of the feelings of a particular being and posed by it. Alsverg Englisch ist näher Englisch nies applies also to every genuine philosophy as the intellectual expression of this being, as the actualization of spiritual possibilities in a form world of concepts, judgments and thought structures comprised in the living phenomenon of its author. Any and every such philosophy is, from the first word to the last, from its most abstract proposition to its most telltale trait of personality, a thing become, mirrored over from soul into world, 
from the realm of freedom into that of necessity, from the immediate living into the dimensional logical, and on that very account it is mortal, and its life has prescribed rhythm and duration. The choice of them, therefore, is subject to strict necessity. Each epoch has its own, important for itself and for no other epoch. It is the mark of the born philosopher that he sees his epoch and his theme with a sure eye. Apart from this, there is nothing of any importance in philosophical production, merely technical knowledge and the industry requisite for the building up of systematic and conceptual subtleties. Consequently, the distinctive philosophy of the 19th century is only ethics and social critique in the productive sense, nothing more. And consequently, again, its most important representatives, apart from actual practitioners, are the dramatists. They are the real philosophers of Faustian activism, and compared with them not one of the lecture room philosophers and systematics counts at all. All that these unimportant pedants have done for us is, to write and rewrite the history of philosophy, and what history, collections of dates and results so that no one today knows what the history of philosophy is or what it might be. Thanks to this, the deep organic unity in the thought of this epoch has never yet been perceived. The essence of it, from the philosophical point of view, can be precised by asking the question, in how far is sure the pupil and fulfiller of Nietzsche? The question is put in no ironic spirit. Shaw is the one thinker of eminence who has consistently advanced in the same direction as that of the true Nietzsche, namely, productive criticism of the Western morale, while following out as poet the last implications of Ibsen and devoting the balance of the artistic creativeness that is in him to practical discussions. Save in so far as the belated romanticist in him has determined the style, sound and attitude of his philosophy. Nietzsche is in every respect a disciple of the materialistic decades. That which drew him with such passion to Schopenhauer was, not that he himself or anyone else was conscious of it, that element of Schopenhauer's doctrine by which he destroyed the great metaphysic and, without meaning to do so, parodied his master Kant, that is to say, the modification of all deep ideas of the Baroque age into tangible and mechanistic notions. Kant speaks in inadequate words, which hide a mighty and scarcely apprehensible intuition, an intuition of the world as appearance or phenomenon. In Schopenhauer this becomes the world as brain phenomenon, Gehirn phenomenon. The changeover from tragic philosophy to philosophical plebanism is complete. It will be enough to cite one passage. In the world as will and idea Schopenhauer says, the will, as thing in itself, constitutes the inner, true and indestructible essence of the man, in itself, however, it is without consciousness. For the consciousness is conditioned by the intellect and this is a mere accident of our being, since it is a function of the brain, and that again, with its dependent nerves and spinal cord, is a mere fruit, a product, nay, even a parasite of the rest of the organism, inasmuch as it does not intervene directly in the latter's activities but only serves a purpose of self-preservation by regulating its relations with the outer world. Here we have exactly the fundamental position of the flattest materialism. It was not for nothing that Schopenhauer, like Rousseau before him, studied the English sensualists. From them he learned to misread Kant in the spirit of megalopolitan utilitarian modernity. The intellect as instrument of the will to life, 25 as weapon in the struggle for existence, the ideas brought to grotesque expression by Shaw in Man and Superman, it was because this was his view of the world that Schopenhauer became the fashionable philosopher when Darwin's main work was published in 1859. In contrast to Schelling, Hegel and Fichte, he was a philosopher, and the only philosopher, whose metaphysical propositions could be absorbed with ease by intellectual mediocrity. The clarity of which he was so proud threatened at every moment to reveal itself as triviality. While retaining enough of formula to produce an atmosphere of profundity and exclusiveness, he presented the civilized view of the world complete and assimilable. His system is anticipated Darwinism, and the speech of Kant and the concepts of the Indians are simply clothing. In his book Aberdeen Willen in Der Natur, 1835, 
we find already the struggle for self-preservation in nature, the human intellect as master weapon in that struggle and sexual love as unconscious selection according to biological interest. 26. It is the view that Darwin, via Malthus, brought to bear with irresistible success in the field of zoology. The economic origin of Darwinism is shown by the fact that the system deduced from the similarities between men and the higher animals ceases to fit even at the level of the plant world and becomes positively absurd as soon as it is seriously attempted to apply it with its will tendency, natural selection, mimicry, to primitive organic forms. Proof, to the Darwinian means the ordering and pictorial presentation of a selection of facts so that they conform to his historico-dynamic basic feeling of evolution. Darwinism, that is to say, that totality of very varied and discrepant ideas, in which the common factor is merely the application of the causality principle to living things, which therefore is a method and not a result, was known in all details to the 18th century. Rousseau was championing the ape-man theory as early as 1754. What Darwin originated is only the Manchester school system, and it is this latent political element in it that accounts for its popularity. The spiritual unity of the century is manifest enough here. From Schopenhauer to Schur, everyone has been, without being aware of it, bringing the same principle into form. Everyone, including even those who, like Hebel, knew nothing of Darwin, is a derivative of the evolution idea, and of the shallow civilized and not the deep Goethean form of it at that, whether he issues it with a biological or an economic imprint. There is evolution, too, in the evolution idea itself, which is Faustian through and through, which displays, in sharpest contrast to Aristotle's timeless and tillishy idea, all our passionate urgency towards infinite future, our will and sense of aim which is so imminent in, so specific to, the Faustian spirit as to be the a priori form rather than the discovered principle of our nature picture. And in the evolution of evolution we find the same change taking place as elsewhere, the turn of the culture to the civilization. In Goethe evolution is upright, in Darwin it is flat, in Goethe organic, in Darwin mechanical, in Goethe an experience and emblem in Darwin a matter of cognition and law. To Goethe evolution meant inward fulfillment, to Darwin it meant progress. Darwin's struggle for existence, which he read into nature and not out of it, is only the plebeian form of that primary feeling which in Shakespeare's tragedies moves the great realities against one another, but what Shakespeare inwardly saw, felt and actualized in his figures as destiny, Darwinism comprehends as causal connection and formulates as a superficial system of utilities. And it is this system and not this primary feeling that is the basis of the utterances of Zarathustra, the tragedy of ghosts, the problems of the ring of the Nibelungs. Only, it was with terror that Schopenhauer, the first of his line, perceived what his own knowledge meant, that is the root of his pessimism, and the Tristan music of his adherent Wagner is its highest expression, whereas the late men, and foremost among them Nietzsche, face it with enthusiasm, though it is true, the enthusiasm is sometimes rather forced. Nietzsche's breach with Wagner, that last product of the German spirit over which greatness broods, marks his silent change of school allegiance, his unconscious step from Schopenhauer to Darwin from the metaphysical to the physiological formulation of the same world feeling, from the denial to the affirmation of the aspect that in fact is common to both, the one seeing as will to life what the other regards as struggle for existence. In his Schopenhauer E.L.S. he still means by evolution an inner ripening, but the superman is the product of evolution as machinery. And Zarathustra is ethically the outcome of an unconscious protest against Parsifal which artistically entirely governs it, of the rivalry of one evangelist for another. But Nietzsche was also a socialist without knowing it. Not his catchwords, but his instincts, were socialistic, practical, directed to that welfare of mankind that Goethe and Kant never spent a thought upon. Materialism, socialism and Darwinism are only artificially and on the surface separable. It was this that made it possible for Shaw in the third act of Man and Superman, one of the most important and significant of the works that issued from the transition, to obtain, 
by giving just a small and indeed perfectly logical turn to the tendencies of master morale and the production of the superman, the specific maxims of his own socialism. Here Shaw was only expressing with remorseless clarity and full consciousness of the commonplace, what the uncompleted portion of the Zarathustra would have said with Wagnerian theatricality and woolly romanticism. All that we are concerned to discover in Nietzsche's reasoning is its practical basis and consequences, which proceed of necessity from the structure of modern public life. He moves amongst vague ideas like new values, Superman, Schindererd, and declines or fears to shape them more precisely. Sure does it. Nietzsche observes that the Darwinian idea of the Superman evokes the notion of breeding, and stops there leaves it at a sounding phrase. Sure pursues the question, for there is no object in talking about it if nothing is going to be done about it, asks how it is to be achieved, and from that comes to demand the transformation of mankind into a stud farm. But this is merely the conclusion implicit in the Zarathustra, which Nietzsche was not bold enough, or was too fastidious, to draw. If we do talk of systematic breeding, a completely materialistic and utilitarian notion, we must be prepared to answer the questions, who shall breed what, where and how? But Nietzsche, too romantic to face the very prosaic social consequences and to expose poetic ideas to the test of facts, omits to say that his whole doctrine, as a derivative of Darwinism, presupposes socialism and, moreover, socialistic compulsion as the means, that any systematic breeding of a class of higher men requires as condition precedent a strictly socialistic ordering of society, and that this Dionysiac idea, as it involves a common action and is not simply the private affair of detached thinkers, is democratic, turn it how you may. It is the climax of the ethical force of thou shalt, to impose upon the world the form of his will. Faustian man sacrifices even himself. The breeding of the superman follows from the notion of selection. Nietzsche was an unconscious pupil of Darwin from the time that he wrote aphorisms, but Darwin himself had remolded the evolution ideas of the 18th century according to the Malthusian tendencies of political economy, which he projected on the higher animal world. Malthus had studied the cotton industry in Lancashire and already in 1857 we have the whole system, only applied to men instead of to beasts, in Buckle's history of English civilization. In other words, the master morale of this last of the romantics is derived, strangely perhaps but very significantly, from that source of all intellectual modernity, the atmosphere of the English factory. The Machiavellism that commended itself to Nietzsche as a Renaissance phenomenon is something closely one would have supposed, obviously, akin to Darwin's notion of mimicry. It is in fact that of which Marx, that other famous disciple of Malthus, treats in his Das Kapital, the Bible of political, not ethical, socialism.27 that is the genealogy of Homeral. The will to power, transferred to the realistic, political and economic domain, finds its expression in Shaw's Major Barbara. No doubt Nietzsche, as a personality, stands at the culmination of this series of ethical philosophers, but here sure the party politician reaches up to his level as a thinker. The will to power is today represented by the two poles of public life, the worker class and the big money and brain men, far more effectually than it ever was by a Borgia. The millionaire undershaft of Shaw's best comedy is a superman, though Nietzsche the romanticist would not have recognized his ideal in such a figure. Nietzsche is forever speaking of transvaluations of all values, of a philosophy of the future, which, incidentally, is merely the Western, and not the Chinese or the African future, but when the mists of his thought do come in from the Dionysiac distance and condense into any tangible form, the will to power appears to him in the guise of dagger and poison and never in that of strike and deal. And yet he says that the idea first came to him when he saw the Prussian regiments marching to battle in 1870. The drama, in this epoch, is no longer poetry in the old sense of the culture days, but a form of agitation, debate and demonstration. The stage has become a moralizing institution. Nietzsche himself often thought of putting his ideas in the dramatic form. 
Wagner's Nibelung poetry, more especially the first draft of it, 1850, expresses his social revolutionary ideas, and even when, after a circuitous course under influences artistic and non-artistic, he has completed the ring, his Siegfried is still a symbol of the fourth estate. His Brunhilde is still the free woman. The sexual selection of which the origin of species enunciated the theory in 1859, was finding its musical expression at the very same time in the third act of Siegfried and in Tristan. It is no accident that Wagner, Hebel and Ibsen, all practically simultaneously, set to work to dramatize the Nibelung material. Hebel, making the acquaintance in Paris of Engels's writings, expresses, in a letter of April 2, 1844, his surprise at finding that his own conceptions of the social principle of his age, which he was then intending to exemplify in a drama Zuijen Diner Zeet, coincided precisely with those of the future Communist Manifesto. And, upon first making the acquaintance of Schopenhauer, letter of March 29, 1857, he is equally surprised by the affinity that he finds between the Welt als Will und Vorstellung and tendencies upon which he had based his Holophonies and his Herods und Mariami. Hebel's diaries, of which the most important portion belongs to the years 1835 to 1845, were, though he did not know it, one of the deepest philosophical efforts of the century. It would be no surprise to find whole sentences of it in Nietzsche who never knew him and did not always come up to his level. The actual and effective philosophy of the nineteenth century, then, has as its one genuine theme the will to power. It considers this will to power in civilized intellectual, ethical, or social forms and presents it as will to life, as life force, as practical dynamical principle, as idea, and as dramatic figure. The period that is closed by Shaw corresponds to the period 350-250 in the classical, the rest of the 19th century philosophy is, to use Schopenhauer's phrase, professors philosophy by philosophy professors. The real landmarks are these. 1819. Schopenhauer, Die Welt als Will und Vorstellung. The will to life is for the first time put as the only reality, original force, a craft, but, older idealist influences still being potent, it is put there to be negatived, Zervern in unimpfolen. 1836. Schopenhauer, Aber den Willen in der Natur. Anticipation of Darwinism, but in metaphysical disguise. 1840. Proudhon, Quist scale appropriate, basis of anarchism. Kant, cause de philosophy positive, the formula order and progress. 1841. Hebel, Judith, first dramatic conception of the new woman and the superman. Feuerbach, Das Wesen des Chrysanthems. 1844. Engels, Umriss einer Kritik des National Economy, foundation of the materialistic conception of history. Hebel, Maria Magdalena, the first social drama. 1847. Marx, Misere de la Philosophie. Synthesis of Hagel and Malthus. These are the epochal years in which economics begins to dominate social ethic and biology. 1848. Wagner's death of Siegfried, Siegfried as social ethical revolutionary, the Fafner Horde's symbol of capitalism. 1850. Wagner's constant glimmer, the sexual problem. 1850-1858. Wagner's Hebel's and Ibsen's Nibelung poetry. 1859, Year of Symbolic Coincidences. Darwin, Origin of Species, Application of Economics to Biology. Wagner's Tristan. Marx, Zur Kritik der Politis and Economy. 1863. J. S. Mill, Utilitarianism. 1865. During, Work de Lebens a work which is rarely heard of, but which exercised the greatest influence upon the succeeding generation. 1867. Ibsen, Brand. Marx, Das Kapital. 1878. Wagner, Parsifal. First dissolution of materialism into mysticism. 
1879. Ibsen, Nora. 1881. Nietzsche, Moore Jean Roth, Transition from Schopenhauer to Darwin, Morale as Biological Phenomenon. 1883. Nietzsche, also Sprach Zarathustra, The Will to Power, but in Romantic Disguise. 1886. Ibsen, Ros Mersham. Nietzsche, Genst von Gut und Bose. 1887-8. Strindberg, Fadren and Froken and Julie. From 1890 the conclusion of the epoch approaches. The religious works of Strindberg and the symbolical of Ibsen. 1896. Ibsen, John Gabriel Borkman. Nietzsche, Abermensch. 1898. Strindberg, Till Damascus. From 1900 the last phenomena. 1903. Ninja, Jeshlukton Charakta, the only serious attempt to revive Kant within this epoch, by referring him to Wagner and Ibsen. 1903. Sure, Man and Superman, Final Synthesis of Darwin and Nietzsche. 1905. Sure, Major Barbara, the type of the Superman referred back to its economic origins. With this, the ethical period exhausts itself as the metaphysical had done. Ethical socialism, prepared by Fichte, Hegel, and Humboldt, was at its zenith of passionate greatness about the middle of the 19th century, and at the end thereof it had reached the stage of repetitions. The 20th century, while keeping the word socialism, has replaced an ethical philosophy that only Epigoni supposed to be capable of further development by a praxis of economic everyday questions. The ethical disposition of the West will remain socialistic but its theory has ceased to be a problem. And there remains the possibility of a third and last stage of Western philosophy, that of a physiognomic skepticism. The secret of the world appears successively as a knowledge problem, a valuation problem and a form problem. Kant saw ethics as an object of knowledge. The 19th century saw it as an object of valuation. The skeptic would deal with both simply as their historical expression of a culture. Chapter 11. Faustian and Apollonine. Nature Knowledge. I. Helmholtz observed, in a lecture of 1869 that has become famous, that the final aim of natural science is to discover the motions underlying all alteration, and the motive forces thereof that is, to resolve itself into mechanics. What this resolution into mechanics means is the reference of all qualitative impressions to fixed quantitative base values, that is, to the extended and to change of place therein. It means, further, if we bear in mind the opposition of becoming and become, form and law, image and notion, the referring of the seen nature picture to the imagined picture of a single numerically and structurally measurable order. The specific tendency of all Western mechanics is towards an intellectual conquest by measurement, and it is therefore obliged to look for the essence of the phenomenon in a system of constant elements that are susceptible of full and inclusive appreciation by measurement, of which Helmholtz distinguishes motion, using the word in its everyday sense, as the most important. To the physicist this definition appears unambiguous and exhaustive, but to the skeptic who has followed out the history of this scientific conviction, it is very far from being either. To the physicist, present-day mechanics is a logical system of clear, uniquely significant concepts and of simple, necessary relations, while to the other it is a picture distinctive of the structure of the West European spirit though he admits that the picture is consistent in the highest degree and most impressively convincing. It is self-evident that no practical results and discoveries can prove anything as to the truth of the theory. The picture dot one for most people, indeed, mechanics appears as the self-evident synthesis of nature impressions. But it merely appears to be so. For what is motion? Is not the postulate that everything qualitative is reducible to the motion of unalterably alike mass points, essentially Faustian and not common to humanity? Archimedes, for example, did not feel himself obliged to transpose the mechanics that he saw into a mental picture of motions. Is motion generally a purely mechanical quantity? 
Is it a word for a visual experience or is it a notion derived from that experience? Is it the number that is found by measurement of experimentally produced facts, or the picture that is subjected to that number, that is signified by it? And if one day physics should really succeed in reaching its supposed aim, in devising a system of law governed motions and of efficient forces behind them into which everything whatsoever appreciable by the senses could be fitted, would it thereby have achieved knowledge of that which occurs, or even made one step towards this achievement? Yet is the former language of mechanics one whit the less dogmatic on that account? Is it not, on the contrary, a vessel of the myth like the root words, not proceeding from experience but shaping it and, in this case, shaping it with all possible rigor? What is force? What is a cause? What is a process? Nay, even on the basis of its own definitions, has physics a specific problem at all? Has it an object that counts as such for all the centuries? Has it even one unimpeachable imagination unit, with reference to which it may express its results? The answer may be anticipated. Modern physics, as a science, is an immense system of indices in the form of names and numbers whereby we are enabled to work with nature as with a machine. As such, it may have an exactly definable end. But as a piece of history, all made up of destinies and incidents in the lives of the men who have worked in it and in the course of research itself, physics is, in point of object, methods and results like an expression and actualization of a culture, an organic and evolving element in the essence of that culture, and every one of its results is a symbol. That which physics, which exists only in the waking consciousness of the culture man, thinks it finds in its methods and in its results was already there underlying and implicit in, the choice and manner of its search. Its discoveries, in virtue of their imagined content, as distinguished from their printable formulas, have been of a purely mythic nature, even in minds so prudent as those of J. B. Meyer, Faraday and Hertz. In every nature law, physically exact as it may be, we are called upon to distinguish between the nameless number and the naming of it between the plain fixation of limits and their theoretical interpretation. The formulas represent general logical values, pure numbers, that is to say, objective space, and boundary elements. But formulas are dumb. The expression s equals one half gt2 means nothing at all unless one is able mentally to connect the letters with particular words and their symbolism. But the moment we clothe the dead signs in such words, give them flesh, body and life, and, in sum, a perceptible significance in the world, we have overstepped the limits of a mere order. Means image, vision, and it is this that makes a nature law out of a figure and letter formula. Everything exact is in itself meaningless, and every physical observation is so constituted that it proves the basis of a certain number of imaged presuppositions and the effect of its successful issue is to make these presuppositions more convincing than ever. Apart from these, the result consists merely of empty figures. But in fact we do not and cannot get apart from them. Even if an investigator puts on one side every hypothesis that he knows as such, as soon as he sets his thought to work on the supposedly clear task, he is not controlling but being controlled by the unconscious form of it, for in living activity he is always a man of his culture, of his age, of his school and of his tradition. Faith and knowledge are only two species of inner certitude, but of the two faith is the older and it dominates all the conditions of knowing, be they never so exact. And thus it is theories and not pure numbers that are the support of all natural science. The unconscious longing for that genuine science which, be it repeated, is peculiar to the spirit of culture man sets itself to apprehend, to penetrate, and to comprise within its grasp the world image of nature. Mere industrious measuring for measuring's sake is not and never has been more than a delight for little minds. Numbers may only be the key of the secret, no more. No significant man would ever have spent himself on them for their own sake. Kant, it is true, says in a well-known passage, I maintain that in each and every discipline of natural philosophy it is only possible to find as much of true science as is to be found of mathematics therein. 
what Kant has in mind here is pure delimitation in the field of the become, so far as law and formula, number and system can, at any particular stage, be seen in that field. But a law without words, a law, consisting merely of a series of figures read off an instrument, cannot even as an intellectual operation be completely effective in this pure state. Every savant's experiment, be it what it may, is at the same time an instance of the kind of symbolism that rules in the savant's ideation. All laws formulated in words are orders that have been activated and vitalized, filled with the very essence of the one, and only the one, culture. As to the necessity which is a postulate in all exact research, here too we have to consider two kinds of necessity, viz, a necessity within the spiritual and living, for it is destiny that the history of every individual research act takes its course when, where and how it does, and a necessity within the known, for which the current western name is causality. If the pure numbers of a physical formula represent a causal necessity, the existence, the birth and the life duration of a theory are a destiny. Every fact, even the simplest, contains ab initio a theory. A fact is a uniquely occurring impression upon a waking being, and everything depends on whether that being, the being for whom it occurs or did occur, is or was classical or western, gothic or baroque. Compare the effect produced by a flash of lightning on a sparrow and on an alert physical investigator and think how much more is contained in the observer's fact than in the sparrows. The modern physicist is too ready to forget that even words like quantity, position, process, change of state and body represent specifically western images. These words excite and these images mirror a feeling of significances, too subtle for verbal description, incommunicable to classical or to imagine or to other mankind as like subtleties of their thought and feeling are incommunicable to us. And the character of scientific facts as such, that is, the mode of their becoming known, is completely governed by this feeling, and if so, then also a forty or I such intricate intellectual notions as work, tension, quantity of energy, quantity of heat, probability comma to every one of which contains a veritable scientific myth of its own. We think of such conceptual images as ensuing from quite unprejudiced research and, subject to certain conditions, definitively valid. But a first-rate scientist of the time of Archimedes would have declared himself, after a thorough study of our modern theoretical physics, quite unable to comprehend how anyone could assert such arbitrary grotesque and involved notions to be science, still less how they could be claimed as necessary consequences from actual facts. The scientifically justified conclusions, he would have said, are really so and so, and thereupon he would have evolved, on the basis of the same elements made facts by his eyes and his mind, theories that our physicists would listen to with amazed ridicule. For what, after all? are the basic notions that have been evolved with inward certainty of logic in the field of our physics. Polarized light rays, errant ions, flying and colliding gas particles, magnetic fields, electric currents and waves, are they not one and all Faustian visions, closely akin to Romanesque ornamentation? The upthrust of Gothic architecture, the Vikings voyaging into unknown seas, the longings of Columbus and Copernicus, did not this world of forms and pictures grow up in perfect tune with the contemporary arts of perspective oil painting and instrumental music? Are they not, in short, our passionate directedness, our passion of the third dimension, coming to symbolic expression in the imagined nature picture as in the soul image? 2. It follows then that all knowing of nature, even the exactest, is based on a religious faith. The pure mechanics that the physicist has set before himself as the end form to which it is his task, and the purpose of all this imagination machinery, to reduce nature, presupposes a dogma, namely, the religious world picture of the Gothic centuries. For it is from this world picture that the physics peculiar to the Western intellect is derived. There is no science that is without unconscious presuppositions of this kind over which the researcher has no control and which can be traced back to the earliest days of the awakening culture. There is no natural science without a precedent religion. 
In this point there is no distinction between the Catholic and the materialistic views of the world, both say the same thing in different words. Even atheistic science as religion, modern mechanics exactly reproduces the contemplativeness of faith. When the Ionic reaches its height in Thales or the Baroque in Bacon, and man has come to the urban stage of his career, his self-assurance begins to look upon critical science, in contrast to the more primitive religion of the countryside, as the superior attitude towards things, and, holding as he thinks the only key to real knowledge, to explain religion itself empirically and psychologically, in other words, to conquer it with the rest. Now, the history of the higher cultures shows that science is a transitory spectacle, belonging only to the autumn and winter of their life course, and that in the cases of the classical, the Indian, the Chinese and the Arabian thought alike a few centuries suffice for the complete exhaustion of its possibilities. Classical science faded out between the Battle of Cannae and that of Actium and made way for the world outlook of the second religiousness. And from this it is possible to foresee a date at which our Western scientific thought shall have reached the limit of its evolution. There is no justification for assigning to this intellectual form world the primacy over others. Every critical science, like every myth and every religious belief, rests upon an inner certitude. Various as the creatures of this certitude may be, both in structure and in sound, they are not different in basic principle. Any reproach, therefore, leveled by natural science at religion is a boomerang. We are presumptuous and no less in supposing that we can ever set up the truth in the place of anthropomorphic conceptions, for no other conceptions but these exist at all. Every idea that is possible at all is a mirror of the being of its author. The statement that man created God in his own image, valid for every historical religion, is not less valid for every physical theory however firm its reputed basis of fact. Classical scientists conceived of light as consisting in corporeal particles proceeding from the source of light to the eye of the beholder. For the Arabian thought, even at the stage of the Jewish Persian academies of Edessa, Risena and Pombaditha, and for Porphyry too, the colors and forms of things were evidenced without the intervention of a medium being brought in a magic and spiritual way to the seeing power which was conceived as substantial and resident in the eyeball. This was the doctrine three taught by Ibn al-Hayyatan, by Avicenna and by the brothers of sincerity. For and the idea of light as a force, an impetus, was current even from about 1300 amongst the Paris alchemists who centered on Albert of Saxony, Buridan and Orr as the discoverer of coordinate geometry. Each culture has made its own set of images of processes, which are true only for itself and only alive while it is itself alive and actualizing its possibilities. When a culture is at its end in the creative element, the imaginative power, the symbolism, is extinct. There are left empty formulas, skeletons of dead systems, which men of another culture read literally, feel to be without meaning or value and either mechanically store up or else despise and forget numbers, formulas, laws mean nothing and are nothing. They must have a body, and only a living mankind, projecting its livingness into them and through them, expressing itself by them, inwardly making them its own, can endow them with that. And thus there is no absolute science of physics, but only individual sciences that come, flourish and go within the individual cultures. The nature of classical man found its highest artistic emblem in the nude statue, and out of it logically there grew up a static of bodies, a physics of the near. The Arabian culture owned the arabesque and the cavern vaulting of the mosque, and out of this world feeling there issued alchemy with its ideas of mysterious efficient substantialities like the philosophical mercury, which is neither a material nor a property but something that underlies the colored existence of metals and can transmute one metal into another. Five and the outcome of Faustian man's nature idea was a dynamic of unlimited span, a physics of the distant. To the classical therefore belong the conceptions of matter and form, to the Arabian, quite spinozistically, the idea of substances with visible or secret attributes, comma six, and to the Faustian the idea of force and mass. Apollinian theory is a quiet meditation, 
imagine a silent knowledge of alchemy the means of grace, even here the religious source of mechanics is to be discerned, and the Faustian is from the very outset a working hypothesis. The Greek asked, what is the essence of visible being? We ask, what possibility is there of mastering the invisible motive forces of becoming? For them, contented absorption in the visible, for us, masterful questioning of nature in methodical experiment. As with the formulation of problems and the methods of dealing with them, so also with the basic concepts. They are symbols in each case of the one and only the one culture. The classical root words comma 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 are not translatable into our speech. To render by prime stuff is to eliminate its Apollonian connotation, to make the hollow shell of the word sound an alien note. That which classical man saw before him as motion in space, he understood as comma change of position of bodies, we, from the way in which we experience motion, have deduced the concept of a process, a going forward thereby expressing and emphasizing that element of directional energy which are thought necessarily predicates in the courses of nature. The classical critic of nature took the visible juxtaposition of states as the original diversity, and specified the famous four elements of empedocles, namely, earth as the rigid corporeal, water as the non-rigid corporeal and air as the incorporeal, together with fire which is so much the strongest of all optical impressions that the classical spirit could have no doubt of its bodileanness. The Arabian elements, on the contrary, are ideal and implicit in the secret constitutions and constellations which define the phenomenon of things for the eye. If we try to get a little nearer to this feeling, we shall find that the opposition of rigid and fluid means something quite different for the Syrian from what it means for the Aristotelian Greek the latter seeing in it different degrees of bodileness and the former different magic attributes. With the former therefore arises the image of the chemical element as a sort of magic substance that a secret causality makes to appear out of things, and to vanish into them again, and which is subject even to the influence of the stars. In alchemy there is deep scientific doubt as to the plastic actuality of things, of the summer to of Greek mathematicians, physicists and poets, and it dissolves and destroys the soma in the hope of finding its essence. It is an iconoclastic movement just as truly as those of Islam and the Byzantine Bogomils were so. It reveals a deep disbelief in the tangible figure of phenomenal nature, the figure of her that to the Greek was sacrosanct. The conflict concerning the person of Christ which manifested itself in all the early councils and led to the Nestorian and Monophysite secessions is an alchemistic problem. It would never have occurred to a classical physicist to investigate things while at the same time denying or annihilating their perceivable form. And for that very reason there was no classical chemistry, any more than there was any theorizing on the substance as against the manifestations of Apollo. The rise of a chemical method of the Arabian style betokens a new world consciousness. The discovery of it, which at one blow made an end of Apollonian natural science, of mechanical statics, is linked with the enigmatic name of Hermes Trismegistus, 7 who is supposed to have lived in Alexandria at the same time as Flatinus and Diophantus. Similarly it was just at the time of the definite emancipation of the Western mathematic by Newton and Leibniz that the Western chemistry ate was freed from Arabic form by Stahl, 1660-1734, and his phlogiston theory. Chemistry and mathematic alike became pure analysis. Already Paracelsus, 1493-1541 had transformed the Magian effort to make gold into a pharmaceutical science, a transformation in which one cannot but surmise an altered world feeling. Then Robert Boyle, 1626-1691, devised the analytical method and with it the Western conception of the element. But the ensuing changes must not be misinterpreted. That which is called the founding of modern chemistry and has Stahl and Lavoisier at its turning points is anything but a building up of chemical ideas, insofar as chemistry implies the alchemistic outlook on nature. It is in fact the end of genuine chemistry, its dissolution into the comprehensive system of pure dynamic, its assimilation into the mechanical outlook which the Baroque age had established through Galileo and Newton. 
the elements of empedocles designate states of bodiliness, bizaic nine corpolish is such verholten, but the elements of Lavoisier, whose combustion theory followed promptly upon the isolation of oxygen in 1771, designate energy systems accessible to human will, rigid and fluid becoming mere terms to describe tension relations between molecules. By our analysis and synthesis, nature is not merely asked or persuaded but forced. The modern chemistry is a chapter of the modern physics of deed. What we call statics, chemistry and dynamics, words that as used in modern science are merely traditional distinctions without deeper meaning, are really the respective physical systems of the Apollonian, Magian and Faustian souls each of which grew up in its own culture and was limited as to validity to the same. Corresponding to these sciences, each to each, we have the mathematics of Euclidean geometry, algebra and higher analysis, and the arts of statue, arabesque and fugue. We may differentiate these three kinds of physics, bearing in mind of course that other cultures may and in fact do give rise to other kinds by their standpoints towards the problem of motion, and call them mechanical orderings of states, secret forces and processes respectively. 3. Now, the tendency of human thought, which is always causally disposed, to reduce the image of nature to the simplest possible quantitative form units that can be got by causal reasoning, measuring and counting, in a word, by mechanical differentiation, leads necessarily in classical, Western and every other possible physics, to an atomic theory. Of Indian and Chinese science we know hardly more than the fact they once existed, and the Arabian is so complicated that even now it seems to defy presentation. But we do know our own and the Apollonian sciences well enough to observe, here too, a deeply symbolical opposition. The classical atoms are miniature forms, the Western minimal quanta, and quanta, too, of energy on the one hand perceptibility, sensuous nearness, and on the other, abstractness are the basic conditions of the idea. The atomistic notions of modern physics, which include not only the Daltonian or chemical atom but also the electrons 9 and the quanta of thermodynamics, make more and more demands upon that truly Faustian power of inner vision which many branches of higher mathematics, such as the non-Euclidean geometries and the theory of groups, postulate and which is not at the disposal of laymen. A quantum of action is an extension element conceived without regard to sensible quality of any kind, which eludes all relation with sight and touch, for which the expression shape has no meaning whatever, something therefore which would be utterly inconceivable to a classical researcher. Such, already, Waldner's is monad sten and such, superlatively are the constituents of Rutherford's picture of the atom as positively charged nucleus with planetary negative electrons, and of the picture that Neil Spoer has imagined by working these in with the quantum of Planck.11 the atoms of Leucippus and Democritus were different in form and magnitude, that is to say, they were purely plastic units, indivisible, as their name asserts, but only plastically indivisible. The atoms of Western physics, for which indivisibility has quite another meaning, resembled the figures and themes of music, their being or essence consisting in vibration and radiation, and their relation to the processes of nature being that of the motive to the movement. Classical physics examines the aspect, western the working, of these ultimate elements in the picture of the become, in the one, the basic notions are notions of stuff and form, in the other they are notions of capacity and intensity. There is a stoicism and there is a socialism of the atom. The words describing the static plastic and the dynamic contrapuntal ideas of it respectively. The relations of these ideas to the images of the corresponding ethics is such that every law and every definition takes these into account. On the one hand, Democritus is multitude of confused atoms, put there, patient knocked about by the blind chance that he as well as Sophocles called comma hunted like Oedipus. On the other hand, systems of abstract force points working in unison, aggressive, energetically dominating space, as field, overcoming resistances like Macbeth. The opposition of basic feelings makes that of the mechanical nature pictures. 
According to Leucippus the atoms fly about in the void of themselves, Democritus merely regards shock and counter-shock as a form of change of place. Aristotle explains individual movements as accidental, Empedocles speaks of love and hate, Anaxagoras of meetings and partings. All these are elements also of classical tragedy, the figures on the Attic stage are related to one another just so. Further, and logically, they are the elements of classical politics. There we have minute cities, political atoms ranged along coasts and on islands, each jealously standing for itself, yet ever needing support, shut in and shy to the point of absurdity, buffeted hither and thither by the planless orderless happenings of classical history, rising today and ruined tomorrow. And in contrast, the dynastic states of our 17th and 18th centuries, political fields of force, with cabinets and great diplomats as effective centers of purposeful direction and comprehensive vision. The spirit of classical history and the spirit of western history can only be really understood by considering the two souls as an opposition. And we can say the same of the atom idea, regarded as the basis of the respective physics. Galileo who created the concept of force and the Milesians who created that of Commodon Mocritus and Leibniz, Archimedes and Helmholtz, are contemporaries, members of the same intellectual phases of quite different cultures. But the inner relationship between atom theory and ethic goes further. It has been shown how the Faustian soul, whose being consists in the overcoming of presence, whose feeling is loneliness and whose yearning is infinity, puts its need of solitude, distance and abstraction into all its actualities, into its public life, its spiritual and its artistic form worlds alike. This pathos of distance, to use Nietzsche's expression, is peculiarly alien to the classical, in which everything human demanded nearness, support and community. It is this that distinguishes the spirit of the Baroque from that of the Ionic, the culture of the ancient regime from that of Periclean Athens. And this pathos, which distinguishes the heroic doer from the heroic sufferer, appears also in the picture of Western physics as tension. It is tension that is missing in the science of Democritus for in the principle of shock and counter-shock it is denied by implication that there is a force commanding space and identical with space. And, correspondingly, the element of will is absent from the classical soul image. Between classical men, or states, or views of the world, there was, for all the quarreling and envy and hatred, no inattention, no deep and urging need of distance, solitude, ascendancy and consequently there was none between the atoms of the cosmos either. The principle of tension, developed in the potential theory, which is wholly untranslatable into classical tongues and incommunicable to classical minds, has become for Western physics fundamental. Its content follows from the notion of energy, the will to power in nature, and therefore it is for us just as necessary as for the classical thought it is impossible. 4. Every atomic theory therefore, is a myth and not an experience. In it the culture, through the contemplative creative power of its great physicists, reveals its inmost essence and very self. It is only a preconceived idea of criticism that extension exists in itself and independently of the form feeling and world feeling of the knower. The thinker, in imagining that he can cut out the factor of life forgets that knowing is related to the known as direction is to extension and that it is only through the living quality of direction that what is felt extends into distance and depth and becomes space. The cognized structure of the extended is a projection of the cognizing being. We have already shown the decisive importance of the depth experience, which is identical with the awakening of a soul and therefore with the creation of the outer world belonging to that soul. The mere sense impression contains only length and breadth, and it is the living and necessary act of interpretation, which, like everything else living, possesses direction, motion and irreversibility. The qualities that our consciousness synthesizes in the word time, that adds depth and thereby fashions actuality and world. Life itself enters into the experiences as third dimension. The double meaning of the word far which refers both to future and to horizon, betrays the deeper meaning of this dimension, through which extension as such is evoked. 
the becoming stiffens and passes and is at once the become, life stiffens and passes and is at once the three-dimensional space of the known. It is common ground for Descartes and Parmenides that thinking and being, that is, imagined and extended, are identical. Cogito, ergo sum is simply the formulation of the depth experience, I cognize, and therefore I am in space. But in the style of this cognizing, and therefore of the cognition product, the prime symbol of the particular culture comes into play. The perfected extension of the classical consciousness is one of sensuous and bodily presence. The Western consciousness achieves extension, after its own fashion, as transcendental space, and as it thinks its space more and more transcendentally it develops by degrees the abstract polarity of capacity and intensity that so completely contrasts with the classical visual polarity of matter and form. But it follows from this that in the known there can be no reappearance of living time. For this has already passed into the known, into constant existence, as depth, and hence duration, that is, timelessness, and extension are identical. Only the knowing possesses the mark of direction. The application of the word time to the imaginary and measurable time dimension of physics is a mistake. The only question is whether it is possible or not to avoid the mistake. If one substitutes the word destiny for time in any physical enunciation, one feels at once that pure nature does not contain time. The form world of physics extends just as far as the cognate form world of number and notion extend, and we have seen that, notwithstanding Kant, there is not and cannot be the slightest relation of any sort between mathematical number and time. And yet this is controverted by the fact of motion in the picture of the world around. It is the unsolved and unsolvable problem of the elitics, being, or thinking, and motion are incompatible, motion is not, is only apparent. And here, for the second time, natural science becomes dogmatic and mythological. The words time and destiny, for anyone who uses them instinctively, touch life itself in its deepest depths life as a whole, which is not to be separated from lived experience. Physics, on the other hand, that is, the observing reason, must separate them. The livingly experienced in itself, mentally emancipated from the act of the observer and become object, dead, inorganic, rigid, is now nature, something open to exhaustive mathematical treatment. In this sense the knowledge of nature is an activity of measurement. All the same, we live even when we are observing and therefore the thing we are observing lives with us. The element in the nature picture in virtue of which it not merely from moment to moment is, but in a continuous flow with and around us becomes, is the copula of the waking consciousness and its world. This element is called movement, and it contradicts nature as a picture, but it represents the history of this picture. And therefore, as precisely as understanding is abstracted, by means of words, from feeling and mathematical space from light resistances, things, so also physical time is abstracted from the impression of motion. Physics investigates nature, and consequently it knows time only as a length. But the physicist lives in the midst of the history of this nature, and therefore he is forced to conceive motion as a mathematically determinable magnitude as a concretion of the pure numbers obtained in the experiment and written down in formulas. Physics, says Kirchhoff, is the complete and simple description of motions. That indeed has always been its object. But the question is one not of motions in the picture but of motions of the picture. Motion, in the nature of physics, is nothing else but that metaphysical something which gives rise to the consciousness of a succession. The known is timeless and alien to motion, its state of becomeness implies this. It is the organic sequence of knowns that gives the impression of emotion. The physicist receives the word as an impression not upon reason but upon the whole man, and the function of that man is not nature only but the whole world. And that is the world as history. Nature, then, is an expression of the culture in each instance. All physics is treatment of the motion problem in which the life problem itself is implicit, not as though it could one day be solved, but in spite of, nay because of, the fact that it is insoluble. 
the secret of motion awakens in man the apprehension of death. If, then, nature knowledge is a subtle kind of self-knowledge, nature understood as picture, as mirror of man, the attempt to solve the motion problem is an attempt of knowledge to get on the track of its own secret, its own destiny. V. Only physiognomic tact can, if creative, succeed in this, and in fact it has done so from time immemorial in the arts, particularly tragic poetry. It is the thinking man who is perplexed by movement, for the contemplative it is self-evident. And however completely the former can reduce his perplexities to system, the result is systematic and not physiognomic, pure extension logically and numerically ordered, nothing living but something become and dead. It is this that led Goethe, who was a poet and not a computer, to observe that nature has no system. It has life, it is life and succession from an unknown center to an unknowable born. For one who does not live it but knows it, nature has a system. But it is only a system and nothing more, and motion is a contradiction in it. The contradiction may be covered up by adroit formulation but it lives on in the fundamental concepts. The shock and counter-shock of Democritus, the entelechy of Aristotle, the notions of force from the impetus of 14th century chemists to the quantum theory of radiation, all contain it. Let the reader conceive of the motion within a physical system as the aging of that system, as in fact it is, as lived experience of the observer, and he will feel at once and distinctly the faithfulness imminent in the unconquerably organic content of, the word motion and all its derivative ideas. But mechanics, having nothing to do with aging, should have nothing to do with motion either, and consequently, since no scientific system is conceivable without a motion problem in it, a complete and self-contained mechanics is an impossibility. Somewhere or other there is always an organic starting point in the system where immediate life enters it, an umbilical cord that connects the mind child with the life mother, the thought with the thinker. This puts the fundamentals of Faustian and Apollinian nature science in quite another light. No nature is pure, there is always something of history in it. If the man is a historical, like the Greek, so that the totality of his impressions of the world is absorbed in a pure point formed present, his nature image is static, self-contained, that is, walled against past and future, in every individual moment. Time as magnitude figures in Greek physics as little as it does in Aristotle's entelechy idea. If, on the other hand, the man is historically constituted, the image formed is dynamic. Number the definitive evaluation of the become, is in the case of a historic man measure, and in that of the historical man function. One measures only what is present and one follows up only what has a past and a future, a course. And the effect of this difference is that the inner inconsistencies of the motion problem are covered up in classical theories and forced into the foreground in Western. History is eternal becoming and therefore eternal future nature is become and therefore eternally past. And here a strange inversion seems to have taken place. The becoming has lost its priority over the become. When the intellect looks back from its sphere, the become, the aspect of life is reversed, the idea of destiny which carries aim and future in it having turned into the mechanical principle of cause and effect of which the center of gravity lies in the past. The spatially experienced is promoted to rank above the temporal living, and time is replaced by a length in a spatial world system. And, since in the creative experience extension follows from direction, the spatial from life, the human understanding imports life as a process into the inorganic space of its imagination. While life looks on space as something functionally belonging to itself, intellect looks upon life as something in space. Destiny asks, whither? Causality asks, whence? To establish scientifically means, starting from the become and actualized, to search for causes by going back along a mechanically conceived course, that is to say, by treating becoming as a length. But it is not possible to live backwards, only to think backwards. Not time and destiny are reversible but only that which the physicist calls time and admits into his formulas as divisible, and preferably as negative or imaginary quantities. 
the perplexity is always there, though it has rarely been seen to be originally and necessarily inherent. In the classical science the elitics, declining to admit the necessity of thinking of nature as in motion, set up against it the logical view that thinking is a being, with the corollary that known and extended are identical and knowledge and becoming therefore irreconcilable. Their criticisms have not been, and cannot be, refuted. But they did not hinder the evolution of classical physics, which was a necessary expression of the Apollonian soul and as such superior to logical difficulties. In the classical mechanics so called of the Baroque, founded by Galileo and Newton, an irreproachable solution of the motion problem on dynamic lines has been sought again and again. The history of the concept of force, which has been stated and restated with all the tireless passion of a thought that feels its own self endangered by a difficulty, is nothing but the history of endeavors to find a form that is unimpeachable, mathematically and conceptually, for motion. The last serious attempt, which failed like the rest, and of necessity, was Hertz's. Without discovering the true source of all perplexities, no physicist as yet has done that. Hertz tried to eliminate the notion of force entirely, rightly feeling that error in all mechanical systems has to be looked for in one or another of the basic concepts, and to build up the whole picture of physics on the quantities of time, space and mass. But he did not observe that it is time itself, which as direction factor is present in the force concept, that is the organic element without which a dynamic theory cannot be expressed and with which a clean solution cannot be got. Moreover, quite apart from this, the concepts force, mass and motion constitute a dogmatic unit. They so condition one another that the application of one of them tacitly involves both the others from the outset. The whole Apollonian conception of the motion problem is implicit in the root word the whole western conception of it in the force idea. The notion of mass is only the complement of that of force. Newton, a deeply religious nature, was only bringing the Faustian world feeling to expression when, to elucidate the words force and motion, he said that masses are points of attack for force and carriers for motion. So the 13th century mystics had conceived of God and his relation to world. Newton no doubt rejected the metaphysical element in his famous saying hypotheses non fingo, but all the same he was metaphysical through and through in the founding of his mechanics. Force is the mechanical nature picture of Western man, what will is to his soul picture and infinite Godhead in his world picture. The primary ideas of this physics stood firm long before the first physicist was born, for they lay in the earliest religious world consciousness of our culture. Vi. With this it becomes manifest that the physical notion of necessity, too, has a religious origin. It must not be forgotten that the mechanical necessity that rules in what our intellects comprehend as nature is founded upon another necessity which is organic and fateful in life itself. The latter creates, the former restricts. One follows from inward certitude, the other from demonstration, that is the distinction between tragic and technical, historical and physical logic. There are, further, differences within the necessity postulated and assumed by science, that of cause and effect, which have so far eluded the keenest sight. We are confronted here with a question at once of very great difficulty and of superlative importance. A nature knowledge is, however philosophy may express the relation, a function of knowing, which is in each case knowing in a particular style. A scientific necessity therefore has the style of the appropriate intellect, and this brings morphological differences into the field at once. It is possible to see a strict necessity in nature even where it may be impossible to express it in natural laws. In fact natural laws, which for us are self-evidently the proper expression form in science, are not by any means so for the men of other cultures. They presuppose a quite special form, the distinctively Faustian form, of understanding and therefore of nature knowing. There is nothing inherently absurd in the conception of a mechanical necessity wherein each individual case is morphologically self-contained and never exactly reproduced, in which therefore the acquisitions of knowledge cannot be put into consistently valid formulas. In such a case nature would appear, to put it metaphorically, as an unending decimal that was also non-recurring, 
destitute of periodicity. And so, undoubtedly, it was conceived by classical minds, the feeling of it manifestly underlies their primary physical concepts. For example, the proper motion of Democritus' atoms is such as to exclude any possibility of calculating motions in advance. Nature laws are forms of the known in which an aggregate of individual cases are brought together as a unit of higher degree. Living time is ignored, that is, it does not matter whether, when or how often the case arises, for the question is not of chronological sequence but of mathematical consequence. But in the consciousness that no power in the world can shake this calculation lies our will to command over nature. That is Faustian. It is only from this standpoint that miracles appear as breaches of the laws of nature. Imagine man saw in them merely the exercise of a power that was not common to all, not in any way a contradiction of the laws of nature. And classical man, according to Protagoras, was only the measure and not the creator of things, a view that unconsciously forgoes all conquest of nature through the discovery and application of laws. We see, then, that the causality principle, in the form in which it is self-evidently necessary for us, the agreed basis of truth for our mathematics, physics and philosophy, is a western and, more strictly speaking, a baroque phenomenon. It cannot be proved, for every proof set forth in a western language and every experiment conducted by a western mind presupposes itself. In every problem, the enunciation contains the proof in germ. The method of a science is the science itself. Beyond question, the notion of laws of nature and the conception of physics as scientio experimentalis, which has held ever since Roger Bacon, contains a priori this specific kind of necessity. The classical mode of regarding nature, the alter ego of the classical mode of being, on the contrary, does not contain it, and yet it does not appear that the scientific position is weakened in logic thereby. If we work carefully through the utterances of Democritus, Anaxagoras, and Aristotle, in whom is contained the whole sum of classical nature speculation, and, above all, if we examine the connotations of key terms like comma 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 we look with astonishment into a world image totally unlike our own. This world image is self-sufficing and therefore, for this definite sort of mankind, unconditionally true and causality in our sense plays no part therein. The alchemist or philosopher of the Arabian culture, too, assumes a necessity within his world cavern that is utterly and completely different from the necessity of dynamics. There is no causal nexus of law form but only one cause, God, immediately underlying every effect. To believe in nature laws would, from this standpoint, be to doubt the armitiness of God. If a rule seems to emerge, it is because it pleases God so, but to suppose that this rule was a necessity would be to yield to a temptation of the devil. This was the attitude also of Carnets, Plotinus and the Neopythagoreans. 12 This necessity underlies the Gospels as it does the Talmud and the Avesta, and upon it rests the technique of alchemy. The conception of number as function is related to the dynamic principle of cause and effect. Both are creations of the same intellect, expression forms of the same spirituality, formative principles of the same objectivized and become nature. In fact the physics of Democritus differs from the physics of Newton in that the chosen starting point of the one is the optically given while that of the other is abstract relations that have been deduced from it. The facts of Apollinian nature knowledge are things, and they lie on the surface of the known but the facts of Faustian science are relations, which in general are invisible to lay eyes, which have to be mastered intellectually, which require for their communication a code language that only the expert researcher can fully understand. The classical, static, necessity is immediately evident in the changing phenomena, while the dynamic causation principle prevails beyond things and its tendency is to weaken, or to abolish even, their sensible actuality. Consider, for example, the world of significance that is connected, under present-day hypotheses, with the expression a magnet. The principle of the conservation of energy, which since its enunciation by J. R. Meyer has been regarded in all seriousness as a plain conceptual necessity, 
is in fact a redescription of the dynamic principle of causality by means of the physical concept of force. The appeal to experience, and the controversy as to whether judgment is necessary or empirical, that is, in the language of Kant, who greatly deceived himself about the highly fluid boundaries between the two, whether it is a priori or a posteriori certain, are characteristically Western. Nothing seems to us more self-evident and unambiguous than experience as the source of exact science. The Faustian experiment, based on working hypotheses and employing the methods of measurement, is nothing but the systematic and exhaustive exploitation of this experience. But no one has noticed that a whole world view is implicit in such a concept of experience with its aggressive dynamic connotation, and that there is not and cannot be experience in this pregnant sense for men of other cultures. When we decline to recognize the scientific results of Anaxagoras or Democritus as experiential results, it does not mean that these classical thinkers were incapable of interpreting and merely threw off fancies but that we miss in their generalizations that causal element which for us constitutes experience in our sense of the word. Manifestly, we have never yet given adequate thought to the singularity of this, the pure Faustian, conception of experience. The contrast between it and faith is obvious, and entirely superficial. For indeed exact sensuous intellectual experience is in point of structure completely congruent with that heart experience as we may well call it, that illumination which deep religious natures of the West, Pascal, for instance, whom one and the same necessity made mathematician and Jansenist, have known in the significant moments of their being. Experience means to us an activity of the intellect, which does not resignedly confine itself to receiving, acknowledging and arranging momentary and purely present impressions but seeks them out and calls them up in order to overcome them in their sensuous presence and to bring them into an unbounded unity in which their sensuous discreteness is dissolved. Experience in our sense possesses the tendency from particular to infinite. And for that very reason it is in contradiction with the feeling of classical science. What for us is the way to acquire experience is for the Greek the way to lose it and therefore he kept away from the drastic method of experiment, therefore his physics, instead of being a mighty system of worked out laws and formulas that strong handedly override the sense present, only knowledge is power, is an aggregate of impressions, well ordered, intensified by sensuous imagery, clean edged, which leaves nature intact in its self completeness. Our exact natural science is imperative. The classical is in the literal sense, the result of passive contemplativeness. 7. We can now say without any hesitation that the form world of a natural science corresponds to those of the appropriate mathematic, the appropriate religion, the appropriate art. A deep mathematician, by which is meant not a master computer but a man, any man, who feels the spirit of numbers living within him, realizes that through it he knows God. Pythagoras and Plato knew this as well as Pascal and Leibniz did so. Terentius Varro, in his examination of the old Roman religion, dedicated to Julius Caesar, distinguished with Roman seriousness between the Theologia Civilis, the sum of officially recognized belief, the Theologia Mythica, the imagination world of poets and artists, and the Theologia Physica of philosophical speculation. Applying this to the Faustian culture, that which Thomas Aquinas and Luther, Calvin and Loyola taught belongs to the first category, Dante and Goethe belong to the second, and to the third belongs scientific physics, inasmuch as behind its formulas there are images. Not only primitive man and the child, but also the higher animals spontaneously evolve from the small everyday experiences an image of nature which contains the sum of technical indications observed as recurrent. The eagle knows the moment at which to swoop down on the prey, the singing bird sitting on the eggs knows the approach of the martin, the deer finds the place where there is food. In man, this experience of all the senses has narrowed and deepened itself into experience of the eye. But, as the habit of verbal speech has now been superadded, understanding comes to be abstracted from seeing, and thenceforward develops independently as reasoning, 
To the instantly comprehending technique is added the reflective theory. Technique applies itself to visible near things and plain needs, theory to the distance and the terrors of the invisible. By the side of the petty knowledge of everyday life fit sets up belief. And still they evolve, there is a new knowledge and a new and higher technique, and to the myth there is added the cult. The one teaches how to know the noumena, the other how to conquer them. For theory in the eminent sense is religious through and through. It is only in quite late states that scientific theory evolves out of religious, through men having become aware of methods. Apart from this there is little alteration. The image world of physics remains mythic, its procedure remains a cult of conjuring the powers and things, and the images that it forms and the methods that it uses remain generically dependent upon those of the appropriate religion. From the later days of the Renaissance onward, the notion of God has steadily approximated, in the spirit of every man of high significance, to the idea of pure endless space. The God of Ignatius Loyola's Exorcitia Spiritualis is the God also of Luther's Einfestberg, of the Improperia of Palestrina and the Cantatas of Bach. He is no longer the father of St. Francis of Assisi and the high vaulted cathedrals. The personally present, caring and mild God felt by Gothic painters like Giotto and Stephen Lochner, but an impersonal principle, unimaginable, intangible, working mysteriously in the infinite. Every relic of personality dissolves into insensible abstraction, such a divinity as only instrumental music of the grand style is capable of representing, a divinity before which painting breaks down and drops into the background. This God feeling it was that formed the scientific world image of the West, its nature, its experience and therefore its theories and its methods, in direct contradiction to those of the classical. The force which moves the mass, that is what Michelangelo painted in the Sistine Chapel, that is what we feel growing more and more intense from the archetype of Il Gesù to the climax in the cathedral facades of Delia Porto and Madonna and from Heinrich Schütz to the transcendent tone worlds of 18th century church music, that is what in Shakespearean tragedy fills with world becoming scenes widened to infinity. And that is what Galileo and Newton captured in formulas and concepts. The word God rings otherwise under the vaulting of Gothic cathedrals or in the cloisters of Marlborough and Street Galland than in the basilicas of Syria and the temples of Republican Rome. The character of the Faustian cathedral is that of the forest. The mighty elevation of the nave above the flanking aisles, in contrast to the flat roof of the basilica, the transformation of the columns, which with base and capital had been set as self-contained individuals in space, into pillars and clustered pillars that grow up out of the earth and spread on high into an infinite subdivision and interlacing of lines and branches, the giant windows by which the wall is dissolved and the interior filled with mysterious light, these are the architectural actualizing of a world feeling that had found the first of all its symbols in the high forest of the northern plains, the deciduous forest with its mysterious tracery, its whispering of ever mobile foliage over men's heads, its branches straining through the trunks to be free of earth. Think of Romanesque ornamentation and its deep affinity to the sense of the woods. The endless, lonely, twilight wood became and remained the secret wistfulness in all western building forms, so that when the form energy of the style died down, in late gothic as in closing baroque, the controlled abstract line language resolved itself immediately into naturalistic branches, shoots, twigs and leaves, cypresses and pines, with their corporeal and Euclidean effect could never have become symbols of unending space. But the oaks, beeches and lindens with the fitful light flecks playing in their shadow-filled volume are felt as bodiless, boundless, spiritual. The stem of the cypress finds conclusive fulfillment of its vertical tendency in the defined columniation of its cone masses, but that of an oak seems, ever restless and unsatisfied, to strain beyond its summit. In the ash, the victory of the upstriving branches over the unity of the crown seems actually to be won. Its aspect is of something dissolving, something expanding into space, and it was for this probably that the world ash became a symbol in the northern mythology. The rustle of the woods, 
a charm that no classical poet ever felt, for it lies beyond the possibilities of Apollinean nature feeling, stands with its secret questions whence, with a, its merging of presence into eternity, in a deep relation with destiny, with the feeling of history and duration, with the quality of direction that impels the anxious, caring, Faustian soul towards infinitely distant future. And for that reason the organ, that roars deep and high through our churches in tones which, compared with the plain solid notes of Orlos and Sthara, seem to know neither limit nor restraint, is the instrument of instruments in Western devotions. Cathedral and organ form a symbolic unity like temple and statue. The history of organ building, one of the most profound and moving chapters of our musical history, is a history of a longing for the forest, a longing to speak in the language of that true temple of Western God-fearing. From the verse of Wolfram von Ischenbach to the music of Tristan this longing has borne fruit unceasingly. Orchestra tone strove tirelessly in the 18th century towards a nearer kinship with the organ tone. The word Schwend, meaningless as applied to classical things, is important alike in the theory of music, in oil painting, in architecture and in the dynamic physics of the Baroque. Stand in a high wood of mighty stems while the storm is tearing above, and you will comprehend instantly the full meaning of the concept of a force which moves mass. Out of such a primary feeling in the existence that has become thoughtful there arises, then, an idea of the divine immanent in the world around, and this idea becomes steadily more definite. The thoughtful percipient takes in the impression of motion in outer nature. He feels about him an almost indescribable alien life of unknown powers, and traces the origin of these effects to Numina, to the other, inasmuch as this other also possesses life. Astonishment at alien motion is the source of religion and of physics both, respectively, they are the elucidations of nature, world around, by the soul and by the reason. The powers are the first object both of fearful or loving reverence and of critical investigation. There is a religious experience and a scientific experience. Now it is important to observe how the consciousness of the culture intellectually concretes its primary noumena. It imposes significant words, names, on them and the conjures, seizes or bounds, them. By virtue of the name they are subject to the intellectual power of the man who possesses the name, and, as has been shown already, the whole of philosophy, the whole of science, and everything that is related in any way to knowing is at the very bottom nothing but an infinitely refined mode of applying the name magic of the primitive to the alien. The pronouncement of the right name, in physics, the right concept, is an incantation. Deities and basic notions of science alike come into being first as vocabal names, with which is linked an idea that tends to become more and more sensuously definite. The outcome of a Newman is a deus, the outcome of a notion is an idea. In the minaming of thing in itself, atom, energy, gravitation, cause, evolution and the like is for most learned men the same sense of deliverance as there was for the peasant of Latium in the words Seers, Consus, Janus, Vesta. 13. For the classical world feeling, conformably to the Apollinean depth experience and its symbolism, the individual body was being. Logically therefore the form of this body, as it presented itself in the light, was felt as its essence, as the true purport of the word being. What has not shape, what is not a shape, is not at all. On the basis of this feeling, which was of an intensity that we can hardly imagine, the classical spirit created as counter-concept to the form of the other non-form viz, stuff, comma comma that which in itself possesses no being and is merely complement to the actual int, representing a secondary and corollary necessity. In these conditions, it is easy to see how the classical pantheon inevitably shaped itself, as a higher mankind side by side with the common mankind, as a set of perfectly formed bodies, of high possibilities incarnate and present, but in the unessential of stuff not distinguished and therefore subject to the same cosmic and tragic necessity. It is otherwise that the Faustian world feeling experiences depth. Here the sum of true being appears as pure efficient space which is being, and therefore what is sensuously felt, 
what is very significantly designated the plenum, das Raumaflend, is felt as a fact of the second order, as something questionable or specious, as a resistance that must be overcome by philosopher or physicist before the true content of being can be discovered. Western skepticism has never been directed against space, always against tangible things only. Space is the higher idea, force is only a less abstract expression for it, and it is only as a counter-concept to space that mass arises. For mass is what is in space and is logically and physically dependent upon space. From the assumption of a wave motion of light, which underlies the conception of light as a form of energy, the assumption of a corresponding mass, the luminiferous ether necessarily followed. A definition of mass and description of properties to mass follows from the definition of force, and not vice versa, with all the necessity of a symbol. All classical notions of substantiality, however they differed amongst themselves as realist or idealist, distinguish it a be formed, that is, anonent, which only receives closer definition from the basic concept of form, whatever this form may be in the particular philosophical system. All Western notions of substantiality distinguish it a be moved, which also is a negative, no doubt, but one polar to a different positive. Form and non-form, force and non-force, these words render as clearly as may be the polarities that in the two cultures underlie the world impression and contain all its modes. That which comparative philosophy has hitherto rendered inaccurately and misleadingly by the one word matter signifies in the one case the substratum of shape, in the other the substratum of force. No two notions could differ more completely. For here it is the feeling of God, a sense of values, that is speaking. The classical deity is superlative shape, the Faustian superlative force. The other is the ungodly to which the spirit will not accord the dignity of being. To the Apollonian world feeling this ungodly other is substance without shape, to the Faustian it is substance without force. 8. Scientists are wont to assume that myths and god ideas are creations of primitive man, and that as spiritual culture advances, this myth forming power is shed. In reality it is the exact opposite, and had not the morphology of history remained to this day an almost unexplored field, the supposedly universal mythopoetic power would long ago have been found to be limited to particular periods. It would have been realized that this ability of a soul to fill its world with shapes, traits and symbols, like and consistent amongst themselves, belongs most decidedly not to the world age of the primitives but exclusively to the spring times of great cultures. Every myth of the great style stands at the beginning of an awakening spirituality. It is the first formative act of that spirituality. Nowhere else is it to be found. There, it must be. I make the assumption that that which are primitive folk, like the Egyptians of Thinite times, the Jews and Persians before Cyrus, the heroes of the Mycenaean Bergs and their Germans of the Migrations, possesses in the way of religious ideas is not yet myth in the higher sense. It may well be a sum of scattered and irregular traits of cults adhering to names, fragmentary saga pictures, but it is not yet a divine order, a mythic organism, and I no more regard this as myth than I regard the ornament of that stage as art. And, be it said, the greatest caution is necessary in dealing with the symbols and sagas current today, or even those current centuries ago, amongst ostensibly primitive peoples for in those thousands of years every country in the world has been more or less affected by some high culture alien to it. There are, therefore, as many form worlds of great myth as there are cultures and early architectures. The antecedents, that chaos of undeveloped imagery in which modern folklore research, for want of a guiding principle, loses itself, do not, on this hypothesis, concern us, but we are concerned on the other hand, with certain cultural manifestations that have never yet been thought of as belonging to this category. It was in the Homeric Age, 1100-800 BC, and in the corresponding knightly age of Teutonism, 901-200 AD, that is, the Epic Ages, and neither before nor after them, that the great world image of a new religion came into being. 
the corresponding ages in India and Egypt are the Vedic and the Pyramid periods, one day it will be discovered that Egyptian mythology did in fact ripen into depth during the third and fourth dynasties. Only in this way can we understand the immense wealth of religious intuitive creations that fills the three centuries of the imperial age in Germany. What came into existence then was the Faustian mythology. Hitherto, owing to religious and learned preconceptions, either the Catholic element has been treated to the exclusion of the northern heen or vice versa, and consequently we have been blind to the breadth and the unity of this form world. In reality there is no such difference. The deep change of meaning in the Christian circle of ideas is identical, as a creative act, with the consolidation of the old heen cults of the migrations. It was in this age that the folklore of Western Europe became an entirety, if the bulk of its material was far older, and if, far later again, it came to be linked with new outer experiences and enriched by more conscious treatment, yet it was then and neither earlier nor later that it was vitalized with its symbolic meaning. To this law belong the great god legends of the Edda and many motives in the gospel poetry of learned monks. The German hero tales of Siegfried and Gudrun, Dietrich and Wayland, the vast twelfth of chivalry tales, derived from ancient Celtic fables, that was simultaneously coming to harvest on French soil, concerning King Arthur and the Round Table, the Holy Grail, Tristan, Percival and Roland. And with these are to be counted, beside the spiritual transvaluation, unremarked but all the deeper for that, of the Passion Story the Catholic hagiology of which the richest Florison was in the 10th and 11th centuries and which produced the lives of the Virgin in the histories of S.S. Roch, Sebald, Severin, Francis, Bernard, Odilia. The Legenda Aurea was composed about 1250, this was the blossoming time of courtly epic and Icelandic scald poetry alike. The great Valhalla gods of the north and the mythic group of the fourteen helpers in South Germany are contemporary, and by the side of Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, in the Velusper we have a Christian form in the South German Muspili. This great myth develops, like heroic poetry, at the climax of the early culture. They both belong to the two primary estates, priesthood and nobility, they are at home in the cathedral and the castle and not in the village below where amongst the people the simple saga world lives on for centuries, called fairy tale, popular belief saw superstition and yet inseparable from the world of high contemplation. Nowhere is the final meaning of these religious creations more clearly indicated than in the history of Alhalla. It was not an original German idea, and even the tribes of the migrations were totally without it. It took shape just at this time, instantly and as an inward necessity, in the consciousness of the peoples newly arisen on the soil of the West. Thus it is contemporary with Olympus, which we know from the Homeric epos and which is as little Mycenaean as Valhalla is German in origin. Moreover, it is only for the two higher estates that Valhalla emerges from the notion of Hell, in the beliefs of the people will remain the realm of the dead. 14. The deep inward unity of this Faustian world of myth and saga and the complete congruence of its expression symbolism has never hitherto been realized, and yet Siegfried, Baldur, Roland, Christ the King in the Holy Land, are different names for one and the same figure. Valhalla and Avalon, the Round Table and the Communion of the Grail Templars, Mary, Frigga and Frau Hall mean the same. On the other hand, the external provenance of the material motives and elements, on which mythological research has wasted an excessive zeal, is a matter of which the importance does not go deeper than the surface. As to the meaning of a myth, its provenance proves nothing. The Newman itself, the primary form of the world feeling, is a pure, necessary and unconscious creation, and it is not transferable. What one people takes over from another, in conversion or in admiring imitation, is a name dress and mask for its own feeling, never the feeling of that are there. The old Celtic and old Germanic myth motives have to be treated, like the repertory of classical forms possessed by the learned monk, and like the entire body of Christian Eastern faith taken over by the Western Church, 
simply as the material out of which the Faustian soul in these centuries created a mythic architecture of its own. It mattered little whether the persons through whose minds and mouths the myth came to life were individual scalds, missionaries, priests or the people, nor did the circumstance that the Christian ideas dictated its forms affect the inward independence of that which had come to life. In the classical, Arabian and Western cultures, the myth of the springtime is in each case that which we should expect, in the first static, in the second magian, in the third dynamic. Examine every detail of form, and see how in the classical it is an attitude and in the west a deed, there a being and here a will that underlies them, how in the classical the bodily and tangible, the sensuously saturated, prevails and how therefore in the mode of worshipping the center of gravity lies in the sense impressive cult, whereas in the north it is space, force and therefore a religiousness that is predominantly dogmatic in coloring that rule. These very earliest creations of the young soul tell us that there is relationship between the Olympian figures, the statue and the corporeal Doric temple, between the Domical Basilica, the spirit of God and the arabesque, between Valhalla and the Mary myth, the soaring nave and instrumental music. The Arabian soul built up its myth in the centuries between Caesar and Constantine, that fantastic mass of cults visions and legends that today we can hardly even survey, syncretic cults like that of the Syrian Baland of Isis and Mithras not only transported to but transformed in Syrian soil, gospels, acts of apostles and apocalypses in astonishing profusion, Christian, Persian, Jewish, Neoplatonist and Manichaean legends, and the heavenly hierarchy of angels and spirits of the fathers and the Gnostics. In the suffering story of the Gospels, the very epic of the Christian nation, set between the story of Jesus's childhood and the Acts of the Apostles, and in the Zoroaster legend that is contemporary with it, we are looking upon the hero figures of early Arabian epic as we see Achilles in the classical and Siegfried and Percival in the Faustian. The scenes of Gethsemane and Golgotha stand beside the noblest pictures of Greek and Germanic saga. These Magian visions, almost without exception, grew up under the pressure of the dying classical which, in the nature of things unable to communicate its spirit, the more insistently lent its forms. It is almost impossible now to estimate the extent to which given Apollinean elements had to be accepted and transvalued before the old Christian myth assumed the firmness that it possessed in the time of Augustine. 9. The Classical Polytheism, consequently, has a style of its own which puts it in a different category from the conceptions of any other world feelings, whatever the superficial affinities may be. This mode of possessing gods without godhead has only existed once, and it was in the one culture that made the statue of naked man the whole sum of its art. Nature, as classical man felt and knew it about him, viz, a sum of well-formed bodily things, could not be deified in any other form but this. The Roman felt that the claim of Yahweh to be recognized as sole God had something atheistic in it. One God, for him, was no God, and to this may be ascribed the strong dislike of popular feeling, both Greek and Roman, for the philosophers insofar as they were pantheists and godless. Gods are bodies, of the perfectest kind, and plurality was an attribute of bodies alike for mathematicians, lawyers and poets. The concept of was valid for gods as well as for men, nothing was more alien to them than oneness, solitariness and self-adequacy, and no existence therefore was possible to them save under the aspect of eternal propinquity. It is a deeply significant fact that in hellers of all countries star gods, the numina of the far, are wanting. Helios was worshipped only in half-oriental roads and Selene had no cult at all. Both are merely artistic modes of expression, it is as such only that they figure in the courtly epos of Homer, elements that Varro would class in the genus mythicum and not in the genus civil. The old Roman religion, in which the classical world feeling was expressed with special purity, knew neither sun nor moon, neither storm nor cloud as deities. The forest stirrings and the forest solitude, the tempest and the surf which completely dominated the nature of Faustian man, even that of pre-Faustian Celts and Teutons, and imparted to their mythology its peculiar character, 
left classical man unmoved. Only concretes, hearth and door, the coppice and the plot field, this particular river and that particular hill, condensed into being for him. We observe that everything that has fatness, everything that contains a suggestion of unbounded and unbodied in it and might thereby bring space as int and divine into the felt nature, is excluded and remains excluded from classical myth. How should it surprise, then, if clouds and horizons, that are the very meaning and soul of Baroque land escapes, are totally wanting in the classical backgroundless frescoes. The unlimited multitude of antique gods, every tree, every spring, every house, nay every part of a house is a god, means that every tangible thing is an independent existence, and therefore that none is functionally subordinate to any other. The bases of the Apollonian and the Faustian nature images respectively are in all contexts the two opposite symbols of individual thing and unitary space. Olympus and Hades are perfectly sense definite places, while the kingdom of the dwarfs, elves and goblins, and Valhalla and Nifleim are all somewhere or other in the universe of space. In the old Roman religion Tellus Mater is not the all mother but the visible ploughable field itself. Faunus is the wood and Volturnus is the river, the name of the seed is Sears and that of the harvest is Consus. Horace is a true Roman when he speaks of Subjo Frigido, under the cold sky. In these cases there is not even the attempt to reproduce the god in any sort of image at the places of worship, for that would be tantamount to duplicating him. Even in very late times the instinct not only of the Romans but of the Greeks also is opposed to idols as is shown by the fact that plastic art, as it became more and more profane, came into conflict more and more with popular beliefs and the devout philosophy. In the house, Janus is the door as god, Vesta the hearth as goddess, the two functions of the house are objectivized and deified at once. A Hellenic river god, like Achilles, who appears as a bull, is definitely understood as being the river and not as, so to say, dwelling in the river. The pants fifteen and satyrs are the fields and meadows as noon defines them, well bounded and, as having figure, having also existence. Dryads and hamadrads are trees, in many places, indeed, individual trees of great stature were honored with garlands and votive offerings without even the formality of a name. On the contrary, not a trace of this localized materiality clings to the elves, dwarfs, witches, Valkyries and their kindred the armies of departed souls that sweep round o' nights. Whereas naiads are sources, nixies and hags, and tree spirits and brownies are souls that are only bound to sources, trees and houses, from which they long to be released into the freedom of roaming. This is the very opposite of the plastic nature feeling, for here things are experienced merely as spaces of another kind. A nymph, a spring, that is assumes human form when she would visit a handsome shepherd, but a nixie is an enchanted princess with nenuphars in her hair who comes up at midnight from the depths of the pool wherein she dwells. Kaiser Barbarossa sits in the Kaiforza cavern and Frau Venus in the Horselberg. It is as though the Faustian universe abhorred anything material and impenetrable. In things, we suspect other worlds. Their hardness and thickness is merely appearance and, a trait that would be impossible in classical myth, because fatal to it, some favoured mortals are accorded the power to see through cliffs and crags into the depths. But is not just this the secret intent of our physical theories, of each new hypothesis? No other culture knows so many fables of treasures lying in mountains and pools, of secret subterranean realms, palaces, gardens wherein other beings dwell. The whole substantiality of the visible world is denied by the Faustian nature feeling, for which in the end nothing is of earth and the only actual is space. The fairy tale dissolves the matter of nature as the Gothic style dissolves the stone mass of our cathedrals, into a ghostly wealth of forms and lines that have shed all weight and acknowledge no bounds. The ever increasing emphasis with which classical polytheism somatically individualized its deities is peculiarly evident in its attitude to strange gods. For classical man the gods of the Egyptians, the Phoenicians and the Germans, 
in so far as they could be imagined as figures, were as real as his own gods. Within his world feeling the statement that such other gods do not exist would have no meaning. When he came into contact with the countries of these deities he did them reverence. The gods were, like a statue or a polis, Euclidean bodies having locality. They were beings of the near and not the general space. If a man were sojourning in Babylon, for instance, and Zeus and Apollo were far away, all the more reason for particularly honoring the local gods. This is the meaning of the altars dedicated to the unknown gods, such as that which Paul so significantly misunderstood in Imagine in a theistic sense at Athens. 16 These were gods not known by name to the Greek but worshipped by the foreigners of the great seaports, Piraeus, Corinth or other, and therefore entitled to their due of respect from him. Rome expressed this with classical clearness in her religious law and in carefully preserved formulas like, for example, the generalis invocatio.17 as the universe is the sum of things, and as gods are things, recognition had to be accorded even to those gods with whom the Roman had not yet practically and historically come into relations. He did not know them, or he knew them as the gods of his enemies, but they were gods for it was impossible for him to conceive the opposite. This is the meaning of the sacral phrase in Livy, 8, 9, 6, Equibus ist pitstas nostrum hostium. The Roman people admits that the circle of its own gods is only momentarily bounded, and after reciting these by name it ends the prayer thus so as not to infringe the rights of others. According to its sacral law, the annexation of foreign territory involves the transfer to Urbs Roma of all the religious obligations pertaining to this territory and its gods, which of course logically follows from the additive god feeling of the classical. Recognition of a deity was very far from being the same as acceptance of the forms of its cult, thus in the Second Punic War the great mother of Pessinus 18 was received in Rome as the Sibyl commanded, but the priests who had come in with her cult, which was of a highly unclassical complexion, practiced under strict police supervision, and not only Roman citizens but even their slaves were forbidden under penalty to enter this priesthood. The reception of the goddess gave satisfaction to the classical world feeling, but the personal performance of her despised ritual would have infringed it. The attitude of the senate in such cases is unmistakable, though the people, with its ever-increasing admixture of eastern elements, had a liking for these cults and in imperial times the army became in virtue of its composition a vehicle, and even the chief vehicle, of the Magian world feeling. This makes it the easier to understand how the cult of deified men could become a necessary element in this religious form world. But here it is necessary to distinguish sharply between classical phenomena and oriental phenomena that have a superficial similarity thereto. Roman Emperor Worship that is, the reverence of the genius of the living princes and that of the dead predecessors as Divi, has hitherto been confused with the ceremonial reverence of the ruler which was customary in Asia Minor, and, above all, in Persia, 19 and also with the later and quite differently meant caliph deification which is seen in full process of formation in Diocletian and Constantine. Actually, these are all very unlike things. However intimately these symbolic forms were interfused in the east of the empire, in Rome itself the classical type was actualized unequivocally and without adulteration. Long before this certain Greeks, for example, Sophocles, Lysandrand, above all, Alexander, had been not merely hailed as gods by their flatterers but felt as gods in a perfectly definite sense by the people. It is only a step, after all from the deification of a thing, such as a copse or a well or, in the limit, a statue which represented a god, to the deification of an outstanding man who became first hero and then god. In this case as in the rest, what was reverenced was the perfect shape in which the world stuff, the UN divine, had actualized itself. In Rome the consul on the day of his triumph wore the armor of Jupiter Capitolinus, and in early days his face and arms were even painted red, in order to enhance his similarity to the terracotta statue of the god whose Newman he for the time being incorporated. X. In the first generations of the imperial age, 
the antique polytheism gradually dissolved, often without any alteration of outward ritual and mythic form, into the Magian monotheism. A new soul had come up, and it lived the old forms in a new mode. The names continued, but they covered other new mana. In all late classical cults, those of Isis and Cybele, of Mithras and Sol and Serapis, the divinity is no longer felt as a localized and formable being. In old times, Hermes Proplus had been worshipped at the entrance of the Acropolis of Athens, while a few yards away, at the point where later the Arctium was built, was the cult site of Hermes as the husband of Aglaia. At the south extremity of the Roman capital, close to the sanctuary of Jupiter Fetrius, which contained, not a statue of the god, but a holy stone, Silex twenty, was that of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, and when Augustus was laying down the huge temple of the latter he was careful to avoid the ground to which the Newman of the former adhered. Twenty one but in early Christian times Jupiter Deligenius or Sol Invictus twenty two could be worshipped wheresoever two or three were gathered together in his name. All these deities more and more came to be felt as a single Newman, though the adherents of a particular cult would believe that they in particular knew the Newman in its true shape. Hence it is that Isis could be spoken of as the million named. Hitherto, names had been the designations of so many gods different in body and locality, now they are titles of the one whom every man has in mind. This Magian monotheism reveals itself in all the religious creations that flooded the empire from the east, the Lexandrian Isis, the sun god favored by Aurelian, the Baal of Palmyra, the Mithras protected by Diocletian, whose Persian form had been completely recast in Syria, the Balath of Carthage, Danat, Diocletus 23, honored by Septimius Severus. The importation of these figures no longer increases as in classical times the number of concrete gods. On the contrary, they absorb the old gods into themselves, and do so in such a way as to deprive them more and more of picturable shape. Alchemy is replacing statics. Correspondingly, instead of the image we more and more find symbols, for example, the bull, the lamb, the fish, the triangle, the cross, coming to the front. In Constantine's in hoc signa Vince is scarcely an echo of the classical remains. Already there is setting in that aversion to human representation that ended in the Islamic and Byzantine prohibitions of images. Right down to Trajan. Long after the last trait of Apollonian world feeling had departed from the soil of Greece, the Roman state worship had strength enough to hold to the Euclidean tendency and to augment its world of deities. The gods of the subject lands and peoples were accorded recognized places of worship, with priesthood and ritual, in Rome, and were themselves associated as perfectly definite individuals with the older gods. But from that point the Magian spirit began to gain ground even here, in spite of an honorable resistance which centered in a few of the very oldest patrician families. 24 The god figures as such, as bodies, vanished from the consciousness of men, to make way for a transcendental god feeling which no longer depended on sense evidences, and the usages, festivals and legends melted into one another. When in 217 Caracalla put an end to all sacral legal distinctions between Roman and foreign deities and Isis, absorbing all older female Numina, became actually the first goddess of Rome 25, and thereby the most dangerous opponent of Christianity and the most obnoxious target for the hatred of the fathers, then Rome became a piece of the East, a religious diocese of Syria. Then the bells of Delish, Petra. Palmyra and Idissa began to melt into the monotheism of Sol, who became and remained, till his representative Licinius fell before Constantine, god of the empire. By now, the question was not between classical and Magian, Christianity was in so little danger from the old gods that it could offer them a sort of sympathy, but it was, which of the Magian religions should dictate religious form to the world of the classical empire. The decline of the old plastic feeling is very clearly discernible in the stages through which emperor worship passed, first, the dead emperor taken into the circle of state gods by resolution of the senate, Divus Julius, 42 BC, 
a priesthood provided for him and his image removed from amongst the ancestor images that were carried in purely domestic celebrations, then, from Marcus Aurelius, no further consecrations of priests, and, presently, no further building of temples, for the service of deified emperors, for the reason that religious sentiment was now satisfied by a general templum divorum, finally, the epithet divus used simply as a title of members of the imperial family. This end to the evolution marks the victory of the Magian feeling. It will be found that multiple names in the inscriptions, such as Isis Magna Mater Juno Astarte Bellona, or Mithras Sol Invictus Helios, come to signify titles of one sole existent Godhead. 26. 11. Atheism is a subject that the psychologist and the student of religion have hitherto regarded as scarcely worth careful investigation. Much has been written and argued about it, and very roundly, by the free thought martyr on the one hand and the religious zealot on the other. But no one has had anything to say about the species of atheism, or has treated it analytically as an individual and definite phenomenon, positive and necessary and intensely symbolic, or has realized how it is limited in time. Is atheism a priori constitution of a certain world consciousness or is it a voluntary self-expression? Is one born with it or converted to it? Does the unconscious feeling that the cosmos has become godless bring in its train the consciousness that it is so, the realization that great Pan is dead? Are there early atheists, for example in the Doric or the Gothic ages? Are the cases of men insisting on describing themselves as atheists who are in fact not atheists at all? And, on the other hand, can there be civilized men who are not wholly or at any rate partially atheist? It is not in dispute, the word itself shows it in all languages, that atheism is essentially a negation, that it signifies the foregoing of a spiritual idea and therefore the precedence of such an idea and that it is not the creative act of an unimpaired formative power. But what is it that it denies? In what way? And who is the denier? Atheism, rightly understood, is the necessary expression of a spirituality that has accomplished itself and exhausted its religious possibilities, and is declining into the inorganic. It is entirely compatible with a living wistful desire for real religiousness 27, therein resembling Romanticism which likewise would recall that which has irrevocably gone, namely, the culture, and it may quite well be in a man as a creation of his feeling without his being aware of it, without its ever interfering with the habits of his thought or challenging his convictions. We can understand this if we can see what it was that made the devout Haydn call Beethoven an atheist after he had heard some of his music. Atheism comes not with the evening of the culture but with the dawn of the civilization. It belongs to the great city, to the educated man of the great city who acquires mechanistically what his forefathers the creators of the culture had lived organically. In respect of the classical feeling of God, Aristotle is an atheist unawares. The Hellenistic Roman Stoicism is atheistic like the socialism of Western and the Buddhism of Indian modernity reverently though they may and do use the word God. But, if this late form of world feeling and world image which preludes our second religiousness is universally a negation of the religious in us, the structure of it is different in each of the civilizations. There is no religiousness that is without an atheistic opposition belonging uniquely to itself and directed uniquely against itself. Men continue to experience the outer world that extends around them as a cosmos of well-ordered bodies or a world cavern or efficient space, as the case may be, but they no longer livingly experience the sacred causality in it. They only learn to know it in a profane causality that is, or is desired to be, inclusively mechanical. There are atheisms of classical, Arabian and Western kinds and these differ from one another in meaning and in matter. Nietzsche formulated the dynamic atheism on the basis that God is dead, and a classical philosopher would have expressed the static and Euclidean by saying that the gods who dwell in the holy places are dead, the one indicating that boundless space has, the other that countless bodies have, become godless. But dead space and dead things are the facts of physics. The atheist is unable to experience any difference between the nature picture of physics and that of religion. 
language, with a fine feeling, distinguishes wisdom and intelligence, the early and the late, the rural and the megalopolitan conditions of the soul. Intelligence even sounds atheistic. No one would describe Heraclitus or Maestricart as an intelligence, but Socrates and Rousseau were intelligent and not wise men. There is something rootless in the word. It is only from the standpoint of the Stoic and of the Socialist, of the typically religious man, that want of intelligence is a matter for contempt. The spiritual in every living culture is religious, has religion, whether it be conscious of it or not. That it exists, becomes, develops, fulfills itself, is its religion. It is not open to a spirituality to be irreligious, at most it can play with the idea of irreligion as Medici and Florentines did. But the megalopolitan is irreligious, this is part of his being, a mark of his historical position. Bitterly as he may feel the inner emptiness and poverty, earnestly as he may long to be religious, it is out of his power to be so. All religiousness in the megalopolis rests upon self-deception. The degree of piety of which a period is capable is revealed in its attitude towards toleration. One tolerates, either because the formal language appears to be expressing something of that which in one's own lived experience is felt as divine, or else because that experience no longer contains anything so felt. What we moderns have called toleration in the classical world is an expression of the contrary of atheism. Plurality of noumena and cults is inherent in the conception of classical religion, and it was not toleration but the self-evident expression of antique piety that allowed validity to them all. Conversely, anyone who demanded exceptions showed himself ipso facto as godless. Christians and Jews counted, and necessarily counted as atheists in the eyes of anyone whose world picture was an aggregate of individual bodies, and when in imperial times they ceased to be regarded in this light, the old classical God feeling had itself come to an end. On the other hand, respect for the form of the local cult whatever this might be, for images of the gods, for sacrifices and festivals was always expected, and anyone who mocked or profaned them very soon learned the limits of classical toleration. Witness the scandal of the mutilation of the Hermia at Athens and trials for the desecration of the Eleusinian mysteries, that is, impious travestying of the sensuous element. But to the Faustian soul, again we see opposition of space and body, of conquest and acceptance of presence, dogma and not visible ritual constitutes the essence. What is regarded as godless is opposition to doctrine. Here begins the spatial spiritual conception of heresy. A Faustian religion by its very nature cannot allow any freedom of conscience, it would be in contradiction with its space invasive dynamic. Even free thinking itself is no exception to the rule. After the stake, the guillotine, after the burning of the books, their suppression, after the power of the pulpit, the power of the press. Amongst us there is no faith without leanings to an inquisition of some sort. Expressed in appropriate electrodynamic imagery, the field of force of a conviction adjusts all the minds within it according to its own intensity. Failure to do so means absence of conviction, in ecclesiastical language, ungodliness. For the Apollonian soul, on the contrary, it was contempt of the cult, in the literal sense, that was ungodly and here its religion admitted no freedom of attitude. In both cases there was a line drawn between the toleration demanded by the God feeling and that forbidden by it. Now, here the late classical philosophy of sophist Stoic speculation, as distinct from the general Stoic disposition, was in opposition to religious feeling. And accordingly we find the people of Athens, that Athens which could build altars to unknown gods persecuting as pitilessly as the Spanish Inquisition. We have only to review the list of classical thinkers and historical personages who were sacrificed to the integrity of the cult. Socrates and Diagoras were executed for semicolon Anaxagoras, Protagoras, Aristotle, Alcibiades only saved themselves by flight. The number of executions for cult impiety, in Athens alone and during the few decades of the Peloponnesian War, ran into hundreds. After the condemnation of Protagoras, a house-to-house -house search was made for the destruction of his writings. In Rome, acts of this sort began, 
so far as history enables us to trace them, in 181 BC when the Senate ordered the public burning of the Pythagorean books of Numa. 28 This was followed by an uninterrupted series of expulsions, both of individual philosophers and of whole schools, and later by executions and by public burnings of books regarded as subversive of religion. For instance, in the time of Caesar alone, the places of worship of Isis were five times destroyed by order of the consuls, and Tiberius had her image thrown into the Tiber. The refusal to perform sacrifice before the image of the emperor was made a penal offense. All these were measures against atheism, in the classical sense of the word, manifested in theoretical or practical contempt of the visible cult. Unless we can put our western feeling of these matters out of action we shall never penetrate into the essence of the world image that underlay the classical attitude to them. Poets and philosophers might spin myths and transform god figures as much as they pleased. The dogmatic interpretation of the sensuous stator was everyone's liberty. The histories of the gods could be made fun of in satiric drama and comedy, even that did not impugn their Euclidean existence. But the statue of the god, the cult, the plastic embodiment of piety, it was not permitted to any man to touch these. It was not out of hypocrisy that the fine minds of the earlier empire, who had ceased to take a myth of any kind seriously, punctiliously conformed to the public cults and, above all, to the cult, deeply real for all classes, of the emperor. And, on the other hand, the poets and thinkers of the mature Faustian culture were at liberty not to go to church, to avoid confession, to stay at home on procession days and, in Protestant surroundings, to live without any relations with the church whatever. But they were not free to touch points of dogma, for that would have been dangerous within any confession and any sect, including, once more and expressly, free thought. The Roman Stoic, who without faith in the mythology piously observed the ritual forms, has his counterpart in those men of the Age of Enlightenment, like Lessing and Goethe, who disregarded the rites of the Church but never doubted the fundamental truths of faith. 12. If we turn back from nature feeling become form to nature knowledge become system, we know God or the gods as the origin of the images by which the intellect seeks to make the world around comprehensible to itself. Goethe once remarked, Tarima, the reason is as old as the world, even the child has reason. But it is not applied in all times in the same way or to the same objects. The earlier centuries had their ideas and intuitions of the fancy, but ours bring them into notions. The great views of life were brought into shapes, into gods, today they are brought into notions. Then the productive force was greater, now the destructive force or art of separation. The strong religiousness of Newton's Mechanics 29 and the almost complete atheism of the formulations of modern dynamics are of like color, positive and negative of the same primary feeling. A physical system of necessity has all the characters of the soul to whose world form it belongs. The deism of the Baroque belongs with its dynamics and its analytical geometry. Its three basic principles, God, freedom and immortality, are in the language of mechanics the principles of inertia, Galileo, least action, de Lambert, and the conservation of energy, Q. R. Meyer. That which nowadays we call quite generally physics is in reality an artifact of the Baroque. At this stage the reader will not feel it as paradoxical to associate the mode of representation which rests on the assumption of distant forces and their, wholly unclassical and anything but naive, idea of action at a distance, attraction and repulsion of masses, especially with the Jesuit style of architecture founded by Vignola, and to call it accordingly the Jesuit style of physics, and I would likewise call the infinitesimal calculus which of necessity came into being just when and where it did, the Jesuit style of mathematic. Within this style, a working hypothesis that deepens the technique of experimentation is correct, for Loyola's concern, like Newton's, was not description of nature but method. Western physics is by its inward form dogmatic and not ritualistic, cultis. Its content is the dogma of force as identical with space and distance. The theory of the mechanical act, as against the mechanical posture, 
in space. Consequently its tendency is persistently to overcome the apparent 